This book is dedicated to Patty Ombre, my business partner, president of my companies, and for 25 years, my sounding board, confidant, and closest friend. From those early days, typing the first chicken soup for the soul stories, to building a hugely successful company that has expanded my impact worldwide, Patty has helped guide my career, advanced these teachings, and held a vision of my work that is bigger and bolder than anything I could have dreamed myself. Words cannot express my gratitude for your endless energy, selfless focus, and lifelong dedication to this work. You are a treasure. Life is like a combination lock. Your job is to find the right numbers in the right order, so you can have anything you want. Brian Tracy If we did all the things we are capable of doing, we would literally astound ourselves. Thomas A. Edison Forward A decade ago, Janet Switzer and I envisioned a time when the success principles would be read in dozens of languages and followed in more than 100 countries, a time when individuals from every walk of life and groups of every kind would use it as a guidebook for dreaming bigger dreams, planning bigger outcomes, taking action in a bigger way, and enjoying the kind of expanded, abundant lifestyle that, for them, never seemed possible before. We envisioned a time when educators, corporate managers, and small group leaders would take up our challenge to advance the message of the success principles by training others in these human potential basics, time when we could look back with pride at the millions of lives that had been touched by the universal message and proven principles in this book. I'm happy to say that time is now. Over the past ten years, not only has the success principle spread to 108 countries in 30 languages, but the feedback and success stories we've received in return have been gratifying and humbling. Men, women, teens, students, athletes, entrepreneurs, stay-at-home parents, rising corporate stars, and other achievers have become dedicated to creating lives of abundance, joy, professional fulfillment, and personal accomplishment. They are proof positive that these principles work, if you work the principles. Through countless stories and heartwarming reports, I've watched this phenomenon unfold, as readers moved beyond today's culture of resignation and mediocrity to create the exciting, compelling life of their dreams. They have overcome their own limitations, whether physical challenges, economic hardship, past failures, or simply their own limiting beliefs, to achieve astounding success. At one time, perhaps just like you, they wondered how a single book could change their lives. Doug Whittle a builder from Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada, doubled his income within a year of applying what he learned, then doubled it again 12 months later. He began enjoying substantially more free time and built four magnificent homes so he and his family could spend summers and winters in temperate climates. Days before talking to Doug, we heard from Miriam Laundrie, a mom who dreamed of bringing self-esteem concepts to more than 100,000 children, changing lives and communities around the globe. Not only did she surpass her goal in less than a year, she attained a Guinness World Records title for her accomplishment. Sean Gallagher, a successful Irish entrepreneur, appeared for three seasons on the hit television show Dragon's Den, Shark Tank in the U.S., and later fulfilled his most audacious goal when he stood for election to become the President of Ireland. He's now a highly sought-after speaker and writer, helping to inform and inspire the next generation of Irish business leaders. Justin Bendel, an aspiring orchestral musician, used the success principles to visualize playing at a world-class concert hall whose picture he'd had for years. Though he didn't know the name of the concert hall in the photo, he pasted it to his vision board anyway. Soon after, he received a fully paid scholarship to pursue graduate studies in music, and within his first year of grad school, was chosen to play with the university orchestra at Carnegie Hall in New York, the concert hall in the photograph he had pasted on his vision board. Using Principle 24, Exceed Expectations, 25-year-old Canadian franchisee Natalie Peace built one of her juice bar locations to record revenues, then sold it for the highest amount ever received for that franchise. 
She's since earned her MBA and now, among other things, teaches business administration classes to fourth-year university students, recommending the success principles as a powerful textbook for future entrepreneurs. After one of my readers, a successful Malaysian businessman, was incarcerated under extremely harsh conditions in China. His wife convinced the guards to pass along his tattered, dog-eared, and marked-up copy of the success principles so he could stay motivated during his 20-month ordeal. He not only re-read it hundreds of times, but also used it to transform himself into an even more motivated, excited, and fearless person who, since his release, has launched a successful information technology business, started two restaurants, and acquired a portfolio of international properties with a group of real estate investors. Pavel Popiolik, Czech Republic's leading importer of computer equipment, with a $600 million business to manage, used what he learned in the success principles to balance his life and work, making time for his true passion, competitive cycling. So far, he's won the Val Duran UCI World Cycling Tour race in the Pyrenees, qualified for the World Masters Cycling Championship, and been profiled in Men's Health magazine. Of course, beyond business success and professional accomplishment are those readers whose entire lives have changed because they implemented the principles in this book. Heather O'Brien Walker, who sustained a devastating brain injury in a warehouse accident at work, first heard the success principles from her hospital bed as her fiancé read them aloud during Heather's 30 days of rehabilitation. Though she couldn't walk or talk or even function normally, she began to visualize her wedding day and made walking down the aisle her breakthrough goal. The process of learning to walk again was grueling. But today, Heather has not only recovered, but she also shares her message of overcoming adversity through speaking engagements and her book, Don't Give Up, Get Up. Akshay Nanavati, an ex-Marine who was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder upon his return from Iraq, is using the principles to beat the condition. His dream? To run across every country in the world, border to border, over the next 25 years, not only as a way to inspire others, but also to give himself the inspiration to get up and take action every day. And Lewis Pugh of Great Britain is the only person to have completed a long-distance swim in every ocean of the world. Over a period of 27 years, he has pioneered swims in the most hostile waters on Earth, including the Antarctic, the North Pole, and the Himalayas, and developed an understanding of the beauty and fragility of life and its many ecosystems. Millions have viewed his talks at TED Global, and he campaigns tirelessly for the creation of marine protected areas and changes to the legal framework governing oceans. In 2013, the United Nations appointed the maritime lawyer as patron of the oceans. And yes, he's a success principles reader, too. With stories like these, and thousands more that have poured in, when it came time to prepare the 10th anniversary edition of The Success Principles, I quickly realized that I could produce an entire companion book filled with just the inspiring and fascinating stories we've received from readers over the last decade. Countless others have used what they learned to become best-selling authors, start businesses, purchase investment properties, get married, lose weight, achieve professional honors, get job promotions, travel the world, get out of debt raise amazing kids, and so much more. But while many of these readers knew exactly what they wanted to achieve when they picked up their copy of The Success Principles, many more didn't. For some readers, achievement seemed so far away that their only want was for life to simply get better. Forrest Willett was one of those readers. At 31 years old, Forrest's life was right on track. He owned three homes, and seven businesses. He'd been married for seven years to a beautiful woman and had a two-year-old son. He was on top of the world. That is, until his world turned upside down. Literally. He was in an automobile accident that threw his car end over end three times, leaving him with a catastrophic brain injury. Suddenly, Forrest found himself incapable of doing even the slightest tasks, with his beautiful wife now teaching him to brush his teeth and comb his hair. Although he knew he was lucky to be alive, 
he began to spiral faster and faster into a deep pit of depression, anger, and despair. In the beginning, like a stroke survivor, he had difficulty conversing on even the most basic level. His humiliation rendered him housebound, and soon fatigue and apathy dominated his existence. For hours, Forrest lay on the sofa, sleeping or watching television. The doctors, his speech therapist, his occupational therapist, his physical therapist, essentially all of the experts, told him that returning to a productive life with the promise of success wasn't possible. So Forrest gave up all hope of ever having a normal existence, let alone a life that fulfilled his dreams. Then one day, as he lay in bed, numbly surfing the TV channels, the words, If you want to get from where you are to where you want to be, caught his attention. Forrest sat up enough to focus on what the news anchor was saying. Jack Canfield was coming up next to discuss his book, The Success Principles. With the smallest spark of hope ignited, Forrest bought the book that they were talking about, the first edition of The Success Principles, which was over 400 pages. At the time, Forrest was just learning to read his son's books, a 35-year-old man reading books for a kindergartner. His speech therapist thought a 400-page book was being overly ambitious. But Forrest was more than ready to get from where he was to where he wanted to be. And so, he began his journey. In the beginning, reading even a single page was slow and laborious. Though he was motivated, Forrest began to wonder if his therapist had been right. Maybe he was being overly ambitious. Then, several months after starting to work his way through The Success Principles, and a full five years after the accident, he got his biggest wake-up call. At his son Hunter's seventh birthday party, Forrest was out in the yard with a boy and a group of his friends, as Hunter opened his presents. Picking a round-shaped package from the pile, Hunter ripped the wrapping paper off to reveal a baseball. Smiling with delight, he immediately threw it at the ground. Naturally, the ball landed with a thud and rolled a couple of feet into the dirt. Hunter picked it up and hurled it at the ground again, where it once more rolled away from him. Before he could try again, the friend who had given him the baseball shouted, Hunter, baseballs don't bounce. In that moment, Forrest was thunderstruck as the impact of his absence hit him like a ton of bricks. How could his son know about such things? They had never thrown a baseball together. Forrest realized he had spent more time with his negative thoughts than with his own son, essentially abandoning him as well as his wife. He knew that if he didn't take charge of his life, it would end up in pieces. He'd find himself divorced, homeless, or worse. The spark inside him turned into a blaze. He went back to the first of the success principles, take 100% responsibility for your life, and tackled it in earnest. In his case, taking 100% responsibility for his life meant he had to stop the negative self-talk. No more poor forest and why did this happen to me? Without that constant negative soundtrack to distract him, Forrest could see that he hadn't been an active participant in his own rehabilitation. He had been letting his physical therapist stretch him, then wondered why he wasn't getting stronger. He'd sat there passively listening while his speech therapist read to him, then complained that his reading skills weren't getting any better. Now Forrest started to believe that his life could be different, that he could make it different. And that's when things really started to change. Almost immediately, his self-awareness began to grow. Things that had gone over his head for so long finally registered. Where were all his friends? The answer was as painful as it was clear. He'd abandoned them, in the same way he'd abandoned his family. Everyone had stopped calling long ago, pushed away by Forrest's negativity, and he'd been too self-absorbed to care. Just noticing these things was a success in itself, Forrest reminded himself. He was making progress. Next, he decided to give up blaming and complaining. Not an easy task. It had become so habitual that Forrest didn't even realize he was doing it. So he asked the people around him to help him become aware when he slipped back into his old ways. In fact, his wife and therapists had a sign. If Forrest began to blame or complain, they let him know by pulling on their ear. When he saw that, he'd stop whatever he was saying in mid-sentence, take a deep breath, 
and consider his next words more carefully. Not that speaking, positively or negatively, was easy for him. Forrest still hadn't fully regained his speech faculties, and sometimes he was unable to find the words he needed, or he stuttered. Because of this, he didn't want to go to the grocery store or post office in case he ran into someone he knew. To counter this, he focused on Principle 22. Practice Persistence Each day he read the success principles for 20 minutes and practiced stepping out of his comfort zone. Day after day, he practiced a little more and went a little further. One of his steps out of his comfort zone took him to a local coffee shop. For years, Forrest had put his head down and walked past the coffee shop, keeping his eyes glued to the cement. But this day, he walked in, reminding himself of Principle 15. Experience your fear and take action anyway. Unfortunately, he was met right away by his worst fear. An old acquaintance recognized him and called out. Although he was cringing with embarrassment inside, Forrest stayed calm and walked over and sat down. He explained as best he could what had been happening. He was amazed to find it actually felt good to stand up for himself. In the coming days, Forrest tried this with others, and with time, talking got easier. He discovered there were people around him who were willing to support him, especially now that Forrest was willing to support himself. He also saw that he wasn't alone in dealing with life's fears and challenges. Everyone he talked to seemed to have struggles and pain of their own. This insight helped him to overcome the shame he'd been carrying for so long. As time passed, he could hardly believe the new successes he was having. Within a year of applying the principles, Forrest was doing all of the things the doctors had said he'd never do again. He returned to school. He got off all medications, both for pain and depression. He started volunteering. He started turning every negative into a positive. And he's been doing that ever since. Today, it's hard to believe there was a time not that long ago that Forrest couldn't speak fluently, nor read or write very well. But he turned that around so completely that he wrote a book about his experiences. As a result, he gets almost daily requests to share his story in front of audiences. And while he never would have believed it possible during the dark days, today he loves public speaking and believes he's found the work he was meant to do. He's thrilled to travel and speak to groups around the world. Reading the success principles also shifted Forrest's thinking about success in general. Before the accident, success, to him, meant more money and more things. A bigger house, a bigger boat, opening more businesses, owning more stuff. After the accident, he'd given up on ever attaining any success, however you define it. Today, thanks to the success principles, he's learned the profound truth that having all the stuff in the world doesn't mean anything if you're not truly living, which Forrest now knows means giving and receiving love. If currency were counted in friends and love, Forrest would be the richest man in the world. While Forrest Willett used the success principles to define and achieve success for himself, how you define success is solely in your power. For you, success might be a substantial income, effortless financial reward, and the luxuries of a high net worth lifestyle. It may be professional recognition or achievement in your hobby or philanthropic endeavors. It may be healthy, happy, and engaged children, or a family life that provides day-after-day -day enjoyment and bliss. Or it may be entrance into the world stage for a project or subject matter you are passionate about. Whatever your definition of success, rest assured that you can hold in your hands the roadmap to achieving it. Even when you're skeptical, the principles always work. One of my favorite stories over the last 10 years is from a reader in the Philippines who at first was skeptical, but who committed to applying the principles anyway for just one year. On the last stop of a six-city Asian tour conducting success principles workshops, a young man named John Kaloub approached me at a book signing in Manila's largest shopping mall. He was writing a newspaper column about successful people for the biggest newspaper in the Philippines and asked me for an interview. At the end of a very engaging hour, I told him that he was a great interviewer and asked how long he had been doing it. With a sense of pride, he replied that I was his very first interviewee. He went on to say that, up until recently, 
He and two partners had owned and operated three successful restaurants, but that bickering between the partners had eventually led to the failure of the business. John was now homeless, broke, and sleeping on couches in his friends' apartments. He had taken public transportation to the book signing because he no longer owned a car. And all the money he had in the world was the three dollars cash left in his pocket. When I heard this, and because I liked John, I bought him a copy of the Success Principles from the bookstore and offered him a free seat in the next day's workshop. Giving him twenty dollars to buy some food, I extracted a promise that, if he liked it, he would write a feature article about the workshop. Two and a half years later, I returned to Manila to conduct another workshop. As I was getting ready to begin, I noticed a well-dressed man in a blue blazer and gold Doc Martin shoes, followed by an entourage of ten people, all wearing the same polo shirt with a bright logo on it. I was curious, so I walked over to the group and, to my surprise and delight, the man in the blue blazer was John Kaloub. He told me that he had become one of the most successful businessmen in Manila. When John related the story of how he'd accomplished his success, I was so moved that I asked John to share it, in his own words. Sitting in the seminar with my arms crossed tightly across my chest, I listened carefully as Jack Canfield described his principles for success. At first I was very skeptical. He had crazy ideas, like cutting out pictures, pasting them on a board and looking at it every day, then feeling as though you already had what you wanted. My rational mind said, What a joke! Like looking at some pictures is going to help me get what I want? At one point, Jack even talked about Dr. Masaru Emoto's famous experiment with water crystals and showed pictures of how water can be affected by thoughts, words, and feelings. Though I was intrigued, I still wasn't convinced. With my mind full of doubts and questions, I returned home from the seminar and thought more about what Jack had shared. It soon dawned on me. Jack was a very, very successful guy who had used these principles— and here I was totally broke. Who would you listen to? I asked myself. Besides, I had lost everything. I had nothing else to lose. I decided to read the book he had given me and diligently follow the principles for one year. Every week I worked with a different principle. I began using visualization and even created one of those crazy dream boards I'd been so skeptical about. The first image I cut out was a picture of a BMW my dream car. At the time, I was so far away from affording any car, let alone a BMW. To get around, I walked or rode in a jeepney, a very crowded mode of public transportation in the Philippines. Soon, however, I used the principle to turn my doubt into trust. It worked, and within a year, I bought my first BMW. Another principle I discovered was principle two. Be clear why you're here. When I was younger, I bounced from job to job, just to make a living and pay my bills. Then, during the seminar, Jack led us through an exercise to identify our deepest passion. I not only realized I have a love for teaching, but I began to identify it as my true gift and purpose. To begin taking action on this purpose, I created a breakthrough goal at the seminar to become the Philippines' leading success coach. I launched a series of seminars— teaching the principles I had learned from Jack. I started coaching and began consulting for different companies. My income quickly rose, and soon I was earning over a million pesos, which in the Philippines is a lot of money. Next, I combined my interest in travel with my passion for teaching and began conducting seminars around the world. Today, my training company is the biggest profit center of all the companies I own. Before, I hadn't been doing what I loved so my success was hit or miss. Now I'm so enthusiastic about teaching these principles that people flock to see me. I've even earned seven figures in one day. Jack has helped me see that you really can have it all. My first vision board was created in 2006, and since then I've achieved more than 70% of what I set out to do. Because of the success principles, I'm the highest-paid motivational speaker in the country, and I'm well on my way to becoming the Philippines' number one success coach. If I can go from broke to becoming a star in my field just by living these principles, anyone can.
I've also seen the results in the lives of my clients as thousands of my countrymen have achieved their dreams. Many were living a hand-to-mouth existence, but are now on their way to becoming multimillionaires. We are all living proof that the principles always work, if you always work the principles. John Kaloub experienced the power of the success principles, and you too will see changes in your life when you apply these classic principles along with the new insights contained in this 10th anniversary edition. I salute you. I congratulate you. I welcome you on this journey. To your success, Jack Canfield. Introduction If a man, for whatever reason, has the opportunity to lead an extraordinary life, he has no right to keep it to himself. Jacques-Yves Cousteau legendary underwater explorer and filmmaker. If a man writes a book, let him set down only what he knows. I have guesses enough of my own. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, German poet, novelist, playwright, and philosopher. This is not a book of good ideas. This is a book of timeless principles used by successful men and women throughout history. I have studied these success principles for over 30 years, and have applied them to my own life. The phenomenal level of success that I now enjoy is the result of applying these principles day in and day out since I began to learn them in 1968. My success includes being the author and editor of more than 200 books, including 60 New York Times bestsellers, with over 500 million copies in print in 50 languages around the world holding a Guinness Book World Record for having seven books on the May 24, 1998 New York Times bestseller list, earning a multi-million dollar net income every year for the past 20 years, living in a beautiful California estate, appearing on every major talk show in America, from Oprah and Montel to Larry King Live and Good Morning America, having a weekly newspaper column read by millions every week commanding speaking fees of $25,000 to $60,000 a talk, speaking to Fortune 500 companies all over the world, being the recipient of numerous professional and civic awards, having an outrageous relationship with my amazing wife and wonderful children, and having achieved a steady state of wellness, balance, happiness, and inner peace. I get to socialize with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, movie, television, and recording stars, celebrated authors, and the world's finest spiritual teachers and leaders. I have spoken to members of Congress, professional athletes, corporate managers, and sales superstars in many of the best resorts and retreat centers in the world, from the Four Seasons Resort in the British West Indies to the finest hotels in Acapulco and Cancun. I enjoy skiing in Idaho, California, and Utah, go river rafting in Colorado, and hike in the mountains of California and Washington. Plus, I get to vacation in the world's finest resorts in Hawaii, Australia, Thailand, Morocco, France, Bali, and Italy. All in all, life is a real kick. Yet, like most of you reading this book, my life started out in a very average way. I grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia, where my dad worked in a florist's shop, making $8,000 a year. My mother was an alcoholic, and my father was a workaholic. I worked during the summers to make ends meet, as a lifeguard at a pool, and at the same florist shop as my father. I went to college on a scholarship, and worked serving breakfast in one of the dorms to pay for books, clothes, and dates. Nobody handed me anything on a silver platter. During my last year of graduate school, I had a part-time teaching job that paid me $120 every two weeks. My rent was $79 a month, so that left $161 to cover all my other expenses. Toward the end of the month, I ate what became known as my 21-cent dinners, a 10-cent can of tomato paste, garlic salt, and water over an 11-cent bag of spaghetti noodles. I know what it is like to be scraping by on the bottom rungs of the economic ladder. After graduate school, I started my career as a high school history teacher in an all-black school on the south side of Chicago. And then I met my mentor, W. Clement Stone. Stone was a self-made multimillionaire who hired me to work at his foundation, 
where he trained me in the fundamental success principles that I still operate from today. My job was to teach these same principles to others. Over the years, I have gone on from my time with Mr. Stone to interview hundreds of successful people, Olympic and professional athletes, celebrated entertainers, best-selling authors, business leaders, political leaders, successful entrepreneurs, and top salespeople. I have read literally thousands of books, attended hundreds of seminars, and listened to thousands of hours of audio programs to uncover the universal principles for creating success and happiness. I then applied those principles to my own life. The ones that worked are the principles I have taught in my speeches, seminars, and workshops to well over two million people in all 50 U.S. states and in 36 countries around the world. These principles and techniques have not only worked for me, but they have also helped hundreds of thousands of my students achieve breakthrough success in their careers, greater wealth in their finances, greater aliveness and joy in their relationships, and greater happiness and fulfillment in their lives. My students have started successful businesses, become self-made millionaires, achieved athletic stardom, received lucrative recording contracts, starred in movie and television roles, won political offices, had huge impact in their communities, written best-selling books, been named Teacher of the Year in their school districts, broken all sales records in their companies, written award-winning screenplays, become presidents of their corporations, been recognized for their outstanding philanthropic contributions, created highly successful relationships, and raised unusually happy and successful children. The principles always work if you always work the principles. All of these same results are possible for you. I know for a fact that you too can attain unimagined levels of success. Why? Because the principles and techniques always work. All you have to do is put them to work for you. A few days before I wrote this book, I was interviewed on a television show in Dallas, Texas. I had made the claim that if people would use the principles I was teaching, I could double their income and double their time off in less than two years. The woman interviewing me was highly skeptical. I gave her a copy of one of my audio programs and told her that if she used the principles and techniques for two years and she didn't double her income and double her time off, I would come back on her show and write her a check for $1,000. If they did work, she had to ask me back and tell her viewers the principles had worked. A short nine months later, I ran into her at the National Speakers Association convention in Orlando, Florida. She told me that not only had she already doubled her income, but she had also moved to a bigger station with a substantial pay increase. It started a public speaking career, and had already finished and sold a book, all in just nine months. The fact is that anyone can consistently produce these kinds of results on a regular basis. All you have to do is decide what you want, believe you deserve it, and practice the success principles in this book. The fundamentals are the same for all people and all professions, even if you're currently unemployed. It doesn't matter if your goals are to be the top salesperson in your company, get straight A's in school, lose weight, buy your dream home or become a world-class professional athlete, rock star, award-winning journalist, multimillionaire, or successful entrepreneur. The principles and strategies are the same. And if you learn them, assimilate them, and apply them with discipline every day, they will transform your life beyond your wildest dreams. You can't hire someone else to do your push-ups for you. As motivational philosopher Jim Rohn so aptly put it, you can't hire someone else to do your push-ups for you. You must do them yourself if you are to get any value out of them. Whether it is exercising, meditating, reading, studying, learning a new language, creating a mastermind group, setting measurable goals, visualizing success, repeating affirmations, or practicing a new skill, you are going to have to do it. No one else can do these things for you. I will give you the road map, but you will have to drive the car. I will teach you the principles, but you will have to apply them. If you choose to put in the effort, I promise you the rewards will be well worth it.
How this book is structured. To help you quickly learn these powerful principles, I have organized this book into six sections. Part 1, The Fundamentals of Success, consists of 25 chapters that contain the absolute basics you must do to get from where you are to where you want to be. You'll start by exploring the critical importance of taking 100% responsibility for your life and your results. From there, you'll learn how to clarify your life purpose, your vision for your ideal life, and what you truly want to achieve. Next, we'll look at how to create an unshakable belief in yourself and your dreams. Then I'll help you turn your vision into a set of concrete goals and an action plan for achieving them. I'll also teach you how to harness the incredible power of affirmations and visualization, two of the greatest success secrets of all Olympic athletes, top entrepreneurs, world leaders, and high achievers. The next few chapters have to do with taking those necessary but sometimes scary action steps that are required to make your dreams come true. Part 2, Transform Yourself for Success, addresses the important inner work you'll need to do, work that'll help you remove any mental and emotional blocks you may have to success. It's not enough to know what to do. You also need to understand the methodology for removing self-defeating beliefs, fears, and habits that are holding you back. Like driving your car with the emergency brake on, these blocks can significantly slow your progress. You must learn how to release the brakes, or you will always experience life as a struggle and fall short of your intended goals. Part 3. Build Your Success Team Reveals how to build different kinds of support teams so you can spend your time focusing exclusively on your core genius. You will also learn how to redefine time, utilize the benefits of a personal coach, and access your own inner wisdom, an untapped but ultra-rich resource. In Part 4, Create Successful Relationships, I'll teach you a number of principles, as well as some very practical techniques, for building and maintaining successful relationships. In this day of strategic alliances and power networks, it's literally impossible to build large-scale, long-lasting success without world-class relationship skills, including in social media. Next, because so many people equate success with money, and because money is vital to our survival and the quality of our life, Part 5 is entitled Success and Money. I'll teach you how to develop a more positive money consciousness, how to ensure that you have plenty of money to live the lifestyle you want, both now and after you retire, and the importance of tithing and service in guaranteeing your financial success. Finally, in Part 6, because technology is so important today, I've honed down the most important principles that successful people follow in Success in the Digital Age, a look at how to master only the technology you need, how to brand yourself and develop a unique voice online, how to use social media to connect and develop valuable relationships, and how to use crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, and other internet-based strategies to find the people and resources that can help you reach your most important goals. How to read this book. Everyone learns differently, and you probably know how you learn best. And though there are many ways that you can read this book, I'd like to make a few suggestions that previous readers have found helpful. You may want to read this book through once, just to get a feel for the total process, before you start the work of creating the life you truly seek. The principles are presented in an order that builds one upon the other. They are like the numbers in a combination lock. You need all the numbers, and you need them in the right order. It doesn't matter what color, race, gender, or age you are. If you know the combination, the lock has to open for you. As you are reading, I strongly encourage you to underline and highlight everything that feels important to you. Make notes in the margin about the things you'll put into action. Then review those notes and highlighted sections again and again. Repetition is the key to real learning. Every time you reread portions of this book, you'll literally remind yourself of what you need to do to get from where you are to where you want to be. As you'll discover, it takes repetitive exposure over time to a new idea before that idea becomes a natural part of your way of thinking and being. You may also discover that you're already familiar with some of the principles here. That's great. But ask yourself, 
Am I currently practicing them? If not, make a commitment to put them into action now. Remember, the principles only work if you work the principles. The second time you read through this book, you'll want to read one chapter at a time. Then take whatever time necessary to put into practice that principle and the techniques that accompany it. If you're already doing some of these things, keep doing them. If not, start now. Like many of my past students and clients, you too may find yourself resisting taking some of the suggested action steps. But my experience has shown that the ones you most resist are the ones you most need to embrace. Remember, reading this book is not the same as doing the homework. Any more than reading a book on weight loss is the same as actually eliminating certain foods, eating fewer calories, and exercising more. You might find it useful to connect with one or two other people who would like to join you as accountability partners. See page 408 and ensure that each of you actually implements what you learn. True learning only occurs when you assimilate and apply the new information, where there is a change in your behavior. A warning. Of course, any change requires sustained effort to overcome years' worth of internal and external resistance. Initially, you may find yourself getting very excited about all this new information. You may feel a newfound sense of hope and enthusiasm for the new vision of your life as it can be. This is good. But be forewarned that you may also begin to experience other feelings as well. You may feel frustration at not knowing about all of this earlier. Anger at your parents and teachers for not teaching you these important concepts at home and at school, or anger at yourself for having already learned many of these things and not having acted on them. Just take a deep breath and realize that this is all part of the process of your journey. Everything in the past has actually been perfect. Everything in your past has led you to this transformative moment in time. Everyone, including you, has always done the best they could with what they knew at the time. Now you are about to know more. Celebrate your new awareness. It is about to set you free. You may also find that there will be times when you wonder, why isn't all of this working faster? Why haven't I already achieved my goal? Why aren't I rich already? Why don't I have the man or woman in my dreams by now? When am I going to achieve my ideal weight? Success takes time, effort, perseverance, and patience. If you apply all of the principles and techniques covered in this book, you will achieve your goals. You will realize your dreams. But it won't happen overnight. Finally, it's natural in the pursuit of any goal to come upon obstacles, to feel temporarily stuck on a plateau. This is normal. Anyone who has ever played a musical instrument, participated in a sport, or practiced a martial art knows that you hit plateaus where it seems as though you're making no progress whatsoever. That's when the uninitiated often quit, give up, drop out, or take up another instrument or sport. But the wise have discovered if they just keep practicing their instrument, sport, or martial art, or in your case, the success principles in this book, eventually they make what feels like a sudden leap to a higher level of proficiency. Be patient. Hang in there. Don't give up. You will break through. I promise you, the principles always work. Okay, let's get started. It's time to start living the life you've imagined. Henry James, American-born author of 20 novels, 112 stories, and 12 plays. Part 1. The Fundamentals of Success Learn the fundamentals of the game and stick to them. Band-Aid remedies never last. Jack Nicklaus, legendary professional golfer. Principle 1. Take 100% responsibility for your life. You must take personal responsibility. You cannot change the circumstances, the seasons, or the wind. But you can change yourself. Jim Rohn, America's foremost business philosopher. One of the most pervasive myths in the American culture today is that we are entitled to a great life, that somehow, somewhere, someone, certainly not us, 
is responsible for filling our lives with continual happiness, exciting career options, nurturing family time, and blissful personal relationships simply because we exist. But the real truth, and the one lesson this whole book is based on, is that there is only one person responsible for the quality of life you live. That person is you. If you want to be successful, you have to take 100% responsibility for everything that you experience in your life. This includes the level of your achievements, the results you produce, the quality of your relationships, the state of your health and physical fitness, your income, your debts, your feelings, everything. This is not easy. In fact, most of us have been conditioned to blame something outside of ourselves for the parts of our life we don't like. We blame our parents, our bosses, our friends, our co-workers, our spouse, the weather, the economy, the government, our astrological chart, our lack of money, anyone or anything we can pin the blame on. We never want to look at where the real problem is. Ourselves. There is a wonderful story told about a man who is out walking one night and comes upon another man down on his knees looking for something under a street lamp. The passerby inquires as to what the other man is looking for. He answers that he is looking for his lost key. The passerby offers to help and gets down on his knees and helps him search for the key. After an hour of fruitless searching, he says, We've looked everywhere for it and we haven't found it. Are you sure that you lost it here? The other man replies, No, I lost it in my house, but there is more light out here under the street lamp. It is time to stop looking outside yourself for the answers to why you haven't created the life and results you want. For it is you who creates the quality of the life you lead and the results you produce. You. No one else. To achieve major success in life, to achieve those things that are most important to you, you must assume 100% responsibility for your life. Nothing less will do. 100% Responsibility for Everything As I mentioned in the introduction, when I was only one year out of graduate school, I had the good fortune to work for W. Clement Stone. He was a self-made multimillionaire worth $600 million at the time. Stone was also America's premier success guru. He was the publisher of Success Magazine, author of The Success System That Never Fails, and co-author with Napoleon Hill of Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. When I was completing my first week's orientation, Mr. Stone asked me if I took 100% responsibility for my life. I think so, I responded. This is a yes or no question, young man. You either do or you don't. Well, I guess I'm not sure. Have you ever blamed anyone for any circumstance in your life? Have you ever complained about anything? Uh, yeah, I guess I have. Don't guess. Think. Yes, I have. Okay, then. That means you don't take 100% responsibility for your life. Taking 100% responsibility means you acknowledge that you create everything that happens to you. It means you understand that you are the cause of all of your experience. If you want to be really successful, and I know you do, then you will have to give up blaming and complaining and take total responsibility for your life. That means all your results, both your successes and your failures. That is the prerequisite for creating a life of success. It is only by acknowledging that you have created everything up until now that you take charge of creating the future you want. You see, Jack, if you realize that you have created your current conditions, then you can uncreate them and recreate them at will. Do you understand that? Yes, sir, I do. Are you willing to take 100% responsibility for your life? Yes, sir, I am. And I did. You have to give up all your excuses. 99% of all failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. George Washington Carver, chemist who discovered over 325 uses for the peanut. If you want to create the life of your dreams, then you are going to have to take 100% responsibility for your life as well. That means giving up all your excuses, all your victim stories, 
all the reasons why you can't and why you haven't up until now, and all your blaming of outside circumstances. You have to give them all up forever. You have to take the position that you have always had the power to make it different, to get it right, to produce the desired result. For whatever reason, ignorance, lack of awareness, fear, needing to be right, the need to feel safe, you chose not to exercise that power. Who knows why? It doesn't matter. The past is the past. All that matters now is that from this point forward you choose. That's right. It's a choice. To act as if you are 100% responsible for everything that does or doesn't happen to you. If something doesn't turn out as planned, you will ask yourself, How did I create that? What was I thinking? What were my beliefs? What did I say or not say? What did I do or not do to create that result? How did I get the other person to act that way? What do I need to do differently next time to get the result I want? A few years after I met Mr. Stone, Dr. Robert Resnick, a psychotherapist in Los Angeles, taught me a very simple but very important formula that made this idea of 100% responsibility even clearer to me. The formula is E plus R equals O. Event plus response equals outcome. The basic idea is that every outcome you experience in life, whether it is success or failure, wealth or poverty, health or illness, intimacy or estrangement, joy or frustration, is the result of how you have responded to an earlier event or events in your life. If you don't like the outcomes you are currently getting, there are two basic choices you can make. 1. You can blame the event, E, for your lack of results, O. In other words, you can blame the economy, the weather, the lack of money, your lack of education, racism, gender bias, the current administration in Washington, your parents, your wife or husband, your boss's attitude, your employees, the system or lack of systems, and so on. If you're a golfer, you've probably even blamed your clubs and the course you've played on. No doubt all these factors do exist, but if they were the deciding factor, nobody would ever succeed. Jackie Robinson would never have played Major League Baseball. Barack Obama would never have become President of the United States. Sidney Poitier and Denzel Washington would never have become movie stars. Dianne Feinstein and Barbara Boxer would never have become U.S. Senators. Bill Gates would never have founded Microsoft and Steve Jobs would never have started Apple computers. For every reason why it's not possible, there are hundreds of people who have faced the same circumstances and succeeded. Lots of people overcome these so-called limiting factors, so it can't be the limiting factors that limit you. It is not the external conditions and circumstances that stop you. It is you. We stop ourselves. We think limiting thoughts and engage in self-defeating behaviors. We defend our self-destructive habits, such as drinking, smoking, and not getting enough sleep, with indefensible logic. We ignore useful feedback, fail to continuously educate ourselves and learn new skills, waste time on the trivial aspects of our lives, engage in idle gossip, eat unhealthy food, fail to exercise, spend more money than we make, fail to invest in our future. Avoid necessary conflict, fail to tell the uncomfortable truth, don't ask for what we want, and then wonder why our lives don't work. 2. You can instead simply change your responses, R, to the events, E, the way things are, until you get the outcomes, O, you want. You can change your thinking, change your communication, change the pictures you hold in your head, your images of yourself and the world, and change your behavior, the things you do. That is all you really have any control over anyway. Unfortunately, most of us are so run by our habits that we never change our behavior. We get stuck in our conditioned responses to our spouses and our children, to our colleagues at work, to our customers and our clients, to our students, and to the world at large. We are a bundle of conditioned reflexes that operate outside of our control. You have to regain control of your thoughts, your images, your dreams and daydreams, and your behavior. Everything you think, say, and do 
needs to become intentional and aligned with your purpose, your values, and your goals. If you don't like your outcomes, change your responses. Let's look at some examples of how this works. I remember living in Los Angeles during a terrible earthquake. Two days later, I watched as a CNN reporter interviewed people commuting to work. The earthquake had damaged one of the main freeways leading into the city. Traffic was at a standstill, and what was normally a one-hour drive had become a two- or three-hour drive. The CNN reporter knocked on the window of one of the cars stuck in traffic and asked the driver how he was doing. He responded angrily, I hate California. First there were fires, then floods, and now an earthquake. No matter what time I leave in the morning, I'm going to be late for work. This sucks. Then the reporter knocked on the window of the car behind him and asked the second driver the same question. This driver was all smiles. He replied, It's no problem. I left my house at 5 a.m. I don't think under the circumstances my boss can ask for more than that. I have lots of music and my Spanish language lessons with me. I've got my cell phone. I have coffee and a thermos. My lunch? I even brought a book to read. So I'm fine. Now, if the earthquake or the traffic, the event, were really the deciding variables, then everyone should have been angry. But everyone wasn't. It was their individual response to the traffic that gave them their particular outcome. It was thinking negative thoughts or thinking positive thoughts, leaving the house prepared or leaving the house unprepared that made the difference. It was all a matter of attitude and behavior that created their completely different experiences. I've heard there's going to be a recession. I've decided not to participate. A friend of mine owns a Lexus dealership in Southern California. When war in the Middle East broke out, people stopped coming in to buy Lexuses. My friend and his sales team knew that if they didn't change their response, R, to the event, E, of nobody coming into the showroom, they were going to slowly go out of business. Their normal response, R, would have been to continue placing ads in the newspaper and on the radio, then wait for people to come into the dealership. But that wasn't working. The outcome, O, oh, they were getting was a steady decrease in sales. So they tried a number of new things. The one that worked was driving a fleet of new cars out to where the rich people were, the country clubs, marinas, polo grounds, parties in Beverly Hills, Westlake Village, and Lake Sherwood, and then inviting them to take a spin in a new Lexus. Now, think about this. Have you ever test-driven a new car and then got back into your old car? Remember that feeling of dissatisfaction you felt as you compared your old car to the new car you had just driven? Your old car was fine up until then. But suddenly you knew there was something better, and you wanted it. The same thing happened with these folks. After test driving the new car, a high percentage of the people bought or leased a new Lexus. The dealership had changed their response, R, to an unexpected event, E, the war until they got the outcome, O, oh, increased sales that they wanted. They actually ended up selling more cars per week than before the war broke out. Everything you experience today is the result of choices you have made in the past. Everything you experience in life, both internally and externally, is the result of how you have responded to a previous event. Event. You are given a $400 bonus. Response. You spend it on a night on the town with friends. Outcome? You are broke. Event. You are given a $400 bonus. Response. You invest it in your mutual fund. Outcome? You have an increased net worth. You have control over only three things in your life. The thoughts you think, the images you visualize, and the actions you take. Your behavior. How you use these three things determines everything you experience. If you don't like what you are producing and experiencing, you have to change your responses. Change your negative thoughts to positive ones. Change what you daydream about. Change your habits. Change what you read. Change your friends. Change how you talk to yourself and others. If you keep on doing what you've always done, you'll keep on getting what you've always got. Twelve-step programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous Define insanity as continuing the same behavior and expecting a different result. 
it ain't gonna happen. If you're an alcoholic and you keep on drinking, your life is not going to get any better. Likewise, if you only continue your current behaviors, your life is not going to get any better either. The day you change your responses is the day your life will begin to get better. If what you are currently doing would produce the more and better that you are seeking in life, the more and better would have already shown up. If you want something different, you are going to have to do something different. You have to give up blaming. All blame is a waste of time, no matter how much fault you find with another, and regardless of how much you blame him, it will not change you. Wayne Dyer, co-author of How to Get What You Really, 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 Really Want You will never become successful as long as you continue to blame someone or something else for your lack of success. If you are going to be a winner, you have to acknowledge the truth. It is you who took the actions, thought the thoughts created the feelings, and made the choices that got you to where you are now. It was you. You are the one who ate the junk food. You are the one who didn't say no. You are the one who took the job. You are the one who stayed in the job. You are the one who chose to believe them. You are the one who ignored your intuition. You are the one who abandoned your dream. You are the one who bought it. You are the one who didn't take care of it. You were the one who decided you had to do it alone. You are the one who trusted him. You were the one who said yes to the dogs. In short, you thought the thoughts, you created the feelings, you made the choice, you said the words, and that's why you are where you are now. You have to give up complaining. The man who complains about the way the ball bounces is likely the one who dropped it. Lou Holtz, the only coach in NCAA history to lead six different college teams to postseason bowl games, and winner of a national championship and Coach of the Year honors, now an ESPN football analyst. Let's take a moment to really look at complaining. In order to complain about something or someone, you have to believe that something better exists. You have to have a reference point of something you prefer that you are not willing to take responsibility for creating. Let's look at that more closely. If you didn't believe there was something better possible, more money, a bigger house, a more fulfilling job, more fun, a more loving partner, you couldn't complain. So you have this image of something better, and you know you would prefer it, but you are unwilling to take the risks required to create it. Complaining is an ineffective response to an event that does not produce a better outcome. Think about this. People only complain about things they can do something about. We don't complain about the things we have no power over. Have you ever heard anyone complain about gravity? No, never. Have you ever seen an elderly person all bent over with age, walking slowly down the street with the aid of a walker, complaining about gravity? Of course not. But why not? If it weren't for gravity, people wouldn't fall down the stairs, planes wouldn't fall out of the sky, and we wouldn't break any dishes. But nobody complains about it. And the reason is because gravity just exists. There is nothing anyone can do about gravity, so we just accept it. We know that complaining will not change it, so we don't complain about it. In fact, because it just is, we use gravity to our advantage. We build aqueducts down mountainsides to carry water to us, and we use drains to take away our waste. Even more interesting is that we choose to play with gravity, to have fun with it. Almost every sport we play uses gravity. We ski, skydive, high jump, throw the discus and the javelin, and play basketball, baseball, and golf, all of which require gravity. The circumstances you complain about are all situations you can change but you have chosen not to. You can get a better job, find a more loving partner, make more money, move to where the jobs are, live in a nicer house, and eat healthier food. But all of these things would require you to change. You could learn to cook healthier food, say no in the face of peer pressure, quit and find a better job, take the time to conduct due diligence, trust your own gut feelings, Go back to school to pursue your dream. 
take better care of your possessions. Reach out for help. Ask others to assist you. Take a self-development class. Sell or give away the dogs. But why don't you simply do those things? It's because they involve risks. You run the risk of being unemployed, left alone, or ridiculed and judged by others. You run the risk of failure, confrontation, or being wrong. You run the risk of your mother, your neighbors, or your spouse disapproving of you. Making a change might take effort, money, and time. It might be uncomfortable, difficult, or confusing. And so to avoid risking any of those uncomfortable feelings and experiences, you stay put and complain about it. As I stated before, complaining means you have a reference point for something better that you would prefer, but that you are unwilling to take the risk of creating. Either accept that you are making the choice to stay where you are, take responsibility for your choice and stop complaining, or take the risk of doing something new and different to create your life exactly the way you want it. If you want to get from where you are to where you want to be, of course you're going to have to take that risk. So make the decision to stop complaining, to stop spending time with complainers, and get on with creating the life of your dreams. Pete Carroll, the coach of the NFL Seattle Seahawks football team, which won the 2014 Super Bowl, has three rules for his team. 1. Always protect the team. 2. No whining, no complaining, and no excuses. And 3. Be early. These are the rules of a Super Bowl championship team. They are worth adapting. The $2 Game Here's an exercise you can do in your home or your office. It's one we do in ours and in our seminars. Find a large jar or a fishbowl and label it No Blaming, No Complaints, No Excuses. Every time you or someone in your group catches themselves blaming someone else, complaining about something, or making an excuse for their lack of results, the offender has to put $2 in the jar, not as punishment, but as a technique to deepen awareness that those behaviors have a cost. You're complaining to the wrong person. Have you ever noticed that people almost always complain to the wrong person? To someone who can't do anything about their complaint? They go to work and complain about their spouse. Then they come home and complain to their spouse about the people at work. Why? Because it's easier. It's less risky. It takes courage to tell your spouse that you are not happy with the way things are at home. It takes courage to ask for a behavioral change. It also takes courage to ask your boss to plan better so that you don't end up working every weekend. But only your boss can do anything about that. Your spouse can't. Learn to replace complaining with making requests and taking action that will achieve your desired outcomes. That is what successful people do. That is what works. If you find yourself in a situation you don't like, either work to make it better or leave. Do something to change it or get the heck out. Agree to work on the relationship or get a divorce. Work to improve working conditions or find a new job. Either way, you will get a change. As the old adage says, don't just sit there and complain, do something. And remember, it's up to you to make the change, to do something different. The world doesn't owe you anything. You have to create it. You either create or allow everything that happens to you. To be powerful, you need to take the position that you create or allow everything that happens to you. By create, I mean that you directly cause something to happen by your actions or inactions. If you walk up to a man in a bar who is bigger than you and has obviously been drinking for a long time and say to him, You are really ugly and stupid and he jumps off the bar stool, hits you in the jaw, and you end up in the hospital. You created that. That's an easy-to-understand example. Here's one that may be harder to swallow. You work late every night. You come home tired and burned out. You eat dinner in a coma, and then sit down in front of the television to watch a basketball game. You're too tired and stressed out to do anything else, like go for a walk or play with the kids. This goes on for years. Your wife asks you to talk to her. You say, Later, I'm watching the game. 
Three years later, you come home to an empty house and a note that she has left you and taken the kids. You created that one, too. Other times, we simply allow things to happen to us by our inaction and our unwillingness to do what is necessary to create or maintain what we want. You didn't follow through on your threat to take away privileges if the kids didn't clean up after themselves, and now the house looks like a war zone. You didn't demand he join you in counseling or leave the first time he hit you, so now you're still getting hit. You didn't attend any sales and motivational seminars because you were too busy, and now the new kid just won the top sales award. You didn't make the time to take the dogs to obedience training, and now they're out of control. You didn't take the time to maintain your car, and now you're sitting by the side of the road with your car broken down. You didn't go back to school, and now you are being passed over for a promotion. Realize that you are not the victim here. You stood passively by and let it happen. You didn't say anything, make a demand, make a request, say no, try something new, or leave. Yellow Alerts be aware that nothing ever just happens to you. Just like the yellow alerts in the Star Trek television series and movies, you almost always receive advance warnings, in the form of telltale signs, comments from others, gut instinct, or intuition, that alert you to the impending danger and give you time to prevent the unwanted outcome. You are getting yellow alerts all the time. They are external yellow alerts. He keeps coming home later and later with alcohol on his breath. The client's first check bounced. He screamed at his secretary. His mother warned you. Your friends told you. And there are internal yellow alerts. That feeling in your stomach. That fleeting thought that just may be. That intuition that said. That fear that emerged. That dream that woke you up in the middle of the night. We have a whole language that informs us. Clues, inklings, suspicions. The handwriting on the wall. I had a feeling that. I could see it coming for a mile. My gut feeling told me. These alerts give you time to change your response, R, in the E plus R equals zero equation. However, too many people ignore the yellow alerts because paying attention to them would require them to do something that is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable to confront your spouse about the cigarettes in the ashtray that have lipstick on them. It is uncomfortable to speak up in a staff meeting when you are the only one who feels that the proposed plan won't work. It is uncomfortable to tell someone you don't trust them. So you pretend not to see and not to know because it is easier, more convenient, and less uncomfortable, avoids confrontation, keeps the peace, and protects you from having to take risks. Life becomes much easier. Successful people, on the other hand, face facts squarely. They do the uncomfortable and take steps to create their desired outcomes. Successful people don't wait for disasters to occur and then blame something or someone else for their problems. Once you begin to respond quickly and decisively to signals and events as they occur, life becomes much easier. You start seeing improved outcomes both internally and externally. Old internal self-talk such as, I feel like a victim, I feel used, nothing ever seems to work out for me, is replaced with, I feel great, I am in control, I can make things happen. External outcomes such as, Nobody ever comes to our store. We missed our quarterly goals. People are complaining that our new product doesn't work, are transformed into, We have more money in the bank. I led the division in sales. Our product is flying off the shelves. Simple isn't necessarily easy. Though this principle is simple, it is not necessarily easy to implement. It requires concentrated awareness, dedicated discipline, and a willingness to experiment and take risks. You have to be willing to pay attention to what you are doing and to the results you are producing. You have to ask yourself, your family, your friends, your colleagues, 
your managers, your teachers, your coaches, and your clients for feedback. Is what I'm doing working? Could I be doing it better? Is there something more I should be doing that I'm not? Is there something I am doing that I should stop doing? How do you see me limiting myself? Don't be afraid to ask. Most people are afraid to ask for feedback about how they are doing because they are afraid of what they are going to hear. There is nothing to be afraid of. The truth is the truth. You are better off knowing the truth than not knowing it. And once you know, you can do something about it. You cannot improve your life, your relationships, your game, or your performance without feedback. Slow down and pay attention. Life will always give you feedback about the effects of your behavior if you'll just pay attention. If your golf ball is always slicing to the right, if you're not making sales, if you're getting C's in all your college courses, if your children are mad at you, if your body is tired and weak, if your house is a mess, or if you're not happy, this is all feedback. It is telling you that something is wrong. This is the time to start paying attention to what is happening. Ask yourself, how am I creating or allowing this to happen? What am I doing that's working that I need to be doing more of? Should I do more practicing, meditating, delegating, trusting, listening, asking questions, keeping my eye on the ball, advertising, saying I love you, controlling my carbohydrate intake? Or what am I doing that's not working? What do I need to be doing less of? Am I talking too much, watching too much television, spending too much money, eating too much sugar, drinking too much, being late too often, gossiping, putting other people down? You can also ask yourself, what am I not doing that I need to try and see if it works? Do I need to listen more, exercise, get more sleep, drink more water, ask for help, do more marketing, read, plan, communicate? Delegate, follow through, hire a coach, volunteer, or be more appreciative. This book is full of proven success principles and techniques you can immediately put into practice in your life. You will have to suspend judgment, take a leap of faith, act as if they are true, and try them out. Only then will you have first hand experience about their effectiveness for your life. You won't know if they work unless you give them a try. And here's the rub. No one else can do this for you. Only you can do it. But the formula is simple. Do more of what is working. Do less of what isn't. And try on new behaviors to see if they produce better results. Pay attention. Your results don't lie. The easiest, fastest, and best way to find out what is or isn't working is to pay attention to the results you are currently producing. You are either rich or you are not. You either command respect or you don't. You are either golfing par or you are not. You are either maintaining your ideal body weight or you are not. You are either happy or you are not. You either have what you want or you don't. It's that simple. Results don't lie. You have to give up any excuses and justifications and come to terms with the results you are producing. If you are under quota or overweight, all the great reasons in the world won't change that. The only thing that will change your results is to change your behavior. Prospect more. Get some sales training. Change your sales presentation. Change your diet. Consume fewer calories and exercise more frequently. These are things that will make a difference. But you have to first be willing to look at the results you are producing. The only starting point that works is reality. So start paying attention to what is so. Look around at your life and the people in it. Are you and they happy? Is there balance, beauty, comfort, and ease? Do your systems work? Are you getting what you want? Is your net worth increasing? Are your grades satisfactory? Are you healthy, fit, and pain-free? Are you getting better in all areas of your life? If not, then something needs to happen, and only you can make it happen. Don't kid yourself. Be ruthlessly honest with yourself. Take your own inventory.
From Victim to Victory Raj Bafsar was born to be a gymnast. It was the natural career choice for a kid who, at the age of four, lived to climb up things, including trees and furniture, and jump off them. His parents, worried that he'd hurt himself and destroy their house, signed him up for gymnastics classes at a nearby gym. Raj quickly fell in love with the sport, and by the age of ten he wanted to be the best at his sport that he loved and represent his country in the Olympics. He began focusing intensely on becoming a better gymnast, and soon the success began to show. He started winning first and second place at competitions, and was a five-time Texas champion by the time he entered high school. His high school and college years were a blur of awards and championships. Regional state champion, national champion, senior national team, and then placement in two medal-winning championship teams. In his mind, he was unstoppable. In 2004, Raj was competing for a spot in the U.S. Olympic gymnastics team. Of the 12 routines he'd done, 11 of them had been perfect. Everybody agreed that he was a shoe-in. Elated, he was thinking, Greece, here I come. But at the conclusion of the trials, when they read off the names of the Olympians, his wasn't on the list. Then he heard the words, Raj Bavsar, alternate. In that moment, his whole world, everything he'd been working toward for a decade and a half, was shattered. His expectations were sky-high and tangled up in his self-worth, so when they weren't met on that awful day in 2004, he came down to earth with a crash. For the next few years, he burned with one desire, to find out why he'd been denied. He needed to find someone to blame. Although Raj went to Greece as an alternate, it was a bittersweet experience watching his teammates work together and compete day after day. Unofficially, he was part of the team, yet it was clear he wasn't really one of them. He never had a chance to compete, and he returned from the trip disillusioned and lost. Back at home, he did some serious soul-searching. He asked himself, Do I truly enjoy gymnastics? Do I love the competition regardless of the scores and the accolades? His answer was yes. So he decided to recommit himself to being a gymnast, and this time to throw himself into the sport, not just to win competitions, but for the art of it and the love of it. Unfortunately, without the intense drive to win, his performance suffered. At the 2007 U.S. Nationals, held nine months before the 2008 Olympic team was selected, he bombed. His performance was rocky, and for the first time in nine years he didn't even make the national team. He had to own up to the truth. What he was doing wasn't working. A few days later, a friend of his, a 2000 Olympian himself, handed Raj a book and said, You need to read this. Raj took it from him and saw on the cover a picture of a white-haired guy with a big smile and the words, How to get from where you are to where you want to be. He thought, No book can get me where I want to be. My problem is different. But when his coach recommended the same book a few days later, Raj decided to give it a chance. I'll let Raj tell the rest of the story. The book was The Success Principles, and the first thing I learned was that, to be successful, you have to take 100% responsibility for everything that happens in your life. This was a tough one to swallow, considering I had been convinced for years that life had played against me. Soon, however, I realized that harboring resentment and dwelling on what happened had gotten me nowhere. Suddenly, instead of continuing to look for someone to blame— I began to turn that energy inward and examine how my own mindset of fear and negativity had contributed to my recent performance. Where was my fear coming from, and what was causing these negative thoughts in my head? I had always thought that fear meant I was broken. But Jack taught me that successful people experience fear and negativity on a daily basis, yet still choose to move forward toward their goals. Negative thoughts, rejection, fear— they're just part of the process. Suddenly, these thoughts became challenges to overcome, rather than huge roadblocks or evidence of my failure. I was on a whole new course. My coach saw the light go on in me. It was like a switch was flipped, he said. Working with him on a new training plan, I recommitted to my dream of being an Olympian. 
but now I also wanted to be an Olympian in life. I created a vision board and mind map, not only to help me visualize success, but also to break down my huge, lofty, overwhelming Olympic goal into areas of daily focus that I could manage. When the 2008 Olympic tryouts were held, I sailed through the competition. I felt happy, clear, and on top of my game. I nailed all my routines. With all the work I'd done on myself, I was confident they would name me to the team this time. But when they named the final team members, my name wasn't called. What? In a cruel repeat of 2004, I heard, Raj Bavzar, alternate. When a reporter from NBC asked me how I felt about being named an alternate a second time, I answered with one sentence. There is no external event that can defeat my sense of inner accomplishment. Still, I was honestly baffled that, after all I had done, my dream was still outside my grasp. While a part of me was ready to give up on being an Olympian, something inside me said, Keep the dream alive. There is no way this is over. The next morning, I called the USA gymnastics officials and reconfirmed that I'd be honored to be an alternate. For the next week, I trained hard and stayed ready. Then it was announced that Paul Ham, the 2004 Olympic gold medalist and a member of the Olympic team for 2008, had made the decision to withdraw due to injuries. The committee would decide which one of the three alternates would be chosen to replace him. Waiting for the decision was probably the most excruciating, yet exciting, 24 hours of my entire life. The next day at the gym, my coach, my sports performance counselor, and I were on the phone to USA Gymnastics when the president of the organization came on the line to give us the official announcement. As he started his announcement, saying how happy they were about the decision, and on and on, inside I was begging, just say the name. Is it me or not? At this time, he finally said, we'd like to announce the new member of the 2008 Olympic team, Raj Bavzar. With a shout, Raj fell to his knees. Then, smiling and crying at the same time, he stood up and hugged his coach. He hugged his counselor. He hugged everyone. But Raj also knew the road ahead would be difficult. With Paul Ham out, not a single member of the team had any Olympic experience. Sports media, even people in the gymnastics community, had written off the team, doubting they could make it into the finals. That was when Raj committed to doing whatever he could to keep their outlook positive. The night before the competition, he assembled all six team members and urged them to commit to caring for each other as human beings first, athletes second. In that moment, each knew that his teammates had his back. The next morning, the team walked onto the competition floor with their heads held high, and in a stunning upset, with the entire arena chanting, USA! USA! Raj and his teammates edged out the Germans to win the Olympic bronze medal. Principle 2. Be clear why you're here. Decide upon your major definite purpose in life, and then organize all your activities around it. Brian Tracy, one of America's leading authorities on the development of human potential and personal effectiveness. I believe each of us is born with a life purpose. Identifying, acknowledging, and honoring this purpose is perhaps the most important action that successful people take. They take the time to understand what they're here to do and then they pursue that with passion and enthusiasm. What were you put on this earth to do? I discovered long ago what I was put on this earth to do. I determined my true purpose in life, my right livelihood. I discovered how to inject passion and determination into every activity I undertake, and I learned how purpose can bring an aspect of fun and fulfillment to virtually everything I do. Now I'd like to help uncover the same secret for you. You see, without a purpose in life, it's easy to get sidetracked on your life's journey. It's easy to wander and drift, 
accomplishing little. But with a purpose, everything in life seems to fall into place. To be on purpose means you're doing what you love to do, doing what you're good at, and accomplishing what's important to you. When you are truly and passionately on purpose, the people, resources, and opportunities you need naturally gravitate toward you. The world benefits too, because when you act in alignment with your true life purpose, which may at first glance seem selfish, all of your actions automatically serve others. Some Personal Life Purpose Statements My life purpose is to inspire and empower people to live their highest vision in a context of love and joy, in harmony with the highest good of all concerned. I inspire people to live their highest vision by collecting and disseminating inspiring stories through the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and in my inspirational keynote speeches. I empower people to live their dreams by writing practical self-help books like this one, Tapping into Ultimate Success and The Power of Focus, by designing courses for high school and college students, and by conducting seminars for individuals and corporations that teach powerful tools for creating one's ideal life both at work and at home. Here are the life purpose statements of some of my friends. It is important to note that they have all become self-made millionaires through the fulfillment of their life purpose. To inspire and empower people to achieve their destiny. Robert Allen, co-author of The One Minute Millionaire. To uplift humanity's consciousness through business. D.C. Cordova, co-founder of the Accelerated Business School. To humbly serve the Lord by being a loving, playful, powerful, and passionate example of the absolute joy that is available to us the moment we rejoice in God's gifts and sincerely love and serve all of His creations. Anthony Robbins, author of Personal Power and Get the Edge, entrepreneur and philanthropist. To leave the world a better place than I found it, for horses and for people, too. Monty Roberts, author of the man who listens to horses. Once you know what your life purpose is, you can organize all of your activities around it. Everything you do should be an expression of your purpose. If an activity didn't align with your purpose, you wouldn't work on it. Period. What's the why behind everything you do? Without purpose as the compass to guide you, your goals and action plans may not ultimately fulfill you. You don't want to get to the top of the ladder only to find you had it leaning against the wrong wall. When Julie Marie Carrier was a child, she was a very big fan of animals. As a result, all she ever heard growing up was, Julie, you should be a vet. You're going to be a great vet. That's what you should do. So when she got to Ohio State University, she took biology, anatomy, and chemistry and started studying to be a vet. A Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship allowed her to spend her senior year studying abroad in Manchester, England. Away from the family and faculty pressures back home, she found herself one dreary day sitting at her desk, surrounded by biology books and staring out the window, when it suddenly hit her. You know what? I'm totally miserable. What am I doing? I don't want to be a vet. Julie then asked herself, What is a job that I would love so much that I'd do it for free, but that I could actually get paid for. It's not being a vet. That's not the right job. Julie thought back over all the things she'd done in her life and what had made her the most happy. Suddenly, it hit her. It was all of the youth leadership conferences that she had volunteered at, and the communications and leadership courses she had taken as elective courses back at Ohio State. How could I have been so ignorant, she thought. Here I am in my fourth year at school and just finally realizing I'm on the wrong path. But it's been right here in front of me the whole time. I just never took the time to acknowledge it until now. Buoyed by her new insight, Julie spent the rest of her year in England taking courses in communications and media performance. When she returned to Ohio State, she was eventually able to convince the administration to let her create her own program in leadership studies. And while it took her two years longer to finally graduate, 
She went on to become a senior management consultant in leadership training and development for the Pentagon. She also won the Miss Virginia USA contest, which allowed her to spend much of the year speaking to kids all across Virginia, plus launch a national speaking career to empower youth with messages of leadership and character. By the way, Julie was able to do this at only 26 years old, a testament to the power that clarity of purpose can create in your life. Today, Julie has reached over a million young people as one of the top national youth leadership speakers for student conferences, high schools, colleges, and youth programs worldwide. You may have seen her on NBC's Today Show or Fox News in the New York Times or as a success coach for teens and young women featured on a goal-setting TV show on MTV. Julie even received an Emmy nomination. You can learn more about Julie at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. The good news is that you don't have to go all the way to England to discover what you are really here to do. You can simply complete two simple exercises that will help you clarify your purpose. Your inner guidance system is your joy. It is the soul's duty to be loyal to its own desires. It must abandon itself to its master passion. Dame Rebecca West, best-selling author. You were born with an inner guidance system that tells you when you are on or off purpose by the amount of joy you are experiencing. The things that bring you the greatest joy are in alignment with your purpose. To begin to hone in on your purpose, here are a couple of exercises. The first is to make a list of the times you have felt most joyful and alive. What are the common elements of these experiences? Can you figure out a way to make a living doing these things? Pat Williams is the senior vice president of the NBA's Orlando Magic basketball team. He has also written more than 70 books and is a professional speaker. When I asked him what he felt the greatest secret to success was, he replied, Figure out what you love to do as young as you can and then organize your life around figuring out how to make a living at it. For young Pat, it was sports, more specifically, baseball. When his father took him to his first baseball game in Philadelphia, he fell in love with the game. He learned to read by reading the sports section of the New York Times. He knew he wanted to grow up and have a career in sports. He devoted almost every waking moment to it. He collected baseball cards, played sports, and wrote a sports column for the school newspaper. Pat went on to have a career in the front office of the Philadelphia Phillies baseball team, then with the Philadelphia 76ers basketball team. When the NBA considered granting an expansion team franchise to Orlando, Pat was there to lead the fight. Now in his 70s, Pat has enjoyed 50-plus years doing what he loves, and he has enjoyed every minute of it. Once you are clear about what brings you the greatest joy, you will have a major insight into your purpose. The second exercise is a simple but powerful way to create a compelling statement of your life purpose that can guide your behavior. Take time now to complete the following exercise. The Life Purpose Exercise There are many ways to approach defining your purpose. I learned this version of the Life Purpose Exercise from Arnold M. Patton, spiritual coach and author of You Can Have It All. His most recent book is The Journey. You can read more about Arnold at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. 1. List two of your unique personal qualities, such as enthusiasm and creativity. 2. List one or two ways you enjoy expressing those qualities when interacting with others, such as to support and to inspire. 3. Assume the world is perfect right now. What does this world look like? How is everyone interacting with everyone else? What does it feel like? Write your answer as a statement in the present tense, describing the ultimate condition, the perfect world as you see it and feel it. Remember, a perfect world is a fun place to be. Example. Everyone is freely expressing their own unique talents. Everyone is working in harmony. Everyone is expressing love. 4. 
Combine the three prior subdivisions of this paragraph into a single statement. Example My purpose is to use my creativity and enthusiasm to support and inspire others to freely express their talents in a harmonious and loving way. Here are some examples of life purpose statements that people in my recent workshops have written. To use my humor, creativity, and knowledge to inspire, uplift, and empower people in recovery to stay sober. Recovery coach and author. To inspire and empower small business owners to systematize for easier revenue generation. Small business consultant and author. To inspire people to have faith in themselves and believe in their natural genius. Educator. To raise healthy, prosperous children who make a difference in the world. Full-time homemaker. To create a world in which people are living ecologically sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, and socially just lives. Environmentalist and social activist. To use my vast knowledge of integrative medicine to educate, inspire, and empower people to live longer and healthier lives. Holistic medical doctor. To live every day to the fullest and give back as much as possible while appreciating someone special every day. Contractor and home builder. To live my life with integrity and compassion while serving others and to always value the unexpected. Fireman. Staying on purpose. Once you have determined and written down your life purpose, read it every day, preferably in the morning. If you are artistic or strongly visual by nature, you may want to draw or paint a symbol or picture that represents your life purpose and then hang it somewhere, on the refrigerator, opposite your desk, near your bed, where you will see it every day. This will keep you focused on your purpose. As you move forward in the next few chapters to define your vision and your goals, make sure they are aligned with and serve to fulfill your purpose. Another approach to clarifying your purpose is to set aside some time for quiet reflection, using meditation to inquire within. See Principle 47. After you become relaxed and enter into a state of deep self-love and peacefulness, ask yourself, What is my purpose for living? Or, What is my unique role in the universe? Allow the answer to simply come to you. Let it be as expansive as you can imagine. The words that come need not be flowery or poetic. What is important is how inspired the words make you feel. If you really want to go deep with this exercise, you can do two more exercises we do in my Breakthrough to Success training. The first is the Passion Test. It is a simple exercise you can go through alone or with a partner. The process can be found in the book The Passion Test by Janet and Chris Atwood. The other exercise, which many people find to be the most powerful, is the Life Purpose Guided Visualization, part of my Awakening Power set of meditations on CD. This six-CD program contains 11 guided visualizations narrated by myself and Dr. Deborah Sandella. You can order this audio program at www.jackcanfield.com. Principle 3. Decide what you want. The indispensable first step to getting the things you want out of life is this. Decide what you want. Ben Stein, actor and author. Once you have decided why you're here, you have to decide what you want to do, be, and have. What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to experience? And what possessions do you want to acquire? In the journey from where you are to where you want to be, you have to decide where you want to be. In other words, what does success look like to you? One of the main reasons why most people don't get what they want is they haven't decided what they want. They haven't defined their desires in clear and compelling detail. Early childhood programming often gets in the way of what you want. Inside every one of us is that tiny seed of the you that you are meant to become. 
Unfortunately, you may have buried this seed in response to your parents, teachers, coaches, and other adult role models as you were growing up. You started out as a baby knowing exactly what you wanted. You knew when you were hungry. You spit out the foods you didn't like and avidly devoured the ones you did. You had no trouble expressing your needs and wants. You simply cried loudly with no inhibitions or holding back until you got what you wanted. You were fed, changed, and held. As you got older, you crawled around and moved toward whatever held the most interest for you. You were clear about what you wanted, and you headed straight toward it with no fear. So what happened? Somewhere along the way, someone said, Don't touch that. Stay away from there. Keep your hands to yourself. Eat everything on your plate, whether you like it or not. You don't really feel that way. You don't really want that. You should be ashamed of yourself. Stop crying. Don't be such a baby. As you got older, you heard, You can't have everything you want simply because you want it. Money doesn't grow on trees. Can't you think of anybody but yourself? Stop being so selfish. Stop doing what you're doing and come do what I want you to do. Don't live someone else's dreams. After many years of these kinds of sanctions, most of us eventually lost touch with the needs of our bodies and the desires of our hearts, and somehow got stuck trying to figure out what other people wanted us to do. We learned how to act and how to be to get their approval. As a result, we now do a lot of things we don't want to do, but that please a lot of other people. We go to medical school because that is what Dad wanted for us. We get married to please our mother. We get a real job instead of pursuing a dream career in the arts. We go straight into graduate school instead of taking a year off and backpacking through Europe. In the name of being sensible, we end up becoming numb to our own desires. It's no wonder that when we ask many teenagers what they want to do or be, they honestly answer, I don't know. There are too many layers of shoulds, ought tos, and you'd betters piled on top of and suffocating what they really want. So how do you reclaim yourself and your true desires? How do you get back to what you really want with no fear, shame, or inhibition? How do you reconnect with your real passion? You start on the smallest level by honoring your preferences in every situation, no matter how large or small. Don't think of them as petty. They might be inconsequential to someone else, but they are not to you. Stop settling for less than you want. If you are going to reown your power and get what you really want out of life, you will have to stop saying, I don't know, I don't care, it doesn't matter to me, or the current favorite of teenagers, whatever. When you are confronted with a choice, no matter how small or insignificant, act as if you have a preference. Ask yourself, if I did know, what would it be? If I did care, which would I prefer? If it did matter, what would I rather do? Not being clear about what you want and making other people's needs and desires more important than your own is simply a habit. You can break it by practicing the opposite habit. The Yellow Notebook Many years ago, I took a workshop with self-esteem and motivational expert Sherry Carter-Scott, author of If Life is a Game, These Are the Rules. As the twenty-four of us entered the training room on the first morning, we were directed to take a seat in one of the chairs facing the front of the room. There was a spiral-bound notebook on every chair. Some were blue, some were yellow, some were red. The one on my chair was yellow. I remember thinking, I hate yellow. I wish I had a blue one. Then Sherry said something that changed my life forever. If you don't like the color of the notebook you have, trade with someone else and get the one you want. You deserve to have everything in your life exactly the way you want it. Wow, what a radical concept. For twenty-some years, I had not operated from that premise. I had settled, thinking I couldn't have everything I wanted. So I turned to the person to my right and said, Would you mind trading your blue notebook for my yellow one? She responded, Not at all. I prefer yellow. I like the brightness of the color. I now had my blue notebook. Not a huge success in the greater scheme of things, 
but it was the beginning of reclaiming my birthright to acknowledge my preferences and get exactly what I want. Up until then, I would have discounted my preference as petty and not worth acting on. I would have continued to numb out my awareness of what I wanted. That day was a turning point for me. The beginning of allowing myself to know and act on my wants and desires in a much more powerful way. Make an I want list. One of the easiest ways to begin clarifying what you truly want is to make a list of 30 things you want to do, 30 things you want to have, and 30 things you want to be before you die. This is a great way to get the ball rolling. Another powerful technique to unearth your wants is to ask a friend to help you make an I want list. Have your friend continually ask, What do you want? What do you want? for 10 to 15 minutes, and jot down your answers. You'll find the first ones aren't all that profound. In fact, most people usually hear themselves saying, I want a Mercedes, I want a big house on the ocean, and so on. However, by the end of the 15-minute exercise, the real you begins to speak. I want people to love me. I want to express myself. I want to make a difference. I want to feel powerful. Ones that are more true expressions of your core values. Make a 20 things I love to do list. What often stops people from expressing their true desire is they don't think they can make a living doing what they love to do. What I love to do is hang out and talk with people, you might say. Well, Oprah Winfrey has made a living hanging out and talking with people for 30 years. And my friend Diane Brouse, who is an international tour guide, makes a living hanging out and talking with people in some of the most exciting and exotic locations in the world. Tiger Woods loves to play golf. Ellen DeGeneres loves to make people laugh. My sister, Kimberly Kerberger, loves to design jewelry. Donald Trump loves to make deals and build buildings. I love to read and share what I have learned with others in books, speeches, and workshops. It is possible to make a living doing what you love. Make a list of 20 things you love to do, and then think of ways you can make a living doing some of those things. If you love sports, you can play sports, be a sports writer or photographer, or work in sports management as an agent or in the front office of a professional team. You could be a coach, a manager, or a scout. You could be a broadcaster, a camera operator, or a team publicist. There are myriad ways to make money in any field that you love. For now, just decide what you like to do, and in the following chapters I'll show you how to be successful and make money at it. Clarify your vision of your ideal life. The theme of this book is how to get from where you are to where you want to be. To accomplish this, you have to know two things, where you are and where you want to get to. Your vision is a detailed description of where you want to get to. It describes in detail what your destination looks like and feels like. To create a balanced and successful life, your vision needs to include the following seven areas. Work and career, finances, recreation and free time, health and fitness, relationships, personal goals, and contribution to the larger community. At this stage in the journey, it is not necessary to know exactly how you are going to get there. All that is important is that you figure out where there is. If you get clear on the what, the how will show up. Your Inner Global Positioning System The process of getting from where you are to where you want to be is like using the GPS, Global Positioning System technology, in your car or smartphone. For the system to work, it simply needs to know where you are now and where you want to go. The navigation system figures out where you are by the use of an onboard computer that receives signals from multiple satellites and calculates your exact position. When you type in your destination, the navigational system plots a perfect course for you. All you have to do is follow the instructions. Success in life works the same way. All you have to do is decide where you want to go by clarifying your vision, then lock in the destination through goal-setting, affirmations, and visualization, and then start moving in the right direction.
Your inner GPS will keep unfolding your route as you continue to move forward. In other words, once you clarify and stay focused on your vision, the exact steps will keep appearing along the way. Once you are clear about what you want and keep your mind constantly focused on it, the how will keep showing up, sometimes just when you need it and not a moment earlier. High Achievers Have Bigger Visions The greater danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. Michelangelo Renaissance sculptor and painter who spent four years lying on his back painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. I want to encourage you not to limit your vision in any way. Let it be as big as it is. When I interviewed Dave Linegar, chairman of the board of Remax, the country's largest franchise real estate company, he told me, Always dream big dreams. Big dreams attract big people. General Wesley Clark, the former supreme allied commander of NATO forces in Europe, once told me, It doesn't take any more energy to create a big dream than it does to create a little one. My experience is that one of the few differences between the superachievers and the rest of the world is that the superachievers simply dream bigger. John F. Kennedy dreamed of putting a man on the moon. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed of a country free of prejudice and injustice. Bill Gates dreams of a world in which every home has a computer that is connected to the Internet. Buckminster Fuller dreamed of a world where everybody had access to electrical power. These high achievers see the world from a whole different perspective, as a place where amazing things can happen, where billions of lives can be improved, where new technology can change the way we live, and where the world's resources can be leveraged for the greatest possible mutual gain. They believe anything is possible, and they believe they have an integral part in creating it. When Mark Victor Hansen and I first published Chicken Soup for the Soul, what we call our 2020 vision was also a big one, to sell one billion chicken soup books and to raise $500 million for charity through tithing a portion of all of our profits by the year 2020. We were and are very clear about what we want to accomplish. As of 2015, we have already sold more than 500 million copies in 47 languages. If you limit your choices only to what seems possible or reasonable, you disconnect yourself from what you truly want, and all that is left is a compromise. Robert Fritz, author of The Path of Least Resistance Don't let anyone talk you out of your vision. There are people who will try to talk you out of your vision. They will tell you that you are crazy and that it can't be done. My friend Monty Roberts, author of The Man Who Listens to Horses, which spent 58 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, calls these people dream stealers. Don't listen to them. When Monty was in high school, his teacher gave the class an assignment to write about what they wanted to do when they grew up. Monty wrote that he wanted to own a 200-acre ranch and raise thoroughbred racehorses. His teacher gave him an F and explained the grade reflected that he deemed Monty's dream unrealistic. No boy who was living in a camper on the back of a pickup truck would ever be able to amass enough money to buy a ranch, purchase breeding stock, and pay the necessary salaries for ranch hands. When he offered Monty the chance of rewriting his paper for a higher grade, Monty told him, You keep the F. I'm keeping my dream. Today, Monty's 154-acre Flag is Up Farms in Solvang, California, raises thoroughbred racehorses, and trains hundreds of horse trainers in a more humane way to join up with and train horses. To learn more about Monty and his work, go to www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources or read one of his books. The Man Who Listens to Horses, Shy Boy, Horse Sense for People, and From My Hands to Yours. His work has produced eight national champions in the show rings of the world and more than 300 international stakes winners in thoroughbred racing. The Vision Exercise Create your future from your future, not your past. Werner Erhardt 
founder of AST Training and the Landmark Forum. The following exercise is designed to help you clarify your vision. Start by putting on some relaxing music and sitting quietly in a comfortable environment where you won't be disturbed. Then, close your eyes and ask your subconscious mind to give you images of what your ideal life would look like if you could have it exactly the way you want it, in each of the following categories. 1. First, focus on the financial area of your life. What is your ideal annual income and monthly cash flow? How much money do you have in savings and investments? What is your total net worth? Next, what does your home look like? Where is it located? Does it have a view? What kind of yard and landscaping does it have? Is there a pool or a stable for horses? What does the furniture look like? Are there paintings hanging in the rooms? Walk through your perfect house, filling in all of the details. At this point, don't worry about how you'll get that house. Don't sabotage yourself by saying, I can't live in Malibu because I don't make enough money. Once you give your mind's eye the picture, your mind will solve the not enough money challenge. Next, visualize what kind of car you are driving and any other important possessions your finances have provided. 2. Next, visualize your ideal job or career. Where are you working? What are you doing? With whom are you working? What kind of clients or customers do you have? What is your compensation like? Is it your own business? 3. Then focus on your free time, your recreation time. What are you doing with your family and friends in the free time you've created for yourself? What hobbies are you pursuing? What kinds of vacations do you take? What do you do for fun? 4. Next, what is your ideal vision of your body and your physical health? Are you free of all disease? Are you pain-free? How long do you live? Are you open, relaxed, in an ecstatic state of bliss all day long? Are you full of vitality? Are you flexible as well as strong? Do you exercise, eat good food, and drink lots of water? How much do you weigh? 5. Then move on to your ideal vision of your relationships with your family and friends. What is your relationship with your spouse and family like? Who are your friends? What do these friendships feel like? Are those relationships loving, supportive, empowering? What kinds of things do you do together? 6. What about the personal arena of your life? Do you see yourself going back to school? getting training, attending personal growth workshops, seeking therapy for a past hurt, or growing spiritually? Do you meditate or go on spiritual retreats with your church? Do you want to learn to play an instrument or write your autobiography? Do you want to run a marathon or take an art class? Do you want to travel to other countries? 7. Finally, focus on the community you've chosen to live in. What does it look like when it is operating perfectly? What kinds of community activities take place there? What charitable, philanthropic, or volunteer work? What do you do to help others and make a difference? How often do you participate in these activities? Who are you helping? You can write down your answers as you go, or you can do the whole exercise first and then open your eyes and write them down. In either case, make sure you capture everything in writing as soon as you complete the exercise. Every day, review the vision you have written down. This will keep your conscious and subconscious minds focused on your vision. And as you apply the other principles in this book, you will begin to manifest all the different aspects of your vision. Share your vision for maximum impact. When you finished writing down your vision, Share your vision with a good friend whom you can trust to be positive and supportive. You might be afraid that your friend will think your vision is too outlandish, impossible to achieve, too idealistic, unrealistic, or materialistic. Almost everyone has these thoughts when they think about sharing their vision. But the truth is, most people, deep down in their hearts, want the very same things you want. Everyone wants financial abundance, 
a comfortable home, meaningful work they enjoy, good health, time to do the things they love, nurturing relationships with their family and friends, and an opportunity to make a difference in the world. But too few of us readily admit it. You'll find that, when you share your vision, some people will want to help you make it happen. Others will introduce you to friends and resources that can help you. You'll also find that each time you share your vision, it becomes clearer and feels more real and attainable. And most important, every time you share your vision, you strengthen your own subconscious belief that you can achieve it. From Living at the Mission to Living His Mission in July 2010, Logan Doughty was sitting outside a homeless shelter, awaiting intake into a long-term, no-frills recovery program. He had recently hit rock bottom due to alcohol and drugs. His parents and siblings wouldn't take him in, and he couldn't control his drinking or his temper long enough for anyone to do anything more than show him the door. He was emotionally spent, physically tired, and seriously stressed. As the months went by at the rescue mission, his head slowly began to clear, and with the help of a twelve-step program plus kind but strict Christian souls, he began to believe he might recover from this devastating chapter in his life. Eventually, his family invited him over occasionally and actually enjoyed having him around. At Christmas that year, his sister Alice gave him a copy of The Success Principles. He thought the gift was sort of corny, but he thanked her nonetheless and added it to his stack of books to read. Logan writes, I respect my sister, so I knew this book wouldn't be garbage. But honestly, I was far from sold. I thought, you can tell the guy's rich. How can he know what I'm going through? To my surprise, Jack seemed like a real guy. He wasn't born rich, and he satisfied my cynical side by explaining in painstaking detail the process by which normal people could actually change their lives. I read the book every day, and even did the exercises Jack suggests. Then, on March 26, 2011, at 9.11 p.m., I had an aha moment, one that will stay with me forever. As I read the chapter, Decide What You Want, I realized that in the past, I would think up ways to make money, but rarely did I focus on what I enjoyed most and what I wanted to do. With great excitement, I began to create my list. 1. Exercise. 2. Kung Fu. 3. Ride my bike. 4. Teach self-defense. When I jotted down 10. Encourage people, things suddenly clicked into place. I instantly knew what I wanted to do. Create and teach a self-defense system that would encourage and empower people. I even realized that I was uniquely suited to help others in this very specific way. For years, I'd been a serious martial artist, and some time ago, I'd started developing a self-defense program for women. But with my descent into alcoholism, the discipline and honor that is so vital to the martial artist had drained away along with my self-respect. In doing Jack's 20 Things exercise, I discovered that my martial arts experience, combined with my newfound energy and focus, made it possible for me to teach self-defense for a living. In fact, I was exceptionally qualified to stand up in front of a group of women and speak to them with authority and understanding. I had witnessed what happened to women on the street and in shelters. I'd seen how the strong prey on the weak. Without that experience, I'd just be an academic, someone who'd studied the martial arts but never applied them in real-life situations under duress and trauma. I realized that my unique experience, skills, and wants could all align in a single activity where I could actually make a living. It was like being struck by a thunderbolt. You can read more about Logan Doughty's heartwarming journey at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash stories. Six months after affirming his true wants, Logan left the rescue mission with a completely different perspective. No longer does he feel like a victim. Instead, he constantly looks for how the world will do him good. He treats others with compassion, tolerance, and patience. Armed with nothing but a bicycle, clothes, and the newfound knowledge that he could change his environment, Logan started a small but successful yard-cleaning business, and within months, 
became the mission's senior self-defense instructor, teaching volunteers and staff how to deal with disruptive and potentially dangerous behavior at the facility. At the same time, he is fully developing and teaching his self-defense program full-time. As Logan puts it, I owe so much of this success to the success principles. Now I know who I am and where I'm going. And that can never be taken away. Principle 4. Believe it's possible. The number one problem that keeps people from winning in the United States today is lack of belief in themselves. Arthur L. Williams, founder of A. L. Williams Insurance Company, which was sold to Primerica for $90 million. Napoleon Hill, the author of Think and Grow Rich, once said, Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. In fact, the mind is such a powerful instrument. It can deliver to you literally everything you want. But you first have to believe that what you want is possible. And belief is a choice. It is simply a thought you choose to think over and over until it becomes automatic. You get what you expect. Scientists used to believe that humans responded to information flowing into the brain from the outside world. But today, they're learning instead that we respond to what the brain, on the basis of previous experience, expects to happen next. Doctors in Texas, for example, studying the effect of arthroscopic knee surgery, assigned patients with sore, worn-out knees to one of three surgical procedures, scraping out the knee joint, washing out the joint, or doing nothing. Researchers at Baylor College of Medicine, for example, recently studied the outcome of arthroscopic knee surgery on patients with painful, worn-out knees who were given one of two types of arthroscopic surgery, either scraping out the knee joint or washing it out. Their results, when then compared to patients who had unknowingly received a pretend surgery, where doctors made tiny incisions in the knee as if to insert their surgical instruments, then did nothing. Two years later, Patients who underwent the pretend surgery reported equal improvement in pain relief and knee function as those patients who had received an actual surgery. The brain expected the imaginary surgery to improve the knee, and it did. This is known as the placebo effect. Why does the brain work this way? Neuropsychologists who study expectancy theory say it's because we spend our whole lives becoming conditioned. Through a lifetime's worth of events, our brain actually learns what to expect next, whether it eventually happens that way or not. And because our brain expects something will happen a certain way, we often achieve exactly what we anticipate. This is why it's so important to hold positive expectations in your mind. When you replace your old negative expectations with more positive ones, when you begin to believe that what you want is possible, your brain will actually take over the job of accomplishing that possibility for you. Better than that, your brain will actually expect to achieve that outcome. You gotta believe. You can be anything you want to be, if only you believe with sufficient conviction and act in accordance with your faith. For whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Napoleon Hill best-selling author of Think and Grow Rich. When Philadelphia Phillies pitcher Tug McGraw, father of legendary country singer Tim McGraw, struck out batter Willie Wilson to earn the Phillies the 1980 World Series title, Sports Illustrated captured an immortal image of elation on the pitcher's mound, an image few people knew was played out exactly as McGraw had planned it. When I had the opportunity to meet Tug one afternoon in New York, I asked him about his experience on the mound that day. It was as if I'd been there a thousand times before, he said. When I was growing up, I would pitch to my father in the backyard. We would always get to where it was the bottom of the ninth in the World Series with two outs and three men on base. I would always bear down and strike them out. Because Tug had conditioned his brain day after day in the backyard, the day eventually arrived where he was living that dream for real. McGraw's reputation as a positive thinker had begun seven years earlier, during the New York Mets' 1973 National League Championship season. 
when Tug coined the phrase, You Gotta Believe, during one of the team's meetings. That Mets team, in last place in the division in August, went on to win the National League pennant and reach Game 7 of the World Series, where they finally succumbed to the Oakland A's. Another example of his always optimistic, you-gotta-believe attitude was the time, while he was a spokesman for the Little League, that he said, Kids should practice autographing baseballs. This is a skill that's often overlooked in Little League. And then he smiled his infectious smile. Believe in yourself and go for it. Sooner or later, those who win are those who think they can. Richard Bach best-selling author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Tim Ferriss, the author of The Four-Hour Workweek, believed in himself. In fact, he believed so strongly in his abilities that he won the national San Shao kickboxing title just six weeks after being introduced to the sport. As a prior All-American and judo team captain at Princeton, Tim had always dreamed of winning a national title. He had worked hard. He was good at his sport. But repeated injuries over multiple seasons had continually denied him his dream. So when a friend called one day to invite Tim to watch him in the National Chinese Kickboxing Championship six weeks away, Tim instantly decided to join him in the competition. Because Tim had never been in any kind of striking competition before, he called USA Boxing and asked where the best trainers could be found. He traveled to a tough neighborhood in Trenton, New Jersey, to learn from boxing coaches who had trained gold medalists. And after four grueling hours a day in the ring, he put in more time conditioning in the weight room. To make up for his lack of time in the sport, Tim's trainers focused on exploiting his strengths instead of making up for his weaknesses. Tim didn't want to merely compete. He wanted to win. When the competition day at last arrived, Tim defeated three highly acclaimed opponents before making it to the finals. As he anticipated what he would have to do to win in the final match, he closed his eyes and visualized defeating his opponent in the very first round. Later, Tim told me that most people fail not because they lack the skills or aptitude to reach their goal, but because they simply don't believe they can reach it. Tim believed, and he won. Believe, even when you don't know how the requirements will be met. Jason McDougall believed it was possible. As a wholesaler who was shipping goods to the historic Canadian department store chain Fields, his gut told him something was wrong at the retail giant. Wondering if the chain might be for sale, Jason cold-called the head of the company and asked him to dinner, never doubting the general manager would say yes. When the dinner conversation eventually turned to the question of a buyout, the general manager replied, if ever there was a time to buy, it would be now. What followed was ninety days of frantic activity for Jason, putting the deal together and coming up with the cash. For Jason and his small company, the transaction was like a minnow swallowing a whale. Not only was the retail chain thirty times the size of Jason's business, but Jason also had no idea where the money would come from. His biggest bank loan up to that point had been just $5,000. Yet still he believed, with utter conviction, that he would eventually own Fields' stores. Even when the first non-refundable deposit was due, $150,000 that Jason didn't have, his unwavering belief led him to attend a Thursday night business function where an old friend offered to give Jason the cash by Friday morning's deadline. At another stage, Jason found himself $400,000 short in making a $1 million deposit, with a deadline that was just two hours away. Using his internal guidance and steadfast belief, Jason came up with the money just minutes before the deadline passed. And just 25 days later, when another $12 million was due, Jason miraculously assembled two banks and six private investors— one of whom rushed through the paperwork in order to meet the funding deadline. At each stage of the transaction, as larger and larger non-refundable deposits were due, Jason had absolute faith that the deal would happen. It had to. In fact, it was either bring in the cash or lose not only the deal, but also all the money he'd paid up to that point. How did Jason maintain his unwavering belief in the face of incredible odds? 
He followed his own guiding philosophy that, if a thing is supposed to happen, it will. If God had put him on this path, he said, the transaction was meant to be. Of course, the fact that each deadline was met through remarkable and serendipitous means only galvanized Jason's belief that this deal was destined to close. Each small success along the way made him believe even more that victory was on the horizon. By the time the transaction was eventually completed six months later, Jason had raised tens of millions of dollars, bought an established company that was an institution in Canada, saved hundreds of jobs, and created a sizable new business for himself. All because he believed it was possible. You must find a place in yourself where nothing is impossible. Deepak Chopra, author of The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success It's not what you don't know that holds you back. It's what you do know that isn't true. In 1983, a 61-year-old, scrawny, and socially awkward potato farmer named Cliff Young entered the Sydney to Melbourne Ultra Marathon, which was considered one of the world's most difficult physical challenges. 544 miles, 875 kilometers, of flats and hills that would take six or seven days to complete. The runners were allowed to eat and sleep as they chose, and the winner would win $10,000. When Cliff showed up in overalls and rain boots, the other runners, who were much younger and dressed in the latest Nike, Reebok, and Adidas running gear, made fun of him. The race officials were worried that Cliff might die of a heart attack, but Cliff assured them that he had grown up on a farm where they couldn't afford horses or four-wheel drives, and that whenever a storm was coming in, he'd often run for two or three days without sleep in order to round up his family's 2,000 sheep on their 2,000-acre ranch. When the race started, all the other runners took off at a high speed, leaving Cliff in the dust. Cliff, however, started with a slow, loping pace and style that would later come to become known as the Cliff Young Shuffle. Now the race officials were sure Cliff would collapse and die somewhere along the route. But Cliff had a secret that no one knew about, including him. You see, Cliff had never met another long-distance runner before. He had never talked to a coach. He had never read Runner's World magazine or a book on long-distance running. He therefore didn't know you were supposed to sleep for six or seven hours a night during a long-distance endurance race. That first night, Cliff slept for only two hours. By running while the others slept, he took the lead the first night and maintained it for the remainder of the race. The next day, he ran nonstop for 23 hours, pausing to sleep for only one hour. Running with virtually no sleep for the entire race, Cliff crossed the finish line ten hours ahead of the next finisher. He had covered 544 miles in five days, 15 hours, and four minutes, the equivalent of almost four marathons a day, shattering the previous race record by more than two days. Cliff's story illustrates that sometimes it isn't what you don't know that stops your success. It's what you do know that isn't true. It is wise to question all of your assumptions about how things are done and be open to new possibilities. Principle 5 Believe in yourself. You weren't an accident. You weren't mass-produced. You aren't an assembly line product. You were deliberately planned, specifically gifted, and lovingly positioned on the earth by the master craftsman. Max Lucado, best-selling author. If you are going to be successful in creating the life of your dreams, you have to believe that you are capable of making it happen. You have to believe you have the right stuff, that you are able to pull it off. You have to believe in yourself, whether you call it self-esteem, self-confidence, or self-assurance. It is a deep-seated belief that you have what it takes, the abilities, inner resources, talents, and skills to create your desired results. Believing in yourself is an attitude. Believing in yourself is a choice. It is an attitude you develop over time. Although it helps if you had positive and supportive parents, 
The fact is that most of us had run-of-the-mill parents who inadvertently passed on to us the same limiting beliefs and negative conditioning they grew up with. But remember, the past is the past. There is no useful payoff for blaming them for your current level of self-confidence. It's now your responsibility to take charge of your own self-concept and your beliefs. You must choose to believe that you can do anything you set your mind to, anything at all, because in fact, you can. It might help you to know that the latest brain research now indicates that with enough positive self-talk and positive visualization combined with the proper training, coaching, and practice, anyone can learn to do almost anything. Of the hundreds of super successful people I have interviewed for this and other books, almost every one of them told me, I was not the most gifted or talented person in my field, but I chose to believe anything was possible. I studied, practiced, and worked harder than the others, and that's how I got to where I am. If a twenty-year-old Texan can take up the luge and become an Olympic athlete, a college dropout can become a billionaire, and a dyslexic student who failed three grades can become a best-selling author and television producer. Then you, too, can accomplish anything if you will simply believe it is possible. If you assume in favor of yourself and act as if it is possible— then you will do the things that are necessary to bring about the result. If you believe it is impossible, you will not do what is necessary, and you will not produce the result. Either way, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The choice of what to believe is up to you. Consider the case of Viktor Serebryakov, the son of a Russian emigre who grew up in a London slum. Believing that he had no chance of ever finishing school or finding meaningful employment, Victor's teachers labeled him a dunce and told him he should drop out of school. Succumbing to the destiny that others had prescribed for him, Victor dropped out of school when he was fifteen and became an itinerant worker, moving from one dead-end job to another, often living on the streets with no aspirations other than merely surviving. When he was thirty-two, Victor joined the British Army, which gave him an intelligence test that revealed he was mentally gifted with an IQ of 161. He was a genius. Astonished by the results, Victor nevertheless decided to believe them. Once he learned that he was a genius, he decided to act like a genius. While he was in the Army, he got assigned to the Education Corps to train recruits. When he left the Army, he got a job at a timber company and eventually became the manager of a group of woodworking factories. He also became a highly respected timber technologist and revolutionized the timber industry by inventing a machine for grading timber and by introducing the metric system to the trade. He later became the chairman of a National Timber Standards Commission and held several valuable sawmill-related patents. One day his wife, Mary, spotted an advertisement for a society that was looking for people of high intelligence. Victor took the entrance test for Mensa and easily surpassed the group's only requirement for membership, an IQ of 140 or more. Again, he scored 161, putting him in the exceptionally gifted category. Several years later, this former dropout was elected chairman of Mensa International. So what made the difference in Victor's life? It wasn't that he suddenly became smart. The truth is that he was smart all along. The intellectual potential was always there. What changed was the way he chose to see himself. When he was fifteen, he chose to believe his teachers, who saw him as stupid. When he was thirty-two, he chose to believe the Army's IQ test that said he was a genius, and he released the innate potential that had always been there. Victor's story is an awesome demonstration of the power of choosing to believe in yourself and your capabilities. What potential is lying dormant in you that could be released if you just chose to believe in yourself and your abilities? I am looking for a lot of men who have an infinite capacity to not know what can't be done. Henry Ford, founder and CEO of the Ford Motor Company. You have to give up. I can't. The phrase, I can't, is the most powerful force of negation in the human psyche. Paul R. Sheely, co-founder, Learning Strategies Corporation. If you are going to be successful, you need to give up the phrase, 
I can't, and all of its cousins, such as, I wish I were able to. The words I can't actually disempower you. They actually make you weaker when you say them. In my seminars, I use a technique called applied kinesiology to test people's muscle strength as they say different phrases. I have them put their left arm out to their side, and I push down on it with my left hand to see what their normal strength is. Then I have them choose something they think they can't do, such as, I can't play the piano, and say it out loud. I then push down on their arm again. It is always weaker. Then I have them say, I can do it. I can play the piano. And their arm is stronger. Your brain is designed to solve any problem and reach any goal that you give it. The words you think and say actually affect your body. We see this in toddlers, for example. When you were a toddler, there was no stopping you. You thought you could climb up on anything. No barrier was too big for you to attempt to overcome. But little by little, your sense of invincibility was conditioned out of you by the emotional and physical abuse that you received from your family, friends, and teachers, and by the decisions you made in response to that until you no longer believe you can. You must take responsibility for removing I can't from your vocabulary. I once attended a Tony Robbins seminar in which we learned to walk on burning coals. When we began, we were all afraid that we would not be able to do it, that we would burn the soles of our feet. As part of the seminar, Tony had us write down every other I can't that we had. I can't find the perfect job. I can't be a millionaire. I can't find the perfect mate. And then we threw them onto the burning coals and watched them go up in flames. Two hours later, 350 of us walked on the burning coals without anybody getting burned. That night, we all learned that just like the belief that we couldn't walk on burning coals without getting burned was a lie, every other limiting belief about our abilities was also a lie. When George Danzig was a graduate student in mathematics at UC Berkeley, he arrived late for a graduate-level statistics class and found two problems written on the blackboard that he assumed had been assigned for homework, so he wrote them down. Not knowing that they had been written on the board as two examples of famous unsolvable statistics problems, he set out to solve them. Danzig would later recount that the problems seemed to be a little harder than usual, but a few days after he copied them down, he handed in the completed solutions for the problems, still believing they were part of an assignment that was overdue. Danzig said, If I had known that the problems were not homework, but were in fact two famous unsolved problems in statistics— I probably would not have thought positively, would have become discouraged, and would never have solved them. Danzig's story is a wonderful example of how, when you pursue your goals without any limiting beliefs about what you can accomplish, you can create unexpected and extraordinary results. Don't waste years believing you can't. On the other hand, there is the story of Catherine Lanigan. All through her childhood and teens, she was considered a gifted writer. In college, she entered the School of Journalism. During the second semester of her freshman year, she was recommended for a creative writing seminar, usually reserved for seniors, to be taught by a visiting professor from Harvard. When she wrote her first short story, the professor called her into his office to discuss her story. He was the quintessential English professor, horned-rimmed glasses, tweed coat, six foot six. He said, Come in, Miss Lanigan, sit down. He took her manuscript, threw it across his desk, and said, Frankly, Miss Lanigan, your writing stinks. She was devastated. He said, I have no idea how you got into my class. You have no concept of plot structure or characterization. There is no way you'll ever make a dime as a writer. But you are a fortunate young woman, because I have caught you at the crossroads of your life. Your parents are spending all their money on your education, and you need to change your major. Because it was too late in the semester for her to drop the course, he said, I know you're coming to the class with a 4.0, and I know you have declared your bid to graduate summa cum laude with highest honors. I'll make a bargain with you. I'll get you through the class, and I'll give you a B if you promise never to write again. Not seeing another choice, she took the bargain. Later that night, she took her short story and a metal waste can, went to the top of her dorm, 
burned the manuscript and declared to the winter night sky, I vow I will never believe in dreams. I will deal only with reality. She then changed her major to education. For fourteen years, Catherine didn't write. But one summer, when she was in San Antonio, she noticed a group of writers and journalists sitting around one of the tables by the pool of her hotel. Summoning up her courage, she walked over to them and said, I want you to know that I really admire what you do as journalists, seeking out news stories. My secret dream was to be a writer. One of the older guys turned around and said, Is that right? Because if you wanted to be a writer, you would be a writer. Catherine replied, I have it on good authority that I have no talent whatsoever. He asked who told her that, and she told him the story of the professor. He gave her his card and told her to call him if she did any writing. She said she wasn't going to write, to which he replied, Oh, yes, you are. She thought about it, went home, wrote a book, and sent it to him. Three months later, he called and said that he liked it and had sent it to his agent, who would call in a half hour. The agent did call and said, Catherine, you are startlingly talented. Catherine signed a contract with the agency and within three weeks had two publishing companies bidding on the book. Since then, Catherine has published 33 books, including Romancing the Stone and Jewel of the Nile, both of which were made into blockbuster movies starring Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. Think about this for a moment. Catherine lost the first 14 years of what was to become a lucrative and creative writing career because she believed the professor who told her she couldn't write. Don't ever let someone else tell you what you are not capable of. With training, determination, and hard work, you can eventually do anything you set your mind to. Remember, your beliefs are a choice. So make the choice to believe in yourself no matter what anyone else says. It's never too late. It's never too late. Never too late to start over. Never too late to be happy. Jane Fonda, Academy Award-winning actress and fitness guru. One of the most common excuses people use to avoid the risk of going for their dreams is, I'm too old. It's too late for me. I didn't start soon enough. Well, it's not true. Consider this. Julia Child, one of the most famous chefs in history, didn't even learn to cook until she was almost 40, and didn't launch The French Chef, the popular television show that would make her a household name, until she was 51. Susan Boyle was an unknown 48-year-old amateur when in the spring of 2009 she skyrocketed onto the international stage by belting out I Dreamed a Dream from Les Miserables on Britain's Got Talent. Since then she has recorded five albums which have sold over 19 million copies, received two Grammy nominations, and amassed an estimated net worth of more than 22 million pounds, 37 million U.S. dollars. Ray Kroc was 52 after spending 17 years of his adult life as a paper cup salesman and approximately another 17 peddling a machine that could make five milkshakes at once when he met the McDonald brothers, who owned a few great hamburger restaurants in California and convinced them to let him help them franchise their operation on a national scale. Seven years later, Ray convinced them to sell out their shares and went on to become a billionaire. Elizabeth Jolly had her first novel published at the age of 56. In one year alone, she received 39 rejection letters. But she finally had 15 novels and four short story collections published to great success. Doris Haddock was 89 in 1999 when she began walking the 3,200 miles, 5,150 kilometers, between Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., to raise awareness for the issue of campaign finance reform. Granny D, as she became known, walked ten miles a day on her journey, relying on the kindness of strangers for her housing and meals over the fourteen months that her walk took. In 2004, at the age of ninety-four, she even made a bid for a seat in the U.S. Senate, making her one of the oldest candidates ever to run for a major public office. Anna Mary Robertson Moses better known to the world as Grandma Moses, 
is one of the biggest names in American folk art, yet she didn't even pick up a brush until she was 76. She painted for another 25 years, which was long enough to allow her to see the canvases she had originally sold for $3 sell for more than $10,000. Today, some of her paintings sell at auction for more than $100,000. In 2007, 95-year-old Nola Oakes graduated from Fort Hay State University in Kansas with a degree in history, making her the oldest person to graduate with a college degree, breaking the record according to Guinness World Records, which had previously belonged to Moselle Richardson, who received a journalism degree from the University of Oklahoma at age 90 in 2004. Three years later, Nola went on to receive her master's degree, making her the oldest recipient of a master's degree at 98. On her hundredth birthday, Nola started writing her first book, Nola Remembers. And then, as if there was some kind of new competition, in 2011, Leo Plass graduated at 99 years old with an associate's degree from Eastern Oregon University, setting a world record for the oldest man to get a college degree. It's clear that it's never too late to do anything. From nursing shoes to running shoes. When Helen Klein was 55 years old, her husband, Norm, came to her and asked her to train with him for a 10-mile run. She had been smoking for 25 years and had never run a mile in her life, but she agreed to try it out. However, panting and exhausted after running two laps on a track they had marked off in their backyard, she wasn't so sure. But she decided to continue, and each day she ran one lap farther. Ten weeks later, she finished last, but she completed the ten-mile race. Spurred on by this success, Helen entered other short races, but realized she was not blessed with amazing speed, so she decided to try longer, slower marathons. Since then, she has run more than 60 marathons and 140 ultramarathons. Here are a few highlights from Helen's remarkable achievements. At age 66, she ran five 100-mile mountain trail events within 16 weeks. In 1991, she ran across the state of Colorado in five days and ten hours, setting the world record for the 500K. She also holds a world age group record in the 100-mile run. In 1995, at age 72, Helen ran 145 miles across the Sahara, and also completed the 370-mile Eco Challenge, in which she rode 36 miles on horseback, hiked 90 miles through broiling desert heat, negotiated 18 miles through freezing water-filled canyons, mountain-biked 30 miles, rappelled down a 440-foot cliff, climbed 1,200 feet straight up, paddled 90 miles on a river raft, hiked another 20 miles, and finally canoed 50 miles to the finish line. She also holds the world marathon record for the 80 to 85-year-old class, completing the 26.2-mile run in 4 hours and 31 minutes. Remember that Helen had never run before the age of 55. Her story is proof that it really is never too late to start. You're never too young to start. On the flip side of the coin, many people stop themselves by telling themselves they're too young to start, or that they don't have enough experience yet to pursue their dreams. That is also a false notion. Consider this. When I was speaking at the California Women's Conference, I met 12-year-old Ryan Ross, whom the media had dubbed Tiny Trump. When he was three years old, he started a chicken and egg business in his backyard. He had 60 chickens and sold a dozen eggs for $3. He was making $15 a day. When he got tired of selling eggs, he started his next venture, a lawn mowing business. He charged his customers $20 an hour, but because he was too young to operate a lawnmower, he paid older kids to do the work for $15 an hour, giving him a $5 an hour profit. His next business was a power washing business for which he charged $200 an hour and paid someone $100 an hour to do the work. At the age of five, Ryan was already investing his profits in buying real estate in his hometown of Toronto, Ontario 
and in British Columbia. By the time he was eight, he owned six buildings and had a personal net worth of a million dollars. Ryan also engages in philanthropy that feeds and clothes families in third world countries. He told me he was having lunch with the real Donald Trump the following week. When Alec Greven was nine years old, HarperCollins published his first book, How to Talk to Girls, which started out as a project for school. In the year after it came out, he appeared on The Ellen DeGeneres Show, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Within the first three months, the book made it onto the New York Times bestsellers list. A year later, he published three more books, How to Talk to Moms, How to Talk to Dads, and How to Talk to Santa. A year after that, at roughly 11 years old, he published Rules for School. His books are now available in 17 countries. And then there's the story of Ryan Hurljack. When he was six years old, he was shocked to learn that children in Africa had to walk many miles every day just to fetch water. So Ryan decided he needed to build a well for a village in Africa. By doing household chores and speaking at churches and schools on clean water issues, Ryan was able to raise enough money to get his first well built in northern Uganda by the time he was eight. Ryan's determination led to his founding the Ryan's Well Foundation, which has raised millions of dollars and has completed 878 water projects and 1,120 latrines in 16 countries, bringing access to clean water and sanitation to more than 823,000 people. Currently, 23-year-old Ryan just completed his studies in international development and political science at University of King's College in Halifax, on the east coast of Canada, and still remains active with the foundation as speaker and a board member. And when Jalen Bledsoe was just 13 years old, he started his own tech company, Bledsoe Technologies, specializing in web design and other IT services. In two years, he grew the company from just two employees to 150 contracted workers and expanded it into a global enterprise now worth $3.5 million. There are very few adults who can say they grew their business into a multi-million dollar business in just two years. By the age of 12, Brianna and Brittany Winner had completed their first novel, The Strand Prophecy, which was distributed nationally through Barnes & Noble. By the end of the 10th grade, these identical twins had completed four novels, a screenplay, a guide to writing, and a comic book. And get this, they are both dyslexic. Don't assume you need a college degree. Here's another statistic showing that belief in yourself is more important than knowledge, training, or schooling. 20% of America's millionaires never set foot in college and 16 of the 492 Americans listed as billionaires in 2014 never got their college diplomas. Two never even finished high school. So although education and a commitment to lifelong learning are essential to success, a formal degree isn't a requirement. This is true even in the high-tech world of the Internet. Larry Ellison, CEO of Oracle, dropped out of the University of Illinois and at the time of this writing, was worth $48 billion. Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard after founding Facebook, and now has a net worth of $28 billion. And Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard, and later founded Microsoft. Today he is considered by Forbes to be one of the richest men in the world, with a net worth of more than $76 billion. Even Vice President Dick Cheney dropped out of college. So when you realize that a former vice president, several of the richest men in America, and many $20 million a movie actors, as well as many of our greatest musicians and athletes, are all college dropouts, it's clear that you can start from anywhere and create a successful life for yourself. What others think about you is none of your business. You have to believe in yourself when no one else does. That's what makes you a winner. Venus Williams, Olympic gold medalist and professional tennis champion. If having others believe in you and your dream was a requirement for success, most of us would never accomplish anything. You need to base your decisions about what you want to do on your goals and desires, 
not the goals, desires, opinions, and judgments of your parents, friends, spouse, children, and co-workers. Quit worrying what other people think about you and follow your heart. I like Dr. Daniel Amen's 1840-60 rule. When you're 18, you worry about what everybody is thinking of you. When you're 40, you don't give a darn what anybody thinks of you. When you're 60, you realize nobody's been thinking about you at all. Surprise, surprise. Most of the time, nobody's thinking about you at all. They're too busy worrying about their own lives. And if they are thinking about you at all, they're wondering what you are thinking about them. Meanwhile, all that time you are wasting worrying about what other people think about your ideas, your goals, your clothes, your hair, and your home, could all be better spent focusing on doing the things that will achieve your goals. Principle 6. Use the Law of Attraction. What you radiate outward in your thoughts, feelings, mental pictures, and words, you attract into your life. Catherine Ponder, author of The Dynamic Laws of Prosperity. One of the most powerful forces in the universe surrounds us, affects us, and can be used to positively impact our future. Like gravity, it is not something we can turn on or off. It just is. And like gravity, we can choose to fight it, complain about it, or harness its tremendous benefits, just as successful people do. I'm talking about the law of attraction. For centuries, most people didn't know it existed, until in 2006, a documentary film and book called The Secret was released that featured me and many of my colleagues as teachers of this powerful law. I've consciously used the law of attraction to create personal success and business milestones throughout my life. And interestingly, the key practices for harnessing its power are many of the same principles and practices you're reading about in this book, The Success Principles. Behaviors like taking 100% responsibility for the outcomes in your life, believing it's possible, visualizing your desired results, creating a vision board, repeating affirmations, acting as if, maintaining a positive expectancy, practicing forgiveness, meditating, practicing uncommon appreciation, and developing a positive money consciousness. Since The Secret and The Law of Attraction have become so much a part of our culture, let's take a few moments to discover what it is, how it works, and most important, how you can use it to create the life and results you want. Stated in its most basic form, The Law of Attraction says, What you think about, talk about, believe strongly about, and feel intensely about, you will bring about. Throughout history, the greatest minds and spiritual teachers have been pointing us to this truth. Consider the following. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11.24, King James Version of the Bible. All that we are is a result of what we have thought. Buddha. A man is but the product of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes. Gandhi. The empires of the future are the empires of the mind. Winston Churchill. We become what we think about all day long. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life, and you will call it fate. Carl Jung. These great thinkers knew the power that our thoughts have over our lives from impacting what we have to creating everything we experience, even to determining our place in the world. How can mere thoughts control so many aspects of our life? Because our thoughts are made up of energy, they can impact our physical world. Today, scientists know that everything found in the universe is made up of energy. This goes for both physical and non-physical objects. Of course, basic chemistry tells us that a physical object, such as a building, a tree, or this book, is made up of billions of individual atoms, little energy bundles that interact and bond with other atoms into many forms including water, metals, plants, soil, plastics, wood pulp, and other raw materials used to manufacture physical objects. Non-physical things, including thoughts, are also made up of energy 
and as such can also bond and interact with aspects and objects of our physical world. It is well known, for instance, that our brain waves, literally our thoughts, are a form of intense energy that can be easily detected with standard medical equipment and that can interact with our physical world as any other form of energy would. What do I mean by interact with our physical world? Well, have you ever thought about a distant friend only to get a phone call from her moments later? Have you ever driven down a highway wondering whether you'll get a speeding ticket only to see flashing red lights in your rearview mirror? That's your brain waves interacting with your physical reality. Luckily, it's possible to use your thoughts to stimulate positive outcomes, too. If you've ever desired something intensely for months, only to suddenly receive it through serendipitous means, or step into a situation where it was provided to you, that was also your thoughts, intention, and desire impacting your experience. The world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. Albert Einstein, physicist and winner of the Nobel Prize. Albert Einstein studied this phenomenon in 1935 when he experimented with quantum mechanics, the idea that energetically activating a particle on one side of the universe created an instantaneous response in a partner particle elsewhere in the universe. Columbia University professor Brian Greene explains it this way. According to quantum theory and the many experiments that bear out its predictions, the quantum connection between two particles can persist even if they are on opposite sides of the universe. In other words, something that happens over here can be entwined with something that happens over there. Brian Greene is a professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia University. His book, The Fabric of the Cosmos, was the basis for a miniseries on PBS television's NOVA program. A number of other documented experiments have also proven that thoughts can rapidly travel through space and either be picked up by others or have an effect on matter. The book Thoughts Through Space recounts an experiment in 1937 by Arctic explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins and Harold Sherman, a student of mental powers who had long been interested in the phenomenon of mind-to-mind -mind communication. The experiment began when a group of Russian flyers crashed on a shelf of ice on the Alaskan side of the North Pole. The Russian government commissioned Sir Hubert Wilkins to organize and lead an aerial search in the region to find and rescue them, if they were still alive. While in New York prior to his departure, Sir Hubert met Harold Sherman and, seeing an unusual opportunity to put mind-to-mind -mind communication to a scientific test, they decided to collaborate on a six-month experiment. It was agreed that Wilkins, once his expedition was underway, would, as an experiment separate from his rescue mission, transmit thought messages at prearranged times directly to Sherman in New York. Both men would keep written records of each session. With Wilkins noting his thoughts as the sender, and Sherman recording his mental impressions in his role as the receiver. Both written records were regularly given to third parties, so the results couldn't be altered later. When Wilkins returned to the United States at the end of his expedition and showed his diary of thought messages sent to Sherman, an amazing 80% of Sherman's readings were accurate, proving that thought messages were successfully sent and received across 3,400 miles. A more recent experiment conducted by astronaut Edgar Mitchell during the Apollo 14 mission in 1971 established that thoughts could travel at least 250,000 miles, the distance from the Earth to the Moon. While in outer space, Mitchell, who holds a doctorate degree in science, transmitted a telepathic message to four individuals on Earth. Three of them received the message correctly. According to the story, one of those to whom the message was transmitted was Olaf Jonsson, an engineer and a psychic, who was living in Chicago. At a prearranged time from inside his space capsule, Mitchell arranged a sequence of cards containing different symbols such as a cross, a star, a wave, a circle, and a square. And Jonsson tried to picture the unknown cards from 250,000 miles away. Not only did Jonsson get all of the symbols correct, he also saw them in the correct order.
Dozens of scientists have produced thousands of papers in the scientific literature offering sound evidence that thoughts are capable of profoundly affecting all aspects of our lives. As observers and creators, we are constantly remaking our world at every instant. Every thought we have, every judgment we hold, however unconscious, is having an effect. Lynn McTaggart, author of The Field, The Intention Experiment, and The Bond. Today, scientists have advanced to studying not just transmission of thoughts, but also bio-entanglement physics, discovering how to harness these energy connections to bring desired results into our physical reality. While The Secret and The Law of Attraction have had their share of critics these past few years, I think humankind is just beginning to understand the power of thought and the theory of entanglement. Literally, that our mind is energetically entangled with the physical universe, and as such, can activate the universe to deliver whatever is on our mind. The law of attraction relies on the fact that everything is in a constant state of vibration. Another fact that's widely known by scientists is that the Earth, and everything on Earth, including you, is vibrating at a specific frequency that's unique to that object or person. From the smallest atomic particle to the largest skyscraper, everything ever created is in a constant state of vibration, literally, in energetic motion. Scientists also know that the Earth's vibrational frequency can fluctuate under intense energy, not only in areas of extreme weather, but also around worldwide events such as terrorist attacks, natural disasters, and other instances of extreme human emotion. It's not much of a stretch to realize that, through our own intense emotions, we too can raise, lower, or even match the vibrational frequencies of objects, situations, experiences, and people we want to attract into our existence. In fact, one of the main precepts of the Law of Attraction is that the level of vibrational frequency and the flow of energy is controlled by thought. Through your deliberate thoughts, you can bring yourself into vibrational harmony with, and attract, anything you desire. As best-selling author Lynn McTaggart writes, Where attention goes, energy flows. Where intention goes, energy flows. To learn more about the power of intention, read The Intention Experiment, Using Your Thoughts to Change Your Life and the World, by Lynn McTaggart. A major focus of The Secret is how to use the power of intention, that is, deliberate thought, to manifest what you want in life. It's a three-step process. Ask, believe, and receive. Step 1. Ask for what you want, not for what you don't want. Every day you send out requests to the universe, as well as to your subconscious mind, in the form of thoughts. Literally, what you think about, read about, talk about, and give your attention to. This includes the books and magazines you read, the television shows and movies you watch, the emails you answer, the websites you visit, the blogs you read, and the music you listen to. Unfortunately, much of this thought is random, contradictory, non-productive, and certainly not deliberate. It happens without our conscious awareness or intention. Even worse, we send negative requests to the universe when we criticize ourselves, complain about things, and focus on the lack of abundance in our lives. Similarly, when you blame, find fault, or judge someone or something, you're also focusing on a negative experience that you don't want. The same is true when you worry. I often refer to worrying as negative goal-setting. You're creating pictures in your mind of what you don't want. Because the Law of Attraction states that you'll attract into your life whatever you give your energy, focus, and attention to, wanted or unwanted, you must become more deliberate about what you think and feel. The Law of Attraction also states that each thought or feeling you offer carries with it a vibrational frequency, to which the universe responds by giving you more of whatever you are vibrating. It doesn't care whether that request is good for you or not. It simply responds to your vibration. The problem is that, most of the time, you're not aware of the vibration you are offering. You are simply responding to things outside of yourself—current events, the news, 
how people treat you, the stock market, how much money you make, how your children are doing in school, and whether or not your team wins. You're responding by feeling positive or negative. Unfortunately, when you merely respond unconsciously to what is currently happening around you, never offering deliberate thought about what you want in your future, you can stay stuck in your current condition forever. This is why most people's lives never seem to change. They get stuck in a cycle of recreating the same reality over and over, because the universe faithfully responds to the negative vibration they are sending out. Compare that with offering positive thoughts instead. Feeling excited, enthusiastic, passionate, happy, joyful, loving, appreciative, abundant, prosperous, relaxed, and peaceful. These are thoughts that give off positive vibrations. By contrast, feeling bored, anxious, worried, confused, sad, lonely, hurt, angry, resentful, guilty, disappointed, frustrated, overwhelmed, stressed out, or depressed, gives off negative vibrations. The law of attraction responds either way and brings you more of what you are vibrating. This is shocking to most people. To learn that the life they're living now is the result of the thoughts and vibrations they've offered in the past is revolutionary. Even more exciting is learning that to create the future of your dreams, you need only change your thoughts and vibrations from this day forward. How would you be feeling if you already had those things and lifestyle experiences you desire, the perfect job, the perfect relationship, world travel, the amount of money that you want to have? Start intentionally creating your future. To become more intentional about the thoughts you offer the universe, you'll need to decide what you want, but also practice feeling those emotions you'll experience when you have it. To help you decide what you want, see Principle 3, Decide What You Want. To learn how to practice the emotional joy and satisfaction of having, being, and doing what you want, see Principle 12, Act As If. Perhaps you want to change careers, move to another state, win a major professional award, have your own TV show, or recover from a major illness. How would you feel once you've arrived at your goal? What would you be doing throughout your day? Who would you be spending time with? The more you focus on and talk about what you do want instead of what you don't want, the faster you will manifest your dreams and goals. Think of your mind as a GPS system like the one on your smartphone or in your car. With every picture you visualize, you're inputting the destination you want to get to. Every time you express a preference for something, you are expressing an intention. A table by the window, front row seats at a conference, first class tickets, a room with an ocean view, a loving relationship. These images and thoughts are all sending requests to the universe. Use words that focus the universe on what you want. Of course, how you state your goals is very important to this focusing process. Instead of saying, I want to get out of debt, which keeps your mind focused on the debt you have now, say, I am living a life of abundance and wealth. Words like these keep you in a positive state of thought. Be similarly careful when you talk with other people about your current situation. Talking about the way things are and describing what's going on in your current reality actually creates more of the same in your future. By thinking about and voicing opinions about your current situation, you're actually prescribing the future rather than simply describing the present. The difference between the two was dramatically brought home to me a few years ago when Mark Victor Hansen and I flew to New York to be inducted into the Ardith Rodale Hall of Fame in recognition for the positive impact of our Chicken Soup for the Soul books. On the flight to New York, I sat next to a man who spent the entire trip talking about how terrible the world was, the government, the economy, crime, corruption, pollution, how ungrateful and out-of-control teenagers were, and on and on. He was an unhappy man. But when Mark and I went out for a late dinner after the award ceremony, all we could talk about were all the wonderful things that were happening in our lives, our recent successes, the projects we were working on, how we could help each other, who we wanted to introduce each other to, 
the recent insights we were having, what we were grateful for, and all the other positives in our life. Having a positive outlook, using future thinking language, and being in a state of expectancy about the good that's coming into your life is the best way to ask the universe to deliver the very things, people, and experiences you want. Replace negative images and thoughts with positive ones. In the same way that you can write the script for your exciting future life, you can prevent the things you don't want by keeping your mind off of them. Whenever you see things you don't want, make a conscious decision not to think about them, write about them, talk about them, push against them, or join groups that focus on them. Whenever you catch yourself worrying or focusing on lack, quickly replace those negative thoughts with pictures, feelings, and emotions of you enjoying what you do want. This is intentional daydreaming, a great use of the power of visualization, something I discuss later in Principle 11. Whenever you slip into judging yourself or someone or something else, realize that you're focusing on what you don't want. Take action to shift your thinking. Civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King's greatest speech was not titled, I Have a Complaint. It was called, I Have a Dream. And when Mother Teresa was asked why she didn't participate in anti-war demonstrations, she said, I will never do that. But as soon as you have a pro-peace rally, I'll be there. These great leaders knew that to be against something, to focus on your opposition to it, just creates more of it. This is why meditation, mindfulness, and paying attention are so important. You will become more powerful in creating what you do want when you learn to focus your attention and monitor your thoughts. Replace negative thoughts that produce feelings of resignation, hopelessness, depression, guilt, fear, and anger with more positive thoughts that produce feelings of happiness, contentment, love, acceptance, hope, peace, and joy. Ask for what you want, then let the universe worry about how you'll get it. As I mentioned in Principle 3, decide what you want. Your only job is to focus on what you want. Don't worry about how to get it. That's the universe's job, and, as we'll see, it's phenomenally good at aligning the people, situations, money, resources, and other things necessary to bring about your desired goals. Be more intentional by deciding exactly what you want. Focus your thoughts. They will attract to you the people, things, and experiences that match the content and vibration of your thoughts. Just like the GPS system I mentioned earlier, when you present your goals to the universe and its powerful technology, you will be surprised and dazzled by what it delivers. This is where the magic and miracles truly happen. It's the same for Christians and other people of faith who are willing to turn their dreams, fears, and desires over to God. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. Nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Step 2. Believe that you'll get what you want. Then take action. Our intentions attract the elements and forces, the events, the situation, the circumstances, and the relationships necessary to fulfill the intended outcome. We don't need to become involved in the details. In fact, trying too hard may backfire. Let the non-local intelligence synchronize the actions of the universe to fulfill your intentions for you. Deepak Chopra Physician, Speaker, and author of The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. What does it mean to believe you'll get what you want? It means maintaining a positive expectancy, going about your day with certainty, knowing that you've put your future in the hands of powers that are greater than yours. It's deciding with conviction that what you want will absolutely happen. This is not always easy. Many people have limiting beliefs which keep them from allowing abundance and happiness into their lives. If this describes you, realize that you must first change your limiting beliefs into thoughts that you are deserving, worthy, lovable, desirable, and capable, as well as smart enough, strong enough, attractive enough, rich enough, 
good enough, and enough in every other way that matters to you. I've written a simple strategy in Principle 33. Transcend your limiting beliefs to help you eliminate any beliefs that are holding you back. And if you need to turn your inner critic into an inner coach, see Principle 32 for ways to overcome negative thoughts that can block the positive expectancy that is so critical to the law of attraction at work. Of course, once you believe that you'll get what you want, the second part of the equation is to take action. Taking the actions that would create your desired result affirms your belief that what you want is within reach. It adds to your expectation. Some of the actions you'll take are what I call obvious actions, like enrolling in biochemistry and anatomy classes in college if your goal is to become a doctor, or changing your diet if your goal is to lose weight. You don't need to wait for the universe to deliver a unique set of circumstances to you. It's obvious what you must do, and those opportunities are readily available to you. Then there are what I call inspired actions. These are actions you take when you receive inner guidance, an intuitive hit, a hunch, or a gut feeling. Like when you respond to a random thought such as, I don't know why, but I have this urge to call my college roommate, or I'm feeling the strong need to attend that conference. Many people during their visualization or meditation time keep paper and pencil nearby to capture these ideas. Most of the time, you won't see the whole plan. But with a strong enough belief, you can move forward and take action anyway, watching for other action steps to appear. She followed her inspiration. By thought, the thing you want is brought to you. By action, you receive it. Wallace T. Wattles, author of The Science of Getting Rich. When Jeanette Ma was four months into her new job as a 401k sales rep for a large national bank, management announced that if the sales team didn't turn things around soon and create some impressive numbers fast, all of them would be out of jobs. Up until that time, they had followed very prescribed steps for making a sale. Make a certain number of cold calls each day, set up a certain number of meetings each week, and use a list of responses to potential objections. These were sales strategies that had been tried and proven many times for others, but it wasn't working for their team. And now the team was spending too much of its time discussing what was going wrong, whose fault it was, and why things weren't working. After learning their jobs were on the line if they didn't produce results in a hurry, Jeanette threw out her pipeline and script sheet and decided to try something else. She remembered hearing about a journal writing technique in which, if you wrote a page a day about what you wanted, as if you already had it, by the time you got to the end of your book, you would have what you want. Jeanette didn't have a lot of time, so she pulled out the smallest book she could find, a two-inch by three-inch notebook about 25 pages long. It took all of two minutes to fill her first page. She wrote about how excited prospects were to talk with her, how they loved her product and couldn't wait for her to implement it. She wrote about the instant excellent rapport she felt and how the product she offered really was the perfect solution for their company. After making her first entry, she checked in with herself about what felt good to do next. The answer was lunch. She hadn't had a real lunch since her first week on the job. Her lunch hour since then had consisted of literally running down the hall to the vending machine. Then she would run back to her desk and eat her unhealthy fare between calls to business owners. On this day, however, she followed her inner guidance and decided on a better lunch. It felt truly luxurious to actually leave the building, sit in an outside table, and enjoy her favorite Greek food on a spring day. After she enjoyed a delicious meal, she kicked her feet up on the table and threw leftover pita bread to the sparrows nearby. When she was good and ready, she meandered back to the office. It was in the elevator, on the way back to her cubicle, that a stranger introduced himself to her and asked who she was. I'm Jeanette, and I sell small business 401ks for the bank. He couldn't believe his ears. He insisted she follow him to his office, which is where he showed her a desk littered with 401k sales literature from a variety of vendors. He said he hadn't been able to make heads or tails of any of it, and he had no idea her bank sold 401ks to small businesses. She shared her sales material. 
he was elated. It was exactly what he wanted. He asked how soon she could put this in place for his company. In a bit of a daze, she let him introduce her to his human resources director. He instructed his human resources director to sign whatever Jeanette needed as soon as possible. He wanted this plan in place immediately. Within two hours of her first entry in her journal, she was already experiencing amazing success. Her colleagues and manager were equally astounded. This never happened. Jeanette attributed the happy result to giving up the supposed-to actions that management had given them and instead doing what felt good. Know when to take inspired action. As the laws of attraction goes to work on your goals, you'll find that numerous ideas, strategies, and inspirations will come into your awareness. These might be flashes of insight that come up during visualization or meditation time. Sometimes the opportunity will appear in the form of an unexpected phone call or a new acquaintance who brings you details of a lucky break. At other times, it will be an unusual monetary transaction, rebate, or other financial boost that brings you the money you need to take the first step toward your goal. Yet again, it might be merely an impulse, an inspired idea, or a strategy that briefly comes to mind that you write down. I call these inspired ideas. They're not random ideas you'd like to try or strategies you think might work. They're approaches you've never considered before that could only have come to mind because of your use of the law of attraction. Whatever appears, your task is to recognize these opportunities for what they are, then act quickly while the associated energy is in your favor. It's not enough to simply think positive thoughts. When a chance appears, you must take action. When Janet Switzer wanted to sell her own book, Instant Income, shortly after the Success Principles was first released, she set the intention to land a publishing deal from a prominent New York publisher, then spent days writing an elaborate book proposal, knowing with certainty that an opportunity to take action would appear. Within two weeks, Janet got a call from the former chairman and CEO of Time Warner Book Group, who had recently retired and started his own literary agency. A friend had mentioned Janet's latest project to him, and he had called to discuss representing her. Because Janet was prepared with her book proposal, was clear about what she wanted, and recognized the lucky break for what it was, she took action and quickly signed on as one of the CEO's first clients. Within weeks, Janet was in New York meeting with America's biggest publishing houses and sold her book for a major advance just a few days later. In the beginning, as you start intentionally creating your future, it may seem like these inspirations and opportunities are swift to appear and overwhelming in number. You may not trust them all, and you'll probably feel like they're seriously impacting your to-do list. So how can you distinguish the truly inspired ideas, prioritize them, then accomplish all of them if you're supposed to take immediate action? How can you discern which actions are the most important and which can be left until later? One way is to use an exercise called somatic decision-making, sometimes referred to as the sway test. It's based on the idea that our bodies instinctively know what's right for us and can therefore help us decide by considering our different options. To start the process, stand with your feet together and your arms relaxed at your side. Close your eyes and simply ask your body, what is a yes answer? Wait until your body automatically leans forward or backward. Then ask your body, what is a no answer? If it leans in the opposite direction, you have successfully calibrated your body's answers. When you've determined which direction means yes for you and which way means no, you can begin to test the accuracy of the calibration by asking your body some standard questions that you already know the answer to, such as, Is my name Jack? Do I live in Dallas, Texas? Am I wearing a blue shirt? Once you have determined that you can trust the answers you are getting, you can begin to ask your body questions about the inspired ideas you've received. Should I bring on Jonathan as a partner in the business? Should I marry Doug? Should I buy the boat that Marcus called about today? Another way to discern between the many inspired ideas you receive is to simply see which ones keep coming up for you. 
When I first got the idea to form the Transformational Leadership Council, I didn't take action right away. In fact, it was months before I could take the necessary steps. But the idea kept popping into my head at odd moments, newly embellished with specific ideas about who to invite as members, what the organization's goals should be, where we would meet for annual meetings, and so on. I couldn't get those thoughts out of my head. The same thing happened with the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book. I got so many messages that I knew I simply had to take action on the idea. Step 3. Receive what you want by becoming a vibrational match for it. Remember I said that everything on Earth vibrates at a specific frequency? In order to receive that which you are intending, you must become a vibrational match for what you want to attract into your life. You are like a radio station that is broadcasting on a specific frequency. If you want to listen to jazz, you have to tune your dial to a station that broadcasts jazz, not one that plays heavy metal. If you want more abundance and prosperity in your life, you have to tune the frequency of your thoughts and feelings to ones of abundance and prosperity. The easiest way to become a vibrational match is to focus on creating positive emotions of love, joy, appreciation, and gratitude throughout your day. You can also practice feeling the emotions you would be experiencing if you already had what you wanted. You can also create these emotions through the thoughts that you think. In fact, your thoughts are creating feelings all the time, so it's important to catch yourself when your emotions turn negative, striving to replace them with what the Law of Attraction authors Esther and Jerry Hicks call a better-feeling thought. For example, thinking you don't have enough money to pay your mortgage will create negative feelings of fear and hopelessness, even guilt and shame for not being able to provide for your family. Instead of giving energy to these negative thoughts, shift your thinking to positive ones such as, I will find a way, or by visualizing yourself easily paying the mortgage on time. At first, this process may seem foreign to you, but the truth is you can, over time, learn to choose only uplifting, inspiring, motivational, and empowering thoughts. It is simply a habit that, with intention and discipline, can be developed. Use affirmations to create a vibrational match. Another way to bring yourself into vibrational alignment with what you want is to use affirmations, something I discuss in great detail in Principle 10, Release the Brakes. An affirmation is a statement of your goal or desire, now realized in present time. They are statements you can write down, then repeat regularly, to bombard your subconscious mind with the thoughts, images, and feelings you would be experiencing if your goal was already complete. Affirmations sound like this. I am so happy and grateful that I live in a 4,000-square-foot oceanfront home on Ka'anapali Beach. Or, I'm so happy and grateful that I am effortlessly depositing $10,000 a month into my bank account. When you use affirmations to visualize your goals as already complete, you keep yourself in that heightened state of joy that is required to maintain a vibrational match to what you want. Resentment that you don't have what you want, on the other hand, keeps you out of vibrational alignment. It's simply impossible to receive or allow what you want when you are bitter, blaming, judging, or feeling guilty. These feelings push away what you want. If the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it would be enough. Meister Eckhart, German theologian and philosopher. Create a vibrational match through appreciation and gratitude. The two most powerful feelings for quickly manifesting your goals are appreciation and gratitude. Think about it. If you had whatever it is you are wanting, you would feel appreciation and gratitude for having received it. So not only is appreciation a great feeling to focus on, but gratitude is also a powerful mindset for attracting more of what you want. You can get into the habit of appreciation by making it a daily discipline. Set aside 5 to 10 minutes a day to focus on appreciation. Make a list in your journal of all the things you are grateful for. That's how I first started. You can also practice appreciation and gratitude through meditation. 
Yet another technique is an exercise that Esther and Jerry Hicks call the rampage of appreciation, where you simply look around you and gently notice something that pleases you. Hold your attention on it while you think about how wonderful, beautiful, or useful it is. If it's an item you own, appreciate the fact that it is already in your life. Continue observing it until you feel the appreciation expanding. When you do this, you are telling the universe, Give me more of this, please. Eventually, choose another object to appreciate, then another, and another. In my longer workshops, I will send people out of the training room on a silent rampage of appreciation, with instructions to focus on all the things in the environment that are serving them. I tell them to feel the appreciation not just for the carpet, which makes the room more attractive, makes the sound more pleasing, and makes walking on the floor more comfortable, but also to appreciate the hotel staff who vacuumed the carpet, the people who made the carpet, the people who installed the carpet, the people who made the dyes, the sheep that gave up their wool, the sheep farmers who sheared the sheep, and so on. People always return from this exercise with a smile on their face and joy in their heart, feeling much happier than when they left the room. You might want to take a short break now from reading this book and do a rampage of appreciation wherever you are. Notice how it makes you feel. The key here is to develop a practice of appreciation and begin to continually look for things to appreciate in your life. This goes for appreciating the positive aspects of all the people you meet, too. As you learn to focus on what is good about them, rather than what is wrong with them, you'll be amazed at how your relationship with them will change. Appreciating and being in a state of gratitude gives power to the old saying, What you think about and thank about is what you will bring about. When I was on The Oprah Winfrey Show with several other teachers who appeared in the movie The Secret, there was a couple in the front row of the studio audience who had shared that before watching The Secret, they had not been happy in their relationship for a very long time. The woman said that after watching the movie, she decided to focus on the positive aspects of her husband rather than on all his thoughts and the things about him that irritated her. She also started writing him notes about what she appreciated about him and leaving them on the kitchen counter where he would find them in the morning. Some day she would even attach a ten-dollar bill with a note that said, I love you. This is for your first cup of coffee at Starbucks to get your day off to a good start. She said that over the course of just a few weeks, the love and romance had come back into their relationship. You could tell it was true by the way they were holding hands as they were sitting snuggled next to each other and smiling like a couple of high school sweethearts. Attention to what is only creates more of what is. In order to affect true positive change in your experience, you must disregard how things are, as well as how others are seeing you, and give more of your attention to the way you prefer things to be. With practice, you will change your point of attraction and will experience a substantial change in your life experience. Esther and Jerry Hicks, co-authors of The Law of Attraction Practice, and you will change your point of attraction. As I said earlier, there are many principles and practices regarding implementing a conscious approach to utilizing the law of attraction throughout this book. However, if you wish to explore the law of attraction more deeply, I recommend starting with these four books. There is a much more extensive list in the Suggested Reading and Additional Resources for Success section at www thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Jack Canfield's Key to Living the Law of Attraction by Jack Canfield and D.D. D. Watkins. The Law of Attraction by Esther and Jerry Hicks. The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. Life Lessons for Mastering the Law of Attraction by Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen, Gina Gabellini, and Ava Gregory. And if you haven't seen the movie The Secret, I highly recommend you watch it. While its documentary format is far from that of a Hollywood blockbuster, it's the easiest way I know to get a quick and powerful overview of the Law of Attraction. Once you discover its power, you'll want to make the Law of Attraction a regular part of your life, a mindset you live with every day. Principle 7 
Unleash the power of goal setting. If you want to be happy, set a goal that commands your thoughts, liberates your energy, and inspires your hopes. Andrew Carnegie, the richest man in America in the early 1900s. Once you know your life purpose, determine your vision, and clarify what your true needs and desires are, you have to convert them into specific, measurable goals and objectives, then act on them with the certainty that you will achieve them. Experts on the science of success know the brain is a goal-seeking organism. Whatever goal you want to give to your subconscious mind, it'll work night and day to achieve. The Awesome Power of Goal Setting For long as I can remember, trainers have cited a study on goal setting done at Yale, in which only 3% of the graduating class had written specific goals for their future. Twenty years later, those 3% were found to be earning an astounding 10 times more than the group that had no clear goals. The trouble is, this study turns out to be merely an urban myth, as extensive reviews of available research literature by Dr. Gail Matthews and Dr. Stephen Krauss revealed that no such study had ever been done. Dr. Gail Matthews is a psychology professor at Dominican University, and Dr. Stephen Krauss is a social psychologist from Harvard University. However, as a result of this finding, Dr. Matthews decided to conduct a study of her own that focused on how goal achievement is influenced by writing down one's goals, committing to goal-directed actions, and being held accountable for those actions. A total of 267 participants, ranging in age from 23 to 72, were recruited from the United States, Europe, Australia, and Asia, and included a variety of entrepreneurs, educators, healthcare professionals, artists, attorneys, bankers, marketers, human services providers, managers, vice presidents, and directors of nonprofits. The participants were randomly assigned to one of five groups. Group 1 was simply asked to think deeply about their goals, what they wanted to accomplish over the next four weeks, but not to write them down. Groups 2, 3, 4, and 5 were asked to write down their goals. Group 3 was asked to also formulate a list of action commitments. Group 4 was asked to formulate a list of action commitments and then send their lists of goals and action commitments to a supportive friend. Group 5 was asked to do all of the above and provide a weekly progress report to a friend. At the end of four weeks, the participants were asked to rate their progress and degree to which they had accomplished their goals. The participants in Group 1 accomplished only 43% of their goals while participants in Group 5 achieved 76% of their goals. That's a 33% increase over Group 1. The complete results are summarized here. Think about goals. Group 1, yes. Group 2 and 3, yes. Group 4, yes. Group 5, yes. Write down goals. Group 1, no. Group 2 and 3, yes. Group 4, Yes. Group 5. Yes. Share with a friend. Group 1. No. Group 2 and 3. No. Group 4. Yes. Group 5. Yes. Weekly progress report to a friend. Group 1. No. Group 2 and 3. No. Group 4. No. Group 5. Yes. Success rate. Group 1. 43%. Group 2 to 3. 56%. Group 4, 64%. Group 5, 76%. This study provides empirical evidence for the importance and effectiveness of three essential success principles. 1. Write down your goals. 2. Make a public declaration of your goals. And 3. Being accountable to another person, such as a coach, an accountability partner, or a mastermind group, for the achievement of your goals. Also consider this. According to a study conducted by David Cole, Professor Emeritus at Virginia Tech, 80% of Americans report that they don't have goals. Some 16% say they do have goals, but they don't write them down. Less than 4% take the time to write down their goals, and less than 1% review them regularly.
This small percentage of Americans who write down their goals and review them regularly earn nine times more over the course of their lifetimes than those who don't set goals. This study alone should motivate you to write down your goals. How much? By when? To make sure a goal unleashes the power of your subconscious mind, it must meet two criteria. How much? Some measurable quantity such as pages, pounds, dollars, square feet, or points. And by when? A specific time and date. It must be stated in a way that you and anybody else could measure it. I will lose 10 pounds is not as powerful as I will weigh 135 pounds by 5 p.m. on June 30th. The second is clearer, because anybody can show up at 5 o'clock on June 30th and look at the reading on your scale. It will either be 135 pounds or less, or not. Be as specific as possible with all aspects of your goals. Include the make, model, color, year, and features, the size, weight, form, and any other details. Remember, vague goals produce vague results. A goal versus a good idea. When there are no criteria for measurement, it is simply something you want, a wish, a preference, a good idea. To engage your subconscious mind, a goal or objective has to be measurable. Here are a few examples to give you more clarity. Good idea. I would like to own a nice home on the ocean. Goal or objective. I will own a 4,000-square-foot house on Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, California, by noon, April 30th, 2017. Good idea. I want to lose weight. Goal or objective. I will weigh 185 pounds by 5 p.m. January 1st, 2017. Good idea. I need to treat my employees better. Goal or objective. I will acknowledge a minimum of six employees for their contribution to the department by 5 p.m. this Friday. Write it out in detail. One of the best ways to get clarity and specificity on your goals is to write them out in detail, as if you are writing specifications for a work order. Think of it as a request to God, source, the universal mind, or the quantum field. Include every possible detail. If there is a certain house you want to own, write down its specifics in vivid, colorful detail. The location, landscaping, furniture, artwork, sound system, and floor plan. If a picture of the house is available, get a copy of it. If it's an ideal fantasy that doesn't yet exist in physical form, take the time to close your eyes and fill in all of the details. Then provide a date by which you expect to own it. When you write it all down, your subconscious mind will know what to work on. It will know which opportunities to hone in on to help you reach your goal. When you create your goals, be sure to write down some big ones that will stretch you and require you to grow to achieve them. It's a good thing to have some goals that make you feel a little uncomfortable. Why? Because the ultimate goal, in addition to achieving your material goals, is to become a master at life. And to do this, you will need to learn new skills, expand your vision of what's possible, build new relationships, and learn to overcome your fears, considerations, and roadblocks. Create a Breakthrough Goal in addition to turning every aspect of your vision into a measurable goal, and all the quarterly and weekly and daily goals that you routinely set, I also encourage you to set what I call a breakthrough goal that would represent a quantum leap for you in your career. Most goals represent incremental improvements in your life. They are like plays that gain you four yards in the game of football. But what if you could come out on the first play of the game and throw a 50-yard pass? That would be a quantum leap in your progress down the field. Just as there are plays in football that move you far up the field in one move, there are plays in life that will do the same thing. They include accomplishments such as losing 60 pounds, writing a book, appearing on Oprah, winning a gold medal at the Olympics, creating a killer website, getting your master's or doctoral degree, getting elected president of your union or professional association or hosting your own radio show. 
The achievement of that one goal would change everything. Wouldn't that be a goal worth pursuing with passion? Wouldn't that be something to focus on a little each day until you achieve it? If you were an independent sales professional, for example, and knew you could get a better territory, a substantial bonus commission, and maybe even a promotion once you landed a certain number of customers, wouldn't you work day and night to achieve that goal? And if you were a stay-at-home mom whose entire lifestyle and finances would change if you earned an extra $1,000 or $2,000 a month through participating in a network marketing company, wouldn't you pursue every possible opportunity until you achieved that goal? That's what I mean by a breakthrough goal, something that changes your life, brings you new opportunities, gets you in front of the right people, and takes every activity, relationship, or group you're involved in to a higher level. What would a breakthrough goal be for you? Writing a best-selling book was a breakthrough goal for me and Mark Victor Hansen. Chicken Soup for the Soul took us from being known in a couple of narrow fields to being recognized internationally. It created greater demand for our audio programs, speeches, and seminars. The additional income it produced allowed us to improve our lifestyle, secure our retirement, hire more staff, take on more projects, and have a larger impact on the world. Reread your goals three times a day. Once you've written down all your goals, both large and small, the next step on your journey to success is to activate the creative powers of your subconscious mind by reviewing your list two or three times every day. Take time to read your list of goals. Read the list out loud with passion and enthusiasm if you are in an appropriate place, one goal at a time. Close your eyes and picture each goal as if it were already accomplished. Take a few more seconds to feel what you would feel if you had already accomplished each goal. Following this daily discipline of success will activate the power of your desire. It increases what psychologists refer to as structural tension in your brain. Your brain wants to close the gap between your current reality and the vision of your goal. By constantly repeating and visualizing your goal is already achieved, you will be increasing this structural tension. This will increase your motivation, stimulate your creativity, and heighten your awareness of resources that can help you achieve your goal. Make sure to review your goals at least twice a day, in the morning upon awakening, and again at night before going to bed. I write each of mine on a 3 by 5 index card. I keep the pack of cards next to my bed, and then I go through the cards one at a time in the morning and again at night. When I travel, I take them with me. Put a list of your goals in your daily planner or calendar system. You can also create a pop-up or screen saver on your computer, tablet, or smartphone that lists your goals. The objective is to constantly keep your goals in front of you. When Olympic decathlon gold medalist Bruce Jenner asked a roomful of Olympic hopefuls if they had a list of written goals, everyone raised their hands. When he asked how many of them had that list with them right at the moment, only one person raised their hand. That person was Dan O'Brien. And it was Dan O'Brien who went on to win the gold medal in the decathlon in the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. Don't underestimate the power of setting goals and constantly reviewing them. Create a Goals Book Another powerful way to speed up the achievement of your goals is to create a goals book. Buy a three-ring binder, a scrapbook, or a journal. Then create a separate page for each of your goals. Write down the goal at the top of the page, and then illustrate it with pictures, words, and phrases that you cut out of magazines, catalogs, and travel brochures that depict your goal as already achieved. As new goals and desires emerge, simply add them to your list and your goals book. Review the pages of your goals book at least once every day. Carry your most important goal in your wallet. When I first started working for W. Clement Stone, he taught me to write my most important goal on the back of my business card and carry it in my wallet at all times. Every time I would open my wallet, I would be reminded of my most important goal. When I met Mark Victor Hansen, I discovered that he, too, used the same technique. After finishing the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, we wrote, 
I am so happy selling 1.5 million copies of Chicken Soup for the Soul by December 30th, 1994. We then signed each other's cards and carried them in our wallets. I still have mine in a frame behind my desk. Though our publisher laughed and told us we were crazy, we went on to sell 1.3 million copies of the book by our target date. Some might say, well, you missed your goal by 200,000 copies. Perhaps, but not by much. And that book went on to sell well over 10 million copies in 47 languages around the world. Believe me, I can live with that kind of failure. Write yourself a check. Around 1990, when Jim Carrey was a struggling young Canadian comic trying to make his way in Los Angeles, he drove his old Toyota up to Mulholland Drive. While sitting there looking at the city below and dreaming of his future, he wrote himself a check for $10 million, dated it Thanksgiving 1995, added the notation for acting services rendered, and carried it in his wallet from that day forth. The rest, as they say, is history. Carey's optimism and tenacity eventually paid off, and by 1995, after the huge box office success of Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber, his asking price had risen to $20 million per picture. When Carey's father died in 1994, he placed the $10 million check into his father's coffin as a tribute to the man who had both started and nurtured his dreams of being a star. One goal is not enough. If you are bored with life, if you don't get up every morning with a burning desire to do things, you don't have enough goals. Lou Holtz, the only coach in NCAA history to ever lead six different college teams to postseason bowl games, and the man who also won national championship and coach of the year honors, currently an ESPN commentator. Lou Holtz, the legendary football coach of Notre Dame, is also a legendary goal-setter. His belief in goal-setting comes from a lesson he learned in 1966, when he was only 28 years old and had just been hired as an assistant coach at the University of South Carolina. His wife, Beth, was eight months pregnant with their third child, and Lou had spent every dollar he had on a down payment on a house. One month later, the head coach who had hired Lou resigned, and Lou found himself without a job. In an attempt to lift his spirits, his wife gave him a book, The Magic of Thinking Big, by David Schwartz. The book said that you should write down all the goals you want to achieve in your life. Lou sat at the dining room table, turned his imagination loose, and before he knew it, he had listed 107 goals he wanted to achieve before he died. These goals covered every area of his life and included having dinner at the White House, appearing on The Tonight Show, meeting the Pope, coaching at Notre Dame, leading his team to a national championship, and shooting a hole-in-one in golf. So far, Lou has achieved 102 of those goals, including shooting a hole-in-one not once, but twice. Take the time to make a list of 101 goals you want to achieve in your life. Write them in vivid detail, noting where, when, how much, which model, what size, and so on. Put them on 3 by 5 cards, on a goals page, or in a goals book. Every time you achieve one of your goals, check it off and write victory next to it. I made a list of 109 major goals that I wanted to achieve before I died. I have already achieved 68 of them in only 24 years, including traveling to Africa, flying in a glider, learning to ski, attending the Summer Olympic Games, writing a children's book, and appearing in a movie. You can read my 101 goals list at www.jackcanfield.com forward slash 101 goals. Considerations, Fears, and Roadblocks It's important to understand that as soon as you set a goal, three things are going to emerge that stop most people, but not you. If you know that these three things are simply part of the process, then you can treat them as what they are, just things to handle, rather than letting them stop you. These three obstacles to success are considerations, fears, and roadblocks. 
Think about it. As soon as you say you want to double your income next year, within moments, considerations such as, I'll have to work twice as hard, or I won't have time for my family, or my wife's going to kill me, begin to emerge. You might have thoughts such as, My territory is maxed out. I can't see how I could possibly get the buyers on my current route to buy any more product from me. If you say you're going to run a marathon, you might hear a voice in your head say, You could get hurt, or You'll have to get up two hours earlier every day. It might even suggest that you're too old to start running. These thoughts are called considerations. They are all the reasons why you shouldn't attempt the goal, all the reasons why it is impossible to achieve. But surfacing these considerations is a good thing. They have been there in your subconscious mind, stopping you all along. Now that you have brought them into your conscious awareness, you can deal with them, confront them, and move past them. Fears, on the other hand, are feelings. You may experience a fear of rejection, a fear of failure, or a fear of making a fool of yourself. You might be afraid of getting physically or emotionally hurt. You might be afraid that you will lose all the money you have already saved. These fears are not unusual. They are just part of the process. Knowing that in advance helps you move through them. Finally, you'll become aware of roadblocks. These are purely external circumstances, well beyond just thoughts and feelings in your head. A roadblock may be that nobody wants to join you on your project. A roadblock might be that you don't have all the money you need to move forward. Perhaps you need other investors. Roadblocks might be that your state or national government has rules or laws that prohibit what you want to do. Maybe you need to petition the government to change the rules. Stu Lichtman a business turnaround expert, took over a well-known shoe company in Maine that was in such bad shape financially, it was virtually doomed to go out of business. The business owed millions of dollars to creditors and was short the $2 million needed to pay them. As part of the proposed turnaround, Stu negotiated the sale of an unused plant near the Canadian border that would bring the company $600,000, but the state of Maine had a lien on that plant that would have taken all of the proceeds. So Stu went to the governor of Maine to inform him of the company's dilemma. We can either go bankrupt, he said, in which case nearly 1,000 Maine residents will soon be out of work and on the unemployment rolls, costing the government millions of dollars. Or the company and the government could together pursue Stu's plan of keeping the company alive, helping to keep the state's economy growing keeping nearly 1,000 people employed, and turning the company around in preparation for a takeover by another company. But the only way to achieve that goal was to overcome, you guessed it, the roadblock of the state's lien on the plant. Instead of letting that lien stop him, Stu decided to talk to the person who could remove the roadblock. In the end, the governor decided to cancel the lien. Of course, you may not encounter roadblocks that require you to approach a governor. But then again, depending on how large your goal is, you very well might. Roadblocks are simply obstacles that the world throws at you. It rains when you're trying to put on an outdoor concert. Your wife doesn't want to move to Kentucky. You don't have the financial backing you need, and so on. Roadblocks are simply real-world circumstances that you need to deal with in order to move forward. They are just things that you will need to handle. Unfortunately, when these considerations, fears, and roadblocks come up, most people see them as a stop sign. They say, Now that I'm thinking that, feeling this, and finding out about that, I think I won't pursue this goal after all. But I'm telling you not to see considerations, fears, and roadblocks as stop signs, but rather as a normal part of the process that will always appear. When you remodel your kitchen, you resign yourself to a little dust and disturbance as part of the price you will have to pay. You simply learn to deal with it. The same is true of considerations, fears, and roadblocks. You just learn to deal with them. In fact, they're supposed to appear. If they don't, it means you haven't set a goal that's big enough to stretch you and grow you. It means there's no real potential for self-development. Learn to welcome considerations, fears, and roadblocks when they appear. Because many times they are the very things that have been holding you back in life. 
Once you can see these subconscious thoughts, feelings, and obstacles, once you are aware of them, you can face them, process them, and deal with them. When you do, you become better prepared for the next venture you want to undertake. Mastery is the goal. You want to set a goal that is big enough that in the process of achieving it, you become someone worth becoming. Jim Rohn, self-made millionaire, success coach, and philosopher. Of course, the ultimate benefit of overcoming these considerations, fears, and roadblocks is not the material rewards that you enjoy, but the personal development that you achieve in the process. Money, cars, houses, boats, attractive spouses, power, and fame can all be taken away, sometimes in the blink of an eye. But what can never be taken away is who you have become in the process of achieving your goal. To achieve a big goal, you are going to have to become a bigger person. You are going to have to develop new skills, new attitudes, and new capabilities. You are going to have to stretch yourself, and in so doing, you will be stretched forever. On October 20th, 1991, a devastating fire roared through the scenic hills above Oakland and Berkeley, California, igniting one building every 11 seconds for over 10 hours, completely destroying more than 3,700 homes and apartments. A friend of mine who is also an author lost everything he owned, including his entire library, files full of research, and a nearly complete manuscript of a book he was writing. Though he was certainly devastated for a short period of time, he soon realized that although everything he owned was indeed lost in the fire, who he had become inside, everything he had learned and all the skills and self-confidence he had developed writing and promoting his books was all still inside of him and could never be burned up in a fire. You can lose the material things, but you can never lose your mastery, what you learn and who you become in the process of achieving your goals. I believe that part of what we're on earth to do is to become masters of many skills. Christ was a spiritual master who turned water into wine, who healed people, who walked on water, and who calmed storms. He says that you and I, too, could do all these things and more. We definitely have that potential. Even today, in a town square in Germany, stands a statue of Christ— its hands blown off during the intensive bombing of World War II. Though the townspeople could have restored the statue decades ago, they learned this more important lesson. Instead, placing a plaque underneath that reads, Christ hath no hands but yours. God needs our hands to complete His tasks on earth. But to become masters and do this great work, we all have to be willing to go through the considerations, fears, and roadblocks. The Power of a Goal Things do not happen. Things are made to happen. John F. Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States of America When I was conducting a workshop in Chennai, India, I had the great fortune to meet C.K. and Veena Kumaravel. Their story illustrates the awesome power of committing to a goal. When C.K. and Veena's children started attending school, Vina decided she wanted to do something to earn 60,000 rupees, $1,300 a month. Vina could have easily landed a job or stayed at home as a homemaker, but she was resolute in her desire to be self-employed. She knew she wanted to be her own boss, but she hadn't yet identified what she wanted to do. One of the techniques I teach that can help you decide what to do with your life is to think about what irritates or frustrates you. Then see whether you can create a livelihood there. If something is bothering you, chances are it's probably bothering others too. I simply suggested that Vina follow that age-old rule of business. Find a need and fill it. Vina realized she had long been irritated by the lack of good quality, affordable beauty salons where they lived. Attractive salons were found only in India's five-star hotels— and were both expensive and intimidating for most local people. At the other end of the spectrum were the local beauty parlors and barber shops with standards of hygiene that were far below par. Vina and C.K. soon realized there was a need for a quality, value-focused salon in Chennai that could serve both men and women. 
Having made the decision to start such a salon, the next challenge was to find skilled staff and managers. Vina was not a beautician, hairdresser, or makeup artist, and CK knew even less about the industry. They solved this first challenge by hiring the manager of the salon at the Taj, the leading five-star hotel in India, who then hired the rest of the staff. Their next challenge, usually the most critical faced by all first-generation entrepreneurs, was to find startup money. C.K. quickly approached what he calls the three F's, family, friends, and fools, and was able to collect enough to open their first Naturals Unisex Salon and Spa on Qatar Nawaz Khan Road in Chennai. Eventually, they achieved Vina's original monthly income goal of 60,000 rupees and even opened a second salon. But they decided to think even bigger. By opening four more salons, Vina concluded they could turn Naturals into a salon chain. One after another, however, the bankers they met with said no. Taking their cue from the success principles, which taught that no means next, they asked again and again, until the 54th banker, impressed by this dedicated husband and wife team doing business together, said yes to their loan request of $130,000. With the addition of the new salons, the Naturals brand was visible and growing. This success inspired Vina and CK to franchise their business. So they advertised in two major newspapers, expecting 500 inquiries or more. When just 334 people responded, and only 32 filled out the preliminary paperwork, Vina and C.K. could identify no one who was actually serious about becoming a franchisee. At the time, beauty salons were considered taboo, and what's more, Naturals was not a big multinational brand. Their solution to the challenge? Find prospective franchisees who would co-invest and partner with Vina and C.K. on each salon location, providing a level of confidence for franchisees who would operate the salon. Soon. The Naturals chain nearly doubled to 13 locations from this winning formula of adding franchisees. By 2009, the chain had grown to 54 salons. And by 2014, there were 376 Naturals salons across India. Veena and CK also negotiated an agreement to open salons inside 250 Easy Day neighborhood stores, and are on target to open 50 salons in the Gulf region, where millions of people from India live and work. What gives CK and Vina the greatest satisfaction is that they've created 184 financially successful women entrepreneurs, 80% of whom started out as stay-at-home housewives. Even more importantly, they have created 6,400 jobs. During one of my trips to Chennai, the Kuma Ravels invited me to attend the opening of one of their new salon spas. What an experience! The salon was clean, brightly lit, and very welcoming, as were all the staff, and the level of positive energy was unmistakable. But the thing that deeply moved me was that several of the staff were visually challenged. The Kuma Ravels had discovered that, due to their heightened sense of touch, these young men and women make the best foot reflexology and massage therapists. And now they employ a large number of these young men and women who would otherwise be relegated to a life of poverty and neglect. Read more about Vina and CK story at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash stories. CK told me that his goal is to erase the word housewife from the dictionary and create 1,000 successful women entrepreneurs, 3,000 salons, and 50,000 jobs by December 31, 2017. Principle 8. Chunk it down. The secret of getting ahead is getting started. The secret of getting started is breaking your complex, overwhelming tasks into small, manageable tasks and then starting on the first one. Mark Twain, celebrated American author and humorist. Sometimes our biggest life goals seem so overwhelming. We rarely see them as a series of small, achievable tasks. But in reality, breaking down a large goal into smaller tasks and accomplishing them one at a time 
is exactly how any big goal gets achieved. So after you have decided what you really want and have set measurable goals with specific deadlines, the next step is to determine all of the individual action steps you will need to take to accomplish your goal. How to chunk it down. There are several ways to figure out the action steps you will need to take to accomplish any goal. One is to consult with people who have already done what you want to do and ask what steps they took. From their experience, they can give you all of the necessary steps, as well as advice on what pitfalls to avoid. Another way is to purchase a book, a manual, or an online course that outlines the process. Yet another way is to start from the end and look backward. You simply close your eyes and imagine that it's now the future and you have already achieved your goal. Then just look back and see what you had to do to get where you are now. What was the last thing you did? And then the thing before that. And then the thing before that. Until you arrive at the first action you had to start with. Remember that it is okay to not know how to do something. It's okay to ask for guidance and advice from those who do know. Sometimes you can get it free, and sometimes you have to pay for it. Get used to asking, Can you tell me how to... and... What would I have to do to... and... How did you... Keep researching and asking until you can create a realistic action plan that will get you from where you are to where you want to go. What will you need to do? How much money will you need to save or raise? What new skills will you need to learn? What resources will you need to mobilize? Who will you need to enroll in your vision? Who will you need to ask for assistance? What new disciplines or habits will you need to build into your life? A valuable technique for creating an action plan for your goals is called mind mapping. Use mind mapping. Mind mapping is a simple but powerful process for creating a detailed to-do list for achieving your goal. It lets you determine what information you'll need to gather, who you'll need to talk to, what small steps you'll need to take, how much money you'll need to earn or raise, which deadlines you'll need to meet, and so on, for each and every goal. When I began creating my first educational program, a breakthrough goal that led to extraordinary gains for me and my business, I used mind mapping to help me chunk down that very large goal into all the individual tasks I would need to complete in order to produce a finished album. For the best primer on mind mapping, see The Mind Map Book, Unlock Your Creativity, Boost Your Memory, Change Your Life, by Tony Buzon and Barry Buzon. The original mind map I created for my audio program is on page 91. To mind map your own goals, follow these steps as illustrated in the example. 1. Center Circle In the center circle, jot down the name of your stated goal. In this case, create an educational audio program. 2. Outside Circles Next, divide the goal into major categories of tasks you'll need to accomplish to achieve the greater goal. In this case, title, studio, topics, audience, and so on. 3. Spokes. Then draw spokes radiating outward from each mini-circle and label each one, such as write copy, color picture for back cover, and arrange lunch. On a separate line connected to the mini-circle, write every single step you'll need to take. Break down each one of the more detailed task spokes with action items to help you create your master to-do list. Next, make a daily to-do list. Once you've completed a mind map for your goal, convert all of the to-do items into daily action items by listing each one on your daily to-do lists and committing to a completion date for each one. Schedule them in the appropriate order into your calendar, then do whatever it takes to stay on schedule. Do first things first. The goal is to stay on schedule and complete the most important item first. In his excellent book, Eat That Frog, 21 Great Ways to Stop Procrastinating and Get More Done in Less Time, Brian Tracy reveals not just how to conquer procrastination, 
but also how to prioritize and complete all of your action items. In his unique system, Brian advises goal setters to identify the one to five things you must accomplish on any given day, and then pick the one you absolutely must do first. This becomes your biggest and ugliest frog. If you know you have to eat a big ugly frog before the end of the day, you don't want to spend the whole day dreading eating it. The simplest thing is to eat it first and get it over with. He then suggests you accomplish that most important task first. In essence, eat that frog first. And by so doing, make the rest of your day much, much easier. It's a great strategy. But unfortunately, most of us leave the biggest and ugliest frog for last, hoping it will go away or somehow become easier. It never does. However, when you accomplish your toughest task early in the day, it sets the tone for the rest of your day. It creates momentum and builds your confidence, both of which move you farther and faster toward your goal. Plan your day the night before. One of the most powerful tools high achievers use for chunking things down, gaining control over their life, and increasing their productivity is to plan their next day the night before. There are two major reasons why this is such a powerful strategy for success. One, if you plan your day the night before, making a to-do list and spending a few minutes visualizing exactly how you want the day to go, your subconscious mind will work on these tasks all night long. You will think of creative ways to solve any problem, overcome any obstacle, and achieve your desired outcomes. And if we can believe some of the newer theories of quantum physics, it will also send out waves of energy that will attract the people and resources to you that are needed to accomplish your goals. 2. By creating your to-do list the night before, you can start your day running. You know exactly what you're going to do and in what order, and you've already pulled together any materials you need. If you have five telephone calls to make, you would have them written down in the order you plan to make them, with the phone numbers next to the person's name and all the support materials at hand. By mid-morning, you would be way ahead of most people, who waste the first half of the day clearing their desk, making lists, finding necessary paperwork, in short, just getting ready to work. Use the Achievers Focusing System A valuable tool that will really keep you focused on achieving all of your goals in the seven areas we explained in your vision, see pages 38 and 39, is the Achievers Focusing System developed by Les Hewitt of the Achievers Coaching Program. It is a form you can use to plan and hold yourself accountable for 13 weeks of goals and action steps. You can download a copy of the form and instructions on how to use it for free at www.thesuccessprinciples.com. Principle 9. Success Leaves Clues Long ago, I realized that success leaves clues, and that people who produce outstanding results do specific things to create those results. I believe that if I precisely duplicated the actions of others, I could reproduce the same quality of results that they had. Anthony Robbins, author of Unlimited Power One of the great things about living in today's world of abundance and opportunity is that almost everything you want to do has already been done by someone else. It doesn't matter whether it's losing weight, running a marathon, starting a business, becoming financially independent, triumphing over breast cancer, or hosting the perfect dinner party. Someone has already done it and left clues in the form of books, manuals, audio and video programs, university classes, online courses, seminars, and workshops. Who's already done what you want to do? If you want to retire a millionaire, for instance, there are hundreds of books ranging from The Automatic Millionaire to The One-Minute Millionaire, and workshops ranging from Harv Ecker's Millionaire Mind Intensive to Marshall Thurber and D.C. Cordova's Money and You. You can access an updated and ever-expanding list of these kinds of resources at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources.
If you want to have a better relationship with your spouse, you can read John Gray's Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, attend a couple's workshop, or take Gay and Katie Hendricks' Conscious Loving and Living Essentials Seminar. For virtually everything you want to do, there are books and courses on how to do it. Better yet, just a phone call away are people who've already successfully done what you want to do and who are available as teachers, facilitators, mentors, advisors, coaches, and consultants. Here are three ways you can begin to seek out clues. 1. Seek out a teacher, coach, mentor, a manual, book, audio program, or an internet resource to help you achieve one of your major goals. 2. Seek out someone who has already done what you want to do and ask the person if you can interview him or her on how you should proceed. 3. Ask someone if you can shadow them for a day and watch them work, or offer to be a volunteer, assistant, or intern for someone you can learn from. Why People Don't Seek Out Clues When I was preparing to go on a morning news show in Dallas, I asked the station's makeup artist what her long-term goals were. She said she'd always thought about opening her own beauty salon, so I asked her what she was doing to make that happen. Nothing, she said, because I don't know how to go about it. I suggested she offer to take a salon owner to lunch and ask how she opened her own salon. You can do that? the makeup artist exclaimed. You most certainly can. In fact, you have probably thought about approaching an expert for advice, but rejected the idea with thoughts such as, why would someone take the time to tell me what they did? Why would they teach me and create their own competition? Banish those thoughts. You will find that most people love to talk about how they built their business or accomplished their goals. But unfortunately, like the makeup artist in Dallas, most of us don't take advantage of all the resources available to us. Why? It never occurs to us. We don't see others using these resources, so we don't do it either. Our parents didn't do it. Our friends aren't doing it. Nobody where we work is doing it. It's inconvenient. We'd have to drive across town to a meeting. We'd have to take time away from television, family, or friends. Asking others for advice or information puts us up against our fear of rejection. We are afraid to take the risk. Connecting the dots in a new way would mean change, and change, even when it's in our best interest, is uncomfortable. Connecting the dots means hard work, and frankly, most people don't want to work that hard. Principle 10 Release the brakes. Everything you want is just outside your comfort zone. Robert Allen, co-author of The One Minute Millionaire. Have you ever been driving your car and suddenly realized you've left the emergency brake on? Did you push down harder on the gas to overcome the drag of the brake? No, of course not. You simply released the brake. And with no extra effort, you started to go faster. Most people drive through life with their psychological emergency brake on. They hold on to negative images about themselves or suffer the mental and emotional effects of powerful experiences they haven't yet resolved or released. They stay in a comfort zone entirely of their own making. They maintain inaccurate beliefs about reality or harbor guilt and self-doubt. And when they try to achieve their goals... These negative images and pre-programmed comfort zones always cancel out their good intentions, no matter how hard they try. Successful people, on the other hand, have discovered that instead of using increased willpower as the engine to power their success, it's simply easier to release the brakes by letting go of and replacing their limiting beliefs, by changing their self-images, and by releasing negative emotions like fear, resentment, anger, guilt, and shame. Get out of your comfort zone. Think of your comfort zone as a prison you live in, a largely self-created prison. It consists of the collection of can'ts, musts, must-nots, and other unfounded beliefs formed from all the negative thoughts and decisions you have accumulated and reinforced during your lifetime. 
Perhaps you've even been trained to limit yourself. Don't be as dumb as an elephant. A baby elephant is trained at birth to be confined to a very small space. Its trainer will tie its leg with a rope to a wooden post planted deep in the ground. This confines the baby elephant to an area determined by the length of the rope, the elephant's comfort zone. Though the baby elephant will initially try to break the rope, the rope is too strong, and so the baby elephant learns that it can't break the rope. It learns that it has to stay in the area defined by the length of the rope. When the elephant grows up into a five-ton colossus that could easily break the same rope, it doesn't even try, because it learned as a baby that it couldn't break the rope. In this way, the largest elephant can be confined by the puniest little rope. Perhaps this also describes you, still trapped in a comfort zone by something as puny and weak as the small rope that controls the elephant, except your rope is made up of the limiting beliefs and images that you received and took on when you were young. If this describes you, the good news is that you can change your comfort zone. How? There are four different ways. 1. You can use affirmations and positive self-talk to affirm already having what you want, doing what you want, and being the way you want. 2. You can create powerful and compelling new internal images of having, doing, and being what you want. 3. You can use the revolutionary technique called tapping therapy. 4. You can simply change your behavior. All four of these approaches will shift you out of your old comfort zone. Stop recreating the same experience over and over. An important concept that successful people understand is that you are never stuck. You just keep recreating the same experience over and over by thinking the same thoughts, maintaining the same beliefs, speaking the same words, and doing the same things. Too often, we create an endless loop of reinforcing behavior, which keeps us trapped in a constant downward spiral. Our limiting thoughts create images in our mind, and those images govern our behavior, which in turn reinforces the limiting thought. Imagine thinking that you are going to forget your talking points when you have to give a presentation at work. The thought stimulates a picture of you forgetting a key point. The image creates an experience of fear. The fear clouds your clear thinking, which makes you forget one of your key points, which reinforces your self-talk that you can't speak in front of groups. See, I knew I would forget what I was supposed to say. I can't speak in front of groups. As long as you keep complaining about your present circumstances, your mind will focus on it. By continually talking about, thinking about, and writing about the way things are, you are continually reinforcing those very same neural pathways in your brain that got you to where you are today. And you are continually sending out the same vibrations that will keep attracting the same people and circumstances that you have already created. To change this cycle, you must focus instead on thinking, talking, and writing about the reality you want to create. You must flood your unconscious with thoughts and images of this new reality. The significant problems we face cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. Albert Einstein, winner, Nobel Prize for Physics. What's your financial temperature? Your comfort zone works the same way the thermostat in your home works. When the temperature in the room approaches the edge of the thermal range you have set, the thermostat sends an electrical signal to the furnace or to the air conditioner to turn it on or off. As the temperature in the room begins to change, the electrical signals continue to respond to the changes and keep the temperature within the desired range. Similarly, you have an internal psychological thermostat that regulates your level of performance in the world. Instead of electrical signals, your internal performance regulator uses discomfort signals to keep you within your comfort zone. As your behavior or performance begins to approach the edge of that zone, you begin to feel uncomfortable. If what you are experiencing is outside the self-image you unconsciously hold, your body will send signals of mental tension and physical discomfort to your system. To avoid this discomfort, you unconsciously pull yourself back into your comfort zone.
My stepfather, who was a regional sales manager for NCR, noticed that each of his salespeople had a self-image of themselves as a salesperson. They were a $2,000 a month salesperson or a $3,000 a month salesperson. If a person's self-image was that he earned $3,000 a month in commissions, then, whenever he earned that much in commissions in the first week of the month, he would slack off for the rest of the month. On the other hand, if it were near the end of the month and he had only earned $1,500 in commissions, he would put in 16-hour days, work weekends, create new sales proposals, and do everything possible to get to the $3,000 level for that month. No matter what the circumstance, a person with a $36,000 self-image would always produce a $36,000 income. To do anything else would make them uncomfortable. I remember one year my stepfather was out selling cash registers on New Year's Eve. He was out well past midnight with the intention of selling two more cash registers so that he would qualify for the annual trip to Hawaii awarded to all salesmen who hit their yearly quota. He had earned the trip for several years running, and his self-image would not allow him to lose out that year. He sold those machines and made the trip. It would have been outside his comfort zone to do anything less. Imagine the same scenario in relation to your savings account. Some people are comfortable as long as they have $2,000 in their savings account. Others are uncomfortable if they have any less than eight months' income salted away. Still others are comfortable with no savings and credit card debt of $25,000. If the person needing eight months' income and savings to feel comfortable is hit with an unexpected medical expense of $16,000, he will curtail his spending, work overtime, have a garage sale, whatever it takes to get his savings back up to the previous level. Likewise, if he suddenly inherits money, he is likely to spend enough of it to stay in that same savings comfort zone. No doubt you have heard that most lottery winners lose, spend, squander, or give away all of their newfound money within a few years of winning it. In fact, 80% of lottery winners in the United States file bankruptcy within five years. The reason is because they failed to develop a millionaire mindset. As a result, they subconsciously recreate the reality that matches their previous mindset. They feel uncomfortable with so much money, so they find some way to get back to their own familiar comfort zone. We have a similar comfort zone for the kinds of restaurants we eat in, the hotels we stay in, the kind of car we drive, the houses we live in, the clothes we wear, the vacations we take, and the type of people we associate with. If you have ever walked down Fifth Avenue in New York or Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, you have probably experienced walking into a store and immediately feeling as if you didn't belong there. The store was just too upscale for you you felt out of place. That's your comfort zone in operation. Change your behavior. When I first moved to Los Angeles, my new boss took me shopping for clothes at this very upscale men's shop in Westwood. The most I had previously ever paid for a dress shirt was $35 at Nordstrom. The cheapest shirt in this store was $95. I was stunned and broke out in a cold sweat. While my boss purchased many things that day, I bought one Italian designer shirt for $95. I was so far out of my comfort zone, I could hardly breathe. The next week, I wore the shirt and was amazed by how much better it fit, how much better it felt, and how much better I looked wearing it. After a couple more weeks of wearing it once a week, I really fell in love with it. Within a month, I bought another one. Within a year, Shirts like that were all I wore. Slowly, my comfort zone had changed because I'd gotten used to something better, even though it cost more. Today, I often pay $300 for custom-made shirts. When I was on the faculty of the Million Dollar Forum and Income Builders International, two organizations dedicated to teaching people how to become millionaires, all of the trainings were held at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Laguna Beach, California the Hilton Hotel on the Big Island of Hawaii, and other high-end luxury resort hotels. The reason was to get the participants used to being treated in a first-class way. It was part of stretching their comfort zones, changing the image of who they thought they were. Every training concluded with a black-tie dinner dance. 
For many of the participants, it was the first time they had ever attended a black tie affair. Another comfort zone stretch. Change your self-talk with affirmations. I've always believed in magic. When I wasn't doing anything in this town, I'd go up every night, sit on Mulholland Drive, look out at the city, stretch out my arms and say, Everybody wants to work with me. I'm a really good actor. I have all kinds of great movie offers. I just repeat these things over and over, literally convincing myself that I had a couple of movies lined up. I'd drive down that hill ready to take the world on, going, Movie offers are out there for me. I just don't hear them yet. It was like total affirmations, antidotes to the stuff that stems from my family background. Jim Carrey, actor. One way to stretch your comfort zone is to bombard your subconscious mind with new thoughts and images of a big bank account, a trim and healthy body, exciting work, interesting friends, memorable vacations, of all your goals as already complete. The technique you use to do this is called affirmations. An affirmation is a statement that describes a goal in its already completed state, such as, I am enjoying watching the sunset from the lanai of my beautiful beachfront condo on the Ka'anapali coast of Maui. Or, I am celebrating feeling light and alive at my perfect body weight of 135. The Nine Guidelines for Creating Effective Affirmations To be effective, your affirmations should be constructed using the following nine guidelines. 1. Start with the words, I am. The words, I am, are the two most powerful words in the language. The subconscious takes any sentence that starts with the words, I am, and interprets it as a command, a directive to make it happen. 2. Use the present tense. Describe what you want as though you already have it, as though it is already accomplished. Wrong. I am going to get a new red Porsche 911. Right. I am enjoying driving my new red Porsche 911. 3. State it in the positive. Affirm what you want, not what you don't want. State your affirmations in the positive. The unconscious does not hear the words no, or not. This means that the statement, don't slam the door, is heard as slam the door. The unconscious thinks in pictures, and the words, don't slam the door, evoke a picture of slamming the door. The phrase, I am no longer afraid of flying, evokes an image of being afraid of flying, while the phrase, I am enjoying the thrill of flying, evokes an image of enjoyment. Wrong. I am no longer afraid of flying. Right. I am enjoying the thrill of flying. 4. Keep it brief. Think of your affirmation as an advertising jingle. Act as if each word costs $1,000. It needs to be short enough and memorable enough to be easily remembered. 5. Make it specific. Vague affirmations produce vague results. Wrong. I am driving my new red sports car. Right. I am driving my new red Porsche 911. 6. Include an action word ending with ing. The active verb adds power to the effect by evoking an image of doing it right now. Wrong. I express myself openly and honestly. Right. I am confidently expressing myself openly and honestly. 7. Include at least one dynamic emotion or feeling word. Include the emotional state you would be feeling if you had already achieved the goal. Some commonly used words are enjoying, joyfully, happily, celebrating, proudly, calmly, peacefully, delighted, enthusiastic, lovingly, secure, serenely, and triumphant. Wrong. I am maintaining my perfect body weight of 178 pounds. Right. I am feeling agile and great at 178. Note that the last one has the ring of an advertising jingle. The subconscious loves rhythm and rhymes. 
8. Make affirmations for yourself, not others. When you are constructing your affirmations, make them describe your behavior, not the behavior of others. Wrong. I am watching Johnny clean up his room. Right. I am effectively communicating my needs and desires to Johnny. 9. Add or something better. When you are affirming getting a specific situation, job, opportunity, vacation, material object, house, car, boat, or relationship, husband, wife, child, always add the words, or something, someone, better. Sometimes our criteria for what we want come from our ego or from our limited experience. Sometimes there is someone or something better that is available for us. So let your affirmations include this phrase when it is appropriate. Example. I am enjoying living in my beautiful beachfront villa on the Kaanapali coast of Maui, or somewhere better. How to Use Affirmations and Visualization 1. Review your affirmations one to three times a day. The best times are first thing in the morning, in the middle of the day to refocus yourself, and around bedtime. 2. If appropriate, read each affirmation out loud. 3. Close your eyes and visualize yourself as the affirmation describes. See it as if you were looking out at the scene from inside of yourself. In other words, don't see yourself standing out there in the scene. See the scene looking out through your eyes as if you were actually living it. 4. Hear any sounds you might hear when you successfully achieve what your affirmation describes. The sound of the surf, the roar of the crowd, the playing of the national anthem. Include other important people in your life congratulating you and telling you how pleased they are with your success. 5. Feel the feelings that you will feel when you achieve that success. The stronger the feelings, the more powerful the process. If you have difficulty creating the feelings, you can affirm, I am enjoying easily creating powerful feelings in my effective work with affirmations. 6. Say your affirmation again, and then repeat this process with the next affirmation. Other ways to use affirmations. 1. Post 3x5 index cards with your affirmations around your home. 2. Hang pictures of the things you want around your house or your room. You can put a picture of yourself in the picture. 3. Repeat your affirmations during wasted time, such as waiting in line, exercising, and driving. You can repeat them silently or out loud. 4. Record your affirmations and listen to them while you work, exercise, drive, or fall asleep. 5. Have one of your parents make a recording of encouraging things you would like to have heard from them when you were growing up, or words of encouragement and permission you would currently like to hear. 6. Repeat your affirmations in the first person, I am, second person, you are, and third person, he or she is, or your name is... 7. Put your affirmations on your screensaver on your computer, tablet, or smartphone, so you'll see them every time you use your computer. Affirmations work. I first learned about the power of affirmations in my 20s, when W. Clement Stone challenged me to set a goal that was so far beyond my current circumstances, it would literally astound me if I achieved it. Though I thought Stone's challenge had merit, I didn't really apply it to my life in a serious way until several years later when I decided to make the jump from earning $25,000 a year to making $100,000 or more. The first thing I did was to craft an affirmation after one I'd seen by Florence Scovel Shin. My affirmation was, God is my infinite supply, and large sums of money come to me quickly and easily under the grace of God for the highest good of all concerned. I am happily and easily earning, saving, and investing $100,000 a year. Next, I created a huge replica of a $100,000 bill, which I affixed to the ceiling above my bed. On awakening, I would see the bill, close my eyes, 
repeat my affirmation, and visualize what I would be enjoying if I were living a $100,000 a year lifestyle. I envisioned the house I would live in, the furnishings and artwork I would own, the car I would drive, and the vacations I would take. I also created the feelings I would experience once I had already attained that lifestyle. Soon, I awoke one morning with my first $100,000 idea. It occurred to me that if I could sell 400,000 copies of my book, 100 Ways to Enhance Self-Concept in the Classroom, on which I received a 25 cents per copy royalty, I would earn a $100,000 income. I added to my morning visualizations the image of my book flying off bookstore shelves and my publisher writing me a $100,000 check. Not long after, a freelance journalist approached me and wrote an article about my work for the National Enquirer. As a result, thousands of additional copies of my book were sold that month. Almost daily, more and more money-making ideas flowed into my mind. For instance, I took out small ads and sold the book on my own, making $3 per copy instead of just 25 cents. I started a mail-order catalog of mine and others' books on self-esteem and made even more money from these same buyers. The University of Massachusetts saw my catalog and invited me to sell books at a weekend conference, helping me generate more than $2,000 in two days and introducing me to another strategy for making $100,000 a year. At the same time I was visualizing greater book sales, I also got the idea to generate more income from my workshops and seminars. When I asked a friend who did similar work how I could charge higher fees, he revealed he was already charging more than double what I was being paid. With his encouragement, I tripled my speaking fee and discovered the schools that were hiring me to speak had budgets even higher than that. My affirmation was paying off big time. But if I hadn't set the goal to make $100,000, and been diligent about affirming and visualizing it, I never would have raised my speaking fees, started a mail-order bookstore, attended a major conference, or been interviewed for a major publication. As a result, my income that year skyrocketed from $25,000 to over $92,000. Of course, I missed my $100,000 goal by $8,000, but I can assure you, I wasn't depressed about it. On the contrary, I was ecstatic. I had almost quadrupled my income in less than one year, using the power of visualization and affirmations coupled with the willingness to act when I had an inspired idea. After our $92,000 year, my wife asked me, if affirmations worked for $100,000, do you think they would also work for $1 million? Using a new affirmation, I am happily depositing my million-dollar royalty check from my best-selling book, along with visualization. I achieved that goal, too, and have continued to make one million dollars or more every year since. Don't wait 30 years to use this strategy. Joe Newberry heard me tell this story at a business networking breakfast in the 1980s, but he didn't get around to putting his own $100,000 bill on the ceiling until thirty years later. It was June, and he was looking for ways to boost his income. When he saw me retell that story in the movie The Secret, he rushed home to put his own $100,000 bill above his bed, where he would see it each morning when he woke up. By September, people were calling to hire him as a consultant. Soon after, he was representing two recording labels and negotiating deals for major artists and in January he flew to New York to pitch Barnes & Noble, as one of dozens of other sales representatives pitching that day, asking them to place an order for the recorded works he represented. After chatting pleasantly with the Barnes & Noble buyer about her kids and family, Joe watched in amazement as she pulled out the necessary paperwork and wrote him an order on the spot. It wasn't the modest order Joe had expected, however. As he headed for the elevator and looked at the paperwork in his hand, he quickly calculated his commissions on the far more substantial order she had written. To the penny, he had just earned $100,000. Principle 11. See what you want. Get 
what you see. Imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. Albert Einstein, winner, Nobel Prize for Physics. Visualization, or the act of creating compelling and vivid pictures in your mind, may be the most underutilized success tool you possess because it greatly accelerates the achievement of any success in three powerful ways. 1. Visualization activates the creative powers of your subconscious mind. 2. Visualization focuses your brain by programming its reticular activating system, RAS, to notice available resources that were always there, but were previously unnoticed. 3. Visualization, through the law of attraction, magnetizes and attracts to you the people, resources, and opportunities you need to achieve your goal. The law of attraction basically states that whatever you think about, talk about, fantasize about, and feel strongly about, you will attract into your life. When you perform any task in real life, researchers have found your brain uses the same identical processes it would use if you were only vividly visualizing that activity. In other words, your brain sees no difference whatsoever between visualizing something and actually doing it. This principle also applies to learning anything new. Research at Harvard University found that students who visualized in advance performed tasks with nearly 100% accuracy, whereas students who didn't visualize achieved only 55% accuracy. Visualization simply makes the brain achieve more. And though none of us were ever taught this in school, sports psychologists and peak performance experts have been popularizing the power of visualization since the 1980s. Almost all Olympic and professional athletes now employ the power of visualization. Jack Nicklaus, the legendary golfer with 73 tournament victories and $5.7 million in winnings, once said, I never hit a shot, not even in practice, without having a very sharp, in-focus picture of it in my head. It's like a color movie. First, I see where I want it to finish, nice and white and sitting high on the bright green grass. Then the scene quickly changes, and I see the ball going there, its path, trajectory and shape, even its behavior on landing. Then there's sort of a fade-out, and the next scene shows me making the kind of swing that will turn the previous images into reality. How Visualization Works to Enhance Performance when you visualize your goals as already complete each and every day, it creates a conflict, structural tension in your subconscious mind between what you are visualizing and what you currently have. Your subconscious mind works to resolve that conflict by turning your current reality into the new, more exciting vision. This conflict, when intensified over time through constant visualization, actually causes three things to happen. One. It programs your brain's RAS to start letting into your awareness anything that will help you achieve your goals. 2. It activates your subconscious mind to create solutions for getting the goals you want. You'll start waking up in the morning with new ideas. You'll find yourself having ideas in the shower while you are taking long walks and while you are driving to work. 3. It creates new levels of motivation you'll start to notice you are unexpectedly doing things that take you to your goal. All of a sudden, you are raising your hand in class, volunteering to take on new assignments at work, speaking out at staff meetings, asking more directly for what you want, saving money for the things that you want, paying down a credit card debt, or taking more risks in your personal life. Let's take a closer look at how the RAS works. At any one time, there are about 11 million bits of information streaming into your brain, most of which you cannot attend to, nor do you need to. So your brain's RAS filters most of them out, letting into your awareness only those signals that can help you survive and achieve your most important goals. So how does your RAS know what to let into your awareness and what to filter out? It lets in anything that will help you achieve the goals you have set and are constantly visualizing and affirming. It also lets in anything that matches your beliefs and images about yourself, others, and the world. 
The RAS is a powerful tool, but it can only look for ways to achieve the exact pictures you give it. Your creative subconscious doesn't think in words. It thinks in pictures. So how does all this help your effort to become successful and achieve the life of your dreams? When you give your brain specific, colorful, and vividly compelling pictures to manifest, it will seek out and capture all the information necessary to bring that picture into reality for you. If you give your mind a $10,000 problem, it will come up with a $10,000 solution. If you give your mind a $1 million problem, it'll come up with a $1 million solution. If you give it pictures of a beautiful home, an adoring spouse, an exciting career, and exotic vacations, it will go to work on achieving those. By contrast, if you are constantly feeding it negative, fearful, and anxious pictures, guess what? It'll go to work to achieve those, too. The Process for Visualizing Your Future The process of visualizing for success is really quite simple. All you have to do is close your eyes and see your goals as already complete. If one of your objectives is to own a nice house on the lake, then close your eyes and see yourself walking through the exact house you would like to own. Fill in all of the details. What does the exterior look like? How is it landscaped? What kind of view does it have? What do the living room, kitchen, master bedroom, dining room, family room, and den look like? How is it furnished? Go from room to room and fill in all of the details. Make the images as clear and bright as possible. This goes for any goal you make, whether it is in the area of work, play, family, personal finances, relationships, or philanthropy. Write down each of your goals and objectives, then review them, affirm them, and visualize them every day. Then, each morning when you wake, and each night before you go to bed, read through the list of goals out loud, pausing after each one to close your eyes and recreate the visual image of that completed goal in your mind. Continue through the list until you have visualized each goal as complete and fulfilled. The whole process will take between 10 and 15 minutes, depending on how many goals you have. If you meditate, do your visualization right after you finish meditating. The deepened state you have achieved in meditation will heighten the impact of your visualizations. Adding Sounds and Feelings to the Pictures To multiply the effect many times over, add sound, smells, tastes, and feelings to your pictures. What sounds would you be hearing? What smells would you be smelling? What tastes would you be tasting? And most important, what emotions and bodily sensations would you be feeling if you had already achieved your goal? If you were imagining your dream house on the beach, you might add in the sound of the surf lapping at the shore outside your home, the sound of your kids playing on the sand, and the sound of your spouse's voice thanking you for being such a good provider. Then add in the feeling of pride of ownership, satisfaction at having achieved your goal, and the feeling of the sun on your face as you sit on your deck looking out at a beautiful sunset over the ocean. Fuel the images with emotion. By far, these emotions are what propel your vision forward. Researchers know that when accompanied by intense emotions, an image or scene can stay locked in the memory forever. I'm sure you remember exactly where you were when the World Trade Center collapsed on September 11, 2001. Your brain remembers it all in great detail, because not only did your brain filter information you needed for survival under these tense moments, but also the images themselves were created with intense emotion. These intense emotions actually stimulate the growth of additional spiny protuberances on the dendrites of brain neurons, which ultimately creates more neural connections, thus locking in the memory much more solidly. You can bring the same emotional intensity to your own visualizations by adding inspiring music, real-life smells, deeply felt passion, even loudly shouting your affirmations with exaggerated enthusiasm. The more passion, excitement, and energy you can muster, the more powerful will be the ultimate result. Visualization works. 
Olympic gold medalist Peter Vidmar describes his use of visualization in his successful pursuit of the gold. To keep us focused on our Olympic goal, we began ending our workouts by visualizing our dream. We visualized ourselves actually competing in the Olympics and achieving our dream by practicing what we thought would be the ultimate gymnastic scenario. I'd say, Okay, Tim, let's imagine it's the men's gymnastics team finals of the Olympic Games. The United States team is on its last event of the night, which just happens to be the high bar. The last two guys up for the United States are Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. Our team is neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, the reigning world champions, and we have to perform our routines perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. At that point, we'd each be thinking, Yeah, right. We're never going to be neck and neck with those guys. They were number one at the Budapest World Championships, while our team didn't even win a medal. It's never going to happen. But what if it did happen? How would we feel? We'd close our eyes and, in this empty gym at the end of a long day, we'd visualize an Olympic arena with 13,000 people in the seats and another 200 million watching live on television. Then we'd practice our routines. First, I'd be the announcer. I'd cup my hands around my mouth and say, Next up, from the United States of America, Tim Daggett. Then Tim would go through his routine as if it were the real thing. Then Tim would go over to the corner of the gym, cup his hands around his mouth, and in his best announcer voice say, Next up, from the United States of America, Peter Vidmar. Then it was my turn. In my mind, I had one chance to perfectly perform my routine in order for our team to win the gold medal. If I didn't, we'd lose. Tim would shout out, Green light! And I'd look at the superior judge, who was usually our coach, Mako. I'd raise my hand, and he'd raise his right back. Then I'd turn, face the bar, grab hold, and begin my routine. Well... A funny thing happened on July 31, 1984. It was the Olympic Games men's gymnastics team finals in Pauley Pavilion on the UCLA campus. The 13,000 seats were all filled, and a television audience in excess of 200 million around the world tuned in. The United States team was on its last event of the night, the high bar. The last two guys up for the United States just happened to be Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. And just as we visualized, our team was neck and neck with the People's Republic of China. We had to perform our high bar routines perfectly to win the gold medal. I looked at Coach Mako, my coach for the past 12 years. As focused as ever, he simply said, Okay, Peter, let's go. You know what to do. You've done it a thousand times, just like every day back in the gym. Let's just do it one more time and let's go home. You're prepared. He was right. I had planned for this moment and visualized it hundreds of times. I was prepared to perform my routine. Rather than seeing myself actually standing in the Olympic arena with 13,000 people in the stands and 200 million watching on television, in my mind I pictured myself back in the UCLA gym at the end of the day with two people left in the gym. When the announcer said, From the United States of America, Peter Vidmar. I imagined it was my buddy Tim Daggett saying it. When the green light came on, indicating it was time for the routine, I imagined that it wasn't really a green light, but that it was Tim shouting, Green light! And when I raised my hand toward the superior judge from East Germany, in my mind I was signaling my coach, just like I had signaled him every day at the end of hundreds of workouts. In the gym, I always visualized I was at the Olympic finals. At the Olympic finals, I visualized I was back in the gym. I turned, faced the bar, jumped up, and grabbed on. I began the same routine I had visualized and practiced day after day in the gym. I was in memory mode, going yet again where I'd already gone hundreds of times. I quickly made it past the risky double-release move that had harpooned my chances at the World Championships. I moved smoothly through the rest of my routine and landed a solid dismount where I anxiously waited for my score from the judges. With a deep voice, the announcement came through the speaker. The score for Peter Vidmar is 9.95. Yes, I shouted. I did it. 
The crowd cheered loudly as my teammates and I celebrated our victory. Thirty minutes later, we were standing on the Olympic medal platform in the Olympic arena with 13,000 people in the stands and over 200 million watching on television, while the gold medals were officially draped around our necks. Tim, me, and our teammates stood proudly wearing our gold medals as the national anthem played and the American flag was raised to the top of the arena. It was a moment we visualized and practiced hundreds of times in the gym. Only this time, it was for real. Visualization helped her walk again. The first time Heather O'Brien Walker heard about positive self-talk and visualization was when she saw me in the film The Secret. I was glued to the screen, she told me. When you told the story of how visualization had brought you so much success, Heather was hooked. But how could she create images that were just as powerful, she wondered. She chose to combine the principle of visualization with her experience in Hollywood, where she had worked among many of Hollywood's greatest stars, including Elizabeth Taylor, Tom Cruise, Drew Barrymore, Bruce Willis, Patrick Swayze, and Demi Moore. She knew that people in the film industry are masters at creating compelling images that pull you into another world. In fact, Heather had already seen stunning visual images flicker across the screen and take moviegoers on emotional journeys that literally changed the way they looked at life. She decided to create her own moving images, mind movies, she called them, with positive self-talk in place of the musical score. Over the years, these movies had been very effective in helping Heather overcome obstacles. At the same time, she had also developed a mantra that she repeated during trying times. Don't give up, get up. Ironically, Heather had no idea that her mantra and mind movies would literally become critical to her very survival. In July 2011, as Heather was joyfully planning the details of her upcoming wedding, she also landed an executive position with a luxury retailer, overseeing a staff of 30 cosmetics consultants, 50 vendors, and millions of dollars in product. Barely a month into her new job, Heather tripped over a cardboard box filled with trash that someone had carelessly left in a stockroom walkway. As she fell violently forward, Heather struck the front of her head, first on a heavy metal shelf, knocking her unconscious and then again as she fell face-first onto the concrete floor. Her fiancé, T.W., frantically rushed to the hospital upon being notified, and as Heather awakened in the hospital ICU, she knew something serious had happened to her. The entire room was spinning and lurching like a carnival ride. Her head felt like it was being crushed in a vice, and there was an ear-piercing ring in her head. She could barely see shapes and objects, Yet the light in the room was blinding. Thunderous sounds surrounded her, too, as if someone had turned up the volume full blast in her ears. As she struggled to sit up and make sense out of it all, she made a terrifying discovery. She couldn't move her legs. Heather later learned that she had suffered a traumatic brain injury, and that the blows to her head would affect the functioning of her entire body from that day forward. She couldn't feel her legs or even move them without physically picking them up using special straps that felt like lead weights. She couldn't even sit up because the dizziness and disorientation made her feel ill. When she tried to speak, her words came out garbled and slurred. She couldn't recall details or follow a conversation. To make matters worse, her doctors were not encouraging about her recovery. People who had sustained similar trauma, they said, were living out their lives in nursing homes, unable to function outside of bed, and some would just slip into a coma and pass away. It was then that Heather knew the only person responsible for bringing about her recovery would be herself. Immediately, she began building a new mind movie, this time focused on her recovery. The problem was that she was attempting to use her brain to heal herself, when her brain was the very thing that had been so deeply injured. As much of a challenge as it was, however, she knew that visualization would be an essential asset to her recovery. For the next month, Heather worked hard on her therapy and replaying her mind movie. She desperately wanted to go home, 
but was warned that, most likely, she'd never be completely free of the vast array of symptoms she suffered. Eventually, still unable to walk, care for herself, or do anything on her own, Heather was released to the full-time care of her fiancé. T.W. had to bathe her, dress her, feed her, take her to the bathroom, and manage all her medications and therapy, all while trying to run his business. Then Heather was dealt another devastating blow. One week after being released from the hospital, on the way home from a doctor's appointment, she and T.W. were hit by a reckless and impaired driver, causing a second traumatic brain injury as Heather's airbag deployed and sent her head crashing into the passenger window. Considering her existing injuries, Heather was lucky to be alive. And, as if that weren't enough adversity to handle, T.W. was also seriously injured, sustaining a broken foot and a severe back injury that would later require several surgeries. The next several weeks were some of the darkest days they had ever faced. Yet Heather continually replayed her mind movie and used her don't-give-up, get-up mantra. One day shortly after the car accident, T.W. approached Heather with an idea. He had an inspiration for a new mind movie, he told her, planning their wedding and officially setting the date. At first, Heather was aghast. In fact, she was angry that T.W. would even suggest such a thing. Wheeling down an aisle in a wheelchair in pain, trying to recite garbled words with the very great possibility that I will lose track of what I'm saying, she exclaimed. No way. Making a complete fool of myself is not what I had in mind for our wedding. As Heather recounted the story, I will never forget T.W. gently taking hold of the armrests of my wheelchair, pulling me close to him and looking me directly in the eye, saying, in his usual joking manner, You're going to be Mrs. Walker, so it's kind of important for you to get up and get yourself walking again quickly. You will walk down that aisle by yourself. Always great at making me laugh, but understanding the seriousness behind the joke, I looked right back into his eyes and said, as if my heart was the one who responded, I said, I believe it. I concentrated many times a day on replaying a new mind movie, that of my barefoot beach wedding, where I saw myself walking down the aisle toward the gently splashing waves feeling the sand between my toes and the breeze on my face, all as my mantra played in the background, Don't give up, get up. I am proud to say that on April 14, 2012, seven months after sustaining my second brain injury, T.W. and I were married in a beautiful beach ceremony where I did indeed walk down the aisle by myself just as I had heard and seen in my mind movie thousands of times before. Today, Heather shares her story through keynote speeches, workshops, and coaching sessions with clients from around the world. She's also published her story in a new book called Don't Give Up, Get Up. At the limit of her perseverance, Heather recovered through the power of visualization. What if I don't see anything when I visualize? Some people are what psychologists refer to as eidetic visualizers. When they close their eyes, they see everything in bright, clear, three-dimensional, technicolor images. Most of us, however, are non-eidetic visualizers. That means you don't really see an image as much as you just think it. This is perfectly okay. It still works just as well. Do the visualization exercise of imagining your goals as already complete twice a day, every day, and you will still get the same benefit as those people who claim to actually see the image. Use printed pictures to help you. If you have trouble seeing your goals, use pictures, images, and symbols you collect to keep your conscious and subconscious mind focused on your goals. For example, if one of your goals is to own a new Lexus LS600, you can take your camera down to your local Lexus dealer and ask a salesperson to take a picture of you sitting behind the wheel. If your goal is to visit Paris, find a poster of the Eiffel Tower. 
Then cut out a picture of yourself and place it at the base of the Eiffel Tower as if it were a photograph taken of you in Paris. Several years ago, I did this with a picture of the Sydney Opera House, and within a year I was in Sydney, Australia, standing in front of it. If your goal is to be a millionaire, you might want to write yourself a check for $1 million, or create a bank statement that shows your bank account or your stock portfolio with a $1 million balance. Mark Victor Hansen and I created a mock-up of the New York Times bestsellers list with the original Chicken Soup for the Soul in the number one spot. Within 15 months, that dream became a reality. Four years later, we made a Guinness World Record for having seven books on the New York Times bestsellers list at the same time. Use Vision Boards once you have created these images, you can place them, one to a page, in a three-ring binder that you review every day. Or you could make a dream board or treasure map, a collage of all these images on a bulletin board, wall, or a refrigerator door, somewhere where you will see them every day. When NASA was working on putting a man on the moon, they had a huge picture of the moon covering the entire wall, from floor to ceiling, of their main construction area. Everyone was clearly visualizing the goal, and they reached that goal two years ahead of schedule. Vision boards and goal books made their dreams come true. In 1995, John Osaroff created a vision board and put it up on the wall of his home office. Whenever he saw a materialistic thing he wanted or a trip he wanted to take, he'd get a photo of it and glue it to the board. Then he'd see himself already enjoying the object of his desire. In May 2000, having just moved into his new home in Southern California a few weeks earlier, he was sitting in his office one morning when his five-year-old son, Keenan, came in and sat on a couple of boxes that had been in storage for over four years. Keenan asked his father what was in the boxes. When John told him his vision boards were in the boxes, Keenan replied, your vision what's? John opened one of the boxes to show Keenan a vision board. John smiled as he looked at the first board and saw pictures of a Mercedes sports car, a watch, and some other items, all of which he had acquired by then. But as he pulled out the second board, he began to cry. On that board was a picture of the house he had just bought and was living in. Not a house like it, but the house. The 7,000-square-foot house that sits on six acres of spectacular views, with a 3,000-square-foot guest house and an office complex, a tennis court, and 320 orange trees. That very home was a home he had seen in a picture that he had cut out of Dream Homes magazine four years earlier. The Magic of Visualizing Create a vision of who you want to be and then live into that picture as if it were already true. Arnold Schwarzenegger, actor, bodybuilder, film producer, and former governor of California. When Kabir Khan was six years old, he found his life's calling the night he saw the world's greatest magician, David Copperfield, perform on television. For days, all he could talk about was the magic show. A few weeks later, his parents bought him a magic kit that had a device in it that made coins vanish. He spent hours in his room practicing. When he turned 11, his mother bought him a full set of magic equipment, and he started performing at birthday parties and his school. As the years passed, his goals became more ambitious. He longed to train with the best magicians in the world, all of whom were in America. But how could he get there? His family didn't have a lot of money, and they expected him to pursue a normal career. So after high school, he attended college and studied marketing. But he also kept his dream alive by performing regularly at one of the large hotels in Kuala Lumpur. Then for his 20th birthday, he received a copy of The Success Principles. From the very first page, he was hooked. And when he learned that I was coming to speak in Kuala Lumpur, he knew he had to come see me. At the training, he heard me talk about writing down your goals, creating a vision board, using affirmations, and taking 100% responsibility for your life. These were all things he had read about in the success principles, but for some reason, 
he'd been holding back from putting them into action. Now he dove in. One of the principles I teach is act as if. Act as if you are already where you want to be. This means thinking like, dressing like, acting like, and feeling like the person who has already achieved your goal. So he asked himself, If I were already a world-famous magician, how would I act? What would I wear? Where would I shop? Thinking that David Copperfield would go only to the best stores, he took the train to the high-end mall, where he saw a shop displaying beautiful watches of all types. One watch, made by a Swiss company called Fortis, really attracted him. The clerk said it was a watch that the Russian astronauts wore. As soon as he placed it on his wrist, he fell in love with the feel of it. It was so solid and well-made. But it cost $3,000. He didn't have that kind of money. Using his cell phone, he took a picture of the watch, still on his wrist. At home, he printed out the photo and pasted it on his vision board. Remembering my instructions, he made a point to look at the picture of the Fortis on his wrist each day. About six months after my workshop, Kabir found a group willing to pay for him to go to magic school in America. But his joy was short-lived, because after more consideration, the group decided that he was too young. They told him he should finish college and then come back and ask again. He was devastated and humiliated. He told all his friends that he was going to America. Now what would he say? He stayed at home for a few days feeling terrible. Then he read in the paper that I was scheduled to give another talk in Kuala Lumpur the very next day. He immediately went to the hotel where he thought I'd be staying and sat in the lobby for six hours holding his copy of The Success Principles in scanning each new arrival coming through the door. Finally, he saw me come in, walked over to me, held up the book, and said, Jack, I need your help. Recognizing him from my last visit, I invited him up to my suite to talk. When he finished telling me his story, I said, You've done well, Kabir, but you need to refine your goals. Don't say, I want to study magic in America. Say, I am studying magic in America. Change your vision board to reflect this. Use images and phrases that create the feeling of already having what you want. I reminded him of principles 17 and 18. Ask, ask, ask. And... Reject rejection. Remember, there are a million people out there. If you don't get your yes, you just haven't asked the right person yet. After my pep talk, he began asking anyone he could think of to sponsor him. Businessmen, community leaders, even the prime minister. He was relentless. And to keep himself accountable, he emailed me regularly with progress reports. Remember the research on the importance of being accountable to another person? See page 86. Not long afterward, a successful Chinese businessman named Mr. Wong offered to pay Kabir's way to America. After meeting with Kabir's family, Mr. Wong handed Kabir a check for 80,000 ringgit, $23,000 U.S., 20,000 ringgit more than the amount he'd put on his vision board. With that money, he was able to go to the United States and attend magic school for a year, graduating with a certificate and an even fiercer desire to become a world-famous magician, the Malaysian David Copperfield. Back in Kuala Lumpur, he began performing regularly throughout Malaysia and eventually all over the Middle East and Asia. He was steadily gaining momentum toward his goal. But to really hit the big time, he knew he'd have to perform in the United States, specifically at the Magic Castle in Hollywood or at a club or hotel in Las Vegas. Now, the Magic Castle is a very prestigious venue for a magician. Only hand-picked magicians are allowed to perform there before its elite audience. His experience with Mr. Wong's check had convinced him of the power of visualizing, so he had a friend make a mock-up of a newspaper article with the headline, Malaysian magician to perform in Hollywood. In the article, he included a photo of himself and the news that he'd been invited to perform at the Magic Castle in Hollywood and also in Las Vegas. He put this article on his vision board and read it every day, making a point to experience the same feelings of gratitude and exhilaration he'd have if it were real. 
It got so that just walking by his vision board would fill his heart with joy. The picture of the fortis on his wrist was also still pinned to his vision board, and Kabir included it in his daily visualization. He had continued to save money toward purchasing it, and when he finally had the amount he needed, he set off to buy the watch. But when he walked into the shop, his heart stopped. The whole Fortis display was gone. The salesman told him that the watches weren't selling well in Malaysia, so they'd stop stocking them. Seeing his disappointment, the man said, Hold on a sec. Let me just look in back. He returned with a pile of watches he said they offered in private shows and dumped them on the counter. There it was. His watch. He picked it up and put it on. The clerk told him that, because it was discontinued, he would give him a big discount. So he paid just $1,000 for his dream watch. Then, after a year of visualizing and doing other practices from the success principles, he received an invitation to perform at the Magic Castle. He also booked a few engagements in some Las Vegas nightclubs. All that was missing now were enough funds to travel to the United States. His fees wouldn't cover all his expenses, even using the money he'd saved on the watch. Determined not to let this opportunity slip away, he racked his brain for ways to raise the money. That's when he had a brilliant idea. He picked up the phone and called the Fortis sales representative for Singapore, who had heard about Kabir's enthusiasm for his Fortis and his persistence in getting it. In fact, he had long considered Kabir an unofficial Fortis ambassador, having inspired a number of people to purchase one. Mr. Michael, Kabir said, it's confirmed. I'm going to be the first Malaysian magician to perform in Hollywood and Las Vegas. This could be a great opportunity for Fortis. Would you like to sponsor my U.S. tour? Mr. Michael contacted the Fortis executives in Switzerland and called them back the next day to tell him they had agreed to sponsor him. He was going to the USA. The trip was fantastic, and performing on stage at the Magic Castle and in Las Vegas was every bit as exciting and fulfilling as he had imagined it would be. But one of the most satisfying moments of all happened before he even left Malaysia. Looking online, he couldn't believe his eyes when he saw an article about his upcoming trip on Yahoo News. He had been reading his made-up headline for months, and there it was. But this time for real. Malaysian magician to perform in Hollywood. He had done it. And quickly, too. He was only 26 years old. The fact that he was the first-ever Malaysian magician to be personally invited to perform in Hollywood and Las Vegas, along with his record of 21 straight shows in Hollywood, earned him an honorary award by the Malaysian Book of Records. Kabir continues to perform internationally, and even gave a recent command performance for the Sheikh of Dubai. But there's more. Mr. Wong and he are now business partners and have several exciting and lucrative projects together, including the iconic revolving restaurant at the famous Kuala Lumpur Tower, the sixth highest restaurant in the world. When Kabir first learned the magic, one of his favorite tricks was to make money disappear. Years later, he credits the success principles for teaching him another kind of magic, the kind that makes money and fame, success, and happiness appear. Today, he tells his audience, magic is believing anything can happen. Start now. Set aside time each and every day to visualize every one of your goals as already complete. This is one of the most vital things you can do to make your dreams come true. Some psychologists are now claiming that one hour of visualization is worth seven hours of physical effort. That's a tall claim, but it makes an important point. Visualization is one of the strongest tools in your success toolbox. Make sure you use it. You don't need to visualize your future achievements for a whole hour. Just 10 to 15 minutes is plenty. Azim Jamal, a prominent speaker in Canada, recommends what he calls the hour of power. 20 minutes of visualization and meditation 20 minutes of exercise, and 20 minutes of reading inspirational or informational books. 
Imagine what would happen to your life if you did this every day. Principle 12. Act as if. Believe and act as if it were impossible to fail. Charles F. Kettering. Inventor with over 140 patents and honorary doctorates from nearly 30 universities. One of the great strategies for success is to act as if you already are where you want to be. This means thinking like, talking like, dressing like, acting like, and feeling like the person who has already achieved your goal. Acting as if sends powerful commands to your subconscious mind to find creative ways to achieve your goals. It programs the reticular activating system, RAS, in your brain to start noticing anything that will help you succeed, and it sends strong messages to the universe that this end goal is something you really want. Start acting as if. The first time I noticed this phenomenon was at my local bank. There were several tellers working there, and I noticed that one in particular always wore a suit and tie. Unlike the other two male tellers who just wore a shirt and a tie, this young man looked like an executive. A year later, I noticed he had been promoted to his own desk where he was taking loan applications. Two years later, he was a loan officer, and later he became the branch manager. I asked him about this one day, and he replied that he always knew he would be a branch manager. So he studied how the manager dressed and started dressing that way. He studied how the manager treated people and started interacting with people the same way. He started acting as if he were a branch manager long before he ever became one. To fly as fast as thought, to be anywhere there is, you must first begin by knowing that you have already arrived. Richard Bach, author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel Becoming an International Consultant in the late 70s, I met a seminar leader who had just returned from Australia. I decided that I, too, wanted to travel and speak around the globe. I asked myself what I would need to become an international consultant. I called the passport office and asked them to send me an application. I purchased a clock that showed all the international time zones. I had business cards printed with the words International Consultant on them. Finally, I decided that Australia would be the first place I would like to go. So I went to a travel agency and got a huge travel poster featuring the Sydney Opera House, Ayers Rock, and a kangaroo crossing sign. Every morning while I ate my breakfast, I looked at that poster on my refrigerator and imagined being in Australia. Less than a year later, I was invited to conduct seminars in Sydney and Brisbane. As soon as I started acting as if I were an international consultant, the universe responded by treating me like one. The powerful law of attraction at work. The law of attraction simply states that what you think about, you will bring about. The more you create the vibration, the mental and emotional states, of already having something, the faster you attract it to you. This is an immutable law of the universe and critical to accelerating your rate of success. Acting as if in the PGA A great example of the power of acting as if is the story of Fred Couples and Jim Nance, who started out as two kids who loved golf and had very big dreams. Fred's goal was to someday win the Masters Tournament, and Jim's was to someday work for CBS Sports as an announcer. When Fred and Jim were sweetmates in college at the University of Houston, they used to play-act the scene where the winner of the Masters is escorted into Butler Cabin to receive his green jacket and be interviewed by the CBS announcer. Fourteen years later, the scene they had rehearsed many times in Taub Hall at the University of Houston played out in reality as the whole world was watching. Fred Couples won the Masters, and was taken by tournament officials into Butler Cabin, where he was interviewed by none other than CBS Sports announcer Jim Nance. After the cameras stopped rolling, the two embraced each other with tears in their eyes. They always knew it was going to be the Masters that Fred won, and that Jim would be there to cover it for CBS. The amazing power of acting as if 
with unwavering certainty. The Millionaire Cocktail Party In my Breakthrough to Success seminars, we do a role-playing exercise called The Millionaire Cocktail Party. Everyone stands up and socializes with the other participants as if they were all at an actual cocktail party. However, they must act as if they have already achieved all of their financial goals in life. They act as if they already have everything they want in life, their dream house, their vacation home, their dream car, their dream career, as well as if they have achieved any personal, professional, or philanthropic goals that are important to them. Everyone suddenly becomes more animated, alive, enthusiastic, and outgoing. People who seemed shy a few minutes earlier reach out and assertively introduce themselves to others. The energy and volume level of the room soars. People excitedly tell each other about their achievements, invite each other to their vacation homes in Hawaii and the Bahamas, and discuss their recent safaris in Africa and their philanthropic missions to third world countries. After about five minutes, I stop the exercise and ask people to share how they are feeling. People report feeling excited, passionate, positive, supportive, generous, happy, self-confident, and content. I then ask them to look at the fact that their inner feelings, both emotional and physiological, were different, even though in reality their outer circumstances were still the same. They had not actually become millionaires in the real world. But they had begun to feel like millionaires simply by acting as if they were. The Party That Could Change Your Life In 1986, I attended a party that deeply impacted the lives of all of us who attended. It was a come-as-you-will-be in 1991 party held on the Queen Mary in Long Beach, California. Those of us who attended were to envision where we would like to be in 1991 five years into the future. When we arrived, we were to act as if it really were 1991, and our vision had already come true. We were to dress the part, talk the part, and bring any props that demonstrated that our dream had already come true. Books written, awards earned, and large paychecks received. We were to spend the evening bragging about our accomplishments, talking about how happy and fulfilled we were, and discussing what we were going to do next. We were to stay in character the entire night. When we arrived, we were met by twenty college students who had been hired to play the part of adoring fans and paparazzi. Cameras flashed, and fans screamed our names, asking for autographs. I went as a best-selling author, with several reviews of my number one New York Times bestseller to show people. A man who came as a multimillionaire dressed as a beach bum, his vision of retirement, spent the evening handing out real lottery tickets to everyone at the party. A woman brought a mock edition of Time magazine with her face on the cover for winning an international award for making advances in the peace movement. A man who wanted to retire and spend his life as a sculptor showed up in a leather sculptor's apron with a hammer and chisel and safety goggles and pictures of sculptures he had made. A man who wanted to become a successful stock trader spent the entire evening answering his cell phone, talking animatedly and then commanding, Buy 5,000 shares! Or, Sell 10,000 shares! He had actually hired someone to call him every 15 minutes during the party just to carry off his act as if. A woman who was just embarking on a writing career and had yet to sell a book arrived carrying mock-ups of three books she had written. In the spirit of everyone supporting everyone else's dream, people told her that they had seen her on Oprah and the Today Show. That woman was Susan Jeffers, who did go on from that transformational evening to publish 17 successful books, including the internationally acclaimed Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And the same thing happened to me. I went on to write, compile, and edit more than 200 books, including 11 number one New York Times bestsellers. That party, where we maintained our future personas for over four hours, flooded our subconscious with powerful images of having already achieved our aspirations. These vivid experiences, 
infused with the positive emotions generated by the events of the evening, strengthened the positive neural pathways in our brains that in some cases forged and in other cases deepened our new self-images of being super successful. And it worked. All those who attended that party have gone on to realize the dreams they acted out that night, and much, much more. Make the commitment to throw a come-as-you'll-be party for your closest circle of friends, your company, your business associates, your graduating class, or your mastermind group. Since this book was first published, many small companies and large corporations have built a come-as-you'll-be party into their in-house trainings, conferences, and sales meetings. Why not build it into yours? Think of the creative energy, awareness, and support it will release. You can use this invitation. Come as you will be in 2020. Join us for a celebration that will stretch your imagination and catapult you into your own future. When? Where? Given by RSVP to Arrive as who you will be five years from now. Dress in your very best. Speak only in the present tense the entire evening, as if it were already 2020. All your goals have been achieved, and all your dreams have already come true. You will be videotaped as you arrive. Bring props to show everyone what you have achieved in the years between, such as best-selling books you've written, magazine covers you've been on, awards you've won, and photographs or scrapbooks of your achievements. Throughout the evening, you will have the opportunity to applaud others in their achievements and to receive congratulations. Sergio's Story Sergio Sedas Gerse is a professor of robotics at the Tecnologico de Monterrey in Monterrey, Mexico. While attending my Breakthrough to Success training, he attended his first Come As You'll Be party. Here's his story. In the first two days of the seminar, I set some goals that I wanted to achieve in my life. To be a guest speaker at a TED conference. To write a book on context-based learning, a new educational model I was developing. To take my wife to Greece. To own a house by the lake. To start a tech museum. To develop a national program that would help youngsters develop self-confidence and a sense of purpose. All of these appeared to be distant dreams. I lacked the money, the time, and the experience. And I had even had to cancel my family's last scheduled vacation. Regardless, as I prepared for my come-as-you'll-be party, I wanted to play the game full out. My wife helped me pick out some pictures for a mock photo album that would be my prop to show people my accomplishments. Pictures of the Greek islands, pictures of Rome— a picture of a house by a lake. She even photoshopped my picture on top of a TED conference stage. I was ready. I was a little nervous when I arrived, but I approached a group of people I knew. One of my friends came dressed as an Olympics coach. She shared that she was coaching a league of minors that got into the Olympics. Soon it was my turn. What have you been up to? they asked. Well, I began. I just came back from giving a talk at a TED conference, and I got my book, Context-Based Learning, published. Oh, and I took my family on a vacation. We went to Greece and Rome. And I thanked them for coming to stay with us at our lake house, which I described clearly. A main house with two adjacent houses full of bunk beds, one for girls and one for boys. The party went on for hours, and I shared my accomplishments of the last five years with nearly a hundred people. Eventually it was time to eat, and slowly people began to leave the foyer and cross the line into a ballroom where dinner was waiting for us. I really did not want to go. I felt comfortable in the future, and I was afraid I would go back in time the moment I crossed the line. But it was time to go. Yet when I crossed the line, I was confused. What was real? What was my imagination? I wasn't sure anymore. A year and a half later, I was invited to speak at a TEDx conference in Chennai, India. My topic was Context-Based Learning, 
Learning Through Understanding. A couple of months later, I submitted a paper on context-based learning and learning through understanding to a conference on education innovation and received the Best Paper Award. But that is not all. A friend of mine from Greece invited me to start a nonprofit organization called Better Life Day in Mexico. Our first conference was in Athens in June. I needed to go to Athens to see what it was all about. With perfect timing, extra money came my way, so I invited my wife to go with me. Just as I was about to purchase the plane tickets, my wife suggested, Why not go via Rome and stop by Santorini, one of the Greek islands? Wow! Everything that I had talked about at the Come As You'll Be party was happening. Three years have passed since then. My national program to generate self-confidence and a sense of purpose in youngsters is now also a reality. It is being taught and migrated into 33 campuses nationwide. I am now an international speaker and trainer. And yes, at the end of each seminar we hold a come-as-you'll-be party. I am always happy to hear the seminar participants play out their dreams and become a witness as their dreams unfold into reality. Milton has opened his own audio recording studio. Gris got her ranch. Miguel started his catering business. It's truly magical. A couple of weeks ago, I picked up the photo album my wife had made for that very first Come As You'll Be party. As I looked through it, one particular picture stood out. It was the picture my wife had composed of me, on stage in front of the TED logo. Side by side... It's the spitting image of an actual picture someone took of me speaking at TEDx in India. Acting as if in the classroom Tricia Jacobson, a health teacher in Conway, New Hampshire, decided to conduct an experimental two-week success principles curriculum with a group of her eighth graders. For the last day, she planned a come-as-you'll-be party similar to what she had experienced at several of my trainings. Here's what happened. I called it a come-as-you'll-be-as-an-adult party and encouraged the kids to come all dressed up and ready to act out their ideal adult lives and greet their classmates as if they hadn't seen each other since the eighth grade. On Friday morning, as the party started, a group of kids gathered in the middle of the room, smiling, high-fiving, and hugging each other as if they hadn't seen each other in years, and sharing their stories about their cool jobs, houses, cars, and families. Mariah, one of the popular girls, showed up in high heels and a sparkly outfit with a plastic microphone, and announced that she was a popular singer-songwriter and had just come off a promotional tour of her new album. She spoke of her mansion house— her hot new husband, and her sports car. Jeff wore his school baseball jersey and told me he had just been drafted by the New York Yankees. He was still dating his middle school crush and saw marriage in the near future. He talked about his busy travel schedule, his record-breaking batting average, and the new car he was going to buy. Ian was a sportscaster at a local TV station, married with three kids, a dog, and a moderate life in New Hampshire. Justin bought the family farm and was enjoying a simple life with his family. Audrey, who was still Mariah's best friend, was now her personal assistant and traveled with her on tour to take care of all the details and keep her friend organized. Brian was an aeronautical design engineer who worked from his high-tech home office, complete with a wall-to-wall -wall big screen TV where he spent his spare time playing video games with friends. He had designed an amazing piece of equipment and was on his way to catch a plane to the Kennedy Space Station to witness the launch. The energy in the room was electric, except in the corner to my right, where two kids were sitting by themselves. Matt wore a shirt and tie and sat quietly at his desk looking at his binder. Emily was dressed in a navy blue business suit that was a couple of sizes too big for her. She was reading her book in silence. When I walked over to check in with Matt, he explained that he was an accountant. He had a house, a wife, two kids, a dog, and a nice car. He had a couple of good friends, 
He liked being quiet, and he spent a lot of time working with numbers, which he really enjoyed. Emily was reluctant to share her story with me at first, but then told me that she had borrowed her mom's business suit. She told me that she had a hard time acting as if it was the future, but she knew she wanted to be an attorney, just like her mom. She also told me she wanted to get better at meeting people, because she got teased a lot at school for being so shy. Matt, who was listening to my conversation with Emily, told us that he was also pretty shy and got teased a lot about being a geek. In a moment of divine inspiration, I asked them if they would like me to introduce them to some people who needed their services. They looked perplexed, but got up and followed me over to where the crowd had gathered and the others were still acting out their roles. I walked over to where Mariah, the up-and-coming rock star, and Jeff, the baseball star, were standing. Mariah, it's so good to see you again, I said. I heard your album and it was awesome. I'm thinking that you could probably use a good accountant and a good lawyer now that you're so successful. Meet my friends Matt and Emily. He's an accountant, and she's a lawyer. Jeff immediately reached over and shook Matt's hand and said, Dude, can you take a look at my new contract? While Mariah asked Emily about what it was like to be a lawyer. I got goosebumps as I watched what unfolded over the next several minutes. Jeff and Mariah connected Matt and Emily to their classmates and promoted their accounting and legal services to anyone they thought would need them. The bell rang. The students grabbed their binders, thanked me for having such a fun party, and were on their way to their next class. I was in shock. But that was nothing compared to what I witnessed the following Monday. As I walked down the hallway to class, I heard someone call my name. I turned around to see Moriah, Emily, and Audrey coming toward me, arm in arm with big smiles, as if they had been friends forever. As I walked into the classroom, Jeff and Matt were sitting near Matt's desk making plans for Matt to help Jeff with his math homework after school. Although I had experienced the power of the come-as-you'll-be party several times before, I had never anticipated the impact such an activity could have on young people. In literally half an hour, connections were made, perspectives were changed, shyness was overcome, and an appreciation for each other's unique gifts and talents was discovered. The purpose of the Come As You'll Be party is to create an emotionally charged experience of what it'll be like when you have made it, when you have achieved your dreams. When you spend an evening living out the lifestyle you want and deserve, you lay down powerful blueprints in your subconscious mind that will later support you in perceiving opportunities, creating powerful solutions, attracting the right people, and taking the necessary actions to achieve your dreams and goals. Be clear that one party like this is not enough by itself to change your entire future. You will still have to do other things to make it happen. However, it is one more piece in an overall system of powerful, acting as if strategies that will support you in the creation of your desired future. Be, do, and have everything you want, starting now. You can begin right now to act as if you have already achieved any goal you desire, and that outer experience of acting as if will create the inner experience, the millionaire mindset, as it were, that will take you to the actual manifestation of that experience. Once you choose what it is you want to be, do, or have, all you have to do is start acting as if you already are being, doing, or having it. How would you act if you already were a straight-A student, top salesperson, highly paid consultant, rich entrepreneur, world-class athlete, best-selling author, internationally acclaimed artist, sought-after speaker, or celebrated actor or musician? How would you think, talk, act, carry yourself, dress, treat other people, handle money, eat, live, travel, and so forth? Once you have a clear picture of that, start being it. Now. Successful people exude self-confidence, ask for what they want, and say what they don't want. They think anything is possible, take risks, and celebrate their successes. They save a portion of their income and share a portion with others. 
You can do all of those things now before you ever become rich and successful. These things don't cost money, just intention. And as soon as you start acting as if, you will start drawing to you the very people and things that will help you achieve it in real life. Remember, the proper order of things is to start now and be who you want to be. Then do the actions that go along with being that person, and soon you will find that you easily have everything you want in life, health, wealth, fulfilling relationships, and social impact. Principle 13. Take Action Things may come to those who wait, but only the things left by those who hustle. Abraham Lincoln 16th President of the United States. What we think, or what we know, or what we believe is, in the end, of little consequence. The only consequence is what we do. John Ruskin, English author, art critic, and social commentator. The world doesn't pay you for what you know. It pays you for what you do. There's an enduring axiom of success that says, The universe rewards action. Yet as simple and as true as this principle is, it's surprising how many people get bogged down in analyzing, planning, and organizing when what they really need to do is take action. When you take action, you trigger all kinds of things that will inevitably carry you to success. You let those around you know that you are serious in your intention. People wake up and start paying attention. People with similar goals become aligned with you. You begin to learn things from your experience that cannot be learned from listening to others or from reading books. You begin to get feedback about how to do it better, more efficiently, and more quickly. Things that once seemed confusing begin to come clear. Things that once appeared difficult begin to be easier. You begin to attract others who will support and encourage you. All manner of good things begin to flow in your direction once you begin to take action. Talk is cheap. Over the years of teaching and coaching people in my company and in my seminars, I have found that the one thing that seems to separate winners from losers more than anything else is that winners take action. They simply get up and do what has to be done. Once they have developed a plan, they start. They get into motion. Even if they don't start perfectly, they learn from their mistakes make the necessary corrections, and keep taking action, all the time building momentum, until they finally produce the result they set out to produce, or something even better than they conceived of when they started. To be successful, you have to do what successful people do, and successful people are highly action-oriented. Once you have created a vision, set goals, broken them down into small steps, visualized and affirmed your success, and chosen to believe in yourself and your dreams, it's now time to take action. Enroll in the course. Get the necessary training. Make those sales calls. Call the travel agent. Start writing that book. Start saving for the down payment on your home. Join the health club. Sign up for those piano lessons. Or write that proposal. Nothing happens until you take action. If your ship doesn't come in, Swim Out to Meet It, Jonathan Winters, Grammy Award-winning comedian, actor, writer, and artist. To demonstrate the power of taking action in my seminars, I hold up a $100 bill and ask, Who wants this $100 bill? Invariably, most of the people in the audience will raise their hands. Some will wave their hands vigorously back and forth. Some will even shout out, I want it, or I'll take it, or give it to me. But I just stand there calmly holding out the bill until they get it. Eventually, someone jumps out of her seat, rushes to the front of the room, and takes the bill from my hand. After that person sits down, now $100 richer for her efforts, I ask the audience, what did this person do that no one else in the room did? She got off her butt and took action. She did what was necessary to get the money. And that is exactly what you must do if you want to succeed in life. You must take action, and in most cases, the sooner the better. I then ask, how many of you thought about getting up and just coming and taking the money 
but you stopped yourself. I then asked them to remember what they told themselves that stopped them from getting up. The usual answers are, I didn't want to look like I wanted it or needed it that badly. I wasn't sure if you'd really give it to me. I was too far back in the room. Other people need it more than I do. I didn't want to look greedy. I was afraid I might be doing something wrong, and then people would judge me or laugh at me. I was waiting for further instructions. I then point out that whatever things they said to stop themselves are the same things that they say to stop themselves in the rest of their lives. One of the universal truths in life is, how you do anything is how you do everything. If you are cautious here, you are probably cautious everywhere. If you hold yourself back for fear of looking foolish here, you probably hold yourself back for fear of looking foolish elsewhere. You have to identify those patterns and break through them. It's time to stop holding yourself back and just go for the gold. Ruben Gonzalez goes for Olympic gold. Ever since third grade, Ruben Gonzalez had wanted to be an Olympic athlete. He respected the Olympians because they were an example of what he believed in. They are willing to commit to a goal, risk adversity in the pursuit of it, and fail and keep trying until they succeed. But it was not until he was in college and saw Scott Hamilton compete in the 1984 Sarajevo Games that he actually made the decision to train for the Olympics. Ruben said to himself, If that little guy can do it, I can do it too. I'm going to be in the next Olympics. It's a done deal. I just have to find a sport. After doing a little research on Olympic sports, Ruben decided he needed to pick a sport that would build on his strengths. He knew that he was a good athlete, but not a great athlete. His strength was perseverance. He never quit anything. In fact, he had earned the nickname Bulldog in high school. He figured he had to find a sport so tough, a sport with so many broken bones, that there would be a lot of quitters. That way, maybe, he could rise to the top on the attrition rate. He finally settled on the luge. Next, he wrote Sports Illustrated, that was before the Internet, and asked, Where do you go to learn how to luge? They wrote back, Lake Placid, New York. That's where they had the Olympics in 1936 and 1980. That's where the track is. Reuben picked up the phone and called Lake Placid. I'm an athlete in Houston, and I want to learn how to luge so I can be in the Olympics in four years. Will you help me? The guy who answered the phone asked, how old are you? Twenty-one years old. Twenty-one? You're way too old. You're ten years too late. We start them when they're ten years old. Forget it. But Reuben couldn't forget it, and he started to tell the man his life story to buy some time until he thought of something. Along the way, he happened to say that he was born in Argentina. All of a sudden, the man on the other end of the phone got excited. Argentina? Why didn't you say so? If you'll go for Argentina, we'll help you. It turns out the sport of luge was in danger of being dropped from the Olympics because there weren't enough countries competing on the international level. If you'll go for Argentina and somehow we can get you into the top 50 ranked losers in the world in four years, which is what you'll need to make it into the Olympics, it would add one more country to the sport of luge, and that would make it a stronger sport. If you make it you'd be helping the U.S. team. Then he added, Before you come all the way to Lake Placid, you have to know two things. Number one, if you want to do it at your age, and you want to do it in only four years, it'll be brutal. Nine out of every ten guys quit. Number two, expect to break some bones. Reuben thought, Great, this works right into my plan. I'm not a quitter. The harder it is, the easier it is for me. A few days later, Ruben Gonzalez was walking down Main Street in Lake Placid, looking for the U.S. Olympic Training Center. A day later, he was in a beginner's class with 14 other aspiring Olympians. The first day was miserable, and he even thought of quitting. But with the help of his friend Craig, he recommitted to his Olympic dream and— Though all fourteen of the other aspirants eventually quit before the end of the first season, 
Reuben finished the summer training. Four grueling years later, Reuben Gonzalez realized his dream when he walked into the opening ceremonies of the 1988 Calgary Winter Olympics. He returned again in Albertville in 1992 and Salt Lake City for the 2000 Winter Games. Reuben Gonzalez, because he took immediate and persistent action on his dream, will always be a three-time Olympian. And as many Olympians do, Reuben has gone on to have a successful career as a motivational speaker. Successful people have a bias for action. Most successful people I know have a low tolerance for excessive planning and talking about it. They are antsy to get going. They want to get started. They want the games to begin. A good example of this is my friend Bob Kriegel's son, Otis. When Otis came home for the summer with his new girlfriend after his freshman year in college, they both began looking for jobs. While Otis just picked up the phone and started calling around to see who might need someone, his girlfriend spent the first week writing and rewriting her resume. By the end of the second day, Otis had landed a job. His girlfriend was still rewriting her resume. Otis just got into action. He figured if someone asked him for a resume, he'd deal with it then. Planning has its place, but it must be kept in perspective. Some people spend their whole lives waiting for the perfect time to do something. There's rarely a perfect time to do anything. What is important is to just get started. Get into the game. Get on the playing field. Once you do, you will start to get feedback that will help you make the corrections you need to make to be successful. Once you are in action, you will start learning at a much more rapid rate. Ready, fire, aim. Most people are familiar with the phrase, ready, aim, fire. The problem is that too many people spend their whole life aiming and never firing. They are always getting ready, getting it perfect. The quickest way to hit a target is to fire, see where the bullet landed, and then adjust your aim accordingly. If the hit was two inches above the target, lower your aim a little. Fire again. See where it is now. Keep firing and keep readjusting. Soon you are hitting the bullseye. The same is true for anything. When we started marketing the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, it occurred to me that it would be a good idea to give away free excerpts from the book to small and local newspapers in exchange for them printing a box at the end of the story telling people that the story was excerpt from Chicken Soup for the Soul, which was available at their local bookstore or by calling our 800 number. I had never done this before so I wasn't sure if there was a correct way to submit a story to a newspaper or magazine. So I just sent off a story from the book entitled Remember You Are Raising Children, Not Flowers, that I had written about my neighbor and his son, along with a cover letter to the editor of L.A. Parent Magazine. The letter read, September 13, 1993, Jack Bierman, L.A. Parent. Dear Jack, I would like to submit this article for publication in L.A. Parent. I have enclosed a brief bio. I would like you to print the little blurb I included on my new book, Chicken Soup for the Soul, with my article. If you would like a copy of the book, I would be more than happy to send one to you. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Jack Canfield. A few weeks later, I received the following letter back. Dear Jack, I was annoyed by your facts. How dare you tell me to include the little blurb on your book? How could you assume I'd be interested in this little bit of unsolicited word processing? Then I read the article. Needless to say, I'll run your little blurb and then some. I was moved by this exercise, and am sure it will touch the hearts of our 200,000-plus readers from here to San Diego. Has it ever appeared anywhere in my demographic? If so, where? I look forward to working with you on raising children, not flowers. Best regards, Jack Bierman, Editor-in-Chief. I had not known how to submit a proper query letter to an editor. There was an accepted format that I was unaware of. But I took action anyway. In a subsequent phone call, 
Jack Bierman generously taught me the correct way to submit an article to a magazine. He gave me feedback on how to do it better next time. Now I was in the game, and I was learning from my experience. Ready, fire, aim. Within a month, I had submitted that same article to over 50 local and regional parenting magazines all across the United States. Thirty-five of them published it, introducing Chicken Soup for the Soul to over six million parents. Do it now. My mentor, W. Clement Stone, used to hand out lapel pins that said, Do it now. When you have an inspired impulse to take action, do it now. Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, said, There are three keys to success. One, being at the right place at the right time. Two, knowing you are there. Three, taking action. On March 24, 1975, Chuck Wepner, a relatively unknown 30-to-1 underdog, did what no one thought he could do. He went 15 rounds with the world heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali. In the ninth round, he reached Ali's chin with the right hand, knocking the champion to the ground, shocking both Ali and the fans watching the fight. Wepner was only seconds away from being the world's heavyweight champion. However, Ali recovered and went on to win the 15-round bout and retain his title. Over a thousand miles away, a struggling actor named Sylvester Stallone watched the fight on a newly purchased television set. Though Stallone had contemplated the idea of writing a screenplay about a down-and-out fighter getting a title shot before he saw the ali Wepner fight, he didn't think it was plausible. But after seeing Wepner, who most people didn't know, fighting the most well-known fighter of all time, all he thought was, get me a pencil. He began to write that night, and three days later he had completed the script for Rocky, which went on to win three Oscars, including one for Best Picture, thus launching Stallone's multi-million dollar movie career. Imagination means nothing without doing. Charlie Chaplin, actor, comedian, and filmmaker. Give me a break. A story is told of a man who goes to church and prays. God, I need a break. I need to win the state lottery. I'm counting on you, God. Having not won the lottery, the man returns to church a week later and once again prays, God, about that state lottery, I've been kind to my wife. I've given up drinking. I've been really good. Give me a break. Let me win the lottery. A week later, still no richer, he returns to pray once again. God, I don't seem to be getting through to you on this state lottery thing. I've been using positive self-talk, saying affirmations and visualizing the money. Give me a break, God. Let me win the lottery. Suddenly, the heavens open up. Light and heavenly music flood into the church, and a deep voice says, My son, give me a break. Buy a lottery ticket. Fail forward. No man ever became great or good, except through many and great mistakes. William E. Gladstone, former Prime Minister of Great Britain Many people fail to take action because they're afraid to fail. Successful people, on the other hand, realize that failure is an important part of the learning process. They know that failure is just a way we learn by trial and error. Not only do we need to stop being so afraid of failure, but we also need to be willing to fail, even eager to fail. I call this kind of instructive failure failing forward. Simply get started, make mistakes, listen to the feedback, correct, and keep moving forward toward the goal. Every experience will yield more useful information that you can apply the next time. This principle is perhaps demonstrated most compellingly in the area of startup businesses. For instance, venture capitalists know that most businesses fail. But in the venture capital industry, a new statistic is emerging. If the founding entrepreneur is 55 years or older, the business has a 73% better chance of survival. 
These older entrepreneurs have already learned from their mistakes. They're simply a better risk because through a lifetime of learning from their failures, they have developed a knowledge base, a skill set, and a self-confidence that better enables them to move through the obstacles to success. You can never learn less. You can only learn more. The reason I know so much is because I have made so many mistakes. Buckminster Fuller, mathematician and philosopher who never graduated from college but received 46 honorary doctorates. One of my favorite stories is about a famous research scientist who had made several very important medical breakthroughs. He was being interviewed by a newspaper reporter who asked him why he thought he was able to achieve so much more than the average person. In other words, what set him so far apart from others? He responded that it all came from a lesson his mother had taught him when he was two years old. He'd been trying to take a bottle of milk out of the refrigerator when he lost his grip and spilled the entire contents on the kitchen floor. His mother, instead of scolding him, said, What a wonderful mess you've made! I've rarely seen such a huge puddle of milk. Well, the damage is already done. Would you like to get down and play in the milk before we clean it up? Indeed, he did. And after a few minutes, his mother continued, You know, whenever you make a mess like this, eventually you have to clean it up. So, how would you like to do that? We could use a towel, sponge, or mop. Which do you prefer? After they were finished cleaning up the milk, she said, What we have here is a failed experiment in how to carry a big bottle of milk with two tiny hands. Let's go out in the backyard, fill the bottle with water, and see if you can discover a way to carry it without dropping it. And they did. What a wonderful lesson. The scientist then remarked that it was at that moment that he knew he didn't have to be afraid to make mistakes. Instead, he learned that mistakes are just opportunities for learning something new, which, after all, is what scientific experiments are all about. That bottle of spilled milk led to a lifetime of learning experiences, experiences that were the building blocks of a lifetime of world-renowned successes and medical breakthroughs. Principle 14. Just lean into it. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Ancient Chinese proverb. Oftentimes, success happens when you just lean into it. When you make yourself open to opportunities and are willing to do what it takes to pursue it further, without a contract, without a promise of success, without any expectation whatsoever, you just start. You lean into it. You see what it feels like, and you find out if you want to keep going. Instead of sitting on the sidelines deliberating, reflecting, and contemplating, leaning into it creates momentum. One of the most extraordinary benefits of just leaning into it is that you begin creating momentum, that unseen energy force that brings more opportunity, more resources, and more people who can help you into your life at seemingly just the right time for you to benefit the most from them. Many of the best-known acting careers, entrepreneurial pursuits, philanthropic projects, and other overnight successes happened because someone responded favorably to the question, Have you ever considered, or, Could I convince you to, or, Would you be willing to take a look at, they leaned into it. You can't cross a sea by merely staring into the water. Rabindranath Tagore, 1913 Nobel Laureate for Literature Be willing to start without seeing the whole path. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. Martin Luther King, Jr., Legendary Civil Rights Leader Nobel Peace Prize recipient. Of course, just leaning into a project or opportunity also means you must be willing to start without necessarily seeing the entire pathway from the beginning. You must be willing to lean into it and see how it unfolds. Often we have a dream, and because we can't see how we're going to achieve it, 
we are afraid to start, afraid to commit ourselves, because the path is unclear and the outcome is uncertain. But leaning into it requires that you be willing to explore, to enter unknown waters, trusting that a port will appear. Simply start. Then keep taking what feel like logical next steps, and the journey will ultimately take you to where you want to go, or even someplace better. Sometimes you don't even have to have a clear dream. From as early as she could remember, Janice Stanfield wanted to be a singer. She didn't know where her dream would eventually lead her, but she knew she had to find out. She leaned into it and took some singing lessons, then eventually got a job singing weekends at a local country club. She leaned into it a little more, and at 26 years old, she packed her bags for Nashville, Tennessee, to pursue her dream of becoming a songwriter and recording artist. Three long years she lived and worked in Nashville, seeing hundreds of more brilliant, talented, and deserving performers than there were record deals to be had. Jana began to see the music industry as a room full of slot machines that paid out just enough to keep you playing. A producer loves your work. An artist considers your song for her next album. And maybe a record company tells you you're great. But rarely do the slot machines pay off with the big jackpot, the coveted recording contract. After several years of working at a record promotion company to learn the business from the inside out, Jana had to face facts. There were no guarantees. She could play the slots forever and grow old in Nashville. Finally, she admitted to herself that continuing to try to get a record deal was like pounding her head against a wall. She didn't realize at the time that often when you lean into it, roadblocks are put in your path to force you into a different path, a path that may be truer to your real purpose. For every failure, there's an alternative course of action. You just have to find it. When you come to a roadblock, take a detour. Mary Kay Ash, founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics. Looking for her underlying motivation. Jana had learned what many achievers have, that even when you can't move forward, you can turn right or you can turn left, but you have to keep moving. She discovered through some personal development courses that sometimes, in the rush to fulfill our dreams, we get caught up in what we think is the only form that will satisfy that dream, in Jana's case, a recording contract. But as Jana would soon learn, there are many ways to accomplish your goal, if you know what you're really pursuing. Because underneath her desire to land a record deal was a deeper motivating need, the real motivation for her dream to use her music to uplift, inspire, and offer hope to people. I want to combine music, comedy, storytelling, and motivation with what I'm here for, she wrote in her journal. I am an artist, and my art is unfolding before me. The roadblock that blocked my path has been lifted. Emboldened by this new insight, Jana began to play anywhere people would let her. Where two or more are gathered... I will bring my guitar, became her motto. She played in living rooms, driveways, schools, churches, anywhere she could. I'm not lost. I'm just exploring. But Jana was still at a loss to figure out how to combine her talents in a way that would be helpful to people and pay her a modest income. There was no one out there already doing what she wanted to do, combining music, comedy, storytelling, and motivation. There was no career path already laid out to follow, no footsteps to walk in. She was charting new territory. She didn't know where she was going or what form it would ultimately take, but she kept leaning into it. Keep leaning, and the path will appear. Jana began to work odd jobs, always leaning into it, trying to figure out how to turn her passion for her art and her desire to help people into something she could make a living from. I'm willing to use my gifts to make this world a better place, she wrote in her journal. I don't know exactly how to use my gifts to do this, but I have let God know that I am ready. Again, she leaned into it. Jana called churches, saying, If you would let me come and sing two songs in your service, 
It will give you a chance to get to know me and how I might be helpful. Then in a few months, maybe you'd like to have me come back and do a concert in the afternoon. The Turning Point After just two or three songs, church members would approach her and ask if she had her songs on tape. There was one song, If I Had Only Known, that people requested more than any other. They'd say, I noticed a lot of people crying when you played that song. I've had a loss that's so painful that I can't cry here at church because I don't know if I can put myself back together once I start. Would you make me a copy of this song so I can have it when I'm alone and really feel the feelings you're bringing to me? Jana spent a lot of time making cassettes and mailing them to people, but all the while her friends kept telling her to make an album. You've got all these demos of songs you recorded when you were trying to get a record deal, they said. Just take your demos and make an album. Jana thought, Oh, I couldn't do that. It wouldn't be a real album with a real record company. It wouldn't really count. It would just show what a failure I've been. But her friends kept after her, and eventually Jana leaned into it one more time. She paid an engineer $100 to put together ten of her songs, which she playfully referred to as a compilation of my top ten most rejected songs. She made the covers at Kinko's and reproduced one hundred cassettes, which she now laughingly recalls she thought would be a lifetime supply. As she traveled from living room to living room and tiny church to tiny church, she set out her cassettes on a card table and sold them after her performance. Then came the turning point. My husband went with me to a church in Memphis, Jana recalls. They didn't feel comfortable having a card table with my cassettes inside the church, so they put my card table out on their new parking lot. It had just been repaved, and in 95-degree weather, the asphalt was hot and black and gooey. After the parking lot finally emptied, we got in the car and turned on the air conditioning and began counting what we'd earned. To Jana's amazement, she had sold $300 worth of cassettes, $50 more than she earned all week working a freelance TV job she had taken to help make ends meet. Holding that $300 in her hand made Jana realize for the first time that she could support herself doing what she loved to do. Today, Jana's company, Keynote Concerts, produces more than 50 motivational concerts a year for groups all over the world. She started her own recording company, Relatively Famous Records, which produced nine of Jana's CDs and has sold well over 100,000 copies. Jana's songs have been recorded by Reba McIntyre, Andy Williams, Susie Boggess, John Schneider, and Megan McDonough. She's open for Kenny Loggins and toured with author Melody Beatty. Her heavy mental music has been featured on Oprah 2020, Entertainment Tonight, and radio stations coast to coast, as well as in the movie Eight Seconds. Jana Stanfield achieved her dream of becoming a songwriter and recording star, all because she leaned into it and trusted the path that appeared. You, too, can get from where you are to where you want to be, if you'll just trust that if you lean into it, the path will appear. Sometimes it'll be like driving through the fog, where you can only see the road ten yards ahead of you. But if you keep moving forward, more of the road will be revealed, and eventually you will arrive at the goal. Pick an area of your life, career, financial, relationship, health and fitness, recreation, hobby, or contribution, that you would like to explore, and just lean into it. Start now. Just do it. Of course, there is no perfect time to start. If you are into astrology and you want to contact your astrologer about an auspicious date to get married, open your store, launch a new product line, or begin a concert tour, okay, that's fine, I can understand that. But for everything else, the best strategy is to just jump in and get started. Lean into it. Don't keep putting things off waiting for twelve doves to fly over your house in the sign of a cross before you begin. Just start. You want to be a public speaker? Fine. 
schedule a free talk for a local service club, school, or church group. Just having a date will put the pressure on you to start researching and writing your speech. If that's too big of a stretch, then join Toastmasters and take a speech class. You want to be in the restaurant business? Go get a job in a restaurant and start learning the business. You want to be a chef? Great. Enroll in a cooking school. Take action and get started today. You do not have to know everything to get going. Just get into the game. You will learn by doing. First, you jump off the cliff and you build wings on the way down. Ray Bradbury, prolific American author of science fiction and fantasy. Don't get me wrong here. I am a big proponent of education, training, and skill building. If you need more training, then go and get it. Sign up for that class or that seminar now. You may need a coach or a mentor to get where you want to go. If so, then go get one. If you're afraid, so what? Feel the fear and do it anyway. The key is to just get started. Quit waiting until you are perfectly ready. You never will be. I started out my career as a history teacher in a Chicago high school. I was far from the perfect teacher on my first day of teaching school. I had a lot to learn about classroom control, effective discipline, how to avoid getting conned by a slick student, how to confront manipulative behavior, and how to motivate an unmotivated student. But I had to start anyway. And it was in the process of teaching that I learned all of those other things. Most of life is on the job training. Some of the most important things can only be learned in the process of doing them. You do something and you get feedback about what works and what doesn't. If you don't do anything for fear of doing it wrong, poorly, or badly, you never get any feedback, and therefore you never get to learn and improve. When I started my first business, a retreat and conference center in Amherst, Massachusetts, called the New England Center for Personal and Organizational Development, I went to a local bank to get a loan. The first bank I went to told me I needed to have a business plan. I didn't know what that was. But I went and bought a book on how to write a business plan. I wrote one up and took it to the bank. They told me there were a bunch of holes in my plan. I asked what they were, and they told me. I went back and rewrote the plan, filling in the areas I had left out or that were unclear or unconvincing. I then went back to the bank. They said the plan was good, but they wanted to pass. I asked them who might be willing to fund the plan. They gave me the names of several bankers in the area they thought might respond favorably. Again, I went off to bank after bank. Each one gave me more feedback until I had honed the plan and my presentation to the point where I did finally obtain the $20,000 loan that I needed. When Mark Victor Hansen and I first released Chicken Soup for the Soul, I thought it would be a good idea to sell the book in bulk quantity to some of the larger network marketing companies, thinking they could give them or resell them to their sales force to motivate them to believe in their dreams, take more risks, and therefore achieve greater success in selling. I got a list of all the companies that belong to the Direct Marketing Association, and I started cold-calling the sales directors of the larger companies. Sometimes I couldn't get the sales director to take my call. Other times I was told, we're not interested. Several times I was actually hung up on. But eventually, after getting better at getting through to the right decision-maker and properly discussing the book's potential benefits, I made several significant sales. A few of the companies liked the book so much, they later hired me to speak at their national conventions, all because I leaned into it. Was I a little scared making cold calls? Yes. Did I know what I was doing when I started? No. I had never tried to sell mass quantities of books to anyone before. I had to learn as I went. But the most important point is that I just got started. I got into communication with the people I wanted to serve, found out what their dreams, aspirations, and goals were, and explored how our book might help them in achieving their objectives. 
Everything unfolded because I was willing to take a risk and jump into the ring. You too have to begin, from wherever you are, to start taking the actions that will get you to where you want to be. Principle 15. Experience your fear and take action anyway. We come this way but once. We can either tiptoe through life and hope that we get to death without being too badly bruised, or we can live a full, complete life, achieving our goals and realizing our wildest dreams. Bob Proctor Self-made millionaire, radio and TV personality, success trainer, and featured teacher in the movie and book The Secret. As you move forward on your journey from where you are to where you want to be, you're going to have to confront your fears. Fear is natural. Whenever you start a new project, take on a new venture, or put yourself out there, there is usually fear. Unfortunately, most people let fear stop them from taking the necessary steps to achieve their dreams. Successful people, on the other hand, feel the fear, along with the rest of us, but don't let it keep them from doing anything they want to do, or have to do. They understand that fear is something to be acknowledged, experienced, and taken along for the ride. They have learned, as author Susan Jeffers suggests, to feel the fear and do it anyway. I consider Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers to be a must-read book. I endorse this book, saying, Should be required for every person who can read. Susan has been a friend for 20 years now, and her transformational work has helped millions of people move forward to create success in their lives. To find out more, visit www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Why are we so fearful? Millions of years ago, fear was our body's way of signaling us that we were out of our comfort zone. It alerted us to possible danger and gave us the burst of adrenaline we needed to run away. Unfortunately, though this response was useful in the days when saber-toothed tigers were chasing us, today most of our threats are not all that life-threatening. Today, fear is more of a signal that we must stay alert and cautious. We can feel fear, but we can still move forward anyway. Think of your fear as a two-year-old child who doesn't want to go grocery shopping with you. You wouldn't let a two-year-old's mentality run your life. Because you must buy groceries, you'll just have to take the two-year-old along with you. Fear is no different. In other words, acknowledge that fear exists, but don't let it keep you from doing important tasks. You have to be willing to feel the fear. Some people will do anything to avoid the uncomfortable feeling of fear. If you are one of those people, you run an even bigger risk of never getting what you want in life. Most of the good stuff requires taking a risk, and the nature of a risk is that it doesn't always work out. People do lose their investments. People do forget their lines. People do fall off mountains. People do die in accidents. But as the old adage so wisely tells us, nothing ventured, nothing gained. In 2009, Peter Douglas was a self-sufficient, successful businessman, rancher, and self-described cowboy who had pulled himself up by the bootstraps his whole life. As the result of a mistake made by the anesthesiologist during what was supposed to be a routine shoulder surgery, he found himself unable to grab his own bootstraps, much less pull on them. He woke up to discover that both his arms were totally paralyzed from the shoulders down. For the first time in his life, without the use of his hands, Peter felt helpless, which he describes as, that feeling you get when you know that you have to do something, but you just can't do it. After years of rehab, Peter still has only limited use of the fine motor skills in his hands. He has some triceps and forearm movement, and he can move his arms with difficulty, but as he describes it, his thumbs are not exactly opposable anymore. For the years following his surgery, he didn't go anywhere without his wife or someone else to help him, and he definitely wouldn't consider traveling by himself. The thought of being alone in a strange place terrified him. What if he needed help? What if he couldn't open his hotel room door by himself? What if? Then one day he decided enough was enough. 
Realizing that he was letting the fear of the unknown dictate his life and where he went, he finally made the decision to travel on his own. But each step of the way, he knew he would have to face and experience the fear of the next complication, obstacle, or stumbling block that might eventually cause him to throw up his hands, in theory at least, and say, that's it, I'm going home. But he was determined to work through the fear. And what he discovered is that, as he faced each fear, a solution appeared. Here's what Peter told me. Fear. I was afraid of the check-in at the airport. I didn't know if I'd have enough strength to swipe my credit card at the check-in kiosk. Solution. I asked the people at the airlines to help, and they were more than happy to assist. Fear. I was nervous about getting the seat belt buckled in. I wasn't sure I'd have enough grasp in my hand to do the task. Solution. The flight attendants were kind and helpful with the seat belt. Fear. I didn't know how I'd get things set up in my hotel room. Solution. Once I was in my room, the bell captain helped me unwrap the soap, set up the room, pull the curtains, unfold the covers, and unpack my luggage. Fear. I didn't know how I would get myself dressed flying solo. I still hadn't been able to get any of my clothes buttoned on my own. Solution. My wife packed all my shirts pre-buttoned, so I simply had to slip them on over my head. My pants had Velcro, so I could fasten them myself. My socks had loops that I could grab and pull. But there were still two buttons on my shirt that needed to be buttoned. Again, I asked for help. The first time I asked a hostess to do it, and she was taken aback. But now it's amazing. If I'm at the hotel for several days, the hostess will watch for me and step right up to help. Fear. I was afraid to eat by myself. I still can't cut meat, and I have difficulty with most flatware. Solution. I traveled with a special fork that allows me to feed myself. And now that I've traveled on my own several times, I can't tell you how many times people have offered to wash the fork for me and take special care of it. What I learned is that we have everything around us we need to erase fear. Just look to your left and to your right at the people around you. Are they strangers? Doesn't matter. There are amazing people at every step of my journey who don't just assist me. They literally jump at the chance to help another human being. The only way to find out if you can do something is to actually do it. As Peter says, it takes a little bit of trust, but the only way you will ever find out if you can fly solo is to experience your fear and take the leap and trust that you will be okay. Peter still experiences some anxiety when he travels on his own, but most of the fear is gone and has been replaced with gratitude for all the assistance people continue to offer him. The reason I know Peter's story is that after facing that he would never rope cattle again, he decided he would like to pursue a career as a public speaker and a trainer. Having heard me speak, and after reading in The Success Principles that success leaves clues, he decided to attend my Train the Trainer program. He has since written a book called Cowboy Leadership and designed a speech, seminar, and workshop all based on his Saddle Up philosophy. You can learn more about Peter Douglas and his work at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Fantasized Experiences Appearing Real Another important aspect to remember about fear is that, as humans, we've also evolved to the stage where almost all of our fears are now self-created. We frighten ourselves by fantasizing negative outcomes to any activity we might pursue. Luckily, because we are the ones doing the fantasizing, we are also the ones who can stop the fear by facing the actual facts, rather than giving in to our imaginations. We can choose to be sensible. Psychologists like to say that fear means fantasized experiences appearing real. To help you better understand how we actually bring unfounded fear into our lives, make a list of the things you are afraid to do. This is not a list of things you are afraid of, such as being afraid of spiders, but things you are afraid to do, such as being afraid to pick up a spider. For example, I am afraid to... Ask my boss for a raise. 
Ask Sally out for a date. Go skydiving. Leave my kids alone with a sitter. Leave this job that I hate. Ask my friends to look at my new business opportunity. Delegate any part of my job to others. Now go back and restate each fear using the following format. I want to blank. And I scare myself by imagining blank. The key words are, I scare myself by imagining. All fear is self-created by imagining some negative outcome in the future. Using some of the same fears listed here, the new format would look like this. I want to ask my boss for a raise, and I scare myself by imagining he would say no and be angry with me for asking. I want to ask Sally out for a date, and I scare myself by imagining that she would say no and I would feel embarrassed. I want to leave this job I hate to pursue my dream, and I scare myself by imagining I would go bankrupt and lose my house. I want to ask my friends to look at my new network marketing business opportunity, and I scare myself by imagining they will think I am only interested in making money off of them. I want to delegate part of my work to others, and I scare myself by imagining that they won't do it as well as I would. Can you see that you are the one creating the fear? How to get rid of fear I have lived a long life and had many troubles, most of which never happened. Mark Twain, celebrated American author and humorist. One way to actually disappear your fear is to ask yourself what you're imagining that is scary to you, and then replace that image with its positive opposite. When I was flying to Orlando recently to give a talk, I noticed the woman next to me was gripping the arms of her seat so tightly her knuckles were turning white. I introduced myself, told her I was a trainer, and said I couldn't help but notice her hands. I asked her, Are you afraid? Yes. Would you be willing to close your eyes and tell me what thoughts or images you are experiencing in your head? After she closed her eyes, she replied, I just keep imagining the plane not getting off the runway and crashing. I see. Tell me, what are you headed to Orlando for? I'm going there to spend four days with my grandchildren at Disney World. Great. What's your favorite ride at Disney World? It's a small world. Wonderful. Can you imagine being at Disney World in one of the gondolas with your grandchildren in the It's a Small World attraction? Yes. Can you see the smiles and the looks of wonder on your grandchildren's faces as they watch all the little puppets and figures from the different countries bobbing up and down and spinning around? Uh-huh. At that point, I started to sing, It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. Her face relaxed, her breathing deepened, and her hands released their grip on the arms of the seat. In her mind, she was already at Disney World. She had replaced the catastrophic picture of the plane crashing with a positive image of her desired outcome, and instantly her fear disappeared. You can use this same technique to disappear any fear that you might ever experience. Replace the physical sensations fear brings. Another technique that works for relieving fear is to focus on the physical sensations you're currently feeling, sensations you're probably just identifying as fear. Next, focus on those feelings you would like to be experiencing instead, courage, self-confidence, calm, joy. Fix these two different impressions firmly in your mind's eye. Then, slowly shuttle back and forth between the two, spending about 15 seconds in each one. After a minute or two, the fear will dissipate, and you will find yourself in a neutral, centered place. Remember when you triumphed in the face of fear. Did you ever learn to dive off a diving board? If so, you probably remember the first time you walked to the edge of the board and looked down. The water looked a lot deeper than it really was, and considering the height of the board and the height of your eyes above the board, it probably looked like a very long way down. You were scared. But did you look at your mom or dad or the diving instructor and say, You know, I'm just too afraid to do this right now. I think I'll do some therapy on this, and if I can get rid of my fear, 
I'll come back and try again. No, you didn't say that. You felt the fear, somehow mustered up courage from somewhere, and jumped into the water. You felt the fear and did it anyway. When you surfaced, you probably swam like crazy to the side of the pool and took a few well-earned deep breaths. Somewhere there was a little rush of adrenaline, the thrill of having survived a risk, plus the thrill of jumping through the air into the water. After a minute, you probably did it again, and then again and again, enough to where it got to be really fun. Pretty soon, all of the fear was gone, and you were doing cannonballs to splash your friends, and maybe even learning how to do a backflip. If you can remember that experience, or the first time you drove a car, or the first time you kissed someone on a date, you've got the model for everything that happens in life. New experiences may feel a little scary. That's the way it works. But every time you face a fear and do it anyway, you build up that much more confidence in your abilities. Scale down the risk. Anthony Robbins says, If you can't, you must, and if you must, you can. I agree. It is those very things that we are most afraid to do that provide the greatest liberation and growth for us. If a fear is so big that it paralyzes you, scale down the amount of risk, take on smaller challenges, and work your way up. If you're starting your first job in sales, call on prospects or customers you think will be the easiest to sell to first. If you're asking for money for your business, practice on those lending sources whom you wouldn't want to get a loan from anyway. If you're anxious about taking on new responsibilities at work, start by asking to do parts of a project you're interested in. If you're learning a new sport, start at lower levels of skill. Master those skills you need to learn, move through your fears, and then take on bigger challenges. When your fear is really a phobia. Some fears are so strong that they can actually immobilize you. If you have a full-blown phobia, such as fear of flying or fear of being in an elevator, it can seriously inhibit your ability to be successful. Fortunately, there is a simple solution to most phobias. The 5-Minute Phobia Cure, developed by Dr. Roger Callahan, is easy to learn and can be self-administered as well as facilitated by a professional. I learned about this magical technique from Dr. Callahan's book and video and have used it successfully in my seminars for more than 15 years. If you have a phobia that is holding you back, visit www.rogercallahan.com for a free guide and other self-help materials. You can also schedule private consultations or find a practitioner near you at www.tftpractitioners.net. The process uses a simple but precise pattern of tapping on various acupressure points of the body while you simultaneously imagine the object or experience that stimulates your phobic reaction. It acts in much the same way as a virus in a computer program, by permanently interrupting the program or sequence of events that occur in the brain between the initial sighting of the thing you are afraid of, such as seeing a snake or stepping into an airplane, and the physical response, such as sweating, shaking, shallow breathing, or weak knees you experience. When I was leading a seminar for real estate agents, a woman revealed that she had a phobia about walking upstairs. In fact, she had experienced it that very morning, when in response to her request for directions to the seminar, the bellman had pointed to a huge staircase leading to the grand ballroom. Fortunately, there was also an elevator, so she made it to the seminar. If there hadn't been, she would have turned around and driven home. She admitted that she had never been on the second floor of any home she had ever sold. She would pretend she had already been up there, tell the prospective buyers what they would find on the second floor on the basis of her reading of the listing sheet, and then let them explore it on their own. I did the five-minute phobia cure with her, and then took all 100 people out to the same hotel stairway that had petrified her earlier in the day. With no hesitation, heavy breathing, or drama, she walked up and down the stairs twice. It is that simple. Take a leap. Come to the edge, he said. 
They said, We are afraid. Come to the edge, he said. They came. He pushed them, and they flew. Guillaume Apollinaire, avant-garde French poet. All the successful people I know have been willing to take a chance, a leap of faith, even though they were afraid. Sometimes they were terrified, but they knew if they didn't act, the opportunity would pass them by. They trusted their intuition, and they simply went for it. Progress always involves risk. You can't steal second base and keep your foot on first. Frederick Wilcox, American author. Mike Kelly lives in paradise and owns several companies under the umbrella of beach activities of Maui. With only a year of college under his belt, he never did return to get his degree. Mike left Las Vegas at age 19 for the islands of Hawaii and ended up selling suntan lotion by the pool at a hotel in Maui. From these humble beginnings, Mike went on to create a company with 175 employees and over $5 million in annual revenues that provides catamaran and scuba diving excursions for tourists, plus concierge services and business centers for many of the island's hotels. Mike credits much of his success to always being willing to take a leap when needed. When Beach Activities of Maui was attempting to expand its business, there was an important hotel whose business he wanted, but a competitor had held the contract for over 15 years. To maintain a competitive edge, Mike always reads the trade journals and keeps an ear open to what is happening in his business. One day he read that this hotel was changing general managers, and the new general manager who would be coming in lived in Copper Mountain, Colorado. This got Mike thinking. Because it's so hard to get through all of the gatekeepers to secure a meeting with the general manager, maybe he should try to contact him before he actually moved to Hawaii. Mike wrestled with what would be the best way to contact him. Should he write a letter? Should he call him on the phone? As he pondered these options, his friend Doug suggested, Why don't you just hop on a plane and go see him? Always one to take action and take it now. Mike quickly put together a pro forma and a proposal and hopped on a plane the next night. After flying all night, he arrived in Colorado, rented a car, and drove the two hours out to Copper Mountain, showing up unannounced at the new general manager's office. Mike explained who he was, congratulated the general manager on his new promotion, told him that he looked forward to having him in Maui, and asked for a few moments to tell him about beach activities of Maui and what it could do for his hotel. Mike didn't get the contract during that first meeting. But the fact that a young kid was so confident in himself and his business that he would take a leap of faith, jump on a plane, fly all the way to Denver, then drive out into the middle of Colorado on the off chance that he would be able to meet in person, left such a huge impression on the general manager that, when he did finally get to Hawaii, he awarded Mike the contract which was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to Mike's bottom line over the ensuing 15 years. Taking a leap can transform your life. Authority is 20% given and 80% taken. So take it. Peter Uberoth, organizer of the 1984 Summer Olympics and commissioner of Major League Baseball, 1984-1988. Multi-millionaire Dr. John Demartini is a resounding success by anyone's standards. He owns several homes in Australia. He spent over 60 days a year for several years together circumnavigating the globe with his wife in their $3 million luxury apartment on board the $550 million Osher liner World of Residency a residence they purchased after selling their Trump Tower apartment in New York City. The author of 54 training programs and 13 books, and a featured teacher in the movie The Secret, John spends the year traveling the world speaking and conducting his courses on financial success and life mastery. But John didn't start out rich and successful. At age seven, he was found to have a learning disability and was told that he would never read, write, or communicate normally. At 14, he dropped out of school, left his Texas home, and headed for the California coast. By 17, he had ended up in Hawaii, 
surfing the waves of Oahu's famed North Shore, where he almost died from strychnine poisoning. His road to recovery led him to Dr. Paul Bragg, a 93-year-old man who changed John's life by giving him one simple affirmation to repeat, I am a genius, and I apply my wisdom. Inspired by Dr. Bragg, John went to college, earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Houston, and later earned his doctoral degree from the Texas College of Chiropractic. When he opened his first chiropractic office in Houston, John started with just 970 square feet of space. Within nine months, he'd more than doubled that and was offering free classes on healthy living. When attendance grew, John was ready to expand again. It was then that he took a leap that changed his career forever. It was Monday, John said. The shoe store next door had vacated over the weekend. What a perfect lecture hall, John thought, as he quickly phoned the leasing company. When no one called him back, John concluded they weren't going to rent the space soon. So he took a leap. I called the locksmith to come out and open up the place, John said. I thought the worst thing they would do was charge me rent. He quickly transformed the space into a lecture hall, and within days was holding free talks there on a nightly basis. Because the space was located right next to a movie theater, he added a loudspeaker so moviegoers could hear his lectures as they walked to their cars. Hundreds began attending classes and eventually became patients. John's practice grew rapidly. Yet nearly six months went by before the property manager came to investigate. You've got a lot of courage, the manager said. You remind me of me. In fact, he was so impressed with John's daring, he even gave John six months free rent. Anybody that has the courage to do what you did deserves it, he told him. The manager later invited John down to his office, where he offered him a quarter of a million dollars a year to come to work for him. John turned it down because he had other plans but it was a huge validation of his courage to act. Taking a leap helped John build a thriving practice, which he later sold to begin consulting full-time with other chiropractors. Taking that leap opened up a doorway for me, John said. If I'd held back, if I had been cautious, I wouldn't have made the breakthrough that gave me the life I live today. Do you want to be safe and good? Or do you want to take a chance and be great? Jimmy Johnson, coach who led the Dallas Cowboys football team to two consecutive Super Bowl championships in 1992 and 1993. High intention, low attachment. If you want to remain calm and peaceful as you go through life, you have to have high intention and low attachment. You do anything you can to create your desired outcomes and then you let it go. Sometimes you don't get the intended result by the date that you want. That is life. You just keep moving in the direction of your goal until you get there. Sometimes the universe has other plans, and often they are better than the ones you had in mind. That is why I recommend adding the phrase, this or something better, to the end of your affirmations. When I was vacationing with my family on a cruise in Tahiti one summer, my son Christopher and my stepson Travis, both twelve at the time, and I set out on a guided bicycle tour around the island of Bora Bora with some other members from our cruise ship. My intention for the day was a bonding experience with my two sons. The wind was blowing really hard that day, and the trip was a difficult one. At one point, Stevie Eller, who was struggling along with her eleven-year-old grandson, took a nasty fall and badly cut her leg. Because there were only a few others in the back of the pack with us, we stayed behind to help her. There were no homes or stores, and virtually no traffic on the far side of the island, meaning that there was no way to call for help. So after attempting some crude first aid, we decided to all push on together. Bored with the slow pace, my boys took off ahead, and I spent the next several hours pedaling and walking next to my new friend, until we eventually reached a hotel where she called for a taxi, and I rejoined my sons, who had stopped for a swim. That night, Stevie and her husband, Carl, asked us to join their family for dinner. It turned out that they were on the nominating committee for the International Achievement Summit 
sponsored by the Academy of Achievement. Its mission? To inspire youth with new dreams of achievement in a world of boundless opportunity by bringing together over 200 university and graduate student delegates from around the world to interact with contemporary leaders who have achieved the difficult or impossible in service to their fellow humans. After our time together, they decided to nominate me to become a member of the Academy and receive their Golden Plate Award, joining previous recipients such as former President Bill Clinton, Placido Domingo, George Lucas, New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, U.S. Senator John McCain, former Prime Minister of Israel Shimon Peres, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Because my nomination was accepted, I was able to attend the annual four-day event with some of the brightest young future leaders and some of the most interesting and accomplished people in the world in 2004, and will be able to attend future meetings when I want to. Had I been totally attached to my original outcome of the day with my two sons and left Stevie to the care of others, I would have missed an even bigger opportunity that spontaneously came my way. I have learned over the years that whenever one door seemingly closes, another door opens. You just have to keep positive, stay aware, and look to see what it is. Instead of getting upset when things don't unfold as you anticipated, always remember to ask yourself the question, What's the possibility that this is? Principle 16 be willing to pay the price. If people knew how hard I had to work to gain my mastery, it wouldn't seem wonderful at all. Michelangelo, Renaissance sculptor and painter who spent four years lying on his back painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Behind every great achievement is a story of education, training, practice, discipline, and sacrifice. You have to be willing to pay the price. Maybe that price is pursuing one single activity while putting everything else in your life on hold. Maybe it's investing all of your own personal wealth or savings. Maybe it's the willingness to walk away from the safety of your current situation. But though many things are typically required to reach a successful outcome, the willingness to do what's required adds that extra dimension to the mix that helps you persevere in the face of overwhelming challenges, setbacks, pain, and even personal injury. Pain is only temporary. The benefits last forever. I remember back to the 1976 Summer Olympic Games, when the men's gymnastic competition captured the attention of the world. With the roar of the crowd in the background, Japan's Shun Fujimoto landed a perfect triple somersault twist dismount from the rings to clinch the gold medal in team gymnastics. With his face contorted in pain and his teammates holding their breath, Fujimoto followed a near-flawless routine by achieving a stunning and perfect landing on a broken right knee. It was an extraordinary display of courage and commitment. Interviewed later about the win, Fujimoto revealed that even though he had injured his knee during the earlier floor exercise, it became apparent as the competition continued that the team gold medal would be decided by the ring's apparatus, his strongest result. The pain shot through me like a knife, he said. It brought tears to my eyes. But now I have a gold medal, and the pain is gone. What was it that gave Fujimoto his extraordinary courage in the face of excruciating pain and the very real risk of serious injury? It was a willingness to pay the price, and probably a long history of paying the price every day on the road to simply winning a spot to compete in the Olympics. Practice, practice, practice. When I played with Michael Jordan on the Olympic team, there was a huge gap between his ability and the ability of the other great players on that team. But what impressed me was that he was always the first one on the floor and the last one to leave. Steve Alford Olympic gold medalist, NBA player, and head basketball coach at the University of Iowa. Before Bill Bradley became a U.S. Senator from New Jersey, he was an amazing basketball player. 
He was an All-American at Princeton University, won an Olympic gold medal in 1964, played in the NBA championships with the New York Knicks, and was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. How did he do so well at his sport? Well, for one thing, when he was in high school, he practiced for four hours a day, every day. In his memoir, Time Present, Time Past, Bradley offers the following account of his self-imposed basketball training regimen. I stayed behind to practice after my teammates had left. My practice routine was to end by making 15 baskets in a row from each of five spots on the floor. If he missed a shot, he would start over from the beginning. He continued this practice all through his college and professional career. He developed this strong commitment to practice when he attended summer basketball camps for high school players sponsored by the St. Louis Hawks' Easy Ed McCauley, where he learned the importance of practicing. When you're not practicing, someone somewhere is. And when the two of you meet, given roughly equal ability, he will win. Bill took that advice to heart. The hours of hard work paid off. Bill Bradley scored over 3,000 points in four years of high school basketball. Olympic athletes pay the price. I learned that the only way you are going to get anywhere in life is to work hard at it. Whether you're a musician, a writer, an athlete, or a businessman, there is no getting around it. If you do, you'll win. If you don't, you won't. Bruce Jenner, Olympic gold medalist in the decathlon. According to John Troop, writing in USA Today, the average Olympian trains four hours a day at least 310 days a year for six years before succeeding. Getting better begins with working out every day. By 7 a.m., most athletes have done more than many people do all day. Given equal talent, the better trained athlete can generally outperform the one who did not give a serious effort and is usually more confident at the starting block. The four years before an Olympics, Greg Louganis probably practiced each of his dives 3,000 times. Kim Semeskel has probably done every flip in her gymnastics routine at least 20,000 times. And Janet Evans has completed more than 240,000 laps. Training works, but it isn't easy or simple. Swimmers train an average of 10 miles a day at speeds of 5 miles per hour in the pool. That might not sound fast but their heart rates average 160 the entire time. Try running up a flight of stairs, then check your heart rate. Then imagine having to do that for four hours. Marathon runners average 160 miles a week at 10 miles per hour. Consider the workout schedule of Michael Phelps, with 22 medals the most decorated Olympic athlete of all time. He was usually at the pool by 6.30 a.m., where he would swim for an average of six hours a day. That's around eight miles a day. He swam six days a week, including holidays. In addition to time in the pool, he lifted weights to add explosive speed to his regimen, spending an hour three days a week lifting weights, as well as an hour three days a week stretching his muscles. Although most of you reading this will never become Olympic athletes, nor do you want to, you can become world-class in whatever you do by putting in the disciplined effort to excel at your chosen trade, craft, or profession. To win at whatever game you choose to play, you need to be willing to pay the price. It's not the will to win that matters. Everyone has that. It's the will to prepare to win that matters. Paul Bear Bryant, college football's winningest coach, with 323 victories, including six national championships and 13 Southeastern Conference titles. Practice specific things consistently. Practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing you do that makes you good. Malcolm Gladwell, author of Outliers, The Story of Success. While many athletes, musicians, dancers, comedians, and other gifted people practice their sports skills, dance variations, and other routines on a regular basis, Dr. Christine Carter, a sociologist at UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center, 
says elite performers differ in their approach to practice time. Not only do top performers practice more than people of average talent, but they spend hours upon hours in what she calls deliberate practice. Rather than merely plunking away at the keyboard because it is fun, they practice to reach specific objectives, such as to play a new piece that is just beyond their reach. In the beginning, Dr. Carter continues, they may also practice a new phrase or even a single measure again and again and again. While deliberate practice is rarely pleasurable, usually difficult, and quite often boring, an elite performer's willingness to practice in this goal-oriented way is what sets the world's best apart from people who are merely good at something. In other words, they don't just practice for fun. They practice specific things consistently over a long period of time. Consider this quote from Jeffrey Colvin, author of Talent is Overrated, What Really Separates World-Class Performers from Everybody Else. The reality that deliberate practice is hard can even be seen as good news. It means that most people won't do it, so your willingness to do it will distinguish you all the more. What's more, numerous studies now show this commitment to practicing toward a specific goal is what helps elite performers overcome a lack of innate talent or prevail over deficiencies in their physical body. Since consistent practice can actually help develop better physical characteristics, such as perfect pitch, more flexible joints, higher octaves, and other attributes. Legendary violinist Isaac Stern was once confronted by a middle-aged woman after a concert. She gushed, Oh, I'd give my life to play like you. Lady, said Stern acidly, that I did. Determined to be an artist at any cost. In the 1970s, Wylan was the classic starving artist who threw everything into his dream. He painted and he hustled. He would set up art shows at his local high school and sell original paintings for just $35, knowing that the only way he could develop as an artist was to sell his paintings for whatever he could get to earn enough money to buy the necessary supplies he needed to create more. Then one day, in what was to become a defining moment for the young artist, Wyland's mother told him, Art really isn't a job. It's a hobby. Now go out and get a real job. The next day, she dropped him off at the Detroit Unemployment Bureau. But to Wyland's dismay, he was fired from three different jobs three days in a row. He couldn't keep his mind on the boring factory work. He wanted to be creative and paint. A week later, he built the studio in the basement and worked day and night creating a portfolio that eventually won him a full scholarship to art school in Detroit. Wyland painted every moment he could and he managed to sell some paintings. But for years, he just managed to scrape by. But because he was determined that art was the only thing he wanted to do, he continued to work and hone his craft. One day, Wylan realized he had to go where other artists flourished and where new ideas were born. His destination was the well-known art colony of Laguna Beach, California, and with his dream fully alive, he moved into a cramped, tiny studio where he both worked and lived for several more years. Eventually, he was invited to participate in the annual art festival, where he learned to talk about his work and interact with collectors. Soon after, galleries in Hawaii discovered him, but often sold his paintings without ever paying him, claiming their overhead was high. Out of the frustration of finally selling high-priced paintings, only to have the money disappear. Wyland realized he had to own his own galleries. In his own galleries, he could control every aspect of selling his art, from how it was framed and hung to how it was sold and who it was sold by. Today, 36 years after opening his first gallery in Laguna Beach, he creates as many as 1,000 works of art a year, some of which sell for $200,000 apiece creates artistic collaborations with the people at Disney, owns four homes in Hawaii, California, and Florida, and lives the life he always dreamed of. Perhaps you, like Wylan, want to turn your hobby into a career. You can become hugely successful doing what you love if you are willing to pay the price. 
In the beginning, you've got to kind of suffer, Wyland says, giving in to everybody else. But there's nothing better than eventually achieving success on your own terms. Willing to do whatever it takes. Gordon Whiskey found his passion at an early age. When he was six years old, his parents took him to see his first movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Two hours later, he knew that what he wanted to do with his life was make movies. Growing up in Toronto, Canada, he made it through high school making short films with friends on outdated equipment. But they were enough to slap together a demo reel that got him accepted to a top film program at a Canadian university. He did well there until his third year, when he made a decision that threatened to derail him on the way to his dream. With only three edit suites available for 150 students to edit their films on, he constantly found himself unable to book an edit suite. That's when he made the choice to take matters into his own hands and stole the security pass card from one of his professors so he could sneak in and work from midnight to 5 a.m. to finish his film. For the first week, everything went well. When week two rolled around, he invited two of his buddies to come in so they, too, could work on their film projects in the neighboring edit suites. But in the third week, having finished their film projects, they decided to celebrate in their secret haven with their girlfriends and booze. At the height of the party, the campus police busted in on them, and Gordon was expelled from the university. Gordon suddenly found himself with no degree and a pending trespassing charge. Still wanting to get into the film business, he gathered what little confidence he had left and went knocking at all the studio doors asking for a job, any job, even offering to work for free. He was met with the same old cliché. Don't call us, kid. We'll call you. Two weeks went by and his phone didn't ring once. And then it hit him. If I'm going to make it in this business, I'm going to have to stand out from all the rest and never take no for an answer. At the time, Toronto hadn't quite hit major studios' status yet, and most production offices were dirty old steel mills converted into sound stages. It's hard to imagine now, but it was so bad that whenever it would rain, film production would grind to a halt due to the echoing sound of raindrops pelting down on the tin-plated rooftops. Knowing the grimy conditions, the second time when Gordon visited each rundown studio and production office that had rejected him, he went armed with a bottle of Windex and a roll of paper towels, and asked for permission to clean their toilets. Some laughed, as they weren't sure if he was serious or not, while others gladly said yes, following it with, But kid, I'm still not going to hire you. Gordon did this every day for a week each day religiously cleaning the dirtiest of dirty production office toilets that had once been graced by steel workers. He encountered dirt on top of dirt. But Gordon worked until that porcelain shined. He also made sure to leave his phone number and name credit behind. Because one thing he had learned about the film business is how important your name credit is. In fact, on the back of every stall door, he attached the following sign to his film resume. Washroom cleaned by Gordon. Looking to get my foot in the world of film. Will work for food. Even though his film resume and experience on paper was slim, he made sure his work spoke for him with the cleanest toilets in town. Think about it. What a perfect place to hang your resume and get someone's undivided attention while they're sitting on the toilet with nothing else to do but read what's hanging in front of them. At the time and unknown to Gordon. There was a team of Los Angeles producers scouting Toronto to see if the city was a suitable match for Boston, the setting for a film they were looking to shoot. It turned out that, in every production office they visited, they noticed a resume inside the toilet stall. It actually became a game of theirs to look into each production office facility to see if Gordon's resume was hanging there. One night, Gordon's phone rang, and he was hired by the Los Angeles producers for two weeks, happily working for food and gas money as he ran errands for them. When the two weeks were up, they called him into their hotel room and shared the good news. The movie had just been given the green light and was going to be called Goodwill Hunting. Even better news, 
The producers made Gordon the personal assistant to Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, who at the time were relatively unknown actors, but were about to become superstars. Because of his willingness to pay the price and do whatever it took, within a month of being expelled from film school and having his dreams crushed, he ended up working on an Academy Award-winning film that changed his life. After the success of Goodwill Hunting, Gordon went on to work on a long list of Hollywood blockbuster films for some of the industry's biggest names, including Steve Martin, Hugh Jackman, John Travolta, Charlize Theron, Gene Hackman, Michelle Pfeiffer, Helen Mirren, Forrest Whitaker, and Morgan Freeman. In 2011, Gordon was asked to join the DreamWorks development team, working alongside his personal hero, Steven Spielberg, the director of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the movie that had originally inspired Gordon's dream. Today, Gordon is the president of Canwood Entertainment, a global entertainment company headquartered in Toronto, Canada. And the sweetest part of the story? Not only has Gordon been invited many times to speak to the graduating class of the university that expelled him, they dismissed all trespassing charges. Putting in the time The big secret in life is that there is no secret. Whatever is your goal, you can get there if you are willing to work. Oprah Winfrey Talk show host, actress, producer, author, and philanthropist. Part of paying the price is the willingness to do whatever it takes to get the job done, no matter what it takes, no matter how long it takes, no matter what comes up. It's a done deal. You are responsible for the results you intend. No excuses. Just a world-class performance or an outstanding result that can be counted on. Consider this. Ernest Hemingway rewrote A Farewell to Arms 39 times. This dedication to excellence would later lead him to win the Pulitzer and Nobel Prizes for Literature. M. Scott Peck received only a $7,500 advance for The Road Less Traveled. However, he was willing to pay the price to fulfill his dream. During the first year after it was published, he participated in 1,000 radio interviews to advertise and promote his book. He continued to do a minimum of one interview a day for the next 13 years, keeping the book on the New York Times bestsellers list for over 694 weeks, or more than 13 years, a record, and selling more than 10 million copies in over 20 languages. Michael Crichton created the Emmy Award-winning television series E.R., his books have sold over 200 million copies in 30 languages, and 14 have been made into films, seven of which he directed. His books and films include Jurassic Park, The Andromeda Strain, Congo, Twister, and Westworld. He is the only person to have had, at the same time, the number one book, the number one movie, and the number one television show in the United States. With all of his natural talent, Michael said, Books aren't written. They're rewritten. It's one of the hardest things to accept, especially after the seventh rewrite hasn't quite done it. Talent is cheaper than table salt. What separates the talented individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. Stephen King, best-selling author with over 50 books in print, many of which have been made into movies such as Carrie, Cujo, and The Green Mile. It's about building momentum. When a NASA rocket takes off from Cape Canaveral, it uses up a large portion of its total fuel just to overcome the gravitational pull of the Earth. Once it has achieved that, it can virtually coast through space for the rest of its journey. Likewise, an amateur athlete often puts in full training days with Spartan self-discipline for years. But after winning a gold medal or a world championship— Offers for endorsements, spokesperson contracts, speaking engagements, retail merchandise deals, and other entrepreneurial opportunities often come pouring in, allowing them to slow down a bit and take advantage of the momentum they created earlier in their career. Likewise, in any business or profession, once you have paid the price to establish yourself as an expert, 
a person of integrity who delivers high-quality results on time, you get to reap the benefits of that for the rest of your life. When I started speaking, no one had ever heard of me. As I delivered more and more speeches and seminars that delivered what the client wanted, my reputation grew. I had a file full of glowing testimonial letters and a track record of credibility that was built up over many years of giving free and low-fee talks until I had honed my craft. The same was true for writing books. It took many years to get good at it. If you are involved in network marketing, you have to put in countless hours in the beginning, not getting paid what you are worth. You may work for months with no real income, but eventually the multiplier effect of your growing downline takes effect, and eventually you are making more money than you ever imagined possible. Creating momentum is an important part of the success process. In fact, successful people know that if you are willing to pay the price in the beginning, you can reap the benefits for the rest of your life. Going Through the Awkward Stage Business consultant Marshall Thurber has said, Anything worth doing well is worth doing badly in the beginning. Remember when you first learned to drive a car, to ride a bicycle, to play an instrument, or to play a sport? You understood in advance that you were going to be very awkward at first. You assumed that awkwardness was just part of what was required to learn that new skill that you wanted. Well, not surprisingly, this initial awkwardness applies to anything you undertake, so you have to be willing to go through that awkward stage in order to become proficient. Children give themselves permission to do this, but sadly, by the time we're adults, we are so often afraid of making a mistake that we don't let ourselves be awkward, so we don't learn the way children do. We're so afraid of doing it wrong. I didn't learn to ski until I was in my forties. In the beginning, I was definitely not good at it. Over time, with lessons, I got better. Even the first time I kissed a girl, it was awkward. But to gain a skill or get better at anything you want to do, you have to be willing to keep on going in the face of looking foolish and feeling stupid for a time. Find out the price you have to pay. Of course, if you don't know what the price is, you can't choose to pay it. Sometimes the first step is to investigate the steps that will be required to achieve your desired goal. For example, many people, perhaps you, say they want to own a yacht. But have you ever researched how much money you would have to earn to buy one? Or how much it costs to harbor the yacht in your local marina? Or how much the monthly maintenance, fuel, insurance, and license cost? You may need to research what costs others have had to pay to achieve dreams similar to yours. You might want to make a list of several people who have already done what you want to do and interview them about what sacrifices they had to make along the way. You may discover that some costs are more than you want to pay. You may not want to risk your health, your relationships, or your entire life savings for a certain goal. You have to weigh all of the factors. That dream job may not be worth your marriage, your kids, or a lack of balance in your life. Only you can decide what is right for you and what price you are willing to pay. It may be that what you want doesn't serve you in the long run, but if it does, find out what you need to do and then set about doing it. Principle 17. Ask ask, ask. You've got to ask. Asking is, in my opinion, the world's most powerful and neglected secret to success and happiness. Percy Ross, self-made multimillionaire and philanthropist. History is filled with examples of incredible riches and astounding benefits people have received simply by asking for them. Yet surprisingly, asking one of the most powerful success principles of all, is still a challenge that holds most people back. If you are not afraid to ask anybody for anything, then skip over this chapter. But if you are like most people, you may be holding yourself back by not asking for the information, assistance, support, money, and time that you need to fulfill your vision 
and make your dreams come true. Why people are afraid to ask. Why are people so afraid to ask? They are afraid of many things, such as looking needy, looking foolish, and looking stupid. But mostly they're afraid of experiencing rejection. They're afraid of hearing the word no. The sad thing is that they're actually rejecting themselves in advance. They're saying no to themselves before anyone else even has a chance to. When I was a graduate student at the School of Education at the University of Chicago, I participated in a self-development group with 20 other people. During one of the exercises, one of the men asked one of the women if she found him attractive. I was both shocked by the boldness of the question and embarrassed for the asker, fearing what he might get as a response. As it turned out, she said that she did. Emboldened by his success, I then asked her if she found me attractive. After this little exercise in bold asking, several of the women told us that they found it unbelievable how scared men were when it came to asking women for a date. She said, You reject yourself before you even give us a chance to. Take the risk. We might say yes. Don't assume that you are going to get a no. Take the risk to ask for whatever you need and want. If they say no, you are no worse off than when you started. If they say yes, you are a lot better off. Just by being willing to ask, you can get a raise, a donation, a room with an ocean view, a discount, a free sample, a date, a better assignment, a more convenient delivery date, an extension, time off, or help with the housework. How You Ask for What You Want there's a specific science to asking for and getting what you want or need in life, and Mark Victor Hansen and I have written a whole book about it. And though I recommend you learn more by reading our book, The Aladdin Factor, here are some quick tips to get you started. 1. Ask as if you expect to get it. Ask with a positive expectation. Ask from the place that you have already been given it. It's a done deal. Ask as if you expect to get a yes. 2. Assume you can. Don't start with the assumption that you can't get it. If you are going to assume anything, assume you can get an upgrade. Assume you can get a table by the window. Assume that you can return it without a sales slip. Assume that you can get a scholarship, that you can get a raise, that you can get tickets at this late date. Don't ever assume against yourself. 3. Ask someone who can give it to you. Qualify the person. Who would I have to speak to to get? Who is authorized to make a decision about? What would have to happen for me to get? 4. Be clear and specific. In my seminars, I often ask, Who wants more money? I pick someone who raises a hand, and I give that person a dollar. I say, You now have more money. Are you satisfied? The person usually says, No, I want more than that. So I give the person a couple of quarters and ask, Is that enough for you? No, I want more than that. Well, just how much do you want? We could play this game of more for days and never get to what you want. The person usually gives me a specific number, and then I point out how important it is to be specific. Vague requests produce vague results. Your requests need to be specific. When it comes to money, you need to ask for a specific amount. Don't say, I want a raise. Do say, I want a raise of $500 a month. When it comes to when you want something done, don't say soon or whenever it's convenient. Give a specific date and time. Don't say, I want to spend some time with you this weekend. Do say, I would like to go out for dinner and a movie with you on Saturday night. Would that work for you? When it comes to a behavioral request, be specific. Say exactly what you want the person to do. Don't say, I want more help around the house. Do say, I want you to wash the dishes every night after dinner and take out the garbage Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights. 
5. Ask repeatedly. One of the most important principles of success is persistence, not giving up. Whenever you're asking others to participate in the fulfillment of your goals, some people are going to say no. They may have other priorities, commitments, and reasons not to participate. It's not a reflection on you. Just get used to the idea that there's going to be a lot of rejection along the way to your goal. The key is not to give up. When someone says no, you keep on asking. Why? Because when you keep on asking, even the same person, again and again, you might get a yes on a different day, when the person is in a better mood, when you have new data to present, after you've proven your commitment to them, when circumstances have changed, when you've learned how to close better, when the person trusts you more, when you have paid your dues, when the economy is better. Kids understand this success principle perhaps better than anyone. They will ask the same person for the same thing over and over again without any hesitation. They eventually wear you down. I once read a story in People magazine about a man who asked the same woman more than 30 times to marry him. No matter how many times she said no, he kept coming back. And eventually she said yes. A Telling Statistic Herbert True, a marketing specialist at Notre Dame University, found that 44% of all salespeople quit trying to sell to a prospect after the first call. 24% quit after the second call. 14% quit after the third call. 12% quit trying to sell their prospect after the fourth call. This means that 94% of all salespeople quit by the fourth call. But 60% of all sales are made after the fourth call. This revealing statistic shows that 94% of all salespeople don't give themselves a chance at 60% of the prospective buyers. You may have the capacity, but you also have to have the tenacity. To be successful, you have to ask, 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 ask. Ask. As one of my students recently joked, you have to become an ask hole. Ask, and it shall be given to you. A few years ago, Sylvia Collins flew all the way from Australia to Santa Barbara to take one of my week long seminars, where she learned about the power of asking. A year later, I received this letter from her I'm selling real estate developments on the Gold Coast and work with a team of guys mostly in their twenties. The skills I've acquired through your seminars have helped me perform to be an active part of a winning team. I must tell you how having self-esteem and not being afraid to ask has impacted this office. At a recent staff meeting, we were asked what we would like to do for our once-a-month team-building day. I asked Michael, the managing director, what target would we have to reach for you to take us to an island for a week? Everyone went silent and looked at me. Obviously, it was out of everyone's comfort zone to ask such a thing. Michael looked around and then looked at me and said, Well, if you reach... And then he set a financial target. I'll take the whole team, ten of us, to the Great Barrier Reef. Well, the next month we reached the target, and off we went to Lady Elliot Island for four days. Airfare, accommodations, food, and activities all paid by the company. We snorkeled together, had bonfires on the beach, played tricks on each other, and had so much fun. Afterwards, Michael gave us another target and said he would take us to Fiji if we reached it. And we reached that target in December. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain by asking. To be successful, you have to take risks. And one of the risks is the willingness to risk rejection. Here's an email I received from Donna Hutcherson, who heard me speak at her company's convention in Scottsdale, Arizona. My husband Dale and I heard you at the Walsworth convention in early January. Dale came as one of the spouses. He was particularly impressed by your mention of not having anything to lose by asking or trying. After hearing you speak, he decided to go for one of his lifetime goals and heart's desire, 
a head football coaching position. He applied for four openings within my sales territory, and Sebring High School called him back the next day, encouraging him to fill out the application online. He did so right away and could hardly sleep that night. After two interviews, he was chosen over 61 other applicants. Today, Dale accepted the position as head football coach at Sebring High School in Sebring, Florida. Thank you for your vision and inspiration. A year later, I heard from Donna again. Having taken over a program with back-to-back -back seasons of one win, nine losses, and a reputation for giving up, Dale led the Sebring High School team to a winning record, including four games where the team came from behind to win in the final three minutes of the game. Not only that, but Dale also coached the team to a county championship and the playoffs for only the third time in the 78-year history of the school. He was named County Coach of the Year and Sports Story of the Year. Most important, though, is that he changed the lives of the many players, staff, and students with whom he worked. Will you give me some money? In 1997, 21-year-old Chad Pogracki set out on a one-man mission to clean up the Mississippi River. He started with a 20-foot boat and his own two hands. When Chad realized he would need more than his 20-foot boat, barges, trucks, and equipment, he asked state and local officials for help, only to be turned down. Not to be dissuaded, Chad grabbed a phone book, turned to the business listings, and called Alcoa. Because, he said, it started with an A. Armed with only his passionate commitment to his dream, Chad asked to speak to the top guy. Eventually, Alcoa gave him $8,400. Later, working his way through the A's, he called Anheuser-Busch. As reported in Smithsonian Magazine, Mary Alice Ramirez, the director of environmental outreach at Anheuser-Busch, remembers her first conversation with Chad this way. Will you give me some money? Chad asked. Who are you? replied Ramirez. I want to get rid of the garbage in the Mississippi River, Chad said. Can you show me a proposal? Ramirez inquired. What's a proposal? Chad replied. Ramirez eventually invited Chad to a meeting and gave him a check for $25,000 to expand his Mississippi River beautification and restoration project. More important than Chad's knowledge of fundraising was his clear desire to make a difference, his unflagging enthusiasm, his complete dedication to the project, and his willingness to ask. Eventually, everything Chad needed was secured through asking. He now has a board of directors made up of lawyers, accountants, and corporate officers. He has 12 full-time staff members and tens of thousands of volunteers and has raised millions of dollars in donations to support the work. In the process, he has cleaned up thousands of miles of shoreline on the Mississippi and 22 other rivers, removing over 7 million pounds of trash but he's also drawn attention to the health and beauty of all rivers and the responsibility we all share in keeping them clean. For more information on the Mississippi River Beautification and Restoration Project or how to participate in Adopt a Mississippi River Mile, visit www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. And in 2013, he was named CNN Hero of the Year. Start asking today. Take time now to make a list of the things that you want that you don't ask for at home, school, or work. Next to each one, write down how you stop yourself from asking. What is your fear? Next, write down what it is costing you not to ask. Then write down what benefit you would get if you were to ask. Take time to make a list of what you need to ask for in each of the following seven goal categories that I outlined in Principle 3. Decide what you want. Financial job and career. Fun time and recreation. Health and fitness. Relationships. Personal projects and hobbies. 
and contribution to the larger community. Do you need to ask for a raise, a loan, seed money, venture capital, feedback about your performance, a referral, an endorsement, time off to get additional training, someone to babysit your children, a massage, a hug, or help with a volunteer project? Principle 18. Reject Rejection We keep going back, stronger, not weaker, because we will not allow rejection to beat us down. It will only strengthen our resolve. To be successful, there is no other way. Earl G. Graves, founder and publisher of Black Enterprise magazine. If you are going to be successful, you're going to need to learn how to deal with rejection. Rejection is a natural part of life. You get rejected when you aren't picked for the team, don't get the part in the play, don't get elected, don't get into the college or graduate school of your choice, don't get the job or promotion you wanted, don't get the sale, don't get the raise you wanted, don't get the appointment you requested, don't get the date you asked for, don't get the permission you requested, or you get fired. You get rejected when your manuscript is rejected, your proposal is turned down, your new product idea is passed over, your fundraising request is ignored, your design concept is not accepted, your application for membership is denied, or your offer of marriage is not accepted. Rejection is a myth. To get over rejection, you have to realize that rejection is really a myth. It doesn't really exist. It is simply a concept that you hold in your head. Think about it. If you ask Patty to have dinner with you and she says no, you didn't have anyone to eat dinner with before you asked her, and you don't have anyone to eat dinner with after you asked her. The situation didn't get worse. It stayed the same. It only gets worse if you go inside and tell yourself something extra like, See, mother was right. No one will ever like me. I am the slug of the universe. If you apply to Harvard for graduate school and you don't get in, you weren't in Harvard before you applied, and you are not in Harvard after you applied. Again, your life didn't get worse. It stayed the same. You haven't really lost anything. And think about this. You have spent your whole life not going to Harvard. You know how to handle that. The truth is, you never have anything to lose by asking. And because there is something to possibly gain, by all means, ask. SW, 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 SW. Whenever you ask anyone for anything, remember the following. SW, 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 SW. Which stands for, some will, some won't. So what? Someone's waiting. Some people are going to say yes, and some are going to say no. So what? Out there somewhere, someone is waiting for you and your ideas. It is simply a numbers game. You have to keep asking until you get a yes. The yes is out there waiting. As my partner, Mark Victor Hansen, is so fond of saying, What you want wants you. You just have to hang in there long enough to eventually get a yes. 81 knows, 9 straight yeses. Because the program had so dramatically changed her life, a graduate of my self-esteem and peak performance seminar was volunteering in the evenings to call people to enroll them in an upcoming seminar I was conducting in St. Louis. She made a commitment to talk to three people every night for a month. Many of the calls turned into long conversations, with people asking tons of questions. She made a total of 90 phone calls. The first 81 people decided not to take the seminar. The next nine people all signed up. She had a 10% success ratio, which is a good ratio for phone enrollments. But all nine enrollments came in the last nine calls. What if she had given up after the first 50 people and said, This just isn't working. It's not worth the effort. Nobody is signing up. But because she had a dream of sharing with others the life-transforming experience that she had had, she persevered in the face of a lot of rejection, knowing that it was indeed a numbers game. 
and her commitment to the outcome paid off. She was instrumental in helping nine people transform their lives. If you're committed to a cause that evokes your passion and commitment, you keep learning from your experiences, and you stay the course to the end, you will eventually create your desired outcome. Never give up on your dream. Perseverance is all important. If you don't have the desire and the belief in yourself to keep trying after you've been told you should quit, you'll never make it. Tawny O'Dell, author of Backroads, an Oprah book club pick. Just say, next. Get used to the idea that there is going to be a lot of rejection along the way to your goals. The secret to success is to not give up. When someone says no, you say, next? Keep on asking. When Colonel Harlan Sanders left home with his pressure cooker and his special recipe for cooking southern fried chicken, he received 1,009 rejections before he found someone to believe in his dream. Because he rejected rejection over 1,000 times, there are now 18,875 KFC outlets in 118 countries and territories around the world. If one person tells you no, ask someone else. Remember, there are over 5 billion people on the planet. Someone, somewhere, sometime will say yes. Don't get stuck in your fear or resentment. Move on to the next person. It's a numbers game. Someone is waiting to say yes. Chicken Soup for the Soul Success consists of going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Winston Churchill, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom In the fall of 1991, Mark Victor Hansen and I began the process of selling our first Chicken Soup for the Soul book to a publisher. We flew to New York with Jeff Herman, our literary agent at the time, and met with every major publisher that would grant us a meeting. All of them said they weren't interested. Collections of short stories don't sell. There's no edge to the stories. The title will never work. After that, we were rejected by another 20 publishers who had received the manuscript through the mail. After being rejected by more than 30 publishers, our agent gave the book back to us and said, I'm sorry, I can't sell it for you. What did we do? We said, Next. We also knew we had to think outside of the box. After weeks of racking our brains, we hit on an idea that we thought would work. We printed up a form that was a promise to buy the book when it was published. It included a place for people to write their name, address, and the number of books they pledged to buy. Over a period of months, we asked everyone who attended our speeches or seminars to complete the form if they would buy a copy of the book when it was published. Eventually, we had promises to buy 20,000 books. The following spring, Mark and I attended the American Booksellers Association convention in Anaheim, California, and walked from booth to booth, talking to any publisher who would listen. Even with copies of our signed pledge forms to demonstrate the market for our book, we were turned down again and again. But again and again, we said, Next! At the end of the second very long day, we gave a copy of the first thirty stories in the book to Peter Vegso and Gary Seidler, co-presidents of Health Communications, Inc., a struggling publisher specializing in addiction and recovery books, who agreed to take it home and look it over. Later that week, Gary Seidler took the manuscript to the beach and read it. He loved it and decided to give us a chance. Those hundreds of nexts had paid off. After more than 140 rejections, that first book went on to sell 10 million copies, spawning a series of 250 best-selling books that have been translated into 43 languages with worldwide sales of 500 million books. And those pledge forms? When the book was finally published, we stapled an announcement to the signed forms, sent them to the person at the address on the form, and waited for a check. Almost everyone who had promised to buy a book came through on his or her commitment. In fact, one entrepreneur in Canada bought 1,700 copies, 
and gave one to every one of his clients. This manuscript of yours that has just come back from another editor is a precious package. Don't consider it rejected. Consider that you've addressed it to the editor who can appreciate my work, and it has simply come back stamped, not at this address. Just keep looking for the right address. Barbara Kingsolver, best-selling author of The Poisonwood Bible. 155 Rejections Didn't Stop Him When 19-year-old Rick Little wanted to start a program in high schools that would teach kids how to deal with their feelings, handle conflict, clarify their life goals, and learn communication skills and values that would help them live more effective and fulfilling lives, he wrote a proposal and shopped it to over 155 foundations. He slept in the back of his car and ate peanut butter on crackers for the better part of a year. But he never gave up his dream. Eventually, the Kellogg Foundation gave Rick $130,000. That's almost $1,000 for each no he endured. Since that time, Rick and his team have raised over $100 million to implement the Quest program in 36 languages and more than 30,000 schools in 80 countries around the world. Three million kids per year are being taught important life skills because one 19-year-old rejected rejection and kept on going until he got a yes. In 1989, Rick received a grant for $65 million, the second largest grant ever given in U.S. history, to create the International Youth Foundation. What if Rick had given up after the 100th rejection? and said to himself, Well, I guess this just isn't supposed to be. What a great loss to the world and to Rick's higher purpose for being. He knocked on 12,500 doors. I take rejection as someone blowing a bugle in my ear to wake me up and get going, rather than retreat. Sylvester Stallone, actor, writer, and director. When Dr. Ignatius Piazza was a young chiropractor fresh out of school, he decided he wanted to set up offices in the Monterey Bay area of California. When he approached the local chiropractic association for assistance, they advised him to set up shop somewhere else. They told him he wouldn't be successful because there were already too many chiropractors in the area. Undaunted, he applied the next principle. For months, he went from door to door early in the morning until sunset, knocking on doors. After introducing himself as the new young doctor in town, he asked a few questions. Where should I locate my office? What newspaper should I advertise in to reach your neighbors? Should I open early in the morning or stay open into the evening for those who have nine-to-five jobs? Should I call my clinic Chiropractic West or Ignatius Piazza Chiropractic? And finally, he asked, When I hold my open house, would you like to receive an invitation? If people said yes, he wrote down their names and addresses and continued on, day after day, month after month. By the time he was done, he had knocked on over 12,500 doors and talked to over 6,500 people. He got a lot of no's. He got a lot of nobody homes. He even got trapped on one porch cornered by a pit bull, for a whole afternoon. But he also received enough yeses that during his first month in practice he saw 233 new patients and earned a record income of $72,000 in an area that didn't need another chiropractor. Remember, to get what you want, you're going to need to ask, 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 and say, next, next, next until you get the yes or yeses you're looking for. Asking is, was, and always will be a numbers game. Don't take it personally, because it isn't personal. Some Famous Rejections The girl doesn't, it seems to me, have a special perception or feeling which would lift that book above the curiosity level. From the rejection slip for The Diary of Anne Frank Everyone who has ever made it to the top has had to endure rejections. 
You just have to realize that they are not personal. Consider the following. Angie Everhart, who started modeling at the age of 16, was once told by model agency owner Eileen Ford that she would never make it as a model. Why not? Redheads don't sell. Everhart later became the first redhead in history to appear on the cover of Glamour magazine, had a great modeling career, and then went on to appear in 27 films and numerous TV shows. Novelist Stephen King almost made a multi-million dollar mistake when he threw his Carrie manuscript into the garbage because he was tired of the 30 rejections he had received. We are not interested in science fiction which deals with negative utopias, he was told. They do not sell. Luckily, his wife fished it out of the garbage. Eventually, Carrie was printed by another publisher, sold more than four million copies, and was made into a blockbuster film. In 1998, Google co-founders Sergey Brin and Larry Page approached Yahoo and suggested a merger. Yahoo could have snapped up the company for a handful of stock, but instead they suggested that the young Googlers keep working on their little school project and come back when they had grown up. Within five years, Google had an estimated market capitalization of $20 billion. At the time of this writing, Forbes reported Google's market capitalization at $268.45 billion. Even the first Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, was rejected by 12 publishers before it found a home. Because she didn't give up, J.K. Rowling is now one of the richest people in England, with a net worth near $1 billion. Steven Spielberg applied and was rejected two times by the prestigious USC Film School. He ended up at Cal State University in Long Beach. He later went on to produce and direct some of the greatest blockbuster movies of all time, E.T., Lincoln, Saving Private Ryan, Jurassic Park, Jaws, The Color Purple, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, ultimately giving Spielberg a net worth of $3 billion. Twenty-seven years later, after Spielberg had become famous, USC awarded him an honorary doctoral degree, and two years after that he became a trustee of the university. Susan Story Twice in her life, Susan Mobbett's entire future was changed by the generous acts of people who didn't even know her. The first time it happened was just days after she was born. Her birth mother did what may have been the only kind thing she could have done for her at the time. Instead of abandoning her in the grassland to die, she placed her in a crowded market where she knew that she'd be found. That simple act saved her life. A woman named Monica found her. Monica had virtually no money and already had eight children to care for but she couldn't turn away from Susan's cries. She picked her up and cared for her, and for weeks she brought her back to the market hoping to find her mother. Ultimately, she knew she never would. As poor as she was, Monica somehow found a way to make Susan her ninth. While Monica's love for her saved her life and gave her the hope that she could grow up and become anything she desired, she also knew firsthand the realities of growing up as a girl in the Maasai Mara region of Kenya. Most girls were married off to older men while they were still girls. They'd get pregnant at an age when their young bodies were not meant to bear children, and many didn't survive childbirth. For these girls, there was no time for studies. Their days were filled with walking for hours just to fetch filthy water for their family, and when they got home, new chores awaited them. The tiny fraction of girls in Kenya who were lucky enough to get an education seemed like the chosen few. Too few were able to escape that vicious cycle. Yet from a young age, Susan knew that education was her only way out of a life that the vast majority of women in her village had known for generations. And her only hope was Kisarune Secondary School, the first and only boarding school for girls near her village. That first year, the newly built school, funded by Cynthia Kersey's Unstoppable Foundation, announced that it would accept only 40 girls from the entire region. So Susan studied hard in primary school, and because she was at the top of all of her classes, 
She was confident and hopeful she would be accepted. She applied to Kisaruni and waited eagerly for the response. The last day of primary school, her heart was pounding because she knew she'd get the news of her future that day. When her teacher told her that she had not been accepted to Kisaruni, it felt like a death sentence. The night before the doors were to open at Kisaruni that year, young Susan lay awake, unable to sleep knowing that somewhere forty girls were excitedly lying awake anticipating their first day at school. They were probably preparing their black and red school uniforms and looking forward to meeting new friends. But she had been condemned to a life of poverty in her village. But Susan was not willing to let go of her dream of a better life that easily. The next morning she set out on foot toward Kisaruni, miles away on a dusty path. As she approached the school, she could see the forty lucky girls in their bright uniforms laughing and playing. As Susan arrived, everyone turned to look at her. The principal approached her and asked why she was there. Though Susan was terrified, she bravely said that she had been turned down by the school, but needed to hear it directly from her because she simply couldn't believe it. The principal gently explained that they had room for only forty girls. That meant forty beds, forty desks, and forty chairs. Unfortunately, Susan was the forty-first girl. She tried not to cry. She tried to be brave. But the tears rolled down her dusty cheeks, and she could not imagine how she would be able to walk home. As she gathered her strength to leave, the forty girls began to surround her. One girl shouted, Please don't make her go away. We'll move our beds together. Another girl pleaded, I'll share my desk with her. Another shouted, I'll share my books with her. Please don't make her go. The girls surrounded her in what felt like a circle of protection, not allowing her to move. She was stunned. The girls' generosity that day allowed Susan to attend school that year. And later, when the Unstoppable Foundation and a generous donor heard of Susan's bravery, how she had refused to believe she couldn't go to school, they paid her tuition, making it possible for Susan to continue her studies and become Kisaruni's 41st girl. Let Susan's story of perseverance in the face of rejection inspire you to never count yourself out. Believe you will succeed. Do everything in your power and never give up. Principle 19. Use feedback to your advantage. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. Ken Blanchard and Spencer Johnson, co-authors of The One-Minute Manager. Once you begin to take action, you'll start getting feedback about whether you're doing the right thing. You'll get data, advice, help, suggestions, direction, and even criticism that will help you constantly adjust and move forward while continually enhancing your knowledge, abilities, attitudes, and relationships. By asking for feedback is really only the first part of the equation. Once you receive feedback, you have to be willing to respond to it. There are two kinds of feedback. There are two kinds of feedback you might encounter, negative and positive. We tend to prefer the positive. That is, results, money, praise, a raise, a promotion, satisfied customers, awards, happiness, inner peace, intimacy, pleasure. It feels better. It tells us that we are on course, that we are doing the right thing. We tend not to like negative feedback, lack of results, little or no money, criticism, poor evaluations, being passed over for a raise or a promotion, complaints, unhappiness, inner conflict, loneliness, pain. However, there is as much useful data in negative feedback as there is in positive feedback. It tells us that we are off course, headed in the wrong direction, doing the wrong thing. That is also valuable information. In fact, it's so valuable that one of the most useful projects you could undertake is to change how you feel about negative feedback. I like to refer to negative feedback as information about improvement opportunities. The world is telling me where and how I can improve what I am doing. Here is a place I can get better. 
Here is where I can correct my behavior to get even closer to what I want. More money, more sales, a promotion, a better relationship, better grades, or more success on the athletic field. To reach your goals more quickly, you need to welcome, receive, and embrace all the feedback that comes your way. On course, off course, on course, off course. There are many ways to respond to feedback, some of which work, they take you closer to your stated objectives, and some of which don't, they keep you stuck or take you even further from your goals. When I conduct trainings on the success principles, I illustrate this point by asking for a volunteer from the audience to stand at the far side of the room. The volunteer represents the goal I want to reach. My task is to walk across the room to where he is standing. If I get to where he is standing, I have successfully reached my goal. I instruct the volunteer to act as a constant feedback-generating machine. Every time I take a step, he is to say, on course, if I am walking directly toward him, and off course, if I am walking even the slightest bit off to either side. Then I begin to walk very slowly toward the volunteer. Every time I take a step directly toward him, the volunteer says, on course. Every few steps, I purposely veer off course, and the volunteer says, off course. I immediately correct my direction. Every few steps, I veer off course again, and then correct again in response to his off course feedback. After a lot of zigzagging, I eventually reach my goal and give the person a hug for volunteering. I ask the audience to tell me which feedback the volunteer gave me more often, on course or off course. The answer is always off course. And here is the interesting point. I was off course more than I was on course, and I still got there, just by continually taking action and constantly adjusting to the feedback. The same is true in life. All we have to do is to start to take action and then respond to the feedback. If we do that diligently enough and long enough, we will eventually get to our goals and achieve our dreams. Ways of Responding to Feedback That Don't Work Though there are many ways you can respond to feedback, some responses simply don't work. 1. Caving in and quitting As part of the seminar exercise I described above, I will repeat the process of walking toward my goal. However, in this round I will purposely veer off course, and when my volunteer keeps repeating off course over and over, I break down and cry. I can't take it anymore. Life is too hard. I can't take all this negative criticism. I quit. How many times have you or someone you know received negative feedback and simply caved in over it? All that does is keep you stuck in the same place. Of course, it's easier not to cave in when you receive feedback if you remember that feedback is simply information. Think of it as correctional guidance instead of criticism. Think of the automatic pilot system on an airplane. The system is constantly telling the plane that it has gone too high, too low, too far to the right, or too far to the left. The plane just keeps correcting in response to the feedback it is receiving. It doesn't all of a sudden freak out and break down because of the relentless flow of feedback. Stop taking feedback so personally. It is just information designed to help you adjust and get to the goal a whole lot faster. 2. Getting mad at the source of the feedback. Once again, I will begin walking toward the other end of the room while purposely veering off course, causing the volunteer to say, off course, over and over. This time, I put one hand on my hip, stick out my chin, point my finger and yell, bitch, bitch, bitch. All you ever do is criticize me. You're so negative. Why can't you ever say anything positive? Think about it. How many times have you reacted with anger and hostility toward someone who was giving you feedback that was genuinely useful? All it does is push the person and the feedback away. 3. Ignoring the feedback For my third demonstration, imagine me putting my fingers in my ears and determinedly walking off course. The volunteer might be saying, Off course! Off course! 
but I can't hear anything because my fingers are in my ears. Not listening to or ignoring the feedback is another response that doesn't work. We all know people who tune out everyone's point of view but their own. They are simply not interested in what other people think. They don't want to hear anything anyone else has to say. The sad thing is, feedback could significantly transform their lives if only they would listen and respond. So as you can see, when someone gives you feedback, there are three possible reactions that don't work. One, crying, falling apart, caving in, and giving up. Two, getting angry at the source of the feedback. And three, ignoring the feedback. Crying and falling apart is simply ineffective. It may temporarily release whatever emotions you have built up in your system, but it takes you out of the game. It immobilizes you. It may stop the flow of negative feedback, but it doesn't get you the information you need to reach your goal. You can't win in the game of life if you are not on the playing field. Getting angry at the person giving you the feedback is equally ineffective. It just makes the source of the valuable feedback attack you back or simply go away. What good is that? It may temporarily make you feel better, but it doesn't help you become more successful. In my advanced trainings and in our Train the Trainer program, when everyone knows the other participants fairly well, I have the whole group stand up, mill around, and ask as many people as possible the following question. How do you see me limiting myself? After doing this for 30 minutes, people sit down and record what they have heard. You'd think that this would be hard to listen to for 30 minutes, but it is such valuable feedback that people are actually grateful for the opportunity to become aware of their limiting beliefs and behaviors and replace them with more effective beliefs and behaviors. Everyone then develops an action plan for transcending their limiting behavior. Remember, feedback is simply information. You don't have to take it personally. Just welcome it and use it. The most intelligent and productive response is to say, Thank you for the feedback. Thank you for caring enough to tell me what you see and how you feel. I appreciate it. Be willing to ask for feedback. Most people will not voluntarily give you feedback. They are as uncomfortable with possible confrontation as you are. They don't want to hurt your feelings. They are afraid of your reaction. They don't want to risk your disapproval. So, to get honest and open feedback, you're going to need to ask for it and make it safe for the person to give it to you. In other words, don't shoot the messenger and don't argue with them. Just say, thank you. A powerful question to ask your family members, friends, and colleagues is, how do you see me limiting myself? You might think that the answers would be hard to listen to, but most people find the information so valuable that they are grateful for what people tell them. Armed with this new feedback, you can create a plan of action for replacing your limiting beliefs and behaviors with more effective and productive beliefs and behaviors. Most people are afraid to ask for corrective feedback because they are afraid of what they are going to hear. But you're better off knowing the truth than not knowing the truth. Once you know it, you can do something about it. You cannot fix what you don't know is broken. You cannot improve your life, your relationships, your game, or your performance without feedback. When you avoid asking for feedback, you are the only one who is not in on the secret. The other person is usually already told their spouse, their friends, their parents, their business associates, and other potential customers what they are dissatisfied with. They should be telling you, but they are unwilling to do so for fear of your reaction. As a result, you are being deprived of the very thing you need to improve your relationship, your product, your service, your teaching, your managing, or your parenting. You must do two things to remedy this. First, you must intentionally and actively solicit feedback. Ask your partner, your friends, your colleagues, your boss, your employees, your clients, your parents, your teachers, your students, and your coaches. Second, 
you must be grateful for the feedback. Do not get defensive. Just say, thank you for caring enough to share that with me. Remember, feedback is a gift that helps you become more effective. Be grateful for it. Get your head out of the sand and ask, ask, ask. Then check in with yourself to see what fits for you and put the useful feedback into action. Take whatever steps are necessary to improve the situation, including changing your own behavior. The most valuable question you may ever learn. In the 1980s, a multimillionaire businessman taught me a question that radically changed the quality of my life. If the only thing you get out of reading this book is the consistent use of this question in your personal and business life, it will have been worth the money and time you have invested. So what is this magical question that can improve the quality of every relationship you are in, every product you produce, every service you deliver, every meeting you conduct, every class you teach, and every transaction you enter into? Here it is. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the quality of our relationship, service or product, during the last week, two weeks, or month, or quarter, or semester, or season? Here are a number of variations on the same question that have served me well over the years. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the meeting we just had? Me as a manager. Me as a parent. Me as a teacher. This class this meal, my cooking, our sex life, this deal, this book. Any answer less than a 10 gets this follow-up question. What would it take to make it a 10? This is where the valuable information comes from. Knowing that a person is dissatisfied is not enough. Knowing in detail what will satisfy them gives you the information you need to do what is necessary to create a winning product, service, or relationship. Make it a habit to end every project, meeting, class, training, consultation, and installation with the two questions. Make it a weekly ritual. I ask my wife these same two questions every Sunday night. Here is a typical scenario. How would you rate the quality of our relationship this past week? Eight. What would it take to make it a 10? Come to bed at the same time with me at least four nights a week. Come in for dinner on time or call me and tell me you're going to be late. I hate sitting here waiting and wondering. Let me finish a joke I am telling without interrupting and talking over because you think you can tell it better. Put your dirty laundry in the clothes hamper instead of in a pile on the floor. I ask my assistants this question every Friday afternoon. Here is one response I received one Friday. Six. Whoa! What would it take to make it a ten? We were supposed to have a meeting this week to go over my quarterly review, but it got pushed aside by other matters. It makes me feel unimportant, and that you don't care about me as much as the other people around here. The other thing is that I feel you are not using me enough. You are not delegating anything but the simple stuff to me. I want more responsibility. I want you to trust me more with the important stuff. This job has become boring and uninteresting. I want more of a challenge. This was not easy to hear, but it was true, and it led to two wonderful results. It helped me delegate more important stuff to her and thus cleared my plate, giving me more free time. And it also created a happier assistant who was able to serve me and the company better. It pays to ask. When Mark Victor Hansen and I decided to compile stories for Chicken Soup for the African-American Soul, I asked Lisa Nichols to co-author the book with us. Lisa was the founder and CEO of Motivating the Teen Spirit, which she started to empower teens to fall madly in love with themselves. In recent years, she has expanded her mission to include people of all ages, because she believes that all of us deserve to fall in love with the person we see in the mirror every morning. Lisa later went on to have a featured role in the movie The Secret, and has authored several books of her own, including No Matter What and Unbreakable Spirit.
over the course of working on two different books together. Lisa and I became close friends. She told me that one of the best things to come out of our relationship is the on the scale of one to ten question. After first hearing about this technique, she instantly began to use it with her son, Julani, who was eleven years old at the time. She had been feeling really guilty about being separated from him so much due to her work. The first time she asked him to rate their relationship, Julani gave it a seven. Hmm, she thought. Not terrible, but it sure could be better. Taking a deep breath, she asked, What would it take to make it a ten? He said, I want to see you more. I want to travel with you. She immediately took this to heart and committed to find a way to make it happen. First, she enrolled him in a private school, with the condition that Julani be able to distance learn when he traveled with her. The school administrator said, We've never done that before. Lisa told them, I'm excited that we get to co-create a new possibility. The school agreed to try it and for the next two years Julani traveled with her whenever he wanted to. She'd show him her travel calendar six months in advance, and he'd choose a place that he wanted to go. Eventually, he said, Mom, I'm ready to stay at home. They had handled that particular part of improving their relationship. When Julani was 17, she asked him the 1 to 10 feedback question while they were watching movies at home together. He said, Oh, Mom, this again? She repeated the question. He said, I'd rate it a nine. She asked, What would it take to make it go from a nine to a ten? He sat there and thought. Finally, he said, I can't think of anything. But it seems so weird to say it's a ten. That would make it perfect. She said, Okay, so if it's not perfect, what would make it a ten? Chulani said, all I can think of is sitting on the couch, watching movies with you, our feet touching, and cooking with you. We're doing all that now, but it still feels weird to say it's a ten. In that moment, she felt her heart swell up with love. She told me, I don't care how many stages I stand on, how many millions of people that I speak in front of, how much wealth I generate. The most important thing to me is the relationship I have with my son. It's beyond price. You gave me a tool to monitor my son's needs, his desires, what he's getting, and what he's not getting. For that, I'll be forever grateful. How to Look Really Brilliant with Little Effort Virginia Satir, the author of the classic parenting book People Making, was probably the most successful and famous family therapist who ever lived. During her long and illustrious career, she was hired by the Michigan State Department of Social Services to provide a proposal on how to revamp and restructure the Department of Social Services so it would serve the client population better. Sixty days later, she provided the department with a 150-page report, which they said was the most amazing piece of work they had ever seen. This is brilliant, they gushed. How did you come up with all these ideas? She replied, Oh, I just went out to all the social workers in your system and asked them what it would take for the system to work better. Listen to the feedback. Human beings were given a left foot and a right foot to make a mistake first to the left, then to the right, left again, and repeat. Buckminster Fuller, engineer, inventor, and philosopher. Whether we ask or not, Feedback comes to us in various forms. It might come verbally from a colleague, or it might be a letter from the government. It might be the bank refusing your loan, or it could be a special opportunity that comes your way because of a specific step you took. Whatever it is, it's important to listen to the feedback. Simply take a step and listen. Take another step and listen. If you hear off course, Take a step in a direction you believe may be on course, and listen. Listen externally to what others may be telling you, but also listen internally to what your body, your feelings, and your instincts may be telling you. Is your mind and body saying, I'm happy, I like this, this is the right job for me, 
or I'm weary. I'm emotionally drained. I don't like this as much as I thought. I don't have a good feeling about that guy. Whatever feedback you get, don't ignore the yellow alerts. Never go against your gut. If it doesn't feel right to you, it probably isn't. Is all feedback accurate? Not all feedback is useful or accurate. You must consider the source. Some feedback is polluted by the psychological distortions of the person giving you the feedback. For example, if your drunk husband tells you, You're a no good, <laughs> that is probably not accurate or useful feedback. The fact that your husband is drunk and angry, however, is feedback you should listen to. Look for patterns. Additionally, you should look for patterns in the feedback you get. As my friend Jack Rosenblum likes to say, if one person tells you you're a horse, they're crazy. If three people tell you you're a horse, there's a conspiracy afoot. If ten people tell you you're a horse, it's time to buy a saddle. The point is that if several people are telling you the same thing, there is probably some truth in it. Why resist it? You may get to be right, but the question you have to ask yourself is, would I rather be right or be happy? Would I rather be right or be successful? I have a friend who would rather be right than be happy and successful. He got mad at anyone who tried to give him feedback. Don't you talk to me that way, young lady. This is my business and I'll run it the way I want to. I don't give a hoot what you think. He was a my way or the highway sort of person. He wasn't interested in anyone else's opinion or feedback. In the process, he alienated his wife, his two daughters, his clients, and all his employees. He ended up with two divorces, kids who didn't want to speak to him, and two bankrupt businesses. But he was right. Don't you get caught in this trap. It's a dead-end street. What feedback have you been receiving from your family, friends, members of the opposite sex, co-workers, boss, partners, clients, vendors, and your body that you may need to pay more attention to? Are there any patterns that stand out? Make a list, and next to each item, write an action step you can take to get back on course. What to do when the feedback tells you you failed. When all indicators say you've had a failure experience, there are a number of things you can do to respond appropriately and keep moving forward. 1. Acknowledge you did the best you could with the awareness, knowledge, and skills you had at the time. 2. Acknowledge that you survived and that you can absolutely cope with any and all of the consequences or results. 3. Write down all the insights and lessons you learned from the experience in a file in your computer or in a journal. Read through this file often. Ask others involved, your family, employees, clients, team, and others, what they learned. Then make a list under the heading, Ways to do it better next time. 4. Make sure to thank everyone for their feedback and their insights. If someone is hostile in the delivery of their feedback, Remember that it is an expression of their level of fear, not your level of incompetence or unlovability. Just take in the feedback, use whatever is applicable and valuable for the future, and discard the rest. 5. Clean up any messes that have been created and deliver any communications that are necessary to complete the experience, including any apologies or regrets that are due. Do not try to hide the failure. 6. Take some time to go back and review your successes. It's important to remind yourself that you have had many more successes than you have had failures. You've done many more things right than you've done wrong. 7. Regroup. Spend some time with positive, loving friends, family, and co-workers who can reaffirm your worth and your contribution. 8. Refocus on your vision. Incorporate the lessons learned, recommit to your original plan, or create a new plan of action and then get on with it. Stay in the game. Keep moving toward the fulfillment of your dreams. You're probably going to make a lot of mistakes along the way. 
Just dust yourself off, get back on your horse, and keep riding. Principle 20. Commit to constant and never-ending improvement. We have an innate desire to endlessly learn, grow, and develop. We want to become more than what we already are. Once we yield to this inclination for continuous and never-ending improvement, we lead a life of endless accomplishments and satisfaction. Chuck Galozzi, author of The Three Thieves and Four Pillars of Happiness. In Japan, the word for constant and never-ending improvement is kaizen. Not only is this an operating philosophy for modern Japanese businesses, it is also the age-old philosophy of warriors, too and it's become the personal mantra of millions of successful people. Achievers, whether in business, sports, or the arts, are committed to continual improvement. If you want to be more successful, you need to learn to ask yourself, how can I make this better? How can I do it more efficiently? How can I do this more profitably? How can we serve our customers better? How can I provide more value to more people? How can we do this with greater love? The Mind-Numbing Pace of Change In today's world, a certain amount of improvement is necessary just to keep up with the rapid pace of change. New technologies are announced nearly every month. New manufacturing techniques are discovered even more often. New words come into use any time a trend or fad catches on. And what we learn about ourselves, about our health, and about the capacity for human thought, continues almost unabated. Improving is therefore necessary simply to survive. But to thrive, as successful people do, a more dedicated approach to improvement is required. Improve in small increments. Whenever you set out to improve your skills, change your behavior, or better your family life or business, beginning in small, manageable steps gives you a greater chance of long-term success. Doing too much too fast not only overwhelms you or anyone else involved in the improvement, it can doom the effort to failure, thereby reinforcing the belief that it's difficult, if not impossible, to succeed. When you start with small, achievable steps you can easily master, it reinforces your belief that you can easily improve. Decide what to improve on. At work, your goal might be for your company to improve the quality of your product or service, your customer service program, your online marketing, or your advertising. Professionally, you might want to improve your computer skills, your sales skills, or your negotiating skills. At home, you might want to improve your parenting skills, communication skills, or cooking skills. You could also focus on improving your health and fitness, your knowledge of investing and money management, or your musical ability. Or perhaps you want to develop greater inner peace through meditation, yoga, and prayer. Whatever your goal, decide where you want to improve and what steps you'll need to take to achieve that improvement. Is it learning a new skill? Perhaps you can find that in a night class at the local community college. If it's improving your service to the community, perhaps you can find a way to spend an extra hour per week volunteering. To keep yourself focused on constant and never-ending improvement, ask yourself every day, How can I, or we, improve today? What can I, or we, do better than before? Where can I learn a new skill or develop a new competency? If you do, you'll embark on a lifelong journey of improvement that will ensure your success. You can't skip steps. He who stops being better stops being good. Oliver Cromwell, British politician and soldier, 1599-1658 One of life's realities is that major improvements take time. They don't happen overnight. But because so many of today's products and services promise overnight perfection, we've come to expect instant gratification, and we've become discouraged when it doesn't happen. However, if you make a commitment to learning something new every day, 
getting just a little bit better every day, then eventually over time you will reach your goals. Becoming a master takes time. You have to practice, practice, practice. You have to hone your skills through constant use and refinement. It takes years to have the depth and breadth of experience that produces expertise, insight, and wisdom. Every book you read, every class you take, every experience you have is another building block in your career and your life. Don't shortchange yourself by not being ready when your big break appears. Make sure you have done your homework and honed your craft. Actors usually have to do a lot of preparation. Acting classes, community theater, off-Broadway plays, bit parts in movies and television, more acting classes, voice lessons, accent training, dancing lessons, martial arts training, learning to ride a horse, more bit parts, until one day they are ready for the dream part that is ready for them. Successful basketball players learn to shoot with their opposite hand, improve their foul throw shooting, and work on their three-point shots. Artists experiment with different media. Airline pilots train for every kind of emergency in a flight simulator. Doctors go back to school to learn new procedures and obtain advanced certifications. They are all engaged in a process of constant and never-ending improvement. Make a commitment to keep getting better and better every day in every way. If you do, you'll enjoy the feelings of increased self-esteem and self-confidence that come from self-improvement, as well as the ultimate success that will inevitably follow. You will never change your life until you change something you do daily. The secret of your success is found in your daily routine. John Maxwell, leadership expert, author of 60 books. The Power of the Slight Edge In his book, The Slight Edge, Jeff Olson talks about the compound effect over time of doing just a little bit more or a little bit less of something. Whether it's doing a little more each day, 20 push-ups, 20 minutes of meditation, 20 minutes of aerobics, 20 pages of reading, an extra hour of sleep, taking supplements, or a little less each day, an hour less of television, one less glass of wine, one less $4 latte, or one less hour surfing the Internet. Over time, these little changes make a huge difference in your results. Think about these surprising facts. If you were to replace a sugary soft drink with a glass of water at lunch or during your afternoon break every day for a year, you would end up drinking almost 40 gallons of water. You'd avoid consuming close to 50,000 empty calories, the equivalent of fasting for 22 days, assuming you were eating 2,200 calories a day, and you'd save about $500 in expenses. If you were to cut out an hour of watching television a day, that 365 hours would add up to nine 40-hour work weeks. That's like adding an extra two months of productive time to your life every year. In 12 years, that would equal having two extra years of focused time. Whether you use that time to focus on writing your books, practicing your instrument, improving your sports performance, learning a new language, making more sales calls, marketing on the Internet, reading, exercising, Doing yoga, meditating, or deepening your relationships is up to you. But imagine the difference it would make over time. Principle 21 Keep score for success. You have to measure what you want more of. Charles Coonrat, founder, The Game of Work Remember when you were growing up and your mom or dad measured you every few months and kept track of your height on the wall near the pantry door? It was something visible that let you know where you stood in relation to the past and to your future goal, which was usually to be as tall as your mom or dad. It let you know you were making progress. It encouraged you to eat right and drink your milk to keep growing. Well, successful people keep the same kind of measurements. They keep score of exciting progress, positive behavior, financial gain, anything they want more of. 
In his groundbreaking book, The Game of Work, Charles Coonrat says that scorekeeping stimulates us to create more of the positive outcomes we're keeping track of. It actually reinforces the behavior that created these outcomes in the first place. Think about it. Your natural inclination is always to improve your score. If you were to keep score on the five things that would advance your personal and professional objectives the most, imagine how motivated you would be each time the numbers improved in your favor. Measure what you want, not what you don't want. We learn early in life that it's valuable to count what's valuable. We count the number of times we skip the rope, the number of jacks we pick up, the number of marbles we collect, the number of base hits we get in Little League, and the number of boxes of Girl Scout cookies we sell. Batting averages in baseball tell us the number of times we hit the ball, not the percentage of times we didn't. We keep score mostly of what is good, because that is what we want more of. When Mike Walsh at High Performers International wanted to increase his bottom line, he started keeping track not just of the number of enrollments his company was getting, but also of how many cold calls employees were making, how many face-to-face -face appointments they set up, and how many of those appointments they turned into enrollments. As a result of this kind of scorekeeping, Mike saw a 39% increase in revenues in just six months. Using Critical Drivers to Keep Score in Business Once you start counting what you want more of in your business, you can start to develop benchmarks that you know will boost revenue, profits, and market share. In every business, there is a checklist of goals and targets that, when reached, surpassed, and improved upon, will continually drive revenue and increase profits. These targets are called critical drivers. If you're in insurance or banking, for example, your critical drivers might be the number of cross-sells per customer or the number of loan originations. For a training company, an important critical driver would be the number of opt-ins for your free report. Whatever your critical drivers might be, the key is to inspire, motivate, and empower your team to continually identify, track, measure, and meet those benchmarks, even being accountable to meeting the critical drivers every week. Once you get to that level of keeping score, you will see rapid progress happening in your business. If you are looking to rapidly increase your business revenues, Janet Switzer has several programs that help business owners establish revenue generation systems that include critical drivers so your staff stays focused on activity that increases profits and growth. To learn more, visit www.janetswitzer.com. Not just for business owners anymore. When Tyler Williams joined a junior basketball league, his father, Rick Williams, co-author of Managing the Obvious, decided to counteract the usual negative focus of youth sports by creating a parent's scorecard to keep track of what Tyler did right rather than what he did wrong. He tracked seven contributions his son could make to the team's success. Points, rebounds, assists, steals, block shots, and so on. And awarded Tyler one point every time he made one of those positive plays. Whereas the statistics kept by the coaches centered chiefly on points and rebounds, the two traditional forms of measurement used in junior basketball. Tyler's dad's scorecard awarded points for virtually everything positive accomplished during a game. It wasn't long before Tyler was sprinting over during timeouts to check on his contribution points. When they reached home after the game, Tyler would hustle to his bedroom, where he had a chart on the wall that plotted his progress. With a simple graph Tyler made himself, he could see where he was improving. As the season progressed, the line on his graph went steadily upward. Without a single harsh word from his coach or his dad, Tyler had turned into a better basketball player and enjoyed the process besides. Keeping Score at Home Of course, scorekeeping isn't just for business, sports, and school. It can be applied to your personal life, too. In the May 2000 issue of Fast Company magazine, Vinod Kosla, the founding CEO of Sun Microsystems, said, 
It's great to know how to recharge your batteries, but it's even more important to make sure that you actually do it. I track how many times I get home in time to have dinner with my family. My assistant reports the exact number to me each month. I have four kids, ages 7 to 11. Spending time with them is what keeps me going. Your company measures its priorities. People also need to place metrics around their priorities. I spend about 50 hours a week at work, and I could easily work 100 hours. So I always make sure that, at the end of it all, I get home in time to eat with my kids. Then I help them with their homework and play games with them. My goal is to be home for dinner at least 25 nights a month. Having a target number is key. I know people in my business who are lucky if they make it home five nights a month. I don't think that I'm any less productive than those people. Decide where you need to keep score in order to manifest your vision and achieve your goals. Then post your scores where you and any others playing the game can easily see them. Principle 22 Practice Persistence Most people give up just when they're about to achieve success. They quit on the one-yard line. They give up at the last minute of the game, one foot from a winning touchdown. H. Ross Perot, American billionaire and former U.S. presidential candidate. Persistence is probably the single most common quality of high achievers. They simply refuse to give up. The longer you hang in there, the greater the chance that something will happen in your favor. No matter how hard it seems, the longer you persist, the more likely your success. It's not always going to be easy. Sometimes you're going to have to persist in the face of obstacles, oftentimes unseen obstacles, that no amount of planning or forethought could have predicted. Sometimes you'll encounter what seem like overwhelming odds. And sometimes, the universe will test your commitment to the goal you're pursuing. The going may be hard, requiring you to refuse to give up while you learn new lessons, develop new parts of yourself, and make difficult decisions. History has demonstrated that the most notable winners usually encountered heartbreaking obstacles before they triumphed. They won because they refused to become discouraged by their defeats. B.C. Forbes, founder of Forbes magazine. Hugh Panero, the co-founder and former CEO of XM Satellite Radio, is an example of amazing commitment and perseverance in the corporate sector. After two years recruiting investors ranging from General Motors and Hughes Electronics to DirecTV and Clear Channel Communications, Panero's dream of becoming the world's largest subscription radio service nearly collapsed at the last minute when investors threatened to back out if an acceptable deal wasn't struck by midnight June 6, 2001. After exhausting negotiations and shuttle diplomacy, Panero and his chairman of the board, Gary Parsons, secured commitments of $225 million just minutes before the deadline. Less than a year later, the launch of one of XM's $200 million satellites was aborted just 11 seconds before liftoff, when an engineer misread a message on his computer screen, forcing the company to wait for the next available launch date two months later. Still, Panero persevered and finally scheduled the debut of XM Radio's 101 channels of programming for September 12, 2001. But when terrorists attacked the World Trade Center on the morning of September 11th, just a day prior to the scheduled debut, Panero was forced to cancel the satellite's launch party and pull XM's inaugural TV ad featuring a rap star rocketing past a group of towering skyscrapers. Panero's team urged him to postpone the company's launch for another year. Yet in the end, Panero held fast to his dream and debuted the service just two weeks later. Today, through all the setbacks and delays, most of which make our own daily difficulties pale by comparison, the merged Sirius XM dominates the satellite radio business with more than 23 million subscribers paying every month to enjoy 72 channels of music plus 93 channels of premier sports, 
talk, comedy, children's and entertainment programming, and traffic and weather information. Five years. No is a word on your path to yes. Don't give up too soon. Not even if well-meaning parents, relatives, friends, and colleagues tell you to get a real job. Your dreams are your real job. Joyce Spicer, author of Rejections of the Written Famous. When Debbie McComer decided to pursue her dream of becoming a writer, she rented a typewriter, put it on the kitchen table, and began typing each morning after the kids went off to school. When the kids came home, she moved the typewriter and made them dinner. When they went to bed, she moved it back and typed some more. For two and a half years, Debbie followed this routine. Supermom had become a struggling writer, and she was loving every minute of it. One night, however, her husband Wayne sat her down and said, Honey, I'm sorry, but you're not bringing in any income. We can't do this anymore. We can't survive on just what I make. That night, her heart broken and her mind too busy to let her sleep, she stared at the ceiling in their darkened bedroom. Debbie knew, with all the responsibilities of keeping up a house and taking four kids to sports, church, and scouts, that working forty hours a week would leave her no time to write. Sensing her despair, her husband woke up and asked, What's wrong? I really think I could have made it as a writer. I really do. Wayne was silent for a long time, then sat up, turned on the light, and said, All right, honey, go for it. So Debbie returned to her dream and her typewriter on the kitchen table, pounding out page after page for another two and a half years. Her family went without vacations, pinched pennies, and wore hand-me-downs. But the sacrifice and the persistence finally paid off. After five years of struggling, Debbie sold her first book, then another, and another. Until finally, today, Debbie has published more than 150 books, many of which have become New York Times bestsellers, and four of which have become made-for-television movies. Over 170 million copies of her books are in print, and she has millions of loyal fans. And Wayne? All that sacrifice in support of his wife paid off handsomely. He got to retire at age 50, and now spends his time building an airplane in the basement of their 7,000-square-foot mansion. Debbie's kids got a gift far more important than a few summer camps. As adults, they realize what Debbie gave them was far more important. Permission and encouragement to pursue their own dreams. What could you accomplish if you were to follow your heart, practice this much daily discipline, and never give up? Never give up on your hopes and dreams. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, Press On, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Calvin Coolidge, 30th President of the United States. Consider this. Admiral Robert Peary attempted to reach the North Pole seven times before he made it on try number eight. In its first 28 attempts to send rockets into space, NASA had 20 failures. Oscar Hammerstein had five flop shows that lasted less than a combined total of six weeks before Oklahoma, which ran for 269 weeks and grossed $7 million. Oprah Winfrey was fired from an early television reporting job as she was not deemed suitable for television. Tony O'Dell's career as a writer is a testament to her perseverance. After 13 years, she had written six unpublished novels and collected 300 rejection slips. Finally, her first novel, Back Roads, was published after being chosen by Oprah Winfrey for the Oprah Book Club and the newly anointed novel rose to number two on the New York Times bestsellers list, where it remained for eight weeks. Never, never, never give up. During the Vietnam War, Texas computer billionaire H. Ross Perot decided he would give a Christmas present to every American prisoner of war in Vietnam. According to David Frost, who tells the story, 
Perot had thousands of packages wrapped and prepared for shipping. He chartered a fleet of Boeing 707s to deliver them to Hanoi. But the war was at its height, and the Hanoi government said it would refuse to cooperate. No charity was possible, officials explained, while American bombers were devastating Vietnamese villages. Perot offered to hire an American construction firm to help rebuild what Americans had knocked down. The government still wouldn't cooperate. Christmas drew near, and the packages were unsent. Refusing to give up, Perot finally took off in his chartered fleet and flew to Moscow, where his aides mailed the packages one at a time at the Moscow Central Post Office. They were delivered intact. Can you see now why this man became the great success that he did? He simply refused to ever quit. Hang in there. It's always too soon to quit. Norman Vincent Peale, inspirational author. In 1992, screenwriter Greg Borton began writing the screenplay for Dallas Buyers Club. After drafting ten different scripts for the movie, he spent most of the mid-1990s trying to sell it, but no one was willing to finance the production of the film. According to an interview with Matthew McConaughey, who won an Academy Award for Best Actor in the starring role as AIDS patient Ron Woodruff, the film was turned down by potential backers 87 times before McConaughey eventually signed on 17 years later. In 1996, the script got sold with Dennis Hopper to direct and Woody Harrelson to star. But the company that bought the script went bankrupt. The next year, Borton teamed up with screenwriter Melissa Wallach to revamp the script and sell it to Universal, this time with Mark Forster to direct and Brad Pitt to star. But Forster and Pitt never made the film. Years later, after finally securing financing, director Gary Gillespie and actor Ryan Gosling agreed to do the film. But once more, the financing fell apart. As a result, Universal decided the script was not ready and shelved the film for another nine years. Eventually, due to a clause in their Writers Guild contract, Borton and Wallach managed to get back their rights to the script. And in 2009, nearly 20 years after the script was first conceived, Robbie Brenner, a producer who had been involved with the project almost from the beginning, convinced Matthew McConaughey to get involved. But even after McConaughey lost 47 pounds for the role, and with filming scheduled to begin in just ten weeks, the new investors backed out. With actors and crew secured and ready to move forward, the production forged ahead and did the impossible. On a mere five million dollar budget, they shot the entire film with one camera and fifteen minute takes in just twenty-five days. Dallas Buyers Club was released in 2013 to universal acclaim by critics and audiences alike, and the tenacious commitment to see this film made eventually paid off in spades. Not only was it nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, it earned nominations for Borton and Wallach for Best Original Screenplay at the 2014 Writers Guild of America Awards and at the Oscars and went on to garner numerous Best Actor Awards for McConaughey and Best Supporting Actor Awards for Jared Leto. By February 2014, the film had grossed more than $55 million worldwide. He wouldn't give up his dream. We usually overestimate what we think we can accomplish in one year, but we grossly underestimate what we can accomplish in a decade. Anthony Tony Robbins, motivational speaker and author of Awaken the Giant Within. Daryl Hammond started his career in acting in the 70s while attending the University of Florida. It was a rocky start because with his fumbling speech, the result of extreme child abuse by his mother, he was never cast in a role. He kept at it until eventually one theater professor took a chance on him and, because of Darrell's success in that and several subsequent roles, convinced him he should pursue a career in acting. After barely graduating with a 2.1 grade point average, Darrell followed his dream and moved to New York. 
but for the first several years he waited tables and got so drunk at times that he could barely make it to auditions. Eventually, Daryl cut back on his drinking and started seriously studying acting at the prestigious Herbert Berghoff Studio, which boasts alumni such as Robert De Niro, Matthew Broderick, Billy Crystal, Claire Danes, Whoopi Goldberg, Al Pacino, and Barbara Streisand. That led to some roles in plays off-Broadway and in regional theaters. When he was 26, Daryl tried his hand at stand-up comedy, fell in love with it, and set a goal to be a cast member on Saturday Night Live. But it didn't happen overnight, not even close. After not getting any traction in New York, he moved back to Florida and did voiceover work for the next few years. But he never gave up on his goal, and he committed to a program of self-improvement that helped him get through those years. He came up with the idea that if he could make one small improvement in his abilities once a week, that would be 52 improvements a year. He focused on this for five years and then moved back to New York City with the determination to become a successful stand-up comedian and attract the attention of the Saturday Night Live producers. Starting in your 30s is late for stand-up, and Daryl thought he might be too old to make it, but he decided to try anyway because he didn't want to give up on his dream. He used to put pictures of Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., and Mahatma Gandhi on his wall for inspiration. The reason? They were people who probably didn't have any evidence they could accomplish what they wanted to accomplish, but they kept on going anyway. He continued to perform in the clubs around New York for the next seven years, during which time he had two failed auditions for Saturday Night Live. You'd think after seven years he would have given up. In fact, most people would have. But Daryl persisted. And finally, after seven long years, his persistence paid off. One night, during his act at Caroline's, he threw in a short impression of President Bill Clinton. It just so happened that night that a producer from Saturday Night Live was in the audience, and he was looking for someone for the show that could do a good Bill Clinton impression. As a result, Daryl was invited to audition for Lorne Michaels, the creator of Saturday Night Live. Daryl said he had been preparing for that moment for twelve years. He was ready, and he landed the role, finally fulfilling his ultimate dream. Daryl went on to spend fourteen years on the show, performing in more than two hundred episodes, and became best known for his hilarious impressions of famous people such as Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Dick Cheney, and Donald Trump, as well as entertainers like Sean Connery and Jack Nicholson. Since he left the show in 2009, at 53 years of age, the oldest cast member in the history of the show, he has gone on to appear on Broadway and in numerous movies and television shows, including his own Comedy Central special. Daryl has had an extraordinary career because in the beginning he refused to give up. How to Deal with Obstacles For every failure, there's an alternative course of action. You just have to find it. When you come to a roadblock, take a detour. Mary Kay Ash, founder, Mary Kay Cosmetics. Whenever you confront an obstacle or run into a roadblock, you need to stop and brainstorm three ways to get around, over, or through the block. For every obstacle, come up with three different strategies for handling the potential obstacle. There are any number of ways that will work but you will find them only if you spend time looking for them. Always be solution-oriented in your thinking. Persevere until you find a way that works. Difficulties are opportunities to better things. They are stepping stones to greater experience. When one door closes, another always opens. As a natural law, it has to, to balance. Brian Adams, author of How to Succeed. Principle 23. Practice the rule of five. Success is the sum of small efforts, repeated day in and day out. Robert Collier, best-selling author and publisher of The Secret of the Ages. When Mark Victor Hansen and I published the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, we were so eager and committed to making it a bestseller that we asked 15 best-selling authors 
ranging from John Gray, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, to Ken Blanchard, The One Minute Manager, and Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled, for their guidance and advice. We received a ton of valuable information about what to do and how to do it. Next, we visited with book publishing and marketing guru Dan Pointer, who gave us even more great information. Then we bought and read John Kramer's 1001 Ways to Market Your Book. After all of that, we were overwhelmed with possibilities. To tell the truth, we became a little crazy. We didn't know where to start. Plus, we both had our speaking and seminar business to run. Five Specific Things That Move You Toward Your Goal We sought the advice of Ron Scholastico, a wonderful teacher, who told us, If you would go every day to a very large tree and take five swings at it with a very sharp axe, eventually, no matter how large the tree, it would have to come down. How very simple and how very true. Out of that, we developed what we have called the Rule of Five. This simply means that every day we do five specific things that will move our goal toward completion. With the goal of getting Chicken Soup for the Soul to the top of the New York Times bestseller list, it meant having five radio interviews or sending out five review copies to editors who might review the book or calling five network marketing companies and asking them to buy the book as a motivational tool for their salespeople or giving a seminar to at least five people and selling the book in the back of the room. On some days, we would simply send out five free copies to people listed in the Celebrity Address Book, people such as Harrison Ford, Barbara Streisand, Paul McCartney, and Steven Spielberg. We made phone calls to people who could review the book. We wrote press releases. We called in to talk shows, some at 3 a.m. We gave away free copies at our talks. We sent them to ministers to use as a source of talks for their sermons. We gave free chicken soup for the soul talks at churches. We did book signings at any bookstore that would have us. We asked businesses to make bulk purchases for their employees. We got the book into the PXs on military bases. We asked our fellow speakers to sell the book at their talks. We asked seminar companies to put it out in their catalogs. We bought a directory of catalogs and asked all the appropriate ones to carry the book. We visited gift shops and card shops and asked them to carry the book. We even got gas stations, bakeries, and restaurants to sell the book. It was a lot of effort. A minimum of five things a day, every day, day in and day out, for over two years. Look what a sustained effort can do. Was it worth it? Yes. The book eventually sold over 10 million copies in 43 languages. Did it happen overnight? No. We did not make a bestseller list until over a year after the book came out. A year! But it was the sustained effort of the Rule of Five for over two years that led to the success. One action at a time. One book at a time. One reader at a time. But slowly, over time, each reader told another reader, and eventually, like a slow-building chain letter, the word was spread and the book became a huge success, what Time magazine called the publishing phenomenon of the decade. It was less of a publishing phenomenon and more of a phenomenon of persistent effort, thousands of individual activities that all added up to one large success. In Chicken Soup for the Gardener's Soul, Geraldine Edwards describes the day her daughter Carolyn took her to Lake Arrowhead to see a wonder of nature, fields and fields of daffodils that extend for as far as the eye can see. From the top of the mountain, sloping down for many acres across folds and valleys, between the trees and bushes, following the terrain, there are rivers of daffodils in radiant bloom a literal carpet of every hue of the color yellow, from the palest ivory to the deepest lemon to the most vivid salmon orange. There appear to be over a million daffodil bulbs planted in this beautiful natural scene. It takes your breath away. As they hiked into the center of this magical place, they eventually stumbled on a sign that read, 
answers to the questions I know you are asking. The first answer was, one woman, two hands, two feet, and very little brain. The second was, one at a time. The third, started in 1958. One woman had forever changed the world over a 40-year period, one bulb at a time. What might you accomplish if you were to do a little bit, five things, every day for the next 40 years toward the accomplishment of your goal? If you wrote five pages a day, that would be 73,000 pages of text, the equivalent of 243 books of 300 pages each. If you saved $5 a day, that would be $73,000, enough for four round-the-world trips. If you invested $5 a day with compound interest at only 6% a year, at the end of 40 years, you'd have amassed a small fortune of around $305,000. The Rule of Five Pretty powerful little principle, wouldn't you agree? Principle 24 Exceed Expectations it's Never Crowded Along the Extra Mile, Wayne Dyer, co-author of How to Get What You Really, 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 Really Want. Are you someone who consistently goes the extra mile and routinely over-delivers on your promises? It's rare these days, but it's the hallmark of high achievers who know that exceeding expectations helps you stand above the crowd. Almost by force of habit, successful people simply do more. As a result, they experience not only greater financial rewards for their extra efforts, but also a personal transformation, becoming more self-confident, more self-reliant, and more influential with those around them. Go the Extra Mile Seattle-based Delano's Coffee Roasters roasts coffee beans and distributes them to coffee retailers in almost all 50 U.S. states. Delano's mission statement is, help people, make friends, and have fun. The company has six core values that guide all of their activities. They are so committed to these values that the entire staff of 28 reads the list in unison at the end of every staff meeting. Number two on the list is provide an extra mile level of service, always giving the customer more than they expect. This means they treat every one of their customers like they treat a best friend someone you'd go the extra mile for. In 1997, one of those friends, Marty Cox, who owned four It's a Grind coffee houses in Long Beach, California, was just an average-sized customer. But Marty had big plans for the future. Delano's founder and CEO, David Morris, wanted to help his friend fulfill his big dream. At the time, Delano's shipped their beans by UPS. But in 1997, UPS went on strike, creating a threat to Marty's livelihood. How to get Marty's beans, the lifeblood of his business, from Seattle to Long Beach? Delano's considered the option of using the post office, but the company had heard through the grapevine that the post offices and FedEx were way overworked because of the UPS strike, and they didn't want to risk the beans arriving late. So Morris rented a trailer and drove his 800-pound coffee order to Marty's location two weeks in a row. David made the 17-hour drive from Seattle to Long Beach, delivered Marty's one-week coffee supply, drove back, got more coffee, drove down there the next week, and delivered it again. That kind of commitment to go the extra mile, literally 2,320 miles round trip, turned Marty into a loyal long-term customer. And what has that meant to Delano's? In just six years, Marty's four stores grew into a 150-store franchise with retail operations in nine states. Marty is now Delano's biggest customer. Going the extra mile pays off. As a result of going the extra mile for all of their customers, Delano's has grown from a single 20-pound roaster in one 1,600-square-foot room roasting 200 pounds of coffee beans a month in 1992 to a 45,000-square-foot facility 
and 68 employees, delivering well over 3.2 million pounds of coffee beans a year, with annual sales over $10 million and a growth rate that is on track to double every three years. And in 2011, Delano's was named Macro Roaster of the Year by Roast Magazine. Why go the extra mile? If you are willing to do more than you are paid to do, eventually you will be paid to do more than you do. Source unknown. So what's the payoff for you? When you give more than is expected, you are more likely to receive promotions, raises, bonuses, and extra benefits. You won't need to worry about job security. You'll always be the first hired and the last fired. Your business will make more money and attract lifelong loyal customers. You'll also find that you will feel more satisfied at the end of each day. But you have to start now for the rewards to begin appearing. Give something above and beyond what is expected. If you want to really excel at what you do, really become a howling success in business, school, or life, do more than is required, always giving something extra, something that is not expected. A business that goes the extra mile earns the respect, loyalty, and referrals of its customers. If you're focused on only your own needs, you may think that giving more than is expected is unfair. Why should you give extra effort without compensation or recognition? You have to trust that eventually it will get noticed and that you will receive the compensation and recognition that you deserve. Eventually, as the old saying goes, the cream always rises to the top. So will you and your company. You will earn an impeccable reputation and that is one of your most valuable assets. Here are a few more examples of giving more than is expected. A client pays you for an oil painting, and you frame it for him at no extra charge. You sell someone a car, and you detail it and fill it up with gas before you deliver it to him. You sell someone a house, and when she moves in, she discovers a bottle of champagne and a gift certificate for $100 to a local gourmet restaurant. As an employee, you not only do all of your own work, but you also work on your day off when another employee calls in sick. You take on new responsibilities without demanding more pay. You offer to train a new employee. You anticipate problems before they occur and prevent them. You see something that needs to be done, and you act on it without waiting to be asked and you constantly look for what else you can do to make a contribution and be of service. Instead of focusing on how you can get more, you focus on how you can give more. What can you do to go the extra mile and give more value to your boss, more service to your clients and customers, and more value to your students? One way is to surprise people with more than they expect. I know a car dealer in Los Angeles who provides a free car wash for all of his customers every Saturday at his dealership. Nobody expects it, and everyone loves it. It gets him lots of referral business because everyone is always talking about how satisfied they are with his service. The Four Seasons Always Goes the Extra Mile the name Four Seasons is synonymous with knock-your-socks-off service. The hotel chain always goes the extra mile. If you ask for directions from hotel staffers, they never just tell you. They walk you there. They always treat everybody as if they are royalty. Dan Sullivan tells the story about the man who was taking his daughter to San Francisco for the weekend, but realized that he didn't know how to braid her hair the special way her mother did it. When he called the Four Seasons to see if there was a staff person who could help him out, he was told that there was a woman on staff who was already assigned that job. It was something that management had anticipated that guests would someday need, and the hotel had it covered. Now that's going the extra mile. Another hotel chain that is noted for its outstanding service is the Ritz-Carlton. When I arrived at my room during my last stay at the Ritz-Carlton in Chicago, there was a hot thermos of chicken noodle soup waiting on the desk. It had a little sign on it that read, Chicken Soup, 
for Jack Canfield's body. It was accompanied by a wonderful card from the manager saying how much he and his staff enjoyed the chicken soup books. Nordstrom Goes the Extra Mile Nordstrom is a chain of retail stores that is known for going the extra mile. Nordstrom staff has always provided extraordinary service. Nordstrom salespeople have even been known to drop off merchandise to a customer on their way home from work. Nordstrom also has a policy that you can return anything at any time. Does the policy get abused? Sure it does. But as a result of this policy, Nordstrom has an extraordinary reputation for quality customer service. It is part of the company's carefully guarded brand image. As a result, Nordstrom is very profitable. Make a commitment to be world-class like the Four Seasons, Ritz-Carlton, and Nordstrom by going the extra mile and exceeding expectations, starting today. Part 2. Transform Yourself for Success The greatest revolution of our generation is the discovery that human beings, by changing the inner attitudes of their minds, can change the outer aspects of their lives. William James, Harvard Psychologist Principle 25. Drop out of the Ain't It Awful Club and surround yourself with successful people. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Jim Rohn, self-made millionaire and successful author. When Tim Ferriss, the best-selling author of The Four-Hour Workweek, was 12 years old, an unidentified caller left the above Jim Rohn quote on his answering machine. It changed his life forever. For days, he couldn't get the idea out of his mind. At only 12 years of age, Tim recognized that the kids he was hanging out with were not the ones he wanted influencing his future. So he went to his mom and dad and asked them to send him to private school. Four years at St. Paul's School set him on a path that led to a junior year abroad in Japan studying judo and Zen meditation. Four years at Princeton University, where he became an All-American wrestler a national kickboxing championship, and eventually starting his own company at the age of 23. Tim knew what every parent intuitively knows, that we become like the people we hang out with. Why else are parents always telling their kids that they don't want them hanging out with those kids? It's because we know that kids and adults become like the people they hang out with. That is why it is so important to spend time with the people you want to become like. If you want to be more successful, you have to start hanging out with more successful people. There are lots of places to find successful people. Join a professional association. Attend your professional conferences. Join the Chamber of Commerce. Join the Country Club. Join the Young President's Organization or the Young Entrepreneur's Organization. Volunteer for leadership positions. Join civic groups like Kiwanis. Optimists International, and Rotary International. Volunteer to serve with other leaders in your church, temple, or mosque. Attend lectures, symposia, courses, seminars, clinics, camps, and retreats taught by those who have already achieved what you want to achieve. Fly first class or business class whenever you can. You become like the people you spend the most time with. Pay any price to stay in the presence of extraordinary people. Mike Murdoch, author of The Leadership Secrets of Jesus. John Asaroff is a successful entrepreneur who has seemingly done it all, including traveling the world for a year in his 20s, owning and operating a franchising company whose annual real estate revenues topped $3 billion and helping to build Internet virtual tour pioneer Bamboo.com, now IPix, from a team of six people to a team of 1,500 in just over a year, netting millions in monthly sales, and completing a successful initial public offering on the NASDAQ after just nine months. John was a street kid who had been entangled in the world of drugs and gangs. 
When he landed a job working in the gym at the Jewish community center across the street from his apartment in Montreal, his life was changed by the powerful principle that you become like the people you spend the most time with. In addition to earning $1.65 an hour, he received access to the men's health club. John recounts that he got his early education in business in the men's sauna. Every night after work, from 9.15 to 10 p.m., you'd find him in the steamy hot room listening to successful businessmen tell their tales of success and failure. Many of those successful men were immigrants who had come to Canada to stake their claim, and John was fascinated as much by their setbacks as by their successes. The stories of what went wrong with their businesses, families, and health gave him inspiration because his own family was experiencing tremendous challenges and difficulties. And John learned that it was normal to have challenges, that other families also went through similar crises and still made it to the top. These successful people taught John to never give up on his dreams. No matter what the failure, they told him, try another way. Try going up, over, around, or through, but never give up. There's always a way. John also learned from these successful men that it makes no difference where you are born, what race or color you are, how old you are, or whether you come from a rich family or a poor family. Many of the men in that sauna spoke broken English. Some were single and some were divorced. Some were happily married and some were not. Some were healthy and others were in terrible shape. Some had college degrees and some didn't. Some hadn't even been to high school. For the first time, John realized that success is not reserved just for those born into well-to-do families without challenges and to whom every advantage has been given. He realized that no matter what the conditions of your life, you could build a life of success. He was in the presence of men from all walks of life who had done it and freely shared their wisdom and experience with him. Every night, John attended his own private business school in a sauna in a Jewish community center. You, too, need to be surrounded with those who have done it. You need to be surrounded with people who have a positive attitude, a solution-oriented approach to life, people who know that they can accomplish whatever they set out to do. Confidence is contagious. So is lack of confidence. Vince Lombardi, head coach of the Green Bay Packers, who led them to six division titles, five NFL championships, and two Super Bowls. Drop out of the Ain't It Awful Club. There are two types of people, anchors and motors. You want to lose the anchors and get with the motors because the motors are going somewhere and they're having more fun. The anchors will just drag you down. Wyland, world-renowned marine artist. When I was a first-year history teacher in a Chicago high school, I quickly stopped going into the teacher's lounge, which I soon dubbed the Ain't It Awful Club. Worse than the haze of cigarette smoke that constantly hung over the room was the cloud of emotional negativity. Can you believe what they want us to do now? I got that Simmons kid again this year in math. He's a holy terror. There is no way you can teach these kids. They are totally out of control. It was a constant stream of negative judgments, criticisms, blaming, and complaining. Not too long after, I discovered a group of dedicated teachers that hung out in the library and ate together at two tables in the teacher's lunchroom. They were positive and believed they could overcome and handle anything that was thrown at them. I implemented every new idea they shared with me, as well as a few more that I picked up from my weekend classes at the University of Chicago. As a result, I was selected by the students as Teacher of the Year in only my first year of teaching. Be Selective I just do not hang around anybody that I don't want to be with, period. For me, that's been a blessing, and I can stay positive. I hang around people who are happy, who are growing, who want to learn, who don't mind saying sorry or thank you, and are having a fun time. John Asaroff, author, The Street Kid's Guide to Having It All.
I'd like you to do a valuable exercise that my mentor W. Clement Stone did with me. Make a list of everyone you spend time with on a regular basis. Your family members, co-workers, neighbors, friends, people in your civic organization, fellow members of your religious group, and so on. When you've completed your list, go back and put a minus sign next to those people who are negative and toxic, and a plus sign next to those who are positive and nurturing. As you make a decision about each person, you might find that a pattern will begin to form. Perhaps your entire workplace is filled with toxic personalities. Or perhaps it's your friends who naysay everything you do. Or maybe it's your family members who constantly put you down and undermine your self-esteem and self-confidence. I want you to do the same thing that Mr. Stone told me to do. Stop spending time with those people with a minus sign next to their name. If that is impossible, and remember, nothing is impossible. It is always a choice. Then severely decrease the amount of time you spend with them. You have to free yourself from the negative influence of others. Are there people in your life who are always complaining and blaming others for their circumstances? Are there people who are always judging others, spreading negative gossip, and talking about how bad it is? Stop spending time with them as well. Are there people in your life who, simply by calling you on the telephone, can bring tension, stress, and disorder to your day? Are there dream stealers who tell you that your dreams are impossible and try to dissuade you from believing in and pursuing your goals? Do you have friends who constantly attempt to bring you back down to their level? If so, then it is time for some new friends. Avoid toxic people. Surround yourself with only people who are going to lift you higher. Oprah Winfrey, billionaire talk show host, actor, founder of The Own Network. Until you reach the point in your self-development where you no longer allow people to affect you with their negativity, you need to avoid toxic people at all costs. You're better off spending time alone than spending time with people who will hold you back with their victim mentality and their mediocre standards. Make a conscious effort to surround yourself with positive, nourishing, and uplifting people. People who believe in you, encourage you to go after your dreams, and applaud your victories. Surround yourself with possibility thinkers, idealists, and visionaries. Surround yourself with successful people. One of the clients who hired me to teach these success principles to their salespeople is one of the leading manufacturers of optical lenses. As I mingled with the salespeople prior to the event, I asked each person I met if he or she knew who the top five salespeople in the company were. Most answered yes, and quickly rattled off their names. That night I asked my audience of 300 people to raise their hands if they knew the names of the top five salespeople. Almost everyone raised a hand. I then asked them to raise their hands again if they had ever approached any of those five people and asked them to share their secrets of success. Not one hand went up. Think about it. Everyone knew who the most effective people in the company were, but because of an unfounded fear of rejection, nobody had ever asked these sales leaders to share their secrets. If you are going to be successful, you have to start hanging out with the successful people. You need to ask them to share their success strategies with you. Then try them on and see if they fit for you. Experiment with doing what they do, reading what they read, thinking the way they think, and so on. If these new ways of thinking and behaving work for you, adopt them. If not, drop them and keep looking and experimenting. Principle 26. Acknowledge your positive past. I look back on my life like a good day's work. It is done, and I am satisfied with it. Grandma Moses, American folk artist who lived 101 years. Most people in our culture remember their failures more than their successes. One reason for this is the leave them alone pounce approach to parenting teaching, and management that is so prevalent in our culture. 
When you were a young child, your parents left you alone when you were playing and being cooperative, and then pounced on you when you made too much noise, were a nuisance, or got into trouble. You probably received a perfunctory good job when you got A's, but got a huge lecture when you got C's and D's, or, God forbid, an F. In school, most of your teachers marked the answers you got wrong with an X, rather than marking the ones you got right with a check mark or a star. In sports, you got yelled at when you dropped the football or the baseball. There was almost always more emotional intensity around your errors, mistakes, and failures than there was around your successes. Because the brain more easily remembers events that were accompanied by strong emotions, most people underestimate and underappreciate the number of successes they've had compared to the number of failures they've had. One of the ways to counteract this phenomenon is to consciously focus on and celebrate your successes. One of the exercises I do in my corporate seminar is to have the participants each share a success they have had in the past week. It is always amazing to see how difficult this is for so many people. Many people don't think they have had any successes. They can easily tell you ten ways they messed up in the last seven days, but have a harder time telling you ten victories they had. The sad truth is that we all have many more victories than failures. It's just that we set the bar too high for what we call a success. A participant in the Goals, Gaining Opportunities and Life Skills program I developed to help get people off welfare in California actually asserted that he didn't have any successes. When I inquired about his accent, he told us that he had left Iran when the Shah was toppled in 1979. He had moved his whole family to Germany, where he had learned German and become a car mechanic. More recently, he had immigrated his whole family to the United States, had learned English, and was now in a program learning to be a welder. But he didn't think he had any successes. When the group asked him what he thought a success was, he replied that it was owning a home in Beverly Hills and driving a Cadillac. In his mind, anything less than that was not an achievement. Slowly, with a little coaching, he began to see that he had many success experiences every single week. Simple things such as getting to work on time, getting into the goals program, learning to speak English, providing for his family, and buying his daughter her first bicycle were all successes. The Poker Chip Theory of Self-Esteem and Success so why am I making such a big deal about acknowledging your past successes? The reason it is so important is because of its impact on your self-esteem. Imagine for a moment that your self-esteem is like a stack of poker chips. Then imagine that you and I are playing a game of poker, and you have ten chips, and I have two hundred chips. Who do you think is going to play more conservatively in this game of poker? Yes, you are. If you lose two bets of five chips, you're out of the game. I can lose five chips 40 times before I'm out of the game. So I am going to take more risks, because I can afford to take the losses. Your level of self-esteem works the same way. The more self-esteem you have, the more risks you are willing to take. Research has shown over and over again that the more you acknowledge your past successes, the more confident you become in taking on and successfully accomplishing new ones. You know that even if you fail, it won't destroy you, because your self-esteem is high. And the more you risk, the more you win in life. The more shots you take, the more chances you have of scoring. Knowing that you have had successes in the past will give you the self-confidence that you can have more successes in the future. So let's look at some simple but powerful ways to build and maintain high levels of self-confidence and self-esteem. Begin with nine major successes. Here is a simple way to begin an inventory of your major successes. Consider having your spouse or family do this exercise, too. Start by dividing your life into three equal time periods. For example, if you are 45 years old, your three time periods would be from birth to age 15, 16 to 30 years, and 31 to 45 years. Then list three successes you've had for each time period. To help get you started, I've listed my own below. First third, birth to age 23. 1. 
elected patrol leader in the Boy Scouts. 2. Caught winning touchdown pass to win city championship game. 3. Graduated from Harvard University. 2nd 3rd, age 24 to 47. 1. Earned my master's degree in education from the University of Massachusetts. 2. Published my first book. 3. Founded the New England Center for Personal and Organizational Development. Final third, age 47 to 70. 1. Founded the Canfield Training Group. 2. Chicken Soup for the Soul hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. 3. Achieved goal of having spoken professionally in all 50 states. Can you list 100 successes? To really convince yourself that you're a successful person who can continue to achieve great things, the next step of this exercise is to make a list of 100 successes you've had in your life. My experience is that most people do fine coming up with the first 30 or so. Then it becomes a little more difficult. To come up with 100, you're going to have to list things like learning to ride a bicycle, singing a solo at church, getting your first summer job, the first time you got a hit in Little League, making the cheerleading squad, getting your driver's license, writing an article for your school newspaper, getting an A in Mr. Simon's history class, surviving basic training, learning to surf, winning a ribbon at the county fair, modifying your first car, getting married, having your first child, and leading a fundraising campaign for your child's school. These are all things you probably take for granted now, but they all need to be acknowledged as successes you've had in life. If you are young, you may even need to resort to writing down things like past first grade, past second grade, past third grade, but that's okay. The goal is simply to get to 100. Create a victory log. Another powerful way to keep adding to the stack of poker chips is to keep a written record of your daily successes. It can be as simple as a running list in a spiral-bound notebook, or a document on your computer, or it can be as elaborate as a leather-bound journal. By recalling and writing down your successes each day, you log them into your long-term memory, which enhances your self-esteem and builds your self-confidence. And later, if you need a boost of self-confidence, you can reread what you have written down. Peter Thigpen, a former vice president at Levi Strauss and Company, kept such a victory log on his desk, and every time he had a victory or a win, he wrote it down. When he was about to do something scary, such as negotiate for a multi-million dollar bank loan or make a speech to the board of directors, he would read his victory log to build up his self-confidence. His list included entries such as, I opened up China as a market. I got my teenage son to clean up his room. And I got the board to approve the new expansion plan. When most people are about to embark on some frightening task, they have a tendency to focus on all the times they tried before and didn't succeed, which undermines their self-confidence and feeds their fear that they will fail again. Keeping and referring to your victory log keeps you focused on your successes instead. Start your own victory log as soon as possible. If you want, you can also embellish it like a scrapbook with photos, certificates, memos, and other reminders of your success. If many of your victories are featured on the Internet, for example, if you're an athlete, artist, author, or business person who appears in online news, photo galleries, interviews, or book reviews, you can make a digital scrapbook using the online tool called Pinterest. Pinterest lets you collect links or bookmarks to photos, quotes, and written content featured anywhere on the Internet. Simply start an account at www.pinterest.com and begin pinning things you find online that talk about, portray, or visually capture your victories, such as news articles, blog posts, web pages, or photographs. Collect and organize these pins on your Pinterest board, which is created and controlled by you. If you like, you can share your victory log with friends and family, or with other Pinterest users who want to follow your board. 
And if you own a business and want to use some of your victories for promotional or public relations purposes, simply share your entire Pinterest board or share a subset of accomplishments by collecting them into themes or topics. Display your success symbols. Researchers have discovered that what you see in your environment has a psychological impact on your moods, your attitudes, and your behavior. Your environment has a great deal of influence over you. But here's an even more important fact. You have almost total control over your immediate environment. You get to choose what pictures are hung on your bedroom or office wall, what memorabilia gets taped to your refrigerator or locker door, and what mementos you place on your desk or in your cubicle at work. A valuable technique that will help build your self-esteem and motivate you to greater future success is the practice of surrounding yourself with awards, pictures, and other objects that remind you of your successes. These might include medals from your armed services days, a picture of you scoring the winning touchdown, a picture of you standing on the Great Wall of China, your wedding picture, a trophy, a framed copy of the poem you had published in the local newspaper, a letter of thanks, your college diploma, or your Eagle Scout badge or Girl Scout gold award. Make a special place, a special shelf, the top of your dresser, the refrigerator door, a victory wall in the hallway you pass through every day, and fill it with your success symbols. Clean out that special drawer, those boxes in the closet, your files, then frame, laminate, polish, and display those symbols of your success so that you will see them every day. This will have a powerful effect on your subconscious mind. It will subtly program you to see yourself as a winner, someone who has consistent successes in life. It will also convey this message to others. It will instill confidence in you and in others for you. This is also a great thing to do for your children. Proudly display their success symbols as well. Papers, ribbons, artwork, photographs of them in their baseball uniform or playing the violin, photographs of them enjoying themselves, trophies, medals, and other awards. If you have children living at home, frame their best artwork and hang it on the walls of the kitchen, their rooms, and the hallways in the house. When they see these framed and on the wall, it can be a major boost to their self-esteem. The Mirror Exercise You are a living magnet. What you attract into your life is in harmony with your dominant thoughts. Brian Tracy Leading Authority on the Development of Human Potential and Personal Effectiveness Just as you acknowledge your big successes, you need to acknowledge your small daily successes, too. The mirror exercise is based on the principle that we all need acknowledgement. But the most important acknowledgement is the acknowledgement you give yourself. The mirror exercise gives your inner child, which resides in your subconscious mind, the positive strokes it needs to pursue further achievements. It helps change any negative beliefs you have toward praise and accomplishment and puts you in an achieving frame of mind. Do this exercise for a minimum of three months. After that, you can decide whether you want to continue. I know some very successful people who have been doing this every night for years. Just before going to bed. Stand in front of a mirror and appreciate yourself for all that you have accomplished during the day. Start with a few seconds of looking directly into the eyes of the person in the mirror, your mirror image looking back at you. Then address yourself by name and begin appreciating yourself out loud for the following things. Any achievements, business, financial, educational, personal, physical, spiritual, or emotional. Any personal disciplines you kept, dietary, exercise, reading, meditation, prayer. Any temptations that you did not give in to, eating dessert, lying, watching too much TV, staying up too late, drinking too much. Maintain eye contact with yourself throughout the exercise. When you're finished appreciating yourself, complete the exercise by continuing to look deep into your own eyes and saying, I love you. Then stand there for another few seconds to really feel the impact of the experience. 
as if you were the one in the mirror who had just listened to all of this appreciation. The important thing during this last part is to not just turn away from the mirror feeling embarrassed or thinking of yourself or the exercise as stupid or silly. Here is an example of what your exercise might sound like. Jack, I want to appreciate you for the following things today. First, I want to appreciate you for going to bed on time last night without staying up too late watching TV, so that you got up bright and early this morning and had a really good conversation with Inga. And then you meditated for twenty minutes and worked out for thirty minutes before you took a shower. You ate a healthy, low-fat, low-carbohydrate breakfast. You got to work on time and led a very good staff meeting with your support team. You did a great job of helping everyone listen to everybody's feelings and ideas. And you were great at drawing out the quiet ones. Let's see. Oh, and then you ate a really healthy lunch, soup and salad. And you didn't have the dessert that was offered. And you drank the ten glasses of water that you committed to drinking every day. And then, let's see, you finished editing the new Train the Trainer manual, and you got a really good start on scheduling the summer management training program. And then you filled in your daily success focus journal before you left work. Oh, and you appreciated Veronica for solving the problems with the travel schedule. It was great to see how she just lit up. And when you got home, you called Oren and talked with your grandson on Skype. That was really special. And now you're going to bed at a good time again, and not staying up all night surfing the Internet. You were great today. And one more thing. Jack, I love you. It is not unusual to have a number of reactions the first few times you do this. You might feel silly, embarrassed, like crying, or actually begin crying, or just generally uncomfortable. Occasionally, people have even reported breaking out in hives, feeling hot and sweaty, or feeling a little lightheaded. These are natural and normal reactions, as this is a very unfamiliar thing to be doing. We are not trained to acknowledge ourselves. In fact, we are mostly trained to do the opposite. Don't toot your own horn. Don't get a swelled head. Don't get a stuffed shirt. Pride is a sin. When you begin to act more positive and nurturing toward yourself, it is natural to have physical and emotional reactions as you release the old negative parental wounds, unrealistic expectations, and self-judgments. If you experience any of these things, and not all people do, don't let these things stop you. They are only temporary and will pass after a few days of doing the exercise. When I first began to do this exercise, after just 40 days, I noticed that all my negative internal self-talk had totally vanished, crowded out by the daily positive focus of the mirror exercise. I used to berate myself for things like misplacing my car keys or my glasses. That critical voice just simply disappeared. The same kind of thing can happen for you, but only if you take the time to actually do the exercise. One note to remember. If you find yourself lying in bed realizing you haven't done the mirror exercise yet, get out of bed and do it. Looking at yourself in the mirror is a critical part of the exercise. And one last bit of advice. Be sure to let your spouse, children, roommate, or parents know in advance that you will be doing this exercise each evening for the next three months or more. You don't want them to walk in on you and think you've lost your mind. In fact, you are powerfully retraining your mind to focus on the positive while building up your stack of poker chips. Reward Your Inner Child Inside all of us, there are three distinct and totally separate ego states that work in concert to make up our unique personality. We have a parent-like ego, an adult ego, and a childlike ego, who act much the same way that parents, adults, and children do in real life. Your adult ego state is the rational part of yourself. It gathers data and makes logical decisions devoid of emotion. It plans your schedule, balances your checkbook, figures out your taxes, and determines when to rotate your tires. Your parent-like ego tells you to tie your shoes, brush your teeth, eat your vegetables, do your homework, exercise, meet your deadlines, and finish your projects. 
It has two sides to it. The negative side shows up as your inner critic, the part that judges you when you don't live up to its standards. The positive side shows up as the nurturing part of yourself that makes sure you're protected, taken care of, and provided for. It is also the part that validates, appreciates, and acknowledges you for doing a good job. Your childlike ego, on the other hand, does what all children do. It whines, begs for attention, craves hugs, and acts out when it doesn't get its needs met. As we go through life, it's almost as if we have a three-year-old holding on to us who's constantly asking, Why are we sitting at this desk? Why aren't we having more fun? Why am I still up at three in the morning? Why am I reading this boring report? As the parent of this inner child, one of your most important tasks is to engage it and reward it for behaving while you get your work done. If you had a three-year-old in real life, you might say, Mommy has to finish this proposal in the next twenty minutes, but after Mommy's done, we'll go for an ice cream or play a video game. Your real-life three-year-old would probably answer, Okay, I'll be good because I know I'm going to get something good at the end of it. Well, not surprisingly, your inner child is no different. When you ask it to be still, let you finish your work, stay up late, and so on, it will behave as long as it knows there's a reward at the end for behaving. At some point, it needs to know it will get to read a novel, go to the movies, play with a friend, listen to music, go dancing, let loose, eat out, get a new toy, or take a vacation. A big part of creating more success in your life is rewarding yourself when you succeed. In reality, rewarding yourself for your successes keeps your inner child happy and compliant the next time it must behave while you work hard. It knows it can trust you to eventually deliver on your promises. If you don't, just like a real child, it will start to sabotage your efforts by doing things like getting sick, having accidents, or making mistakes that cost you a promotion or even your job, so that you are forced to take some time off and that will only take you farther away from the success you want to create. A Sense of Completion Another reason to celebrate your successes is that you don't feel complete until you have been acknowledged. It gives you a sense of accomplishment and recognition. If you spend weeks producing a report and your boss doesn't acknowledge it, you are left feeling incomplete. If you send someone a gift and they don't acknowledge receiving it, you end up with this sense of incompletion. There's this little incomplete taking up space inside your mind. Your mind needs to complete the cycle, thus freeing up space that would be better used focusing on your goals. Of course, even more important than just achieving a state of completion, the simple, enjoyable act of acknowledging and rewarding our successes causes your subconscious mind to say, Hey, succeeding is cool. Every time we produce a success, we get to do something fun. Jack will buy us something we want or take us someplace neat. Let's have more of these successes, so Jack will take us out to play more. Rewarding yourself for your wins powerfully reinforces your subconscious mind's desire to want to work harder for you. It's just basic human nature. Principle 27 Keep your eye on the prize. It's easy to be negative and unmotivated, but it takes some work to be positive and motivated. While there's no off button for those relentless tapes, there are things that you can do to turn down the volume and shift your focus from the negative to the positive. Donna Cardillo, RN, speaker, entrepreneur, humorist, and master motivator. Successful people maintain a positive focus in life no matter what is going on around them. They stay focused on their past successes rather than their past failures, and on the next action steps that will get them closer to the fulfillment of their goals rather than on all the other distractions that life presents to them. They are constantly proactive in the pursuit of their chosen objectives. The Most Important 45 Minutes of the Day an important part of any focusing regiment is to set aside time at the end of the day, just before going to sleep, to acknowledge your successes, review your goals, 
focus on your successful future, and make specific plans for what you want to accomplish the next day. Why do I suggest the end of the day? Because whatever you read, see, listen to, talk about, and experience during the last 45 minutes of the day has a huge influence on your sleep and your next day. During the night, your unconscious mind replays and processes this late-night input up to six times more often than anything else you experience during the day. This is why cramming for school exams late at night can work, and why watching a scary movie before bed will give you nightmares. This is also why reading good bedtime stories is so important for children, not just to get them to fall asleep, but because the repeated messages, lessons, and morals of the story become part of the fabric of the child's consciousness. As you drift off to sleep, you enter into the alpha brain wave state of consciousness, a state in which you are very suggestible. If you drift off to sleep after watching the late news, that is what you'll be imprinting into your consciousness. War, crime, automobile accidents, rape, robbery, murder, gang wars, drive-by shootings, kidnappings, and corporate scandals. Think how much better it would be to read an inspirational autobiography or a self-improvement book instead. Imagine the power of meditating, listening to a self-help audio program, or taking the time to plan your next day right before you go to sleep. Here are two exercises that will keep you positively focused and moving forward at the end of the day. The Evening Review This is a powerful exercise to help you more quickly install a new positive behavior, like punctuality, habit, like listening more, or quality, like patience or mindfulness. You'll be amazed at how fast this technique can lead to permanent change. Sit with your eyes closed. Breathe deeply and give yourself one of the following directions. Show me where I could have been more effective today. Show me where I could have been more conscious today. Show me where I could have been a better fill-in-your-profession, manager, teacher, coach, salesperson, etc. today. Show me where I could have been more loving today. Show me where I could have been more assertive today. Show me where I could have been more fill in any quality or characteristic today. As you sit calmly in a state of quiet receptivity, you'll see that a number of events from the day will come to mind. Just observe them without any judgment or self-criticism. When no more events come to mind, take each incident and replay it in your mind the way you would have preferred to have done it had you been more conscious and intentional at the time. This creates a subconscious image that will help evoke the desired behavior the next time a similar situation occurs. Create your ideal day. Another powerful tool to keep you focused on creating your life exactly as you want it to be is to take a few minutes after you have planned your next day's schedule and visualize the entire day going exactly as you want it. Visualize everyone being there when you call them, every meeting starting and ending on time, all of your priorities being handled, all of your errands being completed with ease, making every sale, and so on. See yourself performing at your best in every situation you will encounter during the next day. This will give your subconscious all night to work on creating ways to make it all happen just as you have visualized it. We also now know that every thought you think is broadcast out to the universe on what my friend and success coach Robert Scheinfeld calls the Internet. So when you are visualizing your ideal day, you are also sending out your intention to the other people involved through what the physicists call the quantum field. Get into the habit now of visualizing your ideal next day the night before. It will make a huge difference in your life. Principle 28 Clean up your messes and your incompletes. If a cluttered desk is the sign of a cluttered mind, what is the significance of a clean desk? Lawrence J. Peter, American educator and author. The Cycle of Completion Decide, Plan, Start, Continue, Finish, Complete
It's called the cycle of completion. Each of these steps, decide, plan, start, continue, finish, and complete, is required to succeed at anything, to get a desired result, to finish. Yet how many of us never complete? We get all the way through the finishing stage, but leave one last thing undone. Are there areas in your life when you've left uncompleted projects or failed to get closure with people? When you don't complete the past, you can't be free to fully embrace the present. Failing to complete robs you of valuable attention units. When you start a project or make an agreement or identify a change you need to make, it goes into your present memory bank and takes up what I call an attention unit. We can only pay attention to so many things at one time, and each promise, agreement, or item on your to-do list leaves fewer attention units to dedicate to completing present tasks and bringing new opportunities in abundance into your life. So why don't people complete? Often, incompletes represent areas in our life where we are not clear or where we have emotional and psychological blocks. For instance, you might have a lot of requests, projects, tasks, and other things on your desk you really want to say no to, but you're afraid of being perceived as the bad guy, so you put off responding in order to avoid saying no. Meanwhile, the sticky notes and stacks of paper pile up and distract you. There may also be circumstances in which you have to make decisions that are difficult or uncomfortable, so rather than struggle with the discomfort, you let the incompletes pile up. Some incompletions come from simply not having adequate systems, knowledge, or expertise for handling these tasks. Other incompletions pile up because of our bad work habits. Get into completion consciousness. Continually ask yourself, what does it take to actually get this task completed? Then you can begin to consciously take that next step of filing completed documents, mailing in the forms required, or reporting back to your boss that the project has been completed. The truth is that 20 things completed have more power than 50 things half completed. One finished book, for instance, that can go out and influence the world is better than 13 books you're in the process of writing. Rather than starting 15 projects that end up incomplete and take up space in the house, you'd be better off if you had started just three and completed them. The Four Ds of Completion One way to take care of to-do items is something we've all seen in time management courses, the Four Ds. Do it, delegate it, delay it, or dump it. When you pick up a piece of paper, Decide then and there whether you'll ever do anything with it. If not, dump it. If you can take care of it within 10 minutes, do it immediately. If you still want to take care of it yourself but know it'll take longer, delay it by filing it in a folder of things to do later. If you can't do it yourself or don't want to take the time, delegate it to someone you trust to accomplish the task. Be sure to have the person report back when he or she finishes the task so that you know it is complete. Making space for something new. In addition to professional incompletes, most households are also groaning under the weight of too much clutter, too many papers, worn-out clothes, unused toys, forgotten personal effects, and obsolete, broken, and unneeded items. In the United States, the entire mini-storage industry has sprung up to help homeowners and small businesses store what they no longer can fit into their homes and offices. But do we really need all this stuff? Of course not. One of the ways to free up attention units is to free your living and work environments from the mental burden of all this clutter. When you clear out the old, you also make room for something new. Take a look at your clothes closet, for instance. If you've got one of those where you can't put another thing into it, where you struggle to pull out a dress or shirt, that may be one reason why you don't have more new clothes. There's nowhere to put them. If you haven't worn something in six months, and it's not a seasonal or a special occasion item, such as an evening gown or tuxedo, get rid of it. If there's anything new that you want in your life, gotta make room for it. 
I mean that psychologically as well as physically. If you want a new man in your life, you've got to let go of, forgive and forget, the last one you stopped dating five years ago. Because if you don't, when a new man meets you, the unspoken message he picks up is, this woman's attached to somebody else. She hasn't let go. A woman in one of my seminars admitted that for years she kept piles of books and magazines on her bed, a collection that eventually covered over half the available sleeping space. When she also mentioned that she had suffered terribly from a broken romantic relationship, it was instantly obvious to me that covering half her bed with piles of reading material was her unconscious way of making sure there was no space for a man who might be romantically interested in her. Not only had she failed to complete the past, the part of her that was afraid of being hurt again was making darn sure a similar unwanted future didn't show up either. After helping her see the connection between this self-imposed barrier and the lack of romance in her life, she used EFT tapping to release her fear of being hurt. See page 304. Cleared the clutter off her bed and made her bedroom inviting and welcoming again. Within months, she met a wonderful man who has become the love of her life. My good friend Martin Root once told me that whenever he wants to bring in new business, he thoroughly cleans his office, home, car, and garage. Every time he does, he starts getting calls and letters from people who want to work with him. Others find that doing spring cleaning helps them gain new clarity on problems, challenges, opportunities, and relationships. When we don't throw away clutter and items we no longer need, it's as if we don't trust our ability to manifest the necessary abundance in our lives to buy new ones when we need them. But incompletes like this keep that very abundance from showing up. We need to complete the past so that our present has the space to show up more fully. 25 Ways to Complete Before Moving Forward How many things do you need to complete, dump, or delegate before you can move on and bring new activity, abundance, relationships, and excitement into your life? Use this checklist to jog your thinking, make a list, and then write down how you'll complete each task. Once you've made your list, choose four items and start completing them. Choose those that would immediately free up the most time, energy, or space for you, whether it's mental space or physical space. At minimum, I encourage you to clean up one major incomplete every three months. If you want to really get the ball rolling, schedule a completion weekend and devote two full days to handling as many things on the following list as possible. 1. Former business activities that need completion. 2. Promises not kept, not acknowledged, or not renegotiated. 3. Unpaid debts or financial commitments, money owed to others or to you. 4. Closets overflowing with clothing never worn. 5. A disorganized garage crowded with old discards. 6. Half-hazard or disorganized tax records. 7. Checkbook not balanced or accounts that should be closed. 8. Junk drawers full of unusable items. 9. Missing or broken tools. 10. An attic filled with unused items. 11. A card trunk or back seat full of trash. 12. Incomplete car maintenance. 13. A disorganized basement filled with discarded items. 14. Credenza packed with unfiled or incomplete projects. 15. Filing left undone. 16. Computer files not backed up or data needing to be converted for storage. 17. Desk surface cluttered or disorganized. 18. Family pictures never put into an album. 19. Mending, ironing, or other piles of items to repair or discard. 20. Deferred household maintenance. 21. Personal relationships with unstated requests, resentments, or appreciations. 22. People you need to forgive. 
23. Time not spent with people you've been meaning to spend time with. 24. Incomplete projects or projects delivered without closure or feedback. 25. Acknowledgements that need to be given or asked for. What's irritating you? Like incompletes, daily irritants are equally damaging to your success because they too take up attention units. Perhaps it is the missing button on your favorite suit that keeps you from wearing it to an important meeting, or the torn screen on your patio door that lets in annoying insects. One of the best things you can do to move further and faster along your success path is to fix, replace, mend, or get rid of those daily irritants that annoy you and stay on your mind. Tulane Me Danner, the author of Coach Yourself to Success, recommends walking through every room of your house, your garage, and all around your property, jotting down those things that irritate, annoy, or bother you, and then arranging to get each one handled. Of course, none of these may be urgent to your business or life-threatening to your family, but every time you notice them and wish they were different, they pull energy from you. They are subtly subtracting energy from your life instead of adding energy to your life. They are expiring you rather than inspiring you. Another negative psychological impact of not handling those incompletes and tolerating those things that irritate you is that it creates a state of resignation in you that affects your belief in your ability to achieve your bigger goals. Subconsciously, your mind is thinking, if I can't find a stapler when I want it, and my filing system is dysfunctional, what makes me think I can start my own company or become a millionaire? Consider hiring a professional organizer to get you started. The mission of the National Association of Professional Organizers, NAPO, is to help you declutter your life and build systems to ensure that things stay that way. You may need someone who has a dispassionate eye to look beyond your attachments, familiarity, and fears, and be neutral in a way you can't. Plus, NAPO members are experts in how to make things efficient and easy. It's their profession. For about the cost of several business lunches, you can hire an organizer from your local area for a day of work. Additionally, you can hire people to clean your home, as well as handle all the little irritants, maintenance chores, and other tasks you either don't want to do or aren't skilled enough to do. If your finances don't allow for a professional organizer, ask a friend to help. Hire a neighborhood teen or the stay-at-home mom down the street. You can also read one of the many good how-to books and tackle things yourself. I recommend my favorites at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Just remember that you don't need to get it done all at once. Choose one each month. Just as cleaning up your incompletes is important to your successful future, there is literally no excuse for enduring the disorganization in your life. Principle 29. Complete the past to embrace the future. None of us can change our yesterdays, but all of us can change our tomorrows. Colin Powell, former Secretary of State of the United States of America under President George W. Bush. Does this sound familiar? Some people go through life as if they have a big anchor behind them, weighing them down. If they could release it, they would be able to move faster and succeed more easily. Perhaps that's you, holding on to past hurts, past incompletes, past anger or fear. Yet releasing these anchors can often be the final step you need to complete your past and embrace the future. I have known people who have forgiven their parents and doubled their income in the ensuing few months, as well as doubled their productivity and doubled their ability to achieve things. I have known others who have forgiven their aggressors for past harm and been relieved of actual physical ailments. The truth is, we need to let go of the past to embrace the future. One method I use for this is called the Total Truth Process. The Total Truth Process and Total Truth Letter The Total Truth Process and the Total Truth Letter 
are two tools to help you release negative emotions from the past and come back to your natural state of love and joy in the present. I want to thank John Gray and Barbara DeAngelis who first taught me this process. The reason I call it total truth is that often when we're upset, we fail to communicate all our true feelings to the person we're upset with. We get stuck at the level of anger or pain and rarely move past it to emotional completion. As a result, it can be difficult to feel close to, or even at ease with, the other person after such an angry or painful confrontation. The total truth process helps you express all your true feelings, so you can recapture the caring, closeness, and cooperation that is your natural state. The process is designed so as not to let you dump or discharge negative emotions onto another person but to allow you to move through the negative emotions and release them so that you can return to the state of love and acceptance that is your natural state of being, and from which joy and creativity can flow. The Stages of the Total Truth Process The Total Truth Process can be conducted verbally or in writing. Whichever method you choose, the goal is to express the anger, hurt, and fear and then move toward understanding, forgiveness, and love. If you do it verbally, always with the other person's permission, begin by expressing your anger, and then move through each stage all the way to the final stage of love, compassion, and forgiveness. You can use the following prompts to keep you focused at each stage. For the process to be effective, you need to spend an equal amount of time on each of the six stages. 1. Anger and resentment. I'm angry that. I hate it when. I'm fed up with. I resent. 2. Hurt. It hurt me when. I felt sad when. I feel hurt that. I feel disappointed about. 3. Fear. I was afraid that. I feel scared when. I get afraid of you when I am afraid that I 4. Remorse, regret, and accountability I'm sorry that Please forgive me for I'm sorry for I didn't mean to 5. Wants All I ever want or wanted I want you to I want or wanted. I deserve. 6. Love, compassion, forgiveness, and appreciation. I understand that. I appreciate. I love you for. I forgive you for. Thank you for. If you're uncomfortable doing it verbally, or if the other person cannot or will not participate, you can put your feelings in writing using the Total Truth Letter to express your true feelings. The Total Truth Letter Follow these steps when writing a Total Truth Letter. 1. Write a letter to the person who has upset you, with roughly equal portions of the letter expressing each of the feelings in the Total Truth process. 2. If the other party is not someone who is likely to agree to cooperate with this process, you may choose to simply throw the letter away once you have completed it. Remember, the main purpose here is to get you free from the unexpressed emotions, not to necessarily change the other person. 3. If the person you are upset with is willing to participate, have him or her write a total truth letter to you, too. Then exchange letters. Both of you should be present when you read the letters. Then discuss the experience. Avoid trying to defend your position. Make an effort to understand where the other person is coming from as you read their letter. After some practice, you may find you can go through the six stages of the process quickly and less formally, but in times of great difficulty, you will still want to use the six stages as a guideline. Forgive and move on. As long as you don't forgive, who and whatever it is will occupy rent-free space in your mind. Isabel Holland, award-winning author of 28 books. 
although it may seem unusual to mention forgiveness in a book on how to become more successful. The reality is that anger, resentment, and the desire for revenge can waste valuable energy that could be more effectively applied toward positive goal-directed action. In light of the law of attraction, we have already discussed that you attract more of whatever feelings you are experiencing. Being negative, angry, or unforgiving about a past hurt only ensures that you'll continue to attract more of the same into your life. Forgive and bring yourself back to the present. In the world of business, in families, and in personal relationships, we too need to come from a place of love and forgiveness, to let go so that we can move on. You need to forgive a business partner who lied to you and hurt you financially. You need to forgive a co-worker who stole credit for your work or gossiped about you behind your back. You need to forgive an ex-spouse who cheated on you, then got nasty during the divorce. You needn't condone their actions or ever trust them again. But you do need to learn whatever lessons there are, forgive the other person, and move on. When you do forgive, it puts you back in the present, where good things can happen to you and where you can take action to create future gains for yourself, your team, your company, and your family. Staying mired in the past uses valuable energy and robs you of the power you need to forge ahead in the creation of what you want. But it's so hard to let go. I know how hard it can be to forgive and let go. I've been kidnapped and assaulted by a stranger, been physically abused by an alcoholic father, been the victim of reverse racism, had employees embezzle serious amounts of money from me, been sued in some blatantly frivolous lawsuits, and been taken advantage of in a number of business dealings. But after each experience, I did the work of processing it and forgiving the other party, because I knew that if I didn't, these past hurts would eat away at me and prevent me from focusing my full attention on enjoying the present and creating the future life I wanted. With each experience, I also learned how to avoid letting it happen again. I learned how to better follow my intuition. I learned how to better protect myself, my family, and my hard-earned assets. And each time I finally released the experience, I felt lighter, freer, and stronger, with more energy to focus on the more important tasks at hand. There was no more negative self-talk, no more bitter recriminations. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Nelson Mandela, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Whatever hurts you are feeling, no that I've felt many of them too, but also know that what can hurt you even more is harboring the resentment, holding a grudge, and rerunning the same hatred over and over. The word forgive really means to give it up for yourself, not for them. I've had people in my seminars who, when they finally truly forgive someone, release long-term migraine headaches within minutes find immediate relief from chronic constipation and colitis, release their arthritis pain, improve their eyesight, and immediately experience a host of other physical benefits. One man actually lost six pounds in the next two days without changing his eating habits. I have also seen people subsequently create miracles in their careers and financial lives. Believe me, it is definitely worth the intention and the effort. Steps to Forgiving The following steps are all integral to forgiving. 1. Acknowledge your anger and resentment. 2. Acknowledge the hurt and pain it created. 3. Acknowledge the fears and self-doubts that it created. 4. Acknowledge any part you may have played in letting the behavior or the event occur or letting it continue. 5. Acknowledge what you were wanting that you didn't get, and then put yourself in the other person's shoes and attempt to understand where he or she was coming from at that time, and what needs they were trying to meet, however inelegantly, by their behavior. 6. Let go and forgive the person. If you're paying attention, you probably notice that these steps involve the same six stages as the total truth process. 
make a list. Make a list of anyone you feel has hurt you and how. Blank hurt me by blank. Then one by one, taking as many days as you need, go through the total truth process with each person. You can do it as a written process or a verbal process where you pretend you are talking to the person who is sitting in an empty chair across from you. Make sure you take ample time to think about what must have been going on in each person's life at the time to make him or her do whatever they did to you. Remember that all people, including you, are always doing the best they can to meet their basic needs with the awareness, knowledge, skills, and tools they have at the time. If they could have done better, they would have done better. As they develop more awareness of how their behavior affects others, and as they learn more effective and less harmful ways to meet their needs, they will behave in less harmful ways. Think about it. No parent ever wakes up in the morning and says to his or her mate, I've just figured out three more ways we can screw up the kids. Parents are always doing the best they can to be good parents. But the combination of their own psychological wounds, their lack of knowledge and parenting skills, and the pressure of their lives often converge to create behaviors that hurt us. It is not personal to you. They would have done the same thing to anyone who was in your shoes at that moment. The same is true for everyone else in your life, all the time. If they can do it, you can do it. In my search over the years for inspirational stories for the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, I have found many stories of forgiveness that let me know that human beings can forgive anything, no matter how tragic or brutal. In 1972, the Pulitzer Prize was awarded for a photograph of a young Vietnamese girl, her arms outstretched in terror and pain, running naked, her clothes having been seared from her body, and screaming from her village which had just been bombed with napalm in the Vietnam War. That photo was reprinted thousands of times around the world, can still be found in high school history books. That day, Phan Thi Kim Phuc suffered third-degree burns over more than half of her body. After 17 operations and 14 months of painful rehabilitation, Kim miraculously survived. Having overcome her painful past through a process of forgiveness, she is now a Canadian citizen, goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Educational and Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, and the founder of the Kim Foundation, which helps innocent victims of war. Everyone who has ever met Kim comments on the amazing quality of peace that radiates from her. In 1978, Simon Weston joined the Welsh Guards in Great Britain. As part of the Falklands Task Force, he was aboard the Sir Galahad when it was bombed by Argentine planes. His face was badly disfigured, as he suffered burns over 49% of his body. He has undergone 70 operations since that fateful day, and will still have to endure more. It would be easy for him to spend the rest of his life being bitter. Instead, he says, if you spend your life full of recriminations and bitterness— then you failed yourself, failed the surgeons and nurses and everyone else, because you aren't giving anything back. Hatred can consume you, and it's wasted emotion. Instead of drowning in a sea of bitterness, Simon has become an author, a motivational speaker, and the co-founder and vice president of Weston Spirit, a non-profit organization that has worked with tens of thousands of young people whose lifestyles reflect a poverty of aspiration in the United Kingdom. Like Simon and Kim, you can transcend and triumph, too. Tapping Away Past Hurts Of course, many of these past hurts get stored in the mind, and even in the body, affecting all our future actions and decisions. For many people in my trainings, getting past their past is difficult, painful, and, until the last decade or so, very difficult, particularly if they have experienced violence, trauma, or abuse early in life. But over the last ten years, I've been using a little-known but highly effective, drug-free, and non-invasive way to reduce or eliminate this post-traumatic stress with individuals I work with. 
It also helps reduce chronic pain, anxiety, phobias, and fears, limiting beliefs, plus many stress-related medical conditions. The technique is so powerful that it has been used with genocide victims in Rwanda and Bosnia, for disaster victims in Haiti, and is even used by a trainer of the British Special Forces in the Congo, and with U.S. soldiers returning with post-traumatic stress disorder from the battlefield. Called tapping therapy, it stimulates the body's own ability to release stored pain of any kind. And the results are nothing short of miraculous. For thousands of years, Eastern cultures have focused their methods for healing medical conditions on stimulating energy meridians, or pathways, throughout the body. These energy pathways send electrical impulses throughout the body to keep all systems working. But, in addition to moving and storing energy, it was discovered they also store emotions. Some healthcare professionals even believe that an illness or chronic pain in a specific area of the body is the result of a specific emotional pain stored in that meridian. Thirty-four years ago, clinical psychologist Dr. Roger Callahan, the originator of tapping therapy, discovered that you could stimulate the instant release of these stored emotions by tapping along these meridians in acupressure-like fashion, while focusing your mind on the past hurt or current stress, phobia, fear, or anxiety. He called his method Thought Field Therapy, or TFT. And today, Dr. Callahan's Institute trains practicing therapists, healthcare professionals, and everyday people in how to use TFT both in clinical settings and at home. Others, most notably Gary Craig and Nick Ortner, have brought TFT to the masses as the Emotional Freedom Technique, EFT, and Meridian Tapping Therapy. My book, Tapping into Ultimate Success, describes how to use tapping to free yourself from these stored anxieties, stresses, and emotional hurts, and focuses on helping you to better implement the principles in this book, The Success Principles, by tapping away any limiting beliefs, fears, and internal obstacles that arise when you are attempting to apply any of the principles. The first part of the tapping protocol is to close your eyes, Focus on the fear, anxiety, emotion, pain, or belief that you wish to release, and then determine on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being high, how intense the feeling or belief is. The basic tapping sequence to eliminate fears and negative beliefs and to neutralize negative events then starts by tapping the karate chop spot on the heel of your hand 10 times, firmly enough to feel it but not hard enough to bruise your hand. As you tap your hand, repeat aloud the belief, physical pain, or experience of hurt you are dealing with, as you, most important, tune in to the emotion that belief or hurt brings forth. Follow your statement of the belief or hurt with the affirmation, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. For example, even though I'm afraid to ask for a raise, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Or, even though I believe I don't deserve to be successful, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Once you've tapped the karate chop spot ten times, begin the EFT tapping sequence here while continuing to focus on the past hurt, limiting belief, emotion, stress, pain, or source of anxiety. Tap five to seven times firmly at each point. Accompany each tapping point with a statement that keeps you focused on the emotion, like this. One, top of the head. I'm afraid to ask for a raise. Two, eyebrow. I'm afraid to ask for a raise. Three, outside of eye. I'm afraid he'll say no, and I'll be embarrassed. Four, under the eye. I'll be embarrassed. 5. Under the nose. I'll be so embarrassed if he says no. 6. Chin. I'll be mortified if he says no. 7. Collarbone. I'm afraid to ask for a raise. 8. Under the arm. I'll be so embarrassed. The exact words you say aren't important. 
What's important is that you are continually tuned in to your emotion. Additionally, you can tap the eyebrow, under the eye, collarbone, and under the arm spots on either side of your body. Repeat the sequence, repeating your phrase again and again, until you feel the intensity has dropped down to a one or is totally gone. Tapping therapy also works miraculously for serious phobias of all kinds. Actress and talk show host Kelly Ripa had a severe fear of flying, resulting from the trauma of watching airplanes hit the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. When her producers wanted to tape the Live with Regis and Kelly show from Disneyland in California, she knew she needed to overcome her fear of flying in order to make the trip. Working with Dr. Callahan, who treated her with tapping therapy over the phone in New York, she was able to comfortably get on a plane and make the five-hour flight. Kelly was so delighted that she invited Dr. Callahan on the TV show to treat amusement park guests for their fear of roller coasters. Seventeen people rode a whopper of a roller coaster just moments later, with most saying they wanted to ride again. I have used tapping to help people in my seminars overcome the fear of flying, fear of public speaking, fear of singing in front of others, fear of heights, claustrophobia, and the fear of drowning. Here is what Sharon Worsley, one of my Train the Trainer students, posted on the Internet. Having been a swimmer when I was younger, I had two bad experiences where I nearly drowned at age 12 and 15. For the rest of my life, I was not able to go back into the water. In fact, if I were to speak to you about swimming, I would start to get a physical reaction where my head would start to rise as if I was trying to prevent myself from going under in an imaginary pool. It was debilitating, as I was missing out on having fun with my friends when I traveled as they were enjoying the pool or the ocean, and I was sitting there watching them. Plus, I didn't like this feeling of disempowerment. Well, all that changed on a hot night in June 2010. It was the last night of Jack Canfield's inaugural Train the Trainer program where I was a participant. There I was watching my fellow attendees enjoy the spectacular pool at the Fairmont Scottsdale Princess while I had been standing on the sideline. A friend did eventually coax me into the pool somehow, but I couldn't get into the water past my hips, and I was feeling extremely anxious. Jack heard about this and came over to see if he could help me. Then a seemingly impossible miracle happened. Within minutes of Jack using the tapping method on me, I not only went deeper into the water, but I was soon swimming around, including floating on my back unaided, something that I had figured would never happen again. I have since been swimming and no longer have any hesitation or fear. So as you can see, with the amazing power of this simple technique, there is no longer any reason to let fear, limiting beliefs, or past hurts and traumas stop you from achieving anything you want. Principle 30. Face what isn't working. Facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. Aldous Huxley, visionary writer. Our lives improve only when we take chances, and the first and most difficult risk we can take is to be honest with ourselves. Walter Anderson, editor of Parade Magazine for 20 years. If you are going to become more successful, you have to get out of denial and face what isn't working in your life. Do you defend or ignore how toxic your work environment is? Do you make excuses for your bad marriage? Are you in denial about your lack of energy, your excess weight, your ill health, or your level of physical fitness? Are you failing to acknowledge that sales have been on a consistent downward trend for the last three months? Are you putting off confronting an employee who is not delivering at an acceptable standard of performance? Successful people face these circumstances squarely, heed the warning signs, and take appropriate action, no matter how uncomfortable or challenging it might be. Remember the yellow alerts. Remember E plus R equals O and the yellow alerts in Principle 1? Yellow alerts are all those little signals you get when something's not right. 
Your teen comes home late from school again. Strange notices show up in the company mail. A friend or neighbor makes an odd comment. Sometimes we choose to acknowledge these alerts and take action. But more often than not, we simply choose to ignore them. We pretend not to notice that something's amiss. Why? Because to face what's not working in your life usually means you're going to have to do something uncomfortable. You might have to exercise more self-discipline, confront somebody, risk not being liked, ask for what you want, demand respect instead of settling for an abusive relationship, or maybe even quit your job. But because you don't want to do these uncomfortable things, you'll often defend tolerating a situation that doesn't work. What does denial look like? Though the bad situations in our lives can be uncomfortable, embarrassing, and painful, we often live with them, or worse, we hide them behind myths, widely accepted views, and platitudes. We don't even realize we are in denial. We use phrases such as these. It's just what guys do. You can't control teenagers these days. He's just venting his frustrations. It's got nothing to do with me. It's none of my business. It's not my place to say. I don't want to rock the boat. There's nothing I can do about it. Don't wash your dirty linen in public. Credit card debt like this is normal. I'll get fired if I say anything. Mom's church friends check on her. Luckily, it's only marijuana. She's just at that age. I need these to help me relax. I have to work these long hours to get ahead. We just have to wait it out. I'm sure he's going to pay it back. Occasionally, we'll even make up reasons why something that is not working is working, not realizing that if we would just acknowledge the bad situation sooner, it would often be less painful to resolve. It would be cheaper, the circumstances might be more beneficial, the problems would be easier to solve, we could be more honest with everyone concerned, we would feel better about ourselves, and we would certainly have more integrity. But we have to get past our denial. Successful people, on the other hand, are more committed to finding out why things are going wrong and fixing them than they are to defending their own position or maintaining their ignorance. In business, they look at the hard truth in real numbers, rather than recalculating the numbers to look good to the stockholders. They want to know why someone didn't use their product or service, why the ad campaign didn't work, or why expenditures are unusually high. They are rational and in touch with reality. They are willing to look at what is and deal with it rather than hide it and deny it. Doing more of what doesn't work won't make it work any better. Charles J. Givens, real estate investment strategist and author of Wealth Without Risk. Know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. A big part of getting out of denial is to get good at recognizing bad situations and then deciding to do something about them. It always amazes me how difficult recognition and decision is for most people, even when it comes to alcoholism and drug addiction. With many addicts, their marriages fail, their businesses fail, they lose their house, and even end up on skid row before they realize their addiction is not working for them. Fortunately, most of our problems are less severe than drug addiction, but that doesn't make the recognition or decision any easier. Take your job, for instance. Are you in denial about what you would really like to be doing? Worse yet, do you constantly talk about how happy and fulfilled you are when you're not? Are you living a lie? Workaholics are a perfect example of this kind of denial. A high-pressure schedule can't possibly work long-term for anyone. But most workaholics will defend it with comments such as, I'm making great money. This is how I support my family. It's how I get ahead. And I have to do it to compete at the office. As we've explored already, defending and justifying a bad situation is really just a form of denial. Denial is based on fear. 
Often denial is based on the notion that something even worse will happen if we stop our denial and take corrective action. In other words, we're afraid to face the truth. Many a therapist can tell you that, in spite of overwhelming clues that their spouse is having an affair, many patients won't confront their spouse over it. They simply don't want to face the fact that their marriage might be over. They don't want to deal with the emotional stress and the physical inconvenience of a divorce. They don't want to deal with the financial upheaval or the possibility that they might have to move or get a job. What are some of the situations you are afraid to deal with? Your teenager who is smoking or doing drugs? A supervisor who leaves early but dumps his late projects on you? A business partner who doesn't do his fair share of the work or spends too much money? Your house payment or expenses that are unmanageable? Your aging parents who now need full-time care? Your health, which is becoming a problem because of a poor diet or lack of exercise? A spouse who is never home, withdrawn, disrespectful, abusive, or supercritical? Not enough free time for yourself or your children? Though many of the situations above may require drastic changes in how you live, work, and relate to others, Remember that the solution to these problems isn't always to quit your job, get a divorce, fire the employee, or ground your teenager. It may be more productive to choose less extreme alternatives, such as a discussion with your boss, marriage counseling, setting boundaries with your teens and siblings, scaling back your expenditures, or seeking competent professional help. Of course, these less drastic solutions still require you to face your fears and take action. But you have to face what isn't working first. The good news is that the more you face uncomfortable situations, the better you get at it. When you face just one thing that isn't working, the next time you have the slightest inkling, you are more likely to take action immediately. And the sooner you take action, the easier it is to clean up. Remember the old saying, a stitch in time saves nine? It's true. Take action now. Take the time right now to make a list of what isn't working in your life. Start with the seven major areas where you would normally set goals, financial, career or business, free time or family time, health and appearance, relationships, personal growth, and making a difference. Ask your family, friends, employees, co-workers, class, group, coach, or team what they believe is not working. Ask, what's not working? How can we improve it? What requests can I make? What do you need from me? What do I or we need to do? What action steps can I or we take to get each of these situations to work the way I or we would like? Do you need to talk to someone? Call a repair person? Ask someone for help? Learn a new skill? Find a new resource? Read a book. Call an expert. Make a plan to fix it. Choose one action you can take and then do it. Then keep taking another action and another action until you get the situation resolved. Principle 31. Embrace change. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. John F. Kennedy, 35th President of the United States Change is inevitable. At this very moment, for instance, your body and cells are changing. The earth is changing. The economy, technology, how we do business, even how we communicate is changing. And though you can resist that change and potentially be swept away by it, you can also choose to cooperate with it, adapt to it, and benefit from it. Grow or Die In 1910, Florist's Telegraph Delivery, known today as FTD, was founded by 15 American florists who began using the telegraph to exchange orders and deliver flowers to customers' loved ones thousands of miles away. Gone were the days when a daughter or sister would go to the local florist and order a small bouquet. Family members were relocating to cities and towns far from home. 
and FTD flourished by identifying this trend and combining it with the telegraph, which represented a change in the way we communicate. Around the same time, the American railroad industry began to see the automobile and the airplane as new technologies designed to transport people and goods from place to place. But unlike other industries, who readily embraced these new machines, the railroad industry resisted, believing instead that they were in the railroad business, not the business of transporting goods and people. They didn't realize what they were up against. They didn't grow. Though businesses focusing on the railroads might have become automobile and aircraft businesses, they didn't. As a result, they almost died out. Where do you need to grow? When change happens, you can either cooperate with it and learn how to benefit from it, or you can resist it and eventually get run over by it. It's your choice. When you embrace change wholeheartedly as an inevitable part of life, looking for ways to use new changes to make your life richer, easier, and more fulfilling, your life will work much better. You will experience change as an opportunity for growth and new experiences. Several years ago, I was hired to consult with the Naval Sea Systems Command in Washington, D.C. They had just announced they were moving the entire command to San Diego, California, which meant that a lot of civil service jobs were going to be lost in that transition. My job was to conduct a seminar for all the non-military personnel who would not be moving to California. And though the Naval Sea Systems Command had offered everyone jobs and transfers to San Diego, including reimbursement of all moving expenses, or assistance in locating a new job in the Washington, D.C. area, many of the employees had become almost frozen with fear and resentment. Though nearly all of them looked at this change as a major disaster in their lives, I encouraged them to look at it as an opportunity, as something new. I taught them about E plus R equals O, and how, although the move to San Diego, E was inevitable. Their outcome, O, whether or not they flourished afterward, was entirely dependent on their response, R, to the situation. Perhaps you'll find a more empowering job in D.C., I said, or even get a job with better pay. Or maybe you would like to move to California where it's warm most of the year and new friends and adventures are awaiting you. Slowly, they began to move from panic and fear to realizing that things could indeed work out, maybe even for the better, if only they embraced this change as an opportunity to create something new and better for themselves. How to Embrace Change Realize that there are two kinds of change, cyclical change and structural change, neither of which you can control. Cyclical change, such as the change we see in the stock market, happens several times a year. Prices go up and they go down. There are bull markets and corrections. We see seasonal changes in the weather increased spending during the holidays, more travel in the summer, and so on. These are changes that happen in cycles, and we just accept them as a normal part of life. But there are also structural changes, such as when the computer was invented and the Internet was created, and both of these technologies completely changed how we live, work, get our news, and make purchases. Structural changes like these are the kinds of changes where there is no going back to doing things the way they were before, and these are the kinds of changes that can sweep you away if you resist them. Like the Naval Sea Systems Command employees, FTD florists, or the railroad industry, will you embrace these structural changes and work to improve your life, or will you resist them? Remember back to a time when you experienced a change but resisted. Perhaps it was a move, a job transfer, a change in suppliers, a change in technology in your company, a change in management, or even your teenager going off to college. A change you were going to have to deal with, and you thought it was the worst thing in your world. What happened once you surrendered to the change? Did your life actually improve? Can you look back now and say, Wow, I'm glad that happened. Look at the good it eventually brought me. If you can always remember that you've been through changes in the past, and that they've largely worked out for the best, 
You can begin to approach each new change with the excitement and anticipation you should. To help embrace any change, ask yourself the following questions. What's changing in my life that I'm currently resisting? Why am I resisting that change? What am I afraid of with respect to this change? What am I afraid might happen to me? What's the payoff for my keeping things the way they are? What's the cost I'm paying for keeping things the way they are? What benefits might be there in this change? What would I have to do to cooperate with this change? What's the next step I could take to cooperate with this change? When will I take this next step? Principle 32 Transform your inner critic into an inner coach. A man is literally what he thinks. James Allen, author of As a Man Thinketh. Research indicates that, on average, people talk to themselves about 50,000 times a day. This includes you. Unfortunately, most of that self-talk is about yourself. And according to the psychological researchers, it is 80% negative. Things such as, I shouldn't have said that. They don't like me. I'm never going to be able to pull this off. I don't like the way my hair looks today. That other team is going to kill us. I can't dance. I'm not a speaker. I'll never lose this weight. I can't ever seem to get organized. I'm always late. Argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours. Richard Bach, author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel. We also know from this research that these thoughts have a powerful effect on us. They affect our attitude, our motivation to act, our physiology, even our biochemistry. Our negative thoughts actually control our behavior. They make us stutter, spill things, forget our lines, break out in a sweat, breathe shallowly, feel anxious or scared, and taken to the extreme, they can even paralyze or kill us. Worried Himself to Death Many years ago, Reader's Digest featured the true story of Nick Sitzman, a strong, healthy, and ambitious young railroad yard man. He had a reputation as a diligent worker and had a loving wife, two children, and many friends. One midsummer day, the train crews were informed that they could quit an hour early in honor of the foreman's birthday. While performing one last check on some of the railroad cars, Nick was accidentally locked in a refrigerator boxcar. When he realized that the rest of the workmen had left the site, Nick began to panic. He banged and shouted until his fists were bloody and his voice was hoarse, but no one heard him. With his knowledge of the numbers and the facts, he predicted the temperature to be zero degrees. Nick's thought was, if I can't get out, I'll freeze to death in here. Wanting to let his wife and family know exactly what had happened to him, Nick found a knife and began to etch words on the wooden floor. He wrote, It's so cold, my body is getting numb. If I could just go to sleep. These may be my last words. The next morning, the crew slid open the heavy doors of the boxcar and found Nick dead. An autopsy revealed that every physical sign of his body indicated he had frozen to death. And yet the refrigeration unit of the car was inoperative, and the temperature inside indicated 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Nick had killed himself by the power of his own thoughts. You, too, if you're not careful, can kill yourself with your limiting thoughts— not all at once, like Nick Sitzman, but little by little, day after day, until you have slowly deadened your natural ability to achieve your dreams. Your negative thoughts affect your body. We also know from polygraph lie detector tests that your body reacts to your thoughts, changing your temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate, muscle tension, and how much your hands sweat. When you are hooked up to a lie detector and are asked a question such as, Did you take the money? Your hands will get colder. Your heart will beat faster. Your blood pressure will go up. 
Your breathing will get faster, your muscles will get tighter, and your hands will sweat if you did take the money and you lie about it. These kinds of physiological changes occur not only when you are lying, but also in reaction to every thought you think. Every cell in your body is affected by every thought you have. Negative thoughts affect your body negatively, weakening you, making you sweat, and making you uptight. Positive thoughts affect your body in a positive way, making you more relaxed, centered, and alert. Positive thoughts cause the secretion of endorphins in the brain and reduce pain and increase pleasure.